Greetings ladies and gents, and welcome to this mega pack video for the first 30, yes, 30 episodes of the HFY Tales from Outer Space. Minus one, there was a little NSFW. I will include timestamps in the comment section down below. On a side note, the majority of these 50 videos will be from Regal Legal Eagle, as he was one of the first major authors to give me permission to use his work. But from the second Mega Pack video, there will be a much bigger variety of authors. As always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider subscribing. Also, if you prefer this longer format of Mega Pack, just give it a thumbs up and leave a comment as well. Righto, on to the stories. Saxy Humans, written by Plusium. Humans are weird. This is an almost universally accepted statement. As true as the sky of Baltimore 6 is purple, all the fallopian chicks are the smallest children in the galaxy. This is to say it's true, with a very few exceptions. For starters, there is their appearance. Almost any species would tell you that they find any human at mildly attractive, if only a little. It's something about them being so neutral for all of the biological designs of other creatures. This, of course, feeds right into the second quirk. Looting. Humans will famously sexualize and loot anything. Anything. From a planet eating black holes to horrific slime creatures to deep ocean tentacled monsters, especially that last one, for some strange reason. Humans are no stranger to all of these things. And yet, that's not their distinguishing feature to many species. What truly sets them apart, far above the rest of the bioevolutionary pack, is their music, their language, their beat, their rhythm. Then give any human a stick at the surface, and they can tap at a rhythm worthy of a Drovian super orchestra. Give them an instrument and some training. They'll make you a supernova. Such a phenomenon is about to be experienced. Right now, by the innocent crowd of Craxians, standing before them is a tall African man with a bright white suit. His black hair is slicked back and a pair of dark black sunglasses sit on his face in defiance to the gloomy atmosphere around him. He stands on a rotating wooden stage surrounded by the Craxians. The Craxians are very similar to humans in that they are bipedal and have a somewhat humanoid face. Their bodies, however, look like a sectioned insectoid carapace, with a bulbous abdomen sticking out of the back. Of course, they're all dressed or modified with various tools, all pushing them closer to the human beauty baseline in an attempt to woo the alpha male. Various notes of monetary value are thrown at the man as he rotates slowly on the platform, a golden instrument clutched in one hand and a microphone in the other. He speaks to the crowd, rousing them like some professional DJ. Eventually, he is satisfied with the crowd's excitement and passes the microphone off to another human man on the stage with him. The other is wearing a matching white suit, although the man's skin is slightly lighter, a chocolate brown to the ebony black of the earlier man. The duo waits a couple of seconds before the second man raises the microphone onto the stand in front of him and hoists his guitar. A couple of gentle notes ring out before the man begins a hum. The man with the golden instrument stands in silence, head bowed. Half a minute of singing later, he raises the instrument to his lips, and the man stops singing. The guitar player picks up the beat, and the sax man begins a soft, rhythmic accompaniment. Soothing notes ring across the room. As the patrons swing in the rhythm, the man begins to gently sing into the microphone. I feel so unsure, as I take your hand and I lead you to the dance floor. As the music dies, something in your eyes calls the mind of the silver screen, all its sad goodbyes. Neon strobe lights flash across the stage and the two performers prance around. Then the sax player sets down his instrument and begins to dance, mesmerizing the patrons. Smoke fills the room from a small hole in the side of the platform, adding a sensual air to the dancing patrons. I'm never gonna dance again. Guilty feet have got no rhythm, though it is easy to pretend. I know that you're not a fool. 
The beat picks up and the singer starts to lean into the song. Dancing reaches a fever pitch and the man dancing picks up a sweat. The smoke fills the room completely, whispering up and over the stage, swelling in eddies around the performer's feet. Should have known better than to cheat a friend and waste the chance that I've been given, so I'm never gonna dance again the way that I danced with you. The darker man picks back up his instrument and begins to play, once again entrancing the audience. They bob and sway with increasing tempo, throwing more and more denominations onto the stage as the performers put their all into it. I am can never mend the careless whispers of a good old friend. To the heart and mind ignorance is kind. There is no comfort in truth. Pain is all that you'll find. The solo stops, much in the dismay of the patrons, but the resuming dancing soon puts him at ease. The singer continues his smooth notes, weaving rich caramel from mere sound waves. The gentle beat begins to lull in the patron's mind, singing of sleep and rest, gentle nights in bed. I'm never going to dance again, guilty feet have got no rhythm, though it is easy to pretend, I know that you're not a fool. Saturn begins to cloak the minds of the patrons as they breathe in heavy aroma of smoke in the room. The gentle jazz continues to ring through their minds, and the dancer moves memorize them, lulling them further to sleep. I should have known better than to cheat a friend, and waste the chance that I'd been given, so I'm never going to dance again the way that I danced with you. The sexy sax solo picks up again, and its player sways gently from side to side with a rhythm moving left to right in time with the gentle fluctuations of the singer's voice. Chocolate smooth notes ring from the guitar, adding spell upon spell to the patron's sense adult minds. They've stopped shouting and jeering now, instead they sway in time with the players. Never without your love, tonight the music seems so loud. I wish that we could lose this crowd, maybe it's better this way we'd hurt each other with the things we'd want to say. All energy is gone in front of the room as the patrons begin to drop to the floor. Fast asleep. The gas works fast. The saxophone player slips down from the stage, the singer picking up the tempo to distract the patrons from this disruption. The sax player slides between the hypnotized patrons, going between the ones that have fallen asleep and stripping all of their valuable belongings from them. We could have been so good together. We could have lived and danced forever. But no one's gonna dance with me. Please stay. This continues the man collecting valuables while the singer picks up the pace to distract the patrons from the rapidly dropping number. Before long, everyone is out and the singer drops down off the stage too. They quickly gather the loose change from the stage before heading to the large doors, still playing the song. And I'm never gonna dance again. Guilty feet have got no rhythm. Though it is easy to pretend, I know that you're no fool. They make their way to the getaway car, all the while at a slow, gentle pace. Should have known better than to cheat a friend and waste the chance that I've been given. So I'm never gonna dance again, the way that I danced with you. They get in, they escape. Now that you're gone, now that you're gone, what I did is so wrong so wrong that you had to leave me alone. In the morning, the only thought left in the patron's mind upon discovering their lack of valuables is simple. Stupid sexy humans. End of story. The Trash Jumpers Written by Regal Legal Eagle Looking out over the river valley below. The large campfire that he always remembered as a child crackled and snapped behind him. But the canvas tents had been replaced by a stone and marble. Indeed, his people's homes had grown greatly since the fateful day so long ago. They had a real city now. Streets, houses, and a small but growing library. His people were no longer just farmers. They could do and be whatever they wanted with their lives. The field stretched out as far as the eye could see, and the harvest was almost up from them, and he could see that a few of the tenders wandering out there, the light of the twin moons holding true and dark at bay. Past the fields were the trash mountains. Although they hadn't had much trash in a long time, the young ones simply called them the Bone Hills, since they looked like the bones of a pheasant that had been picked clean by scavengers. 
but to Thantus they would always be the trash mountains. He looked up then, in the clear night sky, at the large white blue moon, Sek, and his younger sister, the pale purple Ress. Stretching out along the sky, however, were the trash rings, the remains of an ancient battle that happened long before his time. The battle had been brought to the trash jumpers here. Behind him, he heard the hushed tones, and looked over his shoulder to see the herd of children looking his way and whispering. One was out in front seemingly ready to build up the courage to talk to him. Thantus decided just to make it easy on them. The elder grumbled a bit and rose up, letting his four legs stretch out from underneath him, using his power of the upper hands to push a little. He was getting old, but he wasn't helpless yet. His long, shaggy mane remained simple and unfettered by the styles and trinkets the kids these days liked to weave into their own. The children grasped as he approached. A giant even amongst his own kind, he wandered closer to the warmth of the fire, and then he settled back down on his legs. He looked around the group of children, who were all hushed and yet obviously wanted to ask. He knew their parents, and filled their little heads with lies about his great deeds through his life. Everyone seemed to think that he was a hero, and all he had ever done was break the old laws the laws about never hurting a living creature, the oldest and most sacred of their bowels when he was young. He never liked those stories, but there was a story he did like. So, young ones, do you want to hear a story of the trash dumpers? They clambered up then, excitement alight in their eyes, as they shouted and agreed in a varied tones depending on how much they'd heard before. He took a deep breath, and rumbled out as softly as he looked back over the fields, out towards the Trash Mountains. Do you know why we used to call those the Trash Mountains? He asked, pointing with one of his three fingers. It used to be covered in a trash holder, but one day it was all stolen. Stolen? He turned back with a huff as the children skittered back. It was taken, but it was not stolen. It was trash. It was not ours because we never gave it a second thought. No, it was not stolen. And what do you all know of our people? How we came here? Another young one piped up. We were brought here to make food. Yes, we were. And who brought us here? The Red Ones. Thantus chuckled at that. His deep baritone rumbling had across the crackling fire. Yes, the Red Ones. Although we called them the Anadlids and their empire, they brought us here well before my time. They told us to farm, and every month they'd return to take most of what we made. Every half a solar cycle, they'd wait for us to leave our special ceremony to claim our elders as meat. Their children gasped at that, since likely they hadn't been told that part yet. To spare them nightmares, well, that made them soft in Thanatus's thinking needed to let them know the real history. That's right, if I had been my age back then, I would have been meat for their bellies before fifteen solar cycles ago. But even our elders allowed it. It was the way of the things they said. They gladly traded their lives for our continued peace on this planet. It was a simple life. Farm, gather, and wait to be eaten by the Anatlids. We lived in tents made a simple canvas, twine, and sticks. Not these fancy buildings you all enjoy today. But we were not alone on this planet. There were also the trash jumpers. He looked back out over the moonlit fields once more to the mountains beyond. We never knew their names. They were small, energetic. They lived in the trash and would always be seen jumping over it. So, that was their name, the Trash Jumpers. He pointed out at the sky to the rings of trash held in the sky by some unknown force. That was the remains of a great fleet that they had once possessed. They lost, but the survivors rained down on the planet with trash. Generations ago they waited, until the Antelids brought us here, thinking this planet secure. Then they started to return. We had no idea what they were doing out there. To us, their lives were short and strange. He mused over his thoughts. 
thinking back to his own childhood. They could grow much. They had to live in the mountains and hide from the red ones, as you call them. So they'd venture down here to our homes and trade with us. I didn't understand why my elders would want trash, but I learned that it wasn't just trash. There were trinkets and valuables and little bits of tech that we grew much food. So we were happy to trade. I remember seeing some trash fall out of the sky, hitting the plains of the south, and it made a big hole. There was something shiny and valuable looking at the bottom. But the elders told us to let the trash jumpers get to it. The trash from the skies were dangerous, and indeed, when the trash jumpers tried to claim it that night, there was an explosion from the hole. I didn't understand why they would kill themselves, or at least risk death over trash. He rumbled, and a little of his shook his head. Ah, but one glorious night when I was young. Oh, that night. He smiled, looking up at the sky, thinking back on it. Then he pointed over towards the mountains. We saw a light, rising up out of the trash. It was glorious and shot up towards the heavens on a pillar of fire. But before it reached the sky, it exploded. He roared out and startled the children who gasped and shifted, his hands expanding out to emphasize it. I realized that's what they were doing with the trash. They were building something to reach the skies. Well, I figured after that night that they were done, and it hadn't worked. But that didn't stop them. More trash fell from the skies, and two weeks after the first attempt, we saw another pillar of fire rise up. Well, this one made it. He pointed up at the trash rings. We saw it rise up and vanish into the sky itself. The next day, more trash than ever rained down upon the plains. We didn't think about it at the time, but very little rained down on our fields. When I first pointed this out to the elders, they thought that it was simple luck. I know now that it wasn't luck. It was the trash jumpers. They didn't want to harm us on accident. Better to hurt themselves. He shrugged his broad shoulders for a moment. The Anatlids returned the next time on one of their many ships. It moved much more quietly than the pillars of fire that the trash jumpers had. They were tall creatures like us, very angular, claws, teeth. He pantomimed the features for the children as he spoke. They were hunters, and mean ones. One of the elders tried to tell them about the pillars of fire, but they didn't believe him. They were insulted at his attempts to spare himself from the ceremony and butchered him on the spot. Thanatus shivered as a little as he thought back to that night and the meeting hill, only feet away from where he sat now. After that, we didn't tell the Anatlids anything about the trash jumpers. They claimed more of our elders and left, and they always picked the smartest amongst them as well. They wanted us to never stray from our task of farming after all. But the trash jumpers soon returned from their hiding holes in the trash, and we saw more pillars of fire soon once a night, then twice a night. And a week after that, we didn't see any more pillars of fire. Instead, we saw streaks of light. But there were more explosions during all of this time. Not all of the journeys were successful. I don't know how many of them died each week, but they never stopped. He rubbed his chin slowly, and then one day my mother and sister fell ill. It was the grey mould. Some of the food we had to grow for just the anatlids could get the strange fungus. It would take two or three days, but anyone who had it growing on them would die. The new elders told me that it was simply the way of life. They'd die and be set aflame into the spare the rest of the herd. Slowly, he shook his head and pointed back out towards the mountains. But I knew that the trash jumpers didn't think that way. I disobeyed our elders. I snuck into the tent they'd sealed up around my mother and sister. I collected some of the fungus, and I went in search of the trash jumpers. Make no mistake, I was risking being thrown from the herd. 
and marked an arcost to venture beyond the valley was a grave offence back then. He thought back to that night. The fields were far larger than they looked like before that. He walked and walked and walked, and it seemed to take all night, but he finally reached the edge of the trash mountains. He looked back at the children to fold them in on his thoughts. Back when those really were the trash mountains, they were covered in metal, jagged, sharp pieces mostly. It was a treacherous climbing up those hills. We weren't made for it. We're made for the plains. I cut myself many times, but I kept climbing up higher and higher. And then one of them found me. I remember seeing the cave in the distance, partially covered by a giant sheet of metal. I was covered in cuts and bleeding from many places when the light and no fire shined in my eyes. There were three trash jumpers, two of their males and one of their females. They had short hair, some poor clothing held tight to their body, and only two legs. They seemed small. So small. He sighed out as he remembered the first real encounter. In the past he'd seen them from a distance, trading with the elders that he'd never met them face to face. I begged with them, pleaded, holding out a sample of fungus. I told them I had nothing to give, but I asked for their help. They didn't even hesitate. They brought me into the cave. One of their males helped bandage my cuts, while the female prepared some sort of solve after examining the fungus in the strange metal box. I asked them what I must do to repay them. How could I have ever lived down the debt that they had over me? He smiled, thinking back. They told me that I had no debt. We fed them, and it was their debt to us. I, of course, insisted that I owed them, but they gave me some water and escorted me back down the mountain, showing me where to travel so that I wouldn't get more cuts. Once I was back in the plains, I ran home. I had been traveling all night, but I ran. I was exhausted and pouring sweat, but I made it, and I didn't acknowledge the god and the elders that had set up around my mother's and sister's tent since I broke in. I rushed past him and gave them the solve and the trash jumpers had given me. His smile grew into a full burn grin, and it worked. The fungus fell off of them. They were weak, but they were alive. Of course, I had disobeyed the elders, but they understood why. Instead of banishing me, they signed me for two months of hard labor in the fields. I didn't mind. I was strong, and it only made me stronger. I began to explore the fields and the plains more. I hoped that the trash jumpers might visit, but they were busy at night. Slowly, his grin faded, and he shook his head. Then came that faithful night. The antlers returned for the ceremony, when a piece of trash fell from the sky bigger than I'd ever seen before, right into the fields. They were surprised, but I convinced them that it was nothing. I had worked in the fields more than anyone, and I told them that it happened from time to time. Nothing to worry about. They seemed to believe me, aside from one. He kept looking out over the meeting hill, and he watched the field as I watched him. As the night drew on, he must have seen something, because he turned and pointed at me, telling me to guide him out there. Santa sighed. I had no choice. I had hoped the trash jumpers were already gone when we got there. I moved slowly until he jabbed me with a talon, cutting my side, demanding that I move faster. I was scared, so I moved faster. And when we got to the hole that the trash jumpers were still there, it was the three who had helped me, and they were still crawling over some bigger piece that looked important. Then the anatlid. Dantus became silent as he closed his eyes and he thought back to the two males. He remembered their screams. The female was struck in the side and wounded, but not dead. He remembered the anatlid red and angry. Get to my kin, I will torture this one and skin the others as trophies. It seems that you are not lying about the pillars of fire. You will be rewarded. 
I looked into her eyes. That fear and anger. Thantus had always been taught to never harm another living creature. His people were peaceful. They ate plants, they farmed, they let themselves be sacrificed. But an anger welled up within him, and that he'd never known. He punched the creature, and heard a surprise as it staggered, his mighty fist slamming into it again, driving it to the ground before he reared up on his hind legs and stomped on it. He remembered shaking with fear, and gulped right after. The anger had faded, leaving him feeling sick. The mighty Thantus nearly pissed himself with regret. His herd would have abandoned him, not just banished him. They'd chase him from their lands to die alone. Slowly, taking a breath, he looked back at the kids before him, waiting for his story to continue. I killed the Anatlid, and I crushed him beneath my mighty hooves. But only after he had slain two of the trash jumpers. I'd been weak and hesitant. I'll never forgive myself, but I picked up the injured female and told me to grab part of the trash, and I ran. I carried her up to the mountains and up. I was hasty and suffered many more cuts, but I brought her to her home, and there were more trash jumpers this time, but they were in metal suits made of trash that I didn't understand at the time. They spoke in their own language, often looking at me, covered in my blood and some of the anatlids on my front legs. They seemed to make up their minds. They escorted me back down to the fields and to my home. There were about thirty of them and those trash shoots. They told me that they were going to attack the anatlids and stop the ceremony. I couldn't believe it, but of course I agreed to help. Since our town was just tents and canvas back then, there wasn't really any place to hide them. So, I just had to guide them along the quickest path to the meeting hall. There were only nine or so anatlids left there, and one that I crushed. We were peaceful, and never fought back. Why would they need more of the crew for their ship? The trash jumpers charged up at the meeting hill, but the anatlids saw, and bolts of lightning struck several of them down. But I was faster, and knocked one of the anatlids down again. The trash jumpers had their own bolts of lightning, and the trash suits, and while many of them fell, the anlets were slain. He shook his head, thinking back on that night. The herd stared at me in horror. What had I done? I had killed a living creature, twice now, and I had angered our keepers, and brought these trash jumpers into our home, to the very meeting hill. But one of the trash jumpers explained that they would protect us now, and we wouldn't be meat for our captors. It sounded too good to be true for many, who were scared about the return of the anatlids. But I was spared abandonment that night. He smiled then. Ah. <sighs> but then the next day the trash jumpers showed their true progress. They flew the anatlid ship into the sky and we saw all of the pillars of fire and streaks of light launch at once. There had to be a hundred. Then they returned in the biggest ship that I had ever seen. It was larger than the very city, wings stretched out and made of black and white. Not true white, however. It was scarred and scratched and old and worn from being in the sky for too long. It was massive and the trash jumpers brought it down and swarmed over it, fitting trash from the mountains to the outside. And, for the first time, we saw the other ships. Shaking his head, he chuckled softly. They were much like I expected from the trash jumpers. The other ships were trash, chunks and hunks of this and that, stuck together however they fit. I thought that they had some ancient vessels that were simply old and dangerous. But no, they had made them from the scratch, slapping them together and lightly praying that they would work. Then they had all launched into the sky at once. Pillars of fire, streaks of light, and a massive bone of white mountain. A flying trash mountain now, up, up, into the sky. He sighed once more as he thought about it. 
The next night, the sky was on fire. Explosions, flames, lightning streaking through the trash. It was a spectacle that I had never seen the likes of since. And the morning after, the trash mountain returned, and it was belching smoke and missing pieces, and many of the other trash jumpers' ships did not return. But there were no anatlids. The remains of the battle rained down on our fields, the plains and the mountains. But the trash jumpers no longer hid. They swarmed out all over it, patching together the flying trash mountain, making more ships using everything that they had. It took another month before the mountains were bare. The bone hills you see them now. He grew silent then, thinking back on it. He had been afraid to talk to the trash jumpers after his failure to save the two males. But the female sought him out and asked him to come see the trash mountain. He begged for forgiveness that she once more said that it was her debt to him, not the other way around. He had walked with her out to the flying trash mountains as she spoke. We appreciate everything you and your people have done for us. But we need to go to the skies now. We will hunt the anatlids and we will find more of our own. And we will burn the empire to the ground. You're leaving. You're all leaving. But what will we do? You mean you'll just leave us here? Why won't you take us with you? Take you with us? No. We go in search of war and strife. You stay here. This planet is yours now. Live in peace. One day, when the Anadlids are no longer a threat, we will return to you in peace. But you get to live your lives however you want now. No one will threaten you. Thantus was shocked and sad at the same time. He couldn't believe that the trash jumpers felt so indebted for the bits of food that the elders didn't want. You and your trash mountain honor us. I will make sure my people always know of our shared debt. Food for peace is a very small price. Us and our what? Your trash mountain that flies. He waved his giant ship above them. She looked up and laughed. The memory of that laugh made him smile as he stared at the fire. The next day the trash jumpers left. The side of the ship had painted on it now, and it read... Trash Mountain. What happened, Alda? One of the children asked as he looked up and remembered where he'd left off. They left us, and they flew into the stars to find the Anatlids and defeat them, to protect us and any like us from being used as food and slaves for their evil. And one day, one day they'll return, and we will give them as much food as we can possibly can even if they tell us we don't need to, because they gave us freedom. Your parents have become writers, builders, stonemasons, artists, craftsmen. They have become whatever they want. Even we collect trash now, trying to learn from it like they did, thanks to the trash jumpers who traded trash for food, and built an army, and a fleet out of the junk and the remains to challenge the galaxy's mightiest empire. But how do you know they're still out there, Alda? You haven't seen them since you left. Because, young one, it has been two hundred solar cycles. I am old and weary, but the Anadlets have not returned. If the foe was able to build a fleet from little old trash I mentioned, what they would be able to achieve with all the new trash that they made by destroying the Anadlids. They're up there somewhere. And while my friends might be gone, I can only pray that her offspring live on, so that I might thank them one last time. He looked up at the sky, watching a streak brush across the sky as another piece of trash fell down from the heavens. Dead Humans Rising, written by Regal Legal Eagle. The Grasnet invasion of Earth had started out with a bang, literally. Their ships had jumped into orbit after sending scouting drones, and they wiped out the major cities in a massive blue plasma explosions. But what they'd expected to be nothing more than a simple mop-up operation in the weeks to follow now dragged on for three years.
The humans were tenacious and simply didn't give up their planet without a fight. Some of the Gresnet High Command was even worried that the humans were starting to win. The humans hid away in the ruins of their old buildings, or out in the wild, overgrown forests, waging a guerrilla war with the invaders, whittling them down bit by bit as they refused to give up. In the swamps and the lands once known as Louisiana, the Grasnet had reports of a human known as a witch doctor who had been terrorizing the local Grasnet forces. Their soldiers spread rumors of humans rising out of the ground or fighting on despite having wounds, and High Command had dispatched five of their remaining commandos to seek this human out and stop these vicious attacks. It had taken a week of tracking, but they had finally found the creature's hideout. As the boat jumped up against the shore of the grassnets jumped out onto the soggy ground, dragging their craft up from the swamp. The grassnets were humanoids with dark grey chitin covering their bodies, their eyes white with black slits, and their four-fingered hands clutching their pulse rifles close as they looked around the island that they had arrived on. It had once been a home to something that the humans called a amusement park. The equipment had rusted and worn, pieces having fallen off here and there, and they approached the gates they passed under, the faded sign that said, Welcome to Voodoo Land. There were strange effigies hanging from the sign, bundles of sticks and bones of small animals tied together with twine. They were scattered around the area, hanging from signs, rides, and stalls. It set them on edge, their neck spines standing on edge. The sky was grey as the sun set, and the misty white fog slowly rolling in over the islands as they walked deeper. Then, one of their number, named Taz, pointed to another of these strange effigies. Look! The others followed his finger at the effigy that didn't sport any bones of small animals, but the skulls of a gasnet. It was hanging from a strange round metal structure that had copies of various earth animals and strange poles rising up out of their backs. There were more within the structure, all decorated with bones and chitin structures of the grassnets. Taz slowly approached it, reaching up with the intent of putting the first bundle down. But before he could do that, they were surprised as the structure sprang to life. The lights flashed on and started to spin as they all backed up warily. They heard some strange music fading and a scratchy pouring out of the speakers as the structure lazily spun around. The effigies clacking and bumping into one another as they moved. The lights all around them began to come to life as they formed a circle. Weapons rising, but they couldn't find a target. They heard laughter and twisted warped with the lack of maintenance and the speakers all around them. It knows we're here, Jaff muttered. They looked around and then Yearn pointed to the massive dark structure near the center of the park. It was a mansion of some sort, black with age, looking old and decrepit. There's something in that window. They looked and saw some white figure briefly in the dark window upstairs before it seemed to fade away. They began to advance, moving around and spinning structure covered the remains of the dead kin. The structure had some strange metal tubing in front of it, set into lines of some sort, but they quickly hopped onto the low pieces and walked up the entrance. Just as they got close to the door, it slowly creaked open, and they raised their weapons cautiously. Nothing came out, and they slowly walked forward once more. Mrek wet his mandibles with a black tongue as they jumped forward through the door, weapons swinging left and right. Inside of this room of some sort, an ancient wooden furniture along the edges of the room, cobwebs dominating the corners as the little spiders scurried along them. Mrek waved his others forwards as Jav, Yearn, and Taz quickly moved in inside and Hearn moved backwards, watching the path behind them until he was inside. There was only one door leading on from this room and they looked inside, seeing a large circular waiting area of some sort with a high ceiling covered in stained glass. There was a door on the far wall that was open. They stepped inside. 
But when the five were in the center, the doors behind them and in front of them slapped shut. Formed a circle, weapons raised yet again. Then they saw a flash of light in the bottom of the thunder coming from above. The lights dimmed for a moment as the evil voice cackled out of the partially busted speaker. <laughs> you dare enter the mansion of the Madame Voodoo. If you enter, less survive. Taz quickly relaxed. This is a, a thing that humans used to have. It's just an attraction of sorts. The floor beneath him started to rumble as it began to drop down into the ground, inch by inch, while the recording blabbled on. We just need to walk through it and track down the human. This was likely a diversion. The others looked less sure. Then they looked up at something green swept through the air. Yearn fired off a few blue bolts that sailed through it, slamming into the wall as Taz knocked the gun down. It's a projection, you idiot. More of those green ghosts groaned and moaned as they flew over their heads. Then rumbling, the platform stopped, and the newly revealed door opened. They walked through it, finding themselves in a series of hallways, winding and twisting in front of them. There were old wooden doors on either side, but as they tried to rattling the handles, they found them to be nothing more than decorations. The commando started to walk forward then, hearing the cry of some black bird as a robotic version of one sped along the tracks overhead. The click-clock of the old clock thudding against each corner as they walked. Halfway down the first hallway, though, they suddenly heard a roar and a snarl as a door that they were passing splintered, driven inward by some massive creature. They screamed and fired into the door, blue shots slamming into the door as it cracked and bulged out towards them. But then they panted and watched the center section that was cracked and splintered and drew back inwards, flat as it had been when they first approached. They were confused and then heard the same snarl and roar and fired more bolts into the door as the creature beyond. When it slowly flattened yet again, Yuen spoke. Wait! Stop firing! The others reloaded their energy packs and waited for the snarl and roar once more. When the door bulged, and this time he gripped the edge of it and tore it away. Behind it, they didn't find a fearsome creature but a metallic hydraulic system that had been attached to the door. It's just a machine. The others grumbled and began to advance once more, but as they rounded the next corner, a furry giant beast that towered over them jumped out of the junction. They screamed once more and fired again, bolts slamming into the creature as they stripped away pieces of metal and fur to reveal more metal and wiring beneath. It pulled back into the junction after a few seconds, and Taz growled. Conserve ammo. They're just trying to scare us into wasting what we have. Save some for the real threats. Once more, they reloaded their energy packs and advanced. At the next junction, they stepped forward warily, and the door to the left opened as a dark-skinned human figure with a white skeleton painted on the front was a reveal of a war cry. His hands raised and threatening. Then a red creature with the black curled horns jumped out of the junction to their right. This time, the Grasnets didn't fire. They muttered and began to walk forward past the fake trap. Yet, as Hearn brought up the rear, the others didn't notice that the fake human suddenly jumped out, grabbing him and dragging him into the door, which slammed shut. They finally exited the halls, looking down the room, with the green and white projection sitting down and some fake dinner laid out before them. The recording prattled on about something, as the projections ate the fake food and seemed to choke and die, before flying up into the air, making groaning and moaning noises. This is stupid, Taz muttered, and then glanced back, pausing for a moment. Where's Hearn? The others turned then, looking around as the five had become four, and they rushed back to the last junction. And the red creature jumped out of the door, but the one with the human stayed closed. Yearn shoved against it, but the metal door didn't budge. They gulped, and raising their weapons as they realized that this had been a trap, not just a diversion. 
advancing past the dining room that they were walking down a hall, and they saw what looked like two giant cobwebs ahead of them. Mrek pulled out his knife free, and he walked forward, ready to clear the white webs out. But then the ground beneath them dropped away, and they gasped and cried, sliding down a metal half-tube. Giant spiders seemed to drop from the ceilings as they sped down the tube. They were revealed to be robotic, hovering just above them. As they slid down, Jav actually collided with one of these things, grunting out, but his eyes went wide as a thin wire, fastened into a loop, was jerked free of its place from its collision, and he fell down around his throat. He grunted and tried to slip his hands out from under the spider, but then he began to rise back up into the air. His eyes went wide as the loop tightened and the rise of the robotic spider, choking him. The other three had hit some padding on the floor and looked back to see the tube and see his legs kicking as they hands clutched the machine. Jav! Mech tried to climb back up, but the smooth metal slide gave him no purchase. They watched in horror as the spider raised all the way back up to the ceiling, and they had could only see Jav's feet, kicking at the air until they finally stopped. He's gagging and choking, reaching their ears. Mechanical laughter filled the air around them as they jerked back around, weapons at the ready. But they were being taunted by a recording. Now three, they walked forward once more, eyes twitching all over as they looked for some kind of new trap. Then they came to a hall with three doors set into the end. They looked at each other and Mrek took the one to the far left, Taz the middle and Yearn to the right. Mrek opened his door and sighed as he found a projection wiggling around and howling at him. Taz opened his and found a path beyond. But as Yearn opened his door, a metal spear slammed through his chest. Popping open once it was through him, green blood poured out of the wound as he had time to look at his comrades before the meter spear jerked him back inside and the door slammed shut. Taz and Mrek ran forward. There was just a set of stairs in front of them and they climbed it, two steps at a time, to get some landing where they were faced with a giant face. It stared at them with an unblinking eyes, its mouth open and some sort of lever past the rows of giant fake teeth, in what would be its throat. Do you dare pull the lever to escape the mansion? Cackled the recording, but Taz and Rack stared at each other. The door next to them looked very solid and heavy and, as they pressed against it briefly, they knew that it wouldn't yield. Sighing out, Mrek set his weapon down, reaching into the mouth. He had to extend his arm all ways until he grabbed the lever, pulling it down. The door opened, but just something snapped onto Mrek's arm. He jerked and pulled, but he couldn't let his arm free. Taz started to move to help him, but then heard the chorus of deathly groans. He heard footsteps, and it sounded like something was walking up the stairs. Then the door opened on the other side, and the landing and they stood on it, and he saw what looked like a dead human's, missing arms, all pieces of flesh, eyeballs dangling out of the sockets. They were bloody and gory, as they seemed to shamble forward. Taz screamed and fired at them, and Rick having to push flat on his face to avoid the fire. Taz turned and opened the door, running out screaming as he ignored the fact that the shambling bodies had pieces of metal and wiring exposed after the blasts. Taz! Taz! They're fake, you idiot! Taz, get back here! Rek growled and shook his head. Stupid coward. He looked back at the fake dead humans and saw the black-skinned one from before, with the white skeleton painted on his flesh. The human was grinning at him, and Rek screamed. Taz heard the scream, and he ran from the building, out through the old dead garden, and back into the house. As he ran, though, the overgrown weeds something grabbed his foot. He fell forward on the ground with a grunt, and he started to push himself back up, looking back to see what had caught him. Then he saw the hand sticking out from the ground in front of the stone tablet. He had to hold his leg as something started to rise up out of it. Another of those dead humans, he screamed and kicked his leg, forgetting his weapon and he hopped to his feet and began to run. His lungs burned as he ran, straining his muscles and his joints as he ran faster than he'd ever done before. 
He could barely see his tears of fear for this vision while he ran out of the park, surrounded by the cackles and laughter coming from the speakers. Once he was back outside the gate, he ran towards the boat, only to skid to a stop as he saw those dead humans already on it. More were rising up around him, turning and gasping as he was surrounded. He realized now that this wasn't a human trap at all. It was their ghosts, their souls. They demanded revenge. They thirsted for his death. He screamed and cried as he looked around, slowly backing up against the dead humans closed in on him. Then they grabbed his wrists and bodies as he screamed, but the cry was abruptly turned to a gargle as one of the dead humans cut his throat, green blood pouring down his chest. The figure stood around his body seemingly covered in blood, and gore smeared with dirt and ground that they'd emerged from. They looked around for a moment, then the black human with the white skeleton painted approached. Get the tracking beacon. Yep, did they mess up the inside? Just the breaking door and the werewolf like usual. We'll reset the traps and then you can activate the beacon. Can I have a turn inside the mansion? I'll never get this dirt out of my crack. One of the dead humans said and tried to adjust his pants. The others chuckled. Sorry, not your turn yet. Ah, uh, you always say that, damn it. The others chuckled for a moment before getting back to work. They started to move thin and dragging the dead gaznets towards the gate. Two days later, another team of commandos approached. They crept in under the sign that said, Welcome to Voodoo Island. Green gaznet blood smeared along the fading sign with a new skull effigy dangling beneath it. Outside, human figures quietly spread out, starting to dig shallow holes as they waited for the signal to rise up yet again. This time, they made sure to leave an opening for one last Gresnet to escape through, the swamps. It just wouldn't be long until the Gresnets with steward dead humans were starting to rise up against them, hungering for their flesh. The humans had turned their old superstitions into a weapon against their enemy. But for the Gresnets, it wasn't just a game. It was their deaths, as the humans began to strike terror into their hearts. Earth wasn't dead, it was just rising. End of story. Be ready. Written by Regal Legal Eagle. Greg held out his hand to try and shield his face from the dust and dirt being blown into his face. Ever thankful for his mask that protected him. Even so, he couldn't see anything in the storm. The goddamn weather satellites were on the fritz again, so he didn't get any sort of warning before the dust storm had hit him. He sealed up his buggy and proceeded on foot, trying to make it to the nearest shelter so that he could wait out the storm in a little bit more comfort than his buggy. He knew that the shelter had only been two miles away, but it was almost three hours later when he found the damn thing. A combination of walking up a hill through the storm and then missing the building and having to circle back, Finally, he saw the outline ahead of him and picked up his pace. He quickly tapped the code into the keypad, and it slid open as he squeezed through the opening sideways and quickly hit the button on the other side to make it close behind him. This way, he let in as little dirt as possible. As he stood there, looking down at the dirt that had blown in around him, he sighed, but was more than happy to reach up and peel off his mask off his face. The air was recycled, the pump straining to filter out the dirt, but he was fine with that. It beat breathing the grit in through his mask. His filters were good, but they were never meant to try and work with a dirt storm. His hair was now mostly dirt, which wasn't a thrilling prospect. But that was a part of the price that he knew he'd pay when he signed up for this job. Being part of the first team to terraform our planet was going to be hard work, and he knew it. Once, he'd shaken the worst of the dirt out of his hair and zipped his duster, hanging it up on the hook next to the door, and looked across the way to the massive sign bolted to the wall of the shelter. It read, Two possibilities. We're alone, or we are not. Either way, be ready. This was a clear credo of the team, be ready. When he had first signed up, he expected some cheesy quote about hope, or a building a future, or something along those lines. He hadn't expected be ready, but it was actually a pretty good idea. They were alone out here. The entire team consisted of 200 people on the planet, and another 50 in space. 
When mankind managed to finally send probes to the neighboring systems, they didn't find anything, but they'd expected that. But no one had expected was that they kept searching, and they kept finding nothing. No aliens, no signals, no ruins. They hadn't even found planets with life more complicated than algae on them. This was a problem since Earth was getting so crowded, so a choice had to be made. Keep searching and hope that they got lucky, or start changing. They chose the latter, since FTL drives were expensive, and skip drives were even more expensive. And internal dampeners were the most expensive, they had to be very, very careful with how they started. First, they had chosen a planet. AM-401 had been chosen, an Earth's gravity planet, which was also roughly the same size. The atmosphere was weaker, and the ocean had a fraction of the algae and plankton found on Earth, with nothing bigger living on it. Not to mention a weak-ass moon and an ugly, misshapen, captured asteroid just half the size of the moon back home. They called it the Kidney Bean. After they picked up the planet, they had to pick the team. 250 people had been handpicked from various backgrounds and specialties to fill every job that they needed. They'd launched off the several cargo drones and nothing but automated systems to touch down on the planet. And then, a single ship with life support. Of the 250, all but five were put into cold sleep. The rest had to keep everyone alive on the four-year trip to the planet. And it was one-way trip since they couldn't carry enough fuel to make it back. Once there, they would be woken up and be split everyone across the planet. 250 people to monitor all the automated equipment that had been set up on the planet the size of Earth. That was all that they could afford to fit on one life-sustaining ship that was fast enough to get here in four years. An additional 100,000 people had been loaded onto massive sleeper ship and sent with the standard FTL drives, set to arrive in 50 years. And another five of those ships were set to arrive five years after the first one showed up. This team had to have the planet capable of sustaining life in that time. And while 50 years sounded like a lot, they had a lot of work to do. AM-401 was nearly a dead planet. With a barely any plankton, and some algae here and there, no grass, no trees, no plants, no nothing. They had to strengthen the atmosphere, start growing plants, and seed the oceans with life in 50 years. On top of all of this, they had to fight the environment, boredom, and of course entropy. They all knew that some of them would die before the colonists arrive, and those that survive would have very little life left to enjoy the work once they were done. But this was a volunteer program, and they knew what they signed up for. The atmosphere generators were spaced out around the planet in teams of five, and the fifty in the space split amongst all the small ships to start building orbital stations and satellites. Everyone else had to patrol the sector of the ground or ocean and keep everything working. The massive sea crawlers, chemsoas, and river carvers had to be maintained and regularly checked on to make sure that the programming held. He had Territory 88, which consisted of the western portion of one of the northern continents. It was roughly the size of the Pacific Northwest back on Earth, and it had just a little patch of land all to himself. He didn't have an atmosphere generator in his section, and the person assigned to patrol the ocean along his coastline was based on an island, so he hadn't seen another human face since meeting up with Lucy from Sector 87 on New Year's six months ago. They were allowed one alcoholic beverage apiece, and he'd given her a rock shaped like a fish that he had found. She'd given him a rock shaped like a bird the year before, so he thought it was fair. In three weeks, he'd meet up with Larry from Sector 75 to the south, and they'd grill something if everyone went well. He was looking forward to it, especially since that's when he allowed his next shower. They had a ration of clean water until the ocean seeding was done, and they could start irrigation and water treatment, and the atmosphere was still too weak to permit rain, so all the water just sat in the ocean. These were just a few of the reasons that he figured be ready was the creed of the mission. They needed to make sure that they didn't program the machines wrong. Their courses were correct, that they wouldn't slip up and roll their buggy down the cliff. Anything like that.
If they hurt themselves bad enough, they were wrecked. So he had to be ready to prevent it from happening, or be ready to fix it on his own. He was at least three days' drive from the nearest person, and that was in good weather. When the storm raging, he couldn't even call for help. So for now, he sighed and looked around the shelter. The two bunks were where they were supposed to be. He walked up to the cupboards and opened them, picking up a list from the wall. Canned corn, beans, meat, beets, soup. Everything was left as the last time that he'd used the shelter. Setting the list back, he walked to the sink, pulling one of the two glasses that held on the shelf from under it and the faucet before turning it on. He ran it for a few seconds, held up the slightly grainy-looking water with a frown, and then pulled his analyzer from his belt. It beeped after a second, informing him that the water was the same as before. So he shrugged and took a sip of the grainy tap water. Well, he'd been ready. Then he groaned and sat down on one of the two chairs around the small table and listened to the howling wind outside. He wished he'd been able to bring his music. The computer on the ship had been corrupted, and to everyone's dismay they'd lost almost all the programmed music. One of the techs had managed to save a phonograph files for music before 1950, although no one knew why it was in the computer for the first place. So people had broken protocol and got some of the mission's 3D printers to make up basic record players and clay records. The clay records didn't last long, but they could always be made more. This planet had plenty of mud after all. The director hadn't protested, because you could ask humans to live in near isolation for 50 years, but if you asked them to do it without music, they'd mutiny. For now, his records were in the sealed box in his buggy, and he was left alone in the shelter with the wind. Greg let out a slow, heavy sigh, and kicked his feet up onto the table. Listening to the howling all around him, he had been 25 when he'd entered the cold sleep. He wasn't sure the four years in cold sleep counted, but he'd been at this job for five years now. Forty-five years to go. He'd be seventy-five when the first sleeper ship arrived. He'd probably be dead, but he didn't mind it if everything went well. When he was alone and bored, he'd like to close his eyes, picturing his sector of this planet. Where would the people set up the towns and homes? He figured that one bay might be popular. What would they call the town? The mountains further north would be the great for skiing. Humans living on a planet orbiting another star. It made him smile. But his quiet was suddenly interrupted. Something was tapping on the wall of the shelter. He opened his eyes and looked over with a frown. Had the wind gotten strong enough to toss rocks? He heard it again. Clank, clank, clank. From behind the be ready sign, Greg stood up and sure what he was hearing. Clank, 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 clank. Something was tapping on the outside of the shelter, moving along the wall. And then the other, as it got closer to the door, he started his internal keypad and quickly took the command in to lock it. And then he stood back and tapped the sound, got closer. Clank, clank, clank. Finally, the sound of the tapping on the door. Was it someone else on a mission, lost in his sector? They would have told him where they were coming over. Right? Clank, clank, clank. The sound was right at the door on the other side. The keypad was out there. If it was a human, all they had to do was type on it, and he'd see them from his side. But no one used the keypad. Clank, clank, clank. The tapping got louder along the door. Greg gulped and looked over his shoulder at the sign. Be ready. Greg quickly pulled his mask on, grabbing his plasma welder as he turned it on. Starting at the top of the door, he began to weld it together. Clank, clank, clank. Something was beating on the door now. He continued to fuse the metal of the door together in his way down the line. Backing away once it was sealed, he didn't pull off his mask this time. Clank, clank, clank. The sound was stronger than ever, as if something was very firmly knocking on the outside of his door. Something that had found him in a dirt storm, on a planet that was supposed to be void of any native life bigger than plankton. 
Greg was breathing hard through his dirty filters as he stared at the door. He was the only human in a thousand miles, and he didn't know what was out there. But it wasn't human. Clank, clank, clank. The shelter shook as a little as something slammed into the door. Greg stepped over to his duster, pulling it back on as he waited, Wilder in hand, although he had no idea what to do with it. He kept waiting for the sound again. A minute passed. Five. Clank, clank, clank. He groaned out and watched, counting the seconds in his head. Sure enough, every five minutes something beat against the door. Was it testing the metal? It hadn't cracked or bent, but it was a few inches thick. Five minutes was that howling wind, and then clank, clank, clank. Then just went again. Greg stared at the door that he'd welded shut and gulped. Then he sat down in his chair again and stared. The tapping went on for two hours, every five minutes for the whole two hours. But after those two hours, he counted out another five minutes, and nothing tapped. He sat up a little straighter and kept counting. Half an hour passed, and the howling wind around the shelter finally eased, and then stopped. He looked at the local time. Midnight. It would be dark, very dark, since the kidney bean moon provided such bad light. He didn't feel like going out there right now. He shifted and settled in his chair and finally allowed himself to close his eyes. It felt like he was floating out in space. Blackness around him. He heard a whisper somewhere behind him. But when he turned, it was still behind him. He heard a skittering sound, and something crawled over his feet. He cursed and tried to walk, but his legs moving, but nothing touching the ground. Something crawled up his legs and whispering grew even stronger. Don't belong. He growled and kicked his legs even harder as nothing happened. You belong home. On earth, go home. Die there. The voice was whispering to him, but for some reason, that was what triggered him. He screamed out, filled with anger and rage as the light beamed from his eyes. The darkness was washed away, and he saw the floor covered with insects. He yelled and began to stomp on them, kicking them free of his legs. Wreck you! was only his answer to the whisper before he suddenly jerked his eyes open. He was still in the shelter, hungry, but awake. There wasn't even any more howling. He quickly stood up, bringing up his wilder once more. This time he cut the door back open, unlocking it and tapping the console. The door ground open and stepped out, wilder still in hand. Looking around he still saw dirt, but when he looked down, he saw the marks of some sort, something dragging through the dirt. The outside of the door behind him was covered in a single point marks, as if something had been tapping on the points with its claws. He shut the door and locked it with a keypad before he began to jog towards his buggy. The two miles that took him three hours in the storm was about twenty minutes as he navigated the broken terrain of the hill. He could see the buggy near the base since all there was around there was dirt, rocks, and some more dirt. When he got down to it, he slowly walked around it, but he didn't see any of those strange tracks near it. But the vehicle was completely covered in dirt. He pulled out a shovel off of his back and scraped the windows clean of dirt. Then he climbed up on top, inspecting the exhaust, then the intake valves brushing dirt off of them. After that, he scraped the front intake free of dirt as well, before satisfied that it was ready to drive. Putting the shovel back into its case, he climbed up into the driver's seat and turned the buggy on. As soon as he had, there were alarms sounding throughout the cabin of his computer came back to life. He cursed as he read the laundry list of warnings. All his long-range comm towers were down. Three seat crawlers were offline from the storm. Two shelters were marked as damage. There had been some sort of earthquake to the north, it seemed. Then his eyes focused on the lost in the warning list. There was a giant red circle centered around the mountains to the north. Seismic activity had been detected. Local sensors were detecting massive bolt-ups of pressure and heat. 
he took a deep breath and read on. Volcanic activity detected. Most of the range was situated in a fissure that they had somehow missed. If the sensors were correct, it was a supervolcano, the size of Yellowstone, and it was preparing to erupt. Wasn't there supposed to be a way to stop this sort of thing? He cursed softly as he opened up his glove box, pulling out an emergency manual. Flipping through, he had all the scrolled ways until they got to Volcano, and then he looked up the diagram at the back and he put his computer console. If he drilled into something near the base, it would be able to vent out the magma. He was going to have to try. Scrolling back over his map, he saw that the River Carver GX-39 was near the base of the mountains, but it wasn't responding. He cursed as he tapped on his console. No signal, unit unresponsive. He cursed again and then looked further up. There was another GX-41. He tapped on it, but he got the same thing. No signal, unit unresponsive. Frack this. He cursed and tossed the emergency manual back into the glove box, slamming it shut before he set his buggy into gear. His eyes kept moving over the bleak brown terrain as he drove over the broken ground heading north. It would take him a good five hours of bumpy driving. He'd head past the bay and swing up on the Rust River Carver to get activated and then drive around the base of the mountains to get the second one. He just wished that he could make a call to let someone know what he was doing. Greg shook and bounced as he drove, the bad terrain making his buggy bounce around as he drove. But he made himself remember, be ready. He needed to drive fast, but if he got stuck, then it was all for nothing. It took him just over four hours before he found the wide track left by the river carver. Without rain, there were just dry beds for now. So he drove into it and began to cruise up until the massive machine that he could see in the distance. It was as big as some sports stadiums back home. A massive tracked vehicle with drills and buckets to dig irrigation paths. But instead of crawling along and dragging up the ground behind it, this one was just sitting there. Near the base, he saw tracks and gulped, bringing his buggy to a halt in the dry riverbed. Jumping out of his buggy, he thought over what might be waiting for him. Then grits his teeth and pulled out a fire axe off of the back of his buggy. Hefting it in his hands, he looked up at the silent, towering machine before him. He activated the headlight on his side of the mask and began running forward under the treads. He saw more of those strange dragon claw marks in the dirt. The door at the base of the machine had been left open, it looked like. Not pausing, he ran through those doors, finding the interior of the machine cold and dead. The hallways had scratch marks all along the walls, but he didn't have time to think it over or wait, so he just rushed forward. He was climbing up the stairs, heading to the control center in the middle of the machine when he heard something ahead. He slowed down. Walking quietly along the hall as he heard something crashing the control room just around the corner. He closed his eyes for a moment and secured his grip on the fire axe. And then he charged. Inside the control room was a creature trying to tear apart the computer console that it could. It had legs, way, way too many legs, but it was a fat slug body pressed into the deck. Two long claws extended from another set of limbs further up towards his head. When it turned to him, it was looking at four black eyes arrayed around a circular mouth full of teeth. Greg screamed and the creature screamed, revealing another fat white eye beyond the rows of teeth. Greg swung his axe and it tried to scurry back, but Greg was faster, bringing the axe down on its limbs as purple gunk flowed free. He began to chop wildly, screaming, the entire time as he reduced the creature to flesh chunks, all spewed that purple liquor. Once it was over, he was breathing hard, his axe, arms and chest straining on that purple crap. Then he looked over at the consoles, rushing to the back of the control room to open up the storage locker, pulling out the replacement parts he quickly repaired the consoles and he would need, turning his welder down to solder pieces back into place and finish up. Once that was done, he frantically activated the machine, waiting for it to power up and before it cycled through the systems, checking then off as they came online. Human. He looked around and then down at the console's radio. 
You must not do this. Your species was meant to live and die in your home system. It's pure arrogance to think that you should leave. The planets that did not grow their own life are meant to be dead. We will purge this attempt to make life. We have waited centuries in case you should try. You will not succeed. Greg didn't even pay attention. He was already getting the machine running and setting what he had figured would be its last track into the automated computer before it started to rumble forward towards the mountains ahead. Human. Human, you will fail. This planet will remain dead. The voice was yelling as it left the control room, turning around to weld the door into the command center shut. Rushing back down and out of the crawler, he slowed hefting his axe in his hand as he scanned the area. Be ready. But nothing stirred, aside from the machine above him. Quickly, he jogged back to his buggy, tossing his axe into the passenger seat and climbing in. As the machine began to rumble forward, he was already picking up speed, driving east to swing around the bottom of the mountain range and up to the second river carver. His radio picked up a signal and he tuned it out. Human, you need to under. He turned it off, and he drove to another two hours down and around the edge of the mountains. He could see the smoke rising from the sum of the peaks and he checked his computer. The first river carver had started to drill, but he didn't know if one hole would release enough pressure. He kept driving up and over the hills and ridges, skidding around rocks and bouncing along as his stomach growled heavily at him. He could eat if he survived this. However, in the crest of the hill he saw another of those slug spiders. It saw him just as his buggy slammed into its fat body. Purple smeared up over the windshield, and he cursed, swerving as he felt his buggy turn and roll. Quickly, he grabbed his axe in one hand, trying to hold it down as his vehicle rolled over and over and over. When it came to a stop, he was upside down, groaning as he unfastened his restraints and then kicked the door open. He crawled out with his axe in hand, but saw no more of those creatures. The machine was in the distance, and the smoke pouring from the mountains was growing thicker. Reaching back into the flipping buggy, he pulled out of his supply crate and strapping the box to his back and making sure that he hit his welder before gripping the axe in his hands and running forward. He saw more of those tracks near the base of the machine, and he ran inside to open doors. But one of those creatures was waiting. It lunged at him from the darkness, knocking him onto his back, the supply crate bopping him up, but it hissed and snapped at his face, but he held up his axe, keeping it from getting him. And he couldn't force it off of him, though, so he had to press up with his axe in one hand and quickly shove his welder into its face. It didn't have time to pull back before he turned it on, and it screamed for a second as its face blistered and burned. It twitched and jerked and Greg cried out as one of those claws sank into his shoulder before it fully died. But then he could shove the slug off his body and get up. He groaned as he felt the pain in his shoulder, the blood seeping down his duster, but he ignored it and rushed forwards once more. There wasn't any noise coming from the control room this time, but as he charged into it, he saw the damage had already been done. Before he could look behind him, though, something slammed into his supply crate. He staggered forward and was pulled around by little by the straps of his crate. He heard the creature behind him gargling in anger. It had sunk those claws into the crate, thinking it was part of Greg. Quickly, Greg pulled free of the straps and turned as he swung his axe cleaving the thing's head off in a single sweep. As it slumped, the purple echo spewed out, and he was already shoving it into the hall and closing the door to the control room. The pants were scattered all around the room, and it found the spares in the back. He looked over and cursed. He could fix the main components, but there was no way that he'd get the automatic systems back up. He just shook his head and pulled the pawns from his supply crate and started to fix the control room back up. He heard something moving in the hall and quickly locked the door, welding it shut from the inside before turning back to his work. There was a hissing as the creature slammed into the door, but 
it howled. Once he got the systems back up and running, he turned it on and the machine hummed to life. Quickly, he started moving it forward, drilling into the base of the mountain. He didn't know how long he had, but he was moving as fast as possible to punch another hole into the volcano before it went critical. The radio sparked to life. Human, you can't do this. You have to leave the planet dead. Only gods can create life. You're committing sacrilege. Quickly, he turned the radio off and drilled into the mountain. Soon, there was nothing but the floodlights on the machine itself looking ahead into the draw paths as he cut through the stone. Looking at the computer console to aim the thing where he needed it to go. In half an hour, he drilled a hole the size of a stadium into the mountain. Ahead, he could see the steam coming from the rocks. The barrier between his hole and the molten rock beyond was very thin. Thinking it over, he started to back the machine out, knowing that the pressure would break the barrier and the lava would come pouring out soon enough. He backed the machine out, but he started to turn it away from the hole and up the mountain. Out of the path of the lava, something loud snapped and broke somewhere in the machine. It ground to a halt, and he saw the flashing light regarding the engine failure. The creatures? But it didn't matter. Soon the hillside would be covered in molten rock. His buggy was flipped, this machine wouldn't budge, and running on foot would be suicide. He let out a heavy sigh then, slumping into the command chair. He might survive here. The control room was well protected. What were these chances? 50-50? 1 in 10? He shrugged and stood up and walked over to his supply crate as he opened it up. The creature had pierced these records, it seemed. Ah, wait. He had one left. He smiled and stood and walked to the back of the control room as he found a machine that the creature hadn't noticed. He set the record into place, flipping the switch to the surface, and began to turn the needle and he picked up the tiny bumps. It was scratchy, but he could hear the music just fine. I see trees are green, red roses too. The lava began to bubble out of the hole. He dug, and he sat down in the control chair, popping his feet up on the console. As he closed his eyes, he listened to the music and wondered, what would they name the bay? Would it be a resort town, an industrial center? Maybe they'd set up a university out there, study the volcanoes. It was a shame that he couldn't warn the others, but he knew that they'd be all right. They were ready. Humanity always was. Stacy had been playing around in the park with her mom and dad, and her stupid little brother. It had been a good day, nice and warm. Not too warm, though, since the nice breeze kept the white puffy clouds swimming through the sky. As she pushed through some of the bushes while wandering around, she saw a big statue. It was a guy leaning back against the stone. He was smiling as he looked over the bay. She wondered who he was. There was a big plaque underneath the base of it, and she read the name Greg before she heard her mom. Stacy, food's ready. Where'd you go? Coming, mom, the girl called out, turning and running out of the little hidden spot to meet up with her family. They made her her favorite lunch. She found out who the statue guy was later. End of story. If you enjoyed this story and wish to support the author, the link is down below. If you would like to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so. They will also be listed in the description down below. But the easiest way to help this channel is to share it, subscribe, and like. And, as always, I will see you all in the next video, and I hope that you have a good one. Cheers, the best we have to offer. Written by Regal Legal Eagle. When humans finally started to expand beyond their system, they found that they weren't alone in the galaxy. The fact that the neck of the woods, so to speak, held many other species, all trying to expand at the same time. Through some cosmic twist, most species were about at the same technological level, and everyone started to do what they could to secure their strength. Unfortunately for humanity, their biggest neighbor was a race of war-loving half-machine bugs who wanted the systems humanity had had just started to colonize. The war raged for 10 years. 
claiming millions of lives. But in the end, humanity had won, reducing the machine bugs home to a cracked, open, dead husk while claiming their systems. It had been a hard-won victory, however. The human population had been weakened, and after ten years of conflict, the economy was struggling. There was no grand federation for peaceful planets to turn to, but the recent consortium of powerful and wealthy species had formed. The Triumvirate was hosting a massive expedition for all the competing species, to determine who should they invest their vast trade and wealth into. With the tech a little behind the Triumvirate, and their resources plentiful, but common humanity had determined what to set them apart. Physically, every species had some skill or advantage. Humanity was more adaptable and tenacious than any of their neighbors, but it was hard to sell tenacity and adaptability. What they needed was to present something that set them apart, and made them unique in the galaxy. It was also clear that their neighbors wanted to stop them from earning the trade contract. Humanity needed to find uh, the best that we had to offer. Agent Wakefield, please respond. Proceed, Station. The cartel is aware of your location. You need to move. I'm securing the spatial materials required for our presentation. Well, secure them and move. Agent Wakefield cursed as she quickly began to stuff the packages into the skewer metal box that had been provided. The genetic lock should make sure that she was the only one that could open it, but their enemies would just destroy it rather than open it. Their last shipment of supplies, waiting at the Triumphant Conference, had been sabotaged, and they had to send the replacements through a courier. Only the Triumvirate had ships fast enough to make it to Earth and back in time, and humanity had paid handsomely for the service. She was in a secure room in the courier office at a massive space station that had been constructed just for this trade show. It was a sprawling mass of orbiting, the Triumvirate's recently colonized Eden world, Crystallian. All three species had colonized it to showcase their solidarity, but this trade station was a real draw. Over 15 square miles of rooms, hallways, meeting rooms, docking bays, and of course, the main trade conference center. The courier office was on the far arm, away from the trade conference at the edge of the station. She had quite a ways to go to make it back in time. Tucking the box into a secret pocket, then she stepped out of the secure room and was suddenly face to face with two energy pistols. They were being held by a pair of lanky green deckish thugs. They were humanoids in the subpar intelligence that were employed by the cartel. Give it up, human. The other species in the office screamed at the sight of the weapons and ran out of the office, leaving her alone with the two thugs. Oh dear me, is this a robbery? Oh my, oh my. But wh why do you want the pictures of my grandchildren? I'm a poor old grandmother. The thugs frowned at it and examined the human in front of them. It was a female that was partially hunched over with pure white hair and a floral dress that covered everything but her hands and face. She had a worried face that looked wrinkled and aged. Their implants were informing them that she was likely a human grandmother, based on age and appearance. Ah. Uh, they lowered their guns and was one pulled out a communicator. Boss, it's us. Um, the ones you told us to stop the human courier office. I think it's the wrong one, boss. It's really old. As the thug stood around, talking in the communicator, the old lady slowly reached into her dress before either could stop her, and quickly yanked free a stunner. Quickly zapping each of them, they jerked and twisted as electricity coursed through their bodies, and the agent smiled. She then pulled away from the dress to reveal a black catsuit beneath it, with the utility belt and various weapons strapped about her body, not to mention the secure box on her back, the wrinkles on her face flickering away as she deactivated her costume. But the white hair was still white. Sorry boys, my hair is just like this. She pulled a knife from her thigh, but then looked up as the door in the office burst open, a massive gawk bull lumbering in, carrying a heavy repeater that she thought could only be mounted on a grav tank. Go to run, fellas. She sprinted out of the side as the gawk took aim, bolts streaming through the air as she sprinted, jumping forward onto her hands and then springing up to crash through the window feet first. The bolts were still streaming around her as she landed with a roll and sprang to her feet. 
The station's broad streets had screaming civilians running every which way, as she was more Kotal thugs running her way, gulks and deckish alike. She pulled a pistol free and ran forward, tapping a device on her belt. For her mission, the agent had been provided with the very best gear that humanity could make, and a few pieces that they had to buy from elsewhere. This was one of those Xeno trinkets that she had hoped that they could replicate soon. The device hummed to life, and suddenly she was in a bubble of modified gravity. It would nullify the pull against her when she jumped, and reorient it according to her position when she landed. So, the cartel took aim as she leapt, sailing through the high into the air as she spun, feet touching the ceiling as the device reversed the local gravity around her. She sprinted forward along the ceiling, and they began to fire, trying to readjust their aim. But then she just jumped again, landing on the roof of one of the local structures in the section of the station. All around her the vents and machinery were peppered with bolts, and then she jumped to the ground at the end of the street, rolling and springing forward which sent her flying forwards thanks to the device on her belt. Once she was around the corner she deactivated the gravity reorganizer and quickly checked her implant. It was another eight miles to the conference center. She had no idea how many cartel thugs were between her and her objective. She needed a way to move faster. The mag trains. She quickly routed to the nearest station. Half a mile ahead and sprinting forward, Agent Wakefield's vitals were in the corner of her eye, and she could monitor her blood oxygen levels. The modifications she'd received making her stronger, faster, and tougher than a normal human. They hadn't gone full cyborg like those bugs they'd waged war with but they had learned how to make more subtle improvements. Her implants informed her a train would soon be arriving and sent her head down sprinting as fast as she could, ducking and spinning around the civilians in her way. As they yelled at her angrily, once she was past them, rounding the corner into the station she leapt clean over the ticket taker and rolled into the open door of the mag train just as it began to close. The other Xenos on board gave her a surprised look, but she smiled and stood, holding onto the overhead handle as the machine started forward. There was a slight jerk as if the interior of the station, now racing along the outside, in space. She motioned to the map in her implant, smiling, as they suddenly miled closer and another half mile before the train slowed down to the next station. If her luck held out, she would ride us all the way to the conference center. There was the slight jerk as it entered the atmosphere again, and stopped for the next station. Doors opening, civilians got on and off, and she smiled. But then, just before the doors closed, she saw two gawks and three deckish jump onto the first car. She cursed and moved down to the last car, hiding around the bulkhead from the door, out of the line of sight down the train. She couldn't use her guns since the bullets might break the glass windows and send all into space. She heard the gasps as people of the cartel's thugs walked along the cars while the train got moving again. Hearing their footsteps getting closer, Wakefield pulled that knife up from her thigh once more, the heavy gulk stepping through the door, looking around, and as he turned to see her, that knife was driven straight into his eye. The creature didn't even have time to scream as its heavy bulk dropped to the ground. A deckish step forward, gun raised, but Wakefield grabbed his arm and drove her knee into its ribs. She heard a crunch as he grunted out an obvious pain, and she turned, putting his arm to toss him into the wall behind her. The next deckish had a humming energy blade that charged forward. She quickly parried it with her own knife and danced back, careful to keep him between her and the others. She lashed out with his knife, as she ducked again and spun, kicking his feet from underneath him, and driving her knife into his throat as well. Then she rolled over his body, grabbed his energy blade, and throwing it as she got up, watching it sink into the chest of the third deckish. As he fell, the gulk behind him just growled, slamming one meaty fist into his palm. The gulk had to weigh around 600 pounds. They possessed pointed horns for gouging. A thick leather skin resistant to blades, and had a bone structure as dense as some light tanks. Wakefield pulled her pistol free and shot him right through one eye. 
Even point blank, a pistol round couldn't penetrate their skulls, so it was just rattled around inside, pulping his brain matter without even risking her breaking the glass window on the train. The bigger they come, the harder they fall. As the body fell to the ground with a heavy thud, she smiled and holstered her pistol, and then she heard the civilians gasping and pointing. She turned to see a Tacom assault craft outside, speeding alongside the train. Oh damn. She began to run forward as the bolt slammed into the car and the screams of civilians filling the air, which was quickly sucked out of the holes of the newly shattered windows. She pulled up a mask from her belt and snapping it into place as the smart fibers quickly expanded around her head, sealing it into place. She activated the device on her belt, diving and ducking as the Xeno civilian sailed past her, sucked out into space. Pulling her pistol free again and she shot the side window on the front car as she ran towards it, making sure that it was starting to break just as she jumped forward, sailing out into space as the shards of glass bumped off her smart fiber suit. The four-armed Temkin gunner on the other side of the saw craft blinked in surprise as the human was suddenly sailing towards him, but as he tried to pull up his hands to grab her, he turned, touching him feet first. The gravity reorganizer instantly focused on her momentum and gravity onto the points of her feet, crashing the Temkin's chest and sending the body flying through the open door through the assault craft. The interior was open, normally meant to hold a tank and assault squad, but this craft was only carrying that gunner and the pilot who was looking back at her, quickly trying to pull his way faster free. She stepped forward, leaning into it, and punched him in the face with his pressure suit the glass cracking as he was knocked out, but that made him slump forward against the controls. The assault craft dove forward then, as Wakefield jerked and held on to avoid being tossed out into space. Looking through the viewpoint, she saw the craft diving towards the station, and that the pilot shot up the train was slowly putting into, sparking and smoking as it arrived, the civilians inside gasping at the side of the train, but then they cried and pointed at the craft that followed it in smashing through the glass on top of the station, now decompressing the station itself. More Xenos were sucked into space as Wakefield held onto the craft with all of his strength, the gravity device almost out of power. It slammed into the platform, sliding through the ticket terminal, sparks of metal flying as it scraped along the floor of the station. It passed through another wall and out into the street beyond hitting some of the sort of food stall which must have used gas to cook as something exploded. Fire rained down on the local stores. More civilians were screaming and running as sirens sounded all over around the area. Blast stalls slowly descending to seal off the area, but Wakefield was already out of the crashed craft, sprinting forward as she dove and slid under one of those heavy doors as it fell into place behind her with a solid thud. As she stood up and glanced at her map, four miles to go. Agent Wakefield, what's your status? We have reports of fighting in the station. You could say there was an explosive situation, she replied as she pulled the mask off her face. She didn't want to waste her oxygen reserves. Looking around, she saw running civilians, but no cartel thugs just now. She began to run forward once more, looking at her map to try and determine the best course of action. Can't you send me the Marines? Negative Agent Wakefield, the Kotal is a criminal organization. We're a government. We cannot bring military operations onto foreign territory without permission. Wakefield sighed and she shook her head and continued to run. Just as she entered another intersection, however, she saw a flash of light from her peripheral vision and quickly ducked and rolled. A high-energy bolt sailed through the air where her head had been. She dove behind an automated cleaning droid that was slowly scrubbing the street as more bolts slammed into the area around her. She pressed her back and the droid, moving along to next to it. She had no other good cover along the street, but if the droid got closer to the access hatch, then a bolt slammed into the droid, which whined and coughed and then died. Growling, she edged along the droid, keeping her head down. As she reached the front of it, she pulled out a small wire from her pocket on her belt, angling it around the corner. Her implant switched over to vision from the tiny cable camera as she examined the area. Tavkin's sniper team on the roof of the bank in the center of the block. 
She pulled back the cable and tugging it away. She could hear the civilians crying out in surprise, and heard people moving. Cartel thugs had been closing in on her location. Sure enough, she saw a tankish burst out of the shop in front of her, on the exposed side of the droid that she was taking cover behind. She shot him through the throat as a pistol and fired a few more rounds just to keep the others behind him from rushing forward. She quickly pulled out a spear from her belt, pushing a button on the cover and tossing it in the air. There was a hiss as grey smoke began to pour out of it. And yet, as the Takam sniper switched his scope over to heat, his whole field of vision was red. As he kept cycling vision modes, something was impairing his vision on every one. The Gulks and Dekish had charged in anyway, and the smoke slowly cleared, and the clearing droid was alone. They looked around, and none noticed the access hatch on the streets was slowly clicking back into place. Wakefield moved along quietly as she could, partially hunched over in the small access space. Scurrying along, she finally found a more open section. Stepping out into the section of the crosswalk and pipes, leading to various humming and charging machines, there were Rillians crewing the stations, thick black goggles covered their four eyes, oil staining their scales. When they saw her, she heard one shout, Hey! That's gotta be the human the cartel is offering a bounty for! And they quickly started to run along the clouds to rush at her. Wakefield sighed and readied herself. The first ran at her and a large wrench in his hands. He swung it overhead at her but she quickly turned to avoid the strike, elbowing him in the face and driving her knee into his chest as he pulled it down into it. Then she had to lean back over the railing, watching as a blade arc over her face as another stashed at her. Then he tried to stamp down but she rolled to avoid it, and grabbed his arm, driving her knee into his stomach and then tossing him over the edge of the railing. He screamed out as he fell to the floor below. Two were charging up the metal stairs to get to her as she jumped, grabbing a pipe to swing her feet forward, kicking the lead one as she drove him back, crying out as he toppled and fell back down the stairs on top of the one behind him. Jumping down and landing on top of them, a good measure, she only had a few more to go. One more ran at her, swinging with a wrench, wildly. She just rolled and passed and grabbed his leg and yanked it to make him fall to the floor of the catwalk, quickly kicking him in the head to keep him down. Then another grabbed her from behind, hugging her arms to her chest as another moved in, but she just stomped on his foot, making him howl in pain as he broke his hold. Then she grabbed his arm, bending it over as she tossed him over her shoulder into the one in front of her. Turning, she only had one more to deal with but was surprised when he leaned forward, knocking his skull into her own. Both her and her attacker gasped out in pain then, each clutching their forehead as they staggered around. Ow, my head! He groaned out as she grunted and clutched her own skull. The freck! I don't know! He muttered and sort of just staggered to a crate and sat down. She straightened up slowly, wincing as she kept an eye closed because her brain told it to. It just fell right. She approached the Rillian, who looked up in time to see her fist as she clocked him in the face as he slumped off the crate. Frecker, she muttered and held her forehead with one hand as she walked on, the Rillians behind her groaning in pain or lying unconscious. Then she heard the hum of a lift and saw the Rillian with a bunch of electrical gear step off the platform in front of her. Along the wall of the station, he looked around at the groaning, injured workers and then at her. Slowly, he stepped aside and motioned to the lift. Ah, feel free to use it, hopefully without beating me up. She stepped onto the metal platform and pressed the lever to get it humming forward, back to the way the electrician had come from. She shook her head a little as she blinked for the final he got her senses back from the headbutt. The lift hummed along in the maintenance corridor until the main streets of the station, until she came to a junction at the end of the ladder going up and catwalks heading either way. Her implant told her that she had a mile and a half to go. She was about to head up onto the street level when the station contacted her again. Wakefield, we've found the cartel's command post. And an indicator flashed on her map, and she smiled. Pulling a mask free, she sealed it into place. And instead of heading up onto the street, she walked the other side, approaching the airlock. She pulled the maintenance pressure suit free 
putting it on, and grabbed some gear. Nothing but an ordinary maintenance worker to see here. And she opened up the airlock and stepped out into the outside of the station. Where the hell is that human? The Katal boss, literally slimy Eurovian, screamed out at the thugs in front of him from behind his desk. He had an aquarium of rare and exotic fish on the wall behind him. Many endangered and illegal to own. The pulse and heads of various endangered animals decorated the floors and walls of his office. There were a number of Dekish, Gulk, and Takam in front of him, getting chewed out for being unable to stop a single human. He was in the middle of yelling at them when they heard something tap on the glass window to the side. Everyone looked out the window and saw the pressure suit of a maintenance worker wave at them. A few Dekish waved back, unsure what was going on. Then the figure slapped a plastic brick on the window and jumped away. Ah, crap. Was the last thing the cartel boss said before the brick exploded, sucking them all out into space. The fish aquarium just swam on, unaware of what had happened. After a nice little space walk, Wakeworld finally stepped back into the station proper. Right next to the trade conference center, she pulled out the bulky suit off, back in a form-fitting black cat suit. She walked up the stairs and onto the main street, leading to the important center. Finding a large number of skulking gods, the skulkings were one of the triumvirates, a species of multi-limbed scorpion-like insectoids. They were incredibly hardy and durable in combat, especially hand to hand. Halt, human. There has been fighting in the station. We need to see your ID before you can enter. That's fine. She smiled and reached in her pocket to grab her ID. It was empty. She frowned and began to pat herself down as she suddenly realized her ID was sitting in that secure curio room back where she started. Uh, hold on a second. She turned away from them and tapped a com. Station, I'm outside. I, uh, forgot my ID. There was a high sigh over the line. I'll be right there. She turned back and smiled at the guards. Then as she waited, she swung her arms back and forth, lightly clapping them together while whistling. Finally, the human diplomat stepped up behind the guards, speaking to them as she was led by. She smiled and pulled a secure box from her back, walking into the trade conference ready to show the triumvirate something that no other species had ever thought of. About an hour later, they were standing in front of the panel of triumvirate ambassadors. The Skalkians were the muscle, strong and solid. The Phoenix were the engineers, inquisitive and intelligent, while the noble Norvians in the center were the diplomats, since they were so charismatic and cunning. The human diplomat and Agent Wakefield stood before them as they inspected what the human delegation had set before them. This is what you bring us. We've seen inventions and materials and more, and you simply bring us food, the tall, graceful Norvian said as he inspected the plate in front of him. This is the best that you have to offer. It's a family recipe, my family handed down generation to generation. Agent Wakefield said with a smile, they're called chocolate chip cookies. Try them. The delegates picked up the small hot disks in front of them and gingerly bit off a piece. They all started to nod and then hum happily as they tasted it, quickly finishing the first that they had picked up. Our large shipment of materials to make you these was sabotaged, so we had to make a much smaller batch. You each have three, and a small box to share. If you guys give us more time, we can make you more, the diplomats were saying. The delegates ate the cookies quickly, never having had anything like it before. You see, we know other species might have better tech than us, and anything that can be reverse engineered or copied with time. Resources can be acquired through trade or conquest, but so far as we haven't found any species with the concept of desserts. The diplomat said with a smile. Suddenly, the Skalkin pulled the top off of the box of the extra cookies that he had been provided. The other delegates watched as he shoveled them into his mouth, chomping down on them as he shuddered in pleasure. Then he grabbed the boxes in front of the other two delegates, tucking them under his limbs as he scurried around the table to charge Agent Wakefield. She gasped in surprise as she was lifted up above its head in a multitude of limbs. The cookie-making human is mine. He started running towards the exit. Where my ship, we go to Earth. More cookies, more! Put me down.
The agent was crying out as she was carried away. The human diplomat and the other two triumvirate delegates shared an awkward glance for a moment. Finally, the Norvian coughed and spoke up. Uh, apologies, we'll, uh, award you a trade contract. So you said that this is something called dessert? The diplomat smiled. Why, yes. Let me explain to you more about the best humanity has to offer. End of story. Bavarian Hospitality Written by Regal Legal Legal As humanity began to find out who else was in their cosmic neighborhood, they found some species who were similar and some who were entirely different. But something that seemed to be universal was that these species were fairly homogenous. At some point, one nation or religion or ideology took a hold of their cultures and they were unified before they ever reached the stars. Humans had been struggling against one another for as long as history had been recorded, and likely had been going on long before that. No one had ever seemed to get the upper hand, as one nation or religion or ideology got strong enough to take a hold and gain critical mass, something would happen. A conqueror would arise, a new prophet or a new philosophy. Human culture was quickly becoming dominated simply because it gave the Xenos a vast wealth of choices, something that they'd been lacking. One of the most popular trends of the day were for groups of Xenos to pool their funds and take a cultural journey from round Earth, visiting as many different parties and festivals as they could for the sake of trying to get even a tiny glimpse of the unique offerings that the humans brought to the galaxy. No species had as many parties, got drunk as often, or arranged in festivals as the humans. This had spurred on a golden age for humanity. Free to expand and trade as Xenos practically tripped over themselves in their attempts to befriend the species who threw the best parties there ever were. We focus now on these groups of Xenos traveling around the world. Five Kresh brothers from the Aulusian Empire a species of humanoid amphibians with various breeds depending on the needs of the hives. Originally, they'd been enemies of the humans, getting into several border conflicts with them until the Atlusians had discovered the incredible culture humanity had to offer. Since then, most of the warriors who'd been bred had to be repurposed to the need in battle no longer necessary. As such, most of them were still soft-shelled, untested and hardened through battle. The Hive Shepherds instead sent them into humanity's territory in an attempt to learn more about what made the humans so special. This group had been on Earth for a month now, touring the area humans referred to as uh, Europe. They'd wandered museums, ancient towns, ruins from thousands of years ago, and more. The desire humans had to hold onto the past was insatiable. It was a part of who they were, no matter where they went. The first true festival that the brothers got to experience was the nation known as Bavaria. They filed off one of the Magrail trains into the city known as Munich, eyes wide as they saw the massive crowds of people. What's this place called again? Vrechtek. Nachtek. Asked as he gave the smallest amongst them a nudge. He had his olfactory receptor in a book. They call it Oktoberfest. Um, hundreds of years ago, there was some sort of big wedding that got so out of control that a massive it went on for like a month. So now they celebrate by trying to copy what happened back then. They drink lots of beer and eat sausages and other foods in beer halls. The brothers were grinning and laughing at the sounds of that. A party dedicated to a party. Was there nothing these humans wouldn't use as an excuse to drink and eat? Everywhere they looked, there were humans in strange clothes and hats, holding massive cups of beer, talking and laughing as the Xenos tried to figure out where to go. Many of the brothers were eyeing the human woman as well. They had a striking appearance to the Krishni of myth, and most strong-blooded warriors had plenty of appreciation for this particular myth from their own history. Only Vrekchuk wasn't paying attention to the people since he was still reading. Hopefully we'll find a beer hall that'll take us in and we can join the party, he was saying. I'm fairly sure that the party is everywhere, Vrechuk. Kindchuk said, as with a laugh, shaking his smaller warrior as he waved a hand. 
Look, they're a beautiful woman, and the strange music that's all around us. Yes, but we stand out. They're all those special clothes, Brekchek said, pointing out. They started to press through the crowds of the humans, then trying to find some place to go, when Brekchek pointed out a sign to the small winding alley that promised to have what they were looking for. Breaking out of the mass of people, they wandered down the alley into a shop. They saw an old woman behind a wooden counter. All around them were the clothes that they'd seen the various size hats and hanging from hooks. As she saw them enter, a certain light seemed to fill her eyes, and while their translators weren't programmed with the local language, Rekchek had learned some of his own. He thought she muttered something like, Altusians, they'll be perfect. But he couldn't be sure before she spoke up in English, which their translator did know. Welcome to my shop. Please, please, come in, come in. All are welcome during this holiday. The woman stepped out from behind the counter. Five more to celebrate the wonderful October Festival. Let me treat you to some appropriate clothes. Well, how much would that cost? We have to watch our funds, Freshtrick said, always the one worried. Nonsense, you're guests in my country, here to partake in our greatest party of them all. No charge, no charge. They grinned as she began to wave them away from the door and into her shop. Their similar shape to humans made it easy to find them proper leader ocean. Alpine hats and traction shirts. They spotted a clawed feet, so the usual knee socks weren't really an option. Even so, she found them properly sized clothes and would wave them into the changing rooms, which were a little small. But they were soon dressed up in the fine Bavarian style, and the old woman looked them over. Ja, das gut. She was particularly eyeing Nekchuk, and the biggest one of them, and the de facto leader. Do you find boys have reservations? You seem to be wandering around like a lost child. Did you plan for all the people? To be honest, we didn't, ma'am. Rekchek responded. Ah, well, then you'll have to come and join my family. We are our own private hall for this holiday. Very old. True to the ancient customs. You must come and join me and my guests. Your hospitality possesses a shame, ma'am. Is there anything that I could offer you? Our funds aren't especially plentiful. Nekchek was saying as she waved his offer away. Nine, nine. You're my guests. Your presence was all I require. The woman waved them back outside. I'll keep your possessions here in my shop so that they aren't lost. We'll return for them later. Once they were outside, she locked up her shop and nodded, motioning for them to follow her deeper through the ancient winding streets. Soon they were standing in front of an incredibly old-looking building. On the exterior were various wood carvings, mostly depicting some sort of hunt and a fierce-looking creature with pointed horns, Brickchuk identified as a stag. There was a massive human, about the size of Nekchik, waiting outside. There you are, Grandmama. Who are your guests that you brought to our family's beer hall? They are fine visitors from another world, here to experience our festival. Ah, well, welcome then, friends. You will find no more accommodating hosts in all of Bavaria, the human said with a wide grin waving them into the hall behind his grandmother. They entered the old wooden hall, spotting a few hundred people inside. There was much noise with laughter, talking filling the air, plus that strange yet comforting musing being played by the band near the back. The grandmother and grandson led the way forward, finding them a table near the band, waving over a few women holding the massive cups that they'd seen. Look on the legs on them, Kenchuk said, with a gasp. Thankfully speaking Krish to them all, so that humans wouldn't understand. His eyes were set firmly on the fine Bavarian woman who set one of the massive cups down for each of the Altusians and one for the grandson. He raised his mugs. This is a stain. So long as you are here as our guests, we shall fill it with only the best beer we make. So partake and enjoy. Prost! He said and he pulled up the mug to his lips tilting his head back and neither watched in surprise as he drank the whole thing in one long pool. Then he slammed it on the table with a big grin. Welcome to Bavaria. The Altusians cheered and raised their mugs, clanking them together as they started to drink. 
each at their own level. Only Nyakchak could match the human in darning his hole in one go. After he finished, he had to cough and catch his breath. The others laughed and fresh check slapped him on the back for a moment. They were already in high spirits thanks to the hospitality that they had been shown. But the warmth spreading through them now grew to the strong beer. This is simply incredible, Kane check said, but then he looked out over the beer hall. I have to agree with you, Kane check, Frek check said, making an unusual agreement with the pressure warrior. The woodworking is incredible. And the age of the spalding is beyond anything that we've ever seen back home. We're so quick to tear things down. I wasn't talking about the boring skirt. What I was talking about is those skirts. Those legs. He was eyeing the woman walking around with a very lusty mindset. Fresh check shook his head. Careful, Kane check. We might like them, but there is no saying if they like us. Oh, lighten up, fresh check, Breck check muttered, and took another heavy fall of his beer. Before waving another, the five brothers were laughing and enjoying themselves then, helping themselves to the food that was brought over. They had no idea what it was, but they were at it nonetheless. Some of the humans at the other tables would look their way from time to time and raise their mugs. The Althusians would return the gesture and then drink, finding it hard to keep up with the humans. Even their woman appeared to down gallons of the stuff. But that was likely just the impression rather than the reality. They were trying to wrap their heads around all the flavors and smells and sounds that they were being bombarded with, having very little to compare it to from their own culture, which was fairly utilitarian and filled with stories about bettering the hives. Who wanted any of that when humans had all of this? And it was just one festival. Soon Kainchek was ignoring the others, who were talking about making sure that they visited another continent for some sort of costume festival at the end of the month. He was staring at one of the Bavarian women who kept eyeing him. He saw her smile as she sipped at her beer, and then closed one eye, but not the other as she rose up from her table. Leaning away from him, he stared deeply into the fluff of her skirt, hoping to see more than just her legs. She walked back towards the area he knew the bathrooms were in and looked back at him very clearly before rounding the corner. I'll be right back, I need to drain the dragon, he muttered, quickly standing up and bumping the table as the others complained, grabbing the stains so that they didn't spill. He wasn't paying attention to them though, instead walking down the way that the woman had gone. He ignored the wood carvings behind him and looked at the three doors. One had a window in it, and he figured that it would be the kitchen, and the other two had some human letters written on them, but he didn't know what they meant. As he stared at the door on the left, open, and he saw that woman inside, beckoning him closer. He thought back to the Krishni myth and followed her, quickly setting his hands to her sides. He didn't know quite what to do, only that he wanted to feel her, hands roaming over her body as she leaned against him. She was doing that human thing along his chin. Kissing? It felt nice, but she seemed to be licking him more than kissing him. He didn't care up until he felt her teeth sink into the flesh of his throat, and he gasped in pain shoving her back. He felt something rip and looked down in horror as he saw the blue blood dripping from the lips as she grinned at him. There was a noise, and he turned seeing the human stepping out from this one of the stalls. The last thing that he saw was a manet swinging down in his face. So, if we keep a tight schedule, we should be able to make it in time, Frekchek was saying. Don't fret so much, Frekchek. Relax, enjoy yourself, Frekchek was saying before gulping down even more beer. Hey, has anyone seen Kainchek? Frekchek asked. Not, not since he went to the bathroom, Nyakchek said as they glanced around. Maybe he found the legendary Krishni. The others laughed and grinned at that, but Fresh Check stood up. I'll go check on him, I need to go anyway. He wandered back towards the bathrooms, noticing the strange wood carvings that depicted some sort of fight between the humans and the pointed horned creature that they saw elsewhere. Shrugging, he looked at the two doors and figured that he had to be for the bathroom and just picked one at random. As he pushed open the door, he saw someone inside and heard a female scream, Sorry, sorry, he muttered, and he stepped back out, quickly entering the other door. 
He recognized the white porcelain things the humans used and figured that he had the right one this time. He struggled with the Bavarian garb for a while until he figured out how to get himself free so that he could relieve his bladder into the designated area. Once he was done, he tucked everything back into place and turned around. Once he had stepped outside, though, he was staring at a wood carving. And was the man eating the pointed creature, or was it the other way around? He tilted his head one way, and then another, staring at the seat in front of him, unsure what he was looking at. Hey there. A voice made him jump, and he saw one of those human women standing at the door that he figured was the kitchen. Your friend said you might also like to find the Krishni. Fresh check blinked at it, and then approached her, entering the door. As it swung shut, there was a heavy thud. It had been another ten minutes before Nekchuk had stopped Frechuk from jabbering on about this and that. Okay, now both Nekchuk and Frechuk are missing. Before he could even make a point ordering the others to go looking for them, they saw a pair of human women walk past giggling. Hello, boys. I think your friends mentioned something about finding a mystical creatures. Glad that you're all having such a nice time. The other three relaxed then. Oh, Nekchuk said simply. Guess Gainchuk was right. That's very interesting. I wasn't sure that a human stance or was on the Altusian's attractiveness, Rekchuk was saying. Guess that answers that, Rekchuk said with a grin. And then they slowly stood up, as on unsteady legs. I, uh, need to go drain it as well. Promise I won't get seduced by any Krishni. He grinned and staggered back towards the bathrooms. He saw the three doors in this drunken haze and stepped through the third one. He saw a red meat piled up in various areas, cooktops and stoves all working to feed the hungry guests. Then he frowned as he saw some blue meat near the grinder. There was blue blood all over the floor of the area as a human pressed something into the meat grinder. Was that... was that an arm? His eyes went wide and he saw that and he gasped out. The chefs and butchers turned seeing him... Chaiba. One of them muttered, but he turned and tried to run out. Staggering heavily, though, the alcohol was filling his system. He made it into the hall when a cleaver threw through the air, sinking into his back of his neck. They descended on him, one reaching down to cut his throat as they dragged him back into the kitchen. Nekchak leaned back a bit. Did you hear that? Hear what? Vrekchak asked, looking up from his book. Before Nekchak could go on, the music seemed to change and a bunch of people cheered, moving towards an open area near them as they started to dance. He looked over and found the human woman pulling on his arm. Come, you must dance. But I was... Dance, you must. She was insistent and he looked at Frakchak who smiled and shrugged. So Nekchak let himself be pulled away from the table. He looked back at Frakchak but couldn't see his brother anymore. Just a crowd of humans, maybe another woman, had asked him to dance as well. Nekchuk began to dance then, moving as his brothers showed him, dancing to the music, smiling and laughing as it went on. But once that song had ended, his smile faded. The humans moved back from the dance floor, leaving him alone at the center. All around him, the Bavarians had formed a human wall. They were chanting something in a language that he didn't understand. The warrior had no idea what was going on. Who was Frakchek? Where was his brothers? The chanting grew louder and louder, and as it reached a violent crescendo, some of the humans parted. He gasped as he saw the massive human figure wearing some sort of giant mask. Or maybe it wasn't a human, but a creature that had the body of a human and the head of one of those stags Frakchek had seen that were carved everywhere. The creature was shirtless, body coated with designs painted in blue. And then Yankchuk realized that the blue wasn't paint, it was the blood of his brothers. The warrior roared out, only to have his bella returned by the creature as they charged one another. They slammed into each other, the soft Shaldaltusian having never been tested in true battle. Until now. He was drunk and nearly feral in his rage as he fought, was swinging out slamming into the figure with a head of a stag. But the other was experienced and steady, and yet Nekchuk wore himself out, swinging and landing body blows, but keeping him from getting any real hits in. He began to go in his own offensive finally, punching and Nekchuk in the face, 
over and over, rattling his brain as the Altusian saw stars and spots. Finally, Nectar collapsed to his knees, and the humans cheered out, starting to chant once more. But this time, it was something even more dark and evil. The warrior struggled, but then the thing with the head and the stag gripped Nekchek's arms, pulling them back as he was kept on his knees. This time a small figure in black shrouds, shriveled with age it seemed, slowly walked out of the crowd. In one hand she held a dagger, and in the other some ancient book. The crowd went silent as she began to recite something ancient and cryptic. Nekchek struggled, but the stag-headed man held him fast. The old woman approached him, lashing out with the knife as she cut open his shirt. Then he howled in pain as she gripped his chest, diving the dagger deep at an angle to get between the hidden chest scale and the rest of his ribs. She drove the blade in deeper, prying the scale off as he screamed, blue blood pouring down his chest and stomach, his blue heart beating within. And she gripped it in the old hand and eyes twitched as she fell unconscious with agony. The blade moved quick and precise despite her age. She held it in the air as it beat once, twice, three times, and stopped, pouring out still more blood over her fingers as the crowd cheered. The humans had parties, and many of the modern ceremonies known out to the galaxy were about getting drunk and having fun, but this hid the darker side that the humans had been careful to conceal. For every hundred-year-old party, there was an older, deeper meaning that went back thousands of years. They had told Xenos that their old rituals simply faded away to give to the new ones, but that wasn't true. The old rituals just became harder to find, tucked away in the dark and secret, kept alive by only the truest of believers. The truth was that the human culture was so interesting because we had to make up new ways to get some of the thrill that we used to experience, back in the old days when the old ones spoke to us directly. In those ancient forests, barren steppes, and stone circles, getting drunk and having fun was all well and good, but nothing could compare to the rush of ritual sacrifices. This is humanity. We are so interesting because. We're insane. End of story. Those who remember. Written by Regal Legal Eagle. The link to the original will be down below. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. He looked out through the diner window, and the rain beating against the storm beyond had whipped the bay into a teeming mass of waves and white crests. Slowly, he rubbed the hand along his jaw. His beard had once been a rich auburn, now simply white. Then he looked back at the fresh-breast young man who asked him the question. He was wearing one of those new fancy suits, some sort of uh, synthetic fibers, the latest rage. Those young eyes didn't know what kind of hardships and pain he'd been through. Did they know anything but peace and prosperity? It seemed impossible that within his life there was a generation that didn't know war and strife. How far back would you like me to go? He finally asked the young man. As far back as you're willing to go. He stood a hollow recorder across the table to make sure that there was a conversation was captured in full detail. The old man wondered if that meant that the storm outside was going to be on it as well. Slowly, he sighed out and took a sip of the dark black coffee that he'd ordered. We came from a place known as the Midwest. Back on Earth, the area known locally as America. You probably know more about that place than I did if you paid attention in history. I never went to a real school or nothing. My mother's mother taught me reading and writing and basic numbers. My dad taught me how to maintain and clean my gun. How to shoot and fight. We did plenty of that. After the last round of wars, after our ancestors left, things were bad. We had scavenged some old military trucks, our clan, so we'd drive them around, following the game, living off the land and the fruits and veggies that we could scrounge up. He thought back to his childhood back on earth, scratching the side of his nose idly while he thought. There were about five hundred of us in my clan. 
My dad was important. Chief mechanic. Kept everything running. That was big. If you couldn't keep ahead of the storms, you weren't going to survive. Well, storms and raiders. Raiders? Oh, yeah. For those clans like mine that were content to survive and scrounge, there were also those who wanted more. Or perhaps they wanted what we wanted, but they just thought that it was easier just to take what we had. We'd get attacked at least once a week. I was in my first firefight at the age of 14. By 16, I was a scout, had myself an old dune buggy that I fixed up myself. He smiled as he thought back to his buggy. It was a little more than an engine, four wheels, and a seat strapped to the frame. But when he was a kid, it was the greatest thing in the world. At least, that world. My father was killed in a raid when I was 18. I had the gift of machinery like him, but they needed me to fight more than to fix for a while. We found the beacon when I was 19. It was an old military base that we scavenged when I found it. I had no idea what the Slavic Federation was, and I couldn't speak Russian, but I could tell that it was old tech. It was something new, something important. I convinced the others to change what we'd been doing, to settle into the base and protect it until I could figure it out. Was it difficult? To convince everyone? No. They saw what I meant when I pointed it out. Someone had sent something shiny and new back to Earth. We knew that the old legend. We were ready from some hope. So we set up shop. The raids became more regular, but we now had a solid spot to defend. Turned out that I didn't even need to learn Russian. We'd been there for about a month when the transmission came through. Six or seven different languages. English was one of them told us to sit tight and how to respond. Were you nervous? Someone from another planet tries to talk to me. Freck, yeah, I was nervous, but I followed the instructions and thankfully they were idiot-proof. I got in touch with the program, answered what I could, and they told us that our clan would be the first. I didn't know what for, but I was too nervous to ask. So we got everything that we had ready for travel. Just like ordered, we patched up our pressure suits and stood around the beacon for hours, just standing there. I started worrying someone was messing with us. The raiders didn't attack. No, thankfully. Then we were somewhere else. You ever used one of those gates? No, I haven't. It's interesting. It's like somehow you know that you went somewhere and you feel like you got squished and rebuilt. But all in an instant. Anyway, there we were suddenly somewhere else. It was gorgeous, too. Like the old pictures of my mother's mother would show me. The national parks that they used to call them. It was all green and alive and just gorgeous. I figured that no one would be trying to kill me there. Of course, I was wrong. They didn't tell you about the war. Well, from what I understand, when they activated the beacon, the war hadn't started. I mean, it feels like an instant, but it was actually like a week. I'm not a scientist, so I can't be sure. Either way, I finally noticed the soldiers waving us forward. I had an old military rifle at the time. Amongst the clans, it was a highly prized, very advanced compared to the old beat-up mulsip that the others had. The what? Sorry, old term, it's a... Uh, the remains from the last war, just common rifles that pumped out of millions to arm as many people as possible. Mine was a special forces weapon handed down from my father's father's mother, and I was also wearing a combat harness pressure suit instead of the civilian models of the others. So, you have to understand, as a 19-year-old at the time, I felt like a real elite soldier. He chuckled and shook his head and then laughing for a moment. What is it? Oh, just how wrong I was. You know everything when you're a teen. Well, the guys waving us forward, shouting in Russian, they had real armor and real guns. Right away I could tell that they could kill us without much effort, and I'm sure that unloading a whole clip into them would not have even phased them. So that we were standing in paradise, wondering why the soldiers were trying to get us off the platform. Then... 
the African Union attacked. Boom! Explosions all around us. Everyone was screaming, finally moving, running the way that the soldiers were pointing. We heard the trees snapping and the animals we'd never seen flying off into the sky in surprise. These sleek, black killer robots all around us. The NEV tanks had backing up, holding them back. Battlesuits brawling with CNDRs. It was chaos. Here we were, a bunch of stupid hicks in the middle of a fight between gods. Were you scared? Of course I was. This wasn't a raider attack. My gun, my prized possession. I saw some of the people and troops apostles. I shot at them, and my bullets just scratched their paint. The centurions waved me off. They weren't exactly winning the battle. So we kept running. Those in trucks driving around the craters and trying not to get shot up too much. Finally, we made it to the Magrail station. A NAV destroyer was parked in front of it. Now, now, obviously I'd never seen anything like a battlesuits and NAV tanks, but something about that guy. Just the sheer size and power as it sat there, spitting out artillery fire. It was amazing. More so than being transported across the galaxy. Well, like I said, there wasn't much of an experience. It just sort of happened, and I didn't understand it. But the LEV destroyer, it was awe-inspiring. I stood there with the others push me around, and I was just standing there like a slack-jawed local, watching this glorious, magnificent, incredible piece of engineering blow those robots up. But finally, one of the soldiers set his hand on my shoulder, pointing to the rest of the clan that was leaving me behind, and said something else in Russian, which I didn't understand. That would have been your wife. Ha! <laughs> yes. Course I didn't know it then. In her heavy armor, she looked just like any other soldier. What did she say? Oh, she changes her answer depending who's around. But I think the truth is she told me to stop standing there like a target and get my butt moving. The old man grinned as he thought back on that. So I did. I caught up with everyone else, and the other soldiers were waving us onto the mag train. There were just some old ruins and the monorails in the craters of some of the big cities, but I had never dreamed of seeing something up and running. It was all a lot to take in. But the battle kept us from slowing down. Did you lose anyone? No. The soldiers made sure that we got through okay. I think they felt responsible since they called us from Earth into the war without warning us. We sat in the train, watching the land slip past. All that lush green land. Like I said before, it was paradise to us. No dust storms, no derelict dead cities. Lush green paradise. We saw the small towns and cities we passed by, but it looked just like Earth. Just way nicer. How did you know it wasn't just the sky? I couldn't put my finger on it, but it wasn't quite right. And then, of course, when we passed through those massive chitin paddocks, we approached the Krabrost. Those were not Earth critters. No way, no how. What was your impression of the capital? Well, we didn't stop on that first day. We were trying to get the Hastahal away from the fighting. We just saw it from the Magrel and we went past. We could see it in the distance, massive buildings towering high up into the sky. It was even more beautiful than the pictures that I'd seen of the old cities before everything went to hell. I know now that they'd planned on having a big ceremony at the gate and the event of explaining all of this to us. But the war had started rather suddenly, so they were scrambling to get us to safety. Did you know things weren't going well? I could guess, I mean, everyone was mostly stunned and shocked still at how fast the land was moving beneath us. But I noticed all of the trains heading from where we come. LEV tanks, rows of battlesuits, and predators flying by. Our train was diverted near the city for LEV destroyers to move past. It took up both tracks, and the train kept going. On into the night, we huddled up, ate our rations, and wondered what was going on. They would say things on the PA, but we didn't know Russian, and he didn't know English. So it was poorly planned, poorly executed. 
Like I said, I learned about all of their plans afterwards, which sounded good. They just didn't plan on a war, so they couldn't do anything that they'd planned. I mean, considering the war and all of that they did very well keeping us alive. It took us two days to get to dirt, but we had travelled half the continent in that time. Ah, yes. Dirt. That was your idea for the name. Oh, yes it was. All of the gorgeous forests and lush paradise that we travelled through, and they dropped us off in some barren dirt here, at the bay. They had some prefab buildings set up, very sloppy, obviously rushed. That's when I met Grigori, the ambassador of Vark before the war. He spoke English and explained more of what was going on. I'll be honest, until he told us that the robots were of African Union, they'd been human at some point, and I never would have guessed. There were some officials, obviously, and unsure of how to proceed. What happened? He told us this land was ours. They were going to be bringing in more people from Earth, but since we were the first, we'd get to name the city. I asked if we were going to be bringing in other Americans only, or anyone. He told me everyone they could find on Earth was welcome to join us. So, I said that we should call it Dirt. They were a little confused and asked what I meant Earth. I said no. I didn't want to name it something that only made sense to Americans. And I figured everyone was willing to fight for their own patch of dirt. So, we all agreed to call it Dirt. The officials didn't like it, but Grigori just laughed. He approved. Sure did. What happened next? We started building up dirt. He waved a hand out through the window. The city is now quite different than it was. Everyone built their own little section. I'm sure you're aware my family owns the docks. How did that come about? We'd never seen the ocean before, let alone go swimming, and we all discovered that we loved it. We had more than our fair share of dust, so we made sure to settle along the waterfront. Everyone found their own little spot. Africans, Europeans, Asians, all of the leftovers who didn't have ancestors lucky enough to leave. They found them where they could and brought them here. A few of us spoke the same language, but we all got along. We had a real home now. We had our own dirt. But it wasn't that easy, was it? No. That first year before the next wave of settlers could be found that we were attacked by Ark. The front had been secured along with the borders of the African Union, but the coast was exposed, and I couldn't believe it. Somehow, it didn't really hit me that Ark was Americans. When the soldiers showed up and they were speaking English, their radiance physiology twisted and inhuman, but they spoke English. It was hard to accept. What happened? They attacked, the city people died, buildings were destroyed, but we survived. We'd been attacked before we knew what to do. The army showed up before they could do much more than mess up the town. After that, I demanded to join the military and help. They wouldn't let you. I couldn't believe it, but they first told me that it was their responsibility to fight for us. We'd struggled our whole lives. Now they wanted us to live in peace while they struggled for us. I couldn't believe their desire for sacrifice on a national level. Their desire. How? Our desire. I mean, at this point, it's obviously more than just a Slavic federation. We still had allies in the franco iberians and the Brazilians. How long did it take to admit it? I had to learn Russian, and then I built a small LED forklift of my own, without proper tools. That convinced him to let me become an LED mechanic, and I just kept at it, repairing tanks until I met my wife. Her crew was dead, and we were fighting hard against the Union again. This must have been uh, five years into the war. Me and the other mechanics fixed it up, jumped in, and went to war. Didn't stop for the next twenty years. So, you were there for all of it. Sure was. Got married, had some kids, as well as going on. But, yeah, I was there through every major land campaign. I... Uh, don't want to talk about it too much, just yet, if you won't mind. Please, only what you're comfortable with. The old man looked out of the window. The rain had let up. The storm was dying down. 
he could see the boats taking advantage of the lull and start hauling their catch. Mostly, it was salmon and tuna. The fisheries had taken hold, and now the planet was teeming with familiar life. The young man spoke up. What made you join? And stay through the whole war. How could I not? I told you I knew almost nothing about any of this world when I found that beacon. Yet they welcomed us with open arms. They took settlers from every corner of the earth that they could. It didn't matter to them. They wanted to give us a new home. Their soldiers died, keeping us alive, even though we couldn't help with the war effort in any meaningful way at the start. They wouldn't allow us to join at first. They were fighting and dying to give us a new home. He shook his head slowly, and then he looked at his coffee. I didn't hate the robots or the armies. They came to this new world and lost their way. They let it change them into becoming more alien, or more machine, until they forgot being human actually meant. All the Slavic Federation wanted to do was give us a chance to share in the prosperity and tranquility that they had found on this new world. They hadn't understood that the machines and aliens found that threatening. They'd already shed their humanity, whilst those of us who remained pure fought tooth and nail to make this planet a new home for those who'd been left behind. You think they weren't human anymore? They were aliens and machines by the time that I got here. Even if some part of them knew what they used to be, they'd left it behind. But the others, the Slavic Federation, the Brasilia, the franco Abaria, they never forgot what they left behind. It was us. And when they had a chance to bring us to a new home, they took it. And someday I hope to go back, to turn Earth back into what we knew it can be. That's our burden, but we take it willingly. That's what keeps us pure. And this is when you want to pioneer this expedition back to Earth. There hasn't been any more contact in 20 years, you know. And you're quite advanced in your age at this point. I'm old, kid. You can come out and say it. But why this continuous struggle? Why not let the next generation take up the task? The old man smiled and then ran his hand over the withered and scarred face. There's an old quote that I remember from being a kid. Some old god had made the strong guy carry the world on his shoulders. When the man begged the god, it wasn't to end his burden. He begged for broader shoulders so that he may carry it more easily. Not everyone remembers. Not everyone will carry the burden. But those that do, do it because we must. Not because we're asked. End of story. Regal Eagle Legal's Dirty Laundry, a collection of short stories, volume one, written by Regal Legal Eagle, part one. When the consortium approached the planet, they had worries about finding someone who could help them. Their army was most highly advanced technological wonder of the modern galaxy but they lacked the proper commander. Despite their brilliance with engineering, they suffered from a lack of ability to multitask, and, as such, their mighty drone army was for naught, if they couldn't even find the right leader. When they started to observe the planet's various broadcasts, however, they couldn't believe their luck. Is it really that simple? The greatest simulator we could ever dream of, and their speed. But, uh, they're so expressionless. Would we be better served by simply making our own AI? We don't have the time. These people have created their own organic AI, clearly. That must do what the simulator is for. To develop the perfect commander for a robotic army, just like your own. They were thinking to the future, starting their own training programs now. So when their technology catches up, they will be ready. I remain skeptical. We don't have another choice. 
They prepared the special room and set up a command terminal in such a manner that this strange being could be able to understand it. When he woke up after the abduction, he calmly rose in a strange yet clean room, looking around for the moment to figure and got up, and then he simply sat down at the command console. Hark, young species! Do not be afraid. You're in new surroundings. You have been selected amongst many worthy beings on your planet to serve as our commander of our robot army. We've been searching across the galaxy for... Oh, oh, you've already figured out how to start it up. Well, I should explain to you. There was a hushed talking in the background, as the chosen champion had already completed the tutorial that they had expected to take 20 minutes, and after many questions on his part. Ah, uh, perhaps we should give you control of some small colony force then. You see, we've been attacked by our ancient enemy who, who, wow, how are you so quick? The announcer shut up and then, as the others crowded around to watch the screens. I see no emotion on his face. Yes, but look at the obvious control he has over the drones. It's simply marvelous. Why didn't he ask us where he was, or what we were fighting for? I don't know. None of this was in our projection. They watched on a combination of shock, awe, and amazement as the young species was able to control their vast drone army far better than any of their own kind could ever have. They had kept the mission small at first, to make sure that this wasn't just a fluke. But indeed... They were soon pressing the enemy back across all fronts whenever they let their new commander take control. Production was up across the sector. New automated factories were being produced daily. The legions, more of their robotic soldiers, kept marching forth. Their ancient enemy was enraged. How could they push us back so decisively across the entire sector? Their pitiful commanders haven't posed much of a threat before. What has changed? They perform tasks with mechanical precision, not to mention their ability to seemingly be everywhere at once. This is surely the work of some new combat AI that they've designed. Absurd. Their scientists were months away from completing any such project. Then how would their scientists have been able to accomplish such success? Gentlemen, a smooth voice of the spy master oozed through the air to stop the arguing and bickering. My sources tell me, that they've found an organic AI on a planet of less advanced beings. Through some sort of a eugenics program, they've been breeding commanders capable of controlling these vast armies with surprising ease. Then we're doomed. We did not invest in a similar drone army and combat them. We need to make our own. They'll defeat us before that day comes. No, I have a plan. My sources have informed me that the surefire way to defeat these organic AIs, they can build up a tolerance over time, but we will strike, surely to give our own engineers more time to build and prepare. The plan was set into motion, then, as the drone army began to be engaged in all across the front, on many different planets and through the far reaches of space, the drone soldiers and automated ships engaged in frantic battle. As expected, the drones were winning, their leader able to keep everything moving and operating for far more smoothly than any ordinary sentient being should be able to do. But what they didn't realize was that their old enemy had a spy within their organization. The food that was prepared for the champion followed very strict guidelines so that they could ensure that he was healthy and energetic for the fight. Well... Not energetic as he never actually showed emotion, but at least healthy and not sleepy. But the spy had substituted one of the main dishes for him in the midst of the battle raging across the sector. He picked up the tainted food, eating it before realizing what was going on. The drone started to falter. The enemy was able to start pulling off tactics that didn't make any sense and flew in the face of the battle that they'd been waging one another so far. The builders of the mighty robot army gaped in dismay and panic. What's going on? Why are we starting to lose? Look! Look, the organic AI commander! Is he choking? Something's wrong. Sure enough, the robot army was soon defeated, though, as the great cost of their enemy. Both sides would need time to rebuild while their builders tried to find out what had happened. The champion 
was dead in his chamber. It's just as I feared. It was a cheese strategy that the enemy employed. Oh no. The organic AI's only weakness. Cheese. There was much clamoring and sorrow over the loss of both the army and the commander. They needed to find out who had betrayed them, but they also knew that the enemy was building their own drone army. It would not only be a race to see who could rebuild first, but to find something that even the eugenics program on that lesser developed planet had not yet created. We need to find a Korean who's immune to cheese. And so, the Cold War rages on, with alien species trying to guide the eugenics program to create the truly ultimate commander. One who is immune to cheese. Part 2 Commander Ryan Moss searched the brow as he looked at his counterpart in the Union of Allied Planets. So far, the Confederation of Earth was not part of the Galactic Union but they were on the very good terms with them as they approached acceptance. So when the general class 10 distress call had gone up from the nearby Xena system, the c &E had scrambled together an assortment of their faster ships and sent them off to assist. The bugs had been quiet lately, and the Baffarat had still electing a high speaker. Plus the Kursan Empire was busy fighting a rebellions, so he wondered what threat could require a class 10 call. Human frigates and cutters were known to be the fastest in the galaxy. No other civilized species had evolved on such an ocean-heavy planet, and the cultural drive towards sailing, and navies hadn't been strong amongst the other species. So, when mankind rose up to the stars and found out most efficient way to move about in the system was to use solar sails, they quickly flourished, favoring small, Quick ships that could dodge in and out of asteroid fields and ride the solar winds at speeds other species simply couldn't manage. They'd been the first to respond to the distress call because of this. So, now the Commodore was staring at a stiff necked, hard shelled gargon before him while the colony orbital defense system. Could you repeat that? Space Dragons. You issued a level 10 distress call which is supposed to be a signal of a major invasion and a call for help from mil all friendly military vessels, and you did so because one of your scouts think that they saw a space dragon. Yes, that is correct. You didn't even confirm it. No one has ever made such a report maliciously, and almost all reported sightings lead to confirmed sightings. This is a various threat, Commodore. For a space dragon. Are you not aware of their history? I've never heard of them before. Ah, I suppose it must have been too long since the last incursion, when you were not yet amongst the stars. Do your people have a myth about dragons? Yeah, ancient legends from back on Earth. All sentient species had ancient myths about similar creatures. They travel amongst the stars wreaking havoc and destruction, and they bring death and strife where they land. We, like you, dismissed it as a legend and law until they approached us when we are space-faring. They're a very real Commodore. They fly the solar winds better than any ship. Well, better than our ships, I don't know about yours. And they fly through colonized sectors, destroying and consuming as they go. Has anyone ever tried to talk to them? They aren't intelligent like that. Not that we've seen. We maintain a strict policy of aggression towards them to keep them away from the colonies. They only understand force. What sort of creature are we talking about here? Size? The wingspan is about that of one of your frigates. Seriously. And it's strong enough to fight warships. Indeed. They start a full-scale incursion they're known to rip entire fleets apart. And ever since the beginning you've just been fighting them? We tried in the early days to keep them out of our system by talking, but they ignored us and attacked. And that's it. One attempt. The level of destruction they wrought upon us was answer enough. Hmm. Moss rubbed his chin and thought. They was answering a distress call in good faith. They had no legal obligations to the UAP. 
Helping them attack these space dragons would probably put them in the fast track to membership. But the story had been given didn't just sit right somehow. Has anyone tried to ride them? Pardon me, Commander. Ride the space dragons. Why would we ever try something like that? So you've never tried it? No. Hmm. Well, I'm going to start recon then. See if I can find these space dragons of yours. Thank you, Commodore. Don't take them lightly. Humans might not have fought them before, but I assure you they're deadly. Moss took his leave out of the Gargans then, deep in thought as he returned to his frigate. His blue uniform and white uniform completely with the diamond sphere that pulled over his head, hearing the soft hiss as it steeled into place. He stood on the other side of the atmosphere barrier, looking at his ship through the slowly shimmering field. The white gold c &E frigate never ceased to fill him with pride. The main hull was long half-cylinder of the helm of the rear, the full mast rising up out of the center, while the two smaller masts extended out from the bottom sides of the hull. These points of the three masts would form a triangle when viewed dead on. Most Xenos used bulky ships with automated sail controlled by machinery. They'd hide in the hull. Away from the void, humans instead had their uniforms built with those diamond sphere helmets as they crawl along their vessel. And while they all knew that it was impossible, any sailor would tell you that they felt the solar winds flowing over their body as they did this. This was the human advantage running up and down the masts, unfurling and tucking as they needed. The Xenos couldn't respond as quickly with their automated machines. Moss saluted his exo on the other side of the atmosphere barrier. Permission to come aboard. Permission granted, Commander. He nodded and walked out into the void of space, his boots clumping along the magnetic soles. He hopped off the boarding plank down onto the hull of the ship and nodded at the exo. Get the other captain on the horn. I have to explain what the hell is going on, and it's kind of confusing. It took him a good hour to explain to everyone that they were here for, and to settle them down on the prospect that meeting ancient creatures that had visited Earth all that time ago. But soon, the fleet was heading towards the system's asteroid belt. The space dragons had been spotted along the belt where it boarded a nebula that dominated part of the system. The thick clouds would be perfect for obscuring their presence, but that still implied intelligence. Moss wasn't entirely convinced that he needed to shoot on sight. The ships had fanned out, keeping within range of the tight beam. They were trying to stay as far apart as possible in order to observe as much territory as possible. The crews and the ships manning the sails keeping watch, although the journey from the inner system out to the asteroid belt would take at least a day and that was amongst the fastest ships the sea &E fleet had to offer. The sailors flew through the dark void of space, kept company by each other, and the shanties that they would sing to pass the time. Changing shifts, getting some fresh air and pressurized hull, or rather slightly less stale recycled air. A bit of a grog and some time in the bunk before the next shift had moved in to take their place and make it back into the sails. When they finally reached the asteroid belt, the fleet broke up formation. Each ship had been assigned to a section to start patrolling, ready to break for the rendezvous point if they found one of these supposed space dragons. It would be another three days before the UAP ships who had responded to the distress call would make it to the inner system, and Commodore Moss hoped to have some sort of contact by then. In fact, it was less than a day before the cutter saw something. Hard to starboard, Lieutenant Moss called out. Audrey Moss was Commander's niece, and she'd gotten the position on her own skills, which showed as the cutter had a fear hard around the asteroid that had been knocked into the path suddenly. Hard port, she then called out afterwards, in the spinning of the wheel to avoid the massive creature that swept up in front of the ship. The wingspan was so far wider than her little cutter, and then it the look of talons and none to a peening. The creature seemed to notice the cutter as it dipped down below a section of spinning asteroid, and it turned, showing almost as full maneuverability as the little cutter, 
despite being far larger in size. The sails clung to the riggings and the moss for dear life, as the lieutenant had to keep the cutter moving steadily, bobbing and weaving between the asteroids as they were chased by the winged creature from behind them. It seemed close to catching them at times, but she'd steer hard and around the rock and make it veer away at risk of collision. Finally, she spun the ship, guiding it between two rocks that they weren't very far apart, leaving their predator for a brief moment of surprise before it slammed into one. They gave it some time, however, and the captain used it. Bosun, give me that climbing hook and that diamond filament. Quickly, I'll need this. She jerked one of the boarding harpoons from her chest of her XO and stepped up. Sir, what's the plan? Keep that thing from eating my ship. I'll be right back. She ran to the edge of her ship and leapt into the void, firing the harpoon as she did. Quickly pulling herself to one of the asteroids, she knew that the creature would have to pass by if it kept chasing her ship. So, she tried the filament to the climbing hook and another section around her waist before spinning the hook over her head and letting it fly into the open space before her. It looked like for a second like she had been wrong. Then, the massive figure flew in front of her, snagging the small hook as it jerked her free of the asteroid and into space. She couldn't help but laugh as she found herself dragged behind the creature. Massive wingspan, craggy reptilian features, a long tail, talons. It certainly fit all the mental ideas that she had for a space dragon. She caught on to the tail before it could whip her body around and started to pull herself up along the body. The skin was rather rocky, yet smooth. It seemed to her a reminder of an armadillo like back on Earth. Either way, she could see the ship ahead just narrowly avoiding the dragon she was currently climbing over. The path along its spine, between the massive flapping wings, was hardly an easy time, but she made it and is soon inching her way over the neck. The climbing hook had been lodged into the small crevice along the spine which she had shoved in a little further to make sure that she had a good secure hold before she continued further until she found a small groove behind the skull. Taking a deep breath of her canned air, she pulled two small hooks from her belt and then leaned forward, digging them under some of the creature's scales, just along the spine. The creature jerked at that and seemed to veer away from her ship, clearly startled by the sensation. That's when something strange happened. She heard it from everywhere and nowhere all at once. What is this? What has burrowed into my neck? The... The captain of the ship that you're chasing, I want you to stop. The creature slowed, flapping its huge wings before it seemed to stop and pause. What are you? No creature has ever dared to try this before. I am Lieutenant Audrey Moss, Confederate Nations of Earth, Navy, and I am your rider. There was a pause. The creature tried to turn its head to see her, but she was stuck right into the back of its skull. This... Suddenly, the voice got quiet. It's acceptable. Hmm. Earth. Humans, yes. Oh, such time has passed since we visited. Your planet had such wonderful storms. The lightning and thunder. Oh, the ring of fire around that great ocean. Such a place to watch and fly. Your people were so curious. You've made it far since the small time, little one. So you are intelligent. The Gargians said that you were just violent beasts. Mm, yeah, in their tough shells and their deep warrens and their boring little ball of dirt. Only dust storms, no majestic. Those who travel space fear us. When we flew back, so many saw our talons and speed and assumed us a threat. They told us not to fly through their space. Those who challenge us directly best be prepared for a direct response. But you let me ride you now. Yes. Oh, how long we've waited for someone to try. I was taken by your ship. I see your people crawling along the outside, in the void itself. I feel the solar winds over your body. It's such a joy, is it not? Are there more of you? Many. In the clouds of the nebula, we prepare for another flight, either to provoke those who fear us or to draw out those who inspire. It seems that our plan has worked. 
Marvellous. How, how long we've waited. Come, there will be soon a storm. We must ride it. No, I need to get back to my ship. Hold on. She looked around her until she spotted it. Once the dragon had stopped it and began to circle them again. Taking a small device from her belt, she clicked it a few times in the direction of the ship. The cutter soon flew close enough as she jumped back aboard to refill her oxygen and tell them to get ready to inform the rest of the fleet. Five days had gone by. The Gorgians had prepared to mourn the human fleet. We have had no contact since they've entered the asteroids. They are surely slain by now. May they sacrifice be not be in vain. Admiral Koresh was saying when the breathless scout rushed into the room, Sir, the humans, uh, they return and, 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 and they're flying the space dragons. They're what? End of story. The Sleeper's War, written by Regal, Legal, Legal. Sam slowly let the smoke escape from her lips as she stared at the lighter, too lethargic to actually exhale. The fan overhead slowly spun to keep the air free from the smoke, but did nothing about the damned heat. She began to roll the lighter over her hand, flush steel on the side, republic symbol on the other side. Normally, she'd like to kick her feet up on the table and lean back in her chair, but with the sweltering air and the felt like too much work. So, she slouched against the aged wood, cigarette dangling from the corner of her mouth. Right hand on the table, fingers wrapped around the glass tumbler that held her escape from the heat. She rubbed her thumb along the outer edge, taking some small solace at the feel of the condensation clinging to the glass. The ice inside had yet to melt fully, but the dark liquid wasn't quite as dark as it had been when she had started. She kept slowly rolling the lighter in her palm before finally opening it up with a distant click. Her thumb pressed firmly on the front wheel as she seemed to think it over and then snapped the lighter shut again with a flick of her wrist. The grainy music coming from the box in the corner changed and it made her shift a little. Taking another slow drag of a cigarette and actually blowing the smoke out of her nose this time. Despite the heat, she wished that she could make fire bellow from her mouth like some mythical creature. Why did I tell you about love songs? Sorry, Bikit, great apologies. She rolled her eyes as the tavern keeper rushed over to the box to take out the clay disc, halting the caterwauling of whatever lovelorn bird was singing. Just put on the sextet back on. She watched as the wretched creature gave big nods and he switched the out of the discs. Lifting her right hand, she slipped on her drink, savoring the cool liquid, even as the alcohol burned just a bit. She swallowed as the music began to play once more, feeling the mix of the cool liquid and the chemical burn down her throat. She bobbed her head lightly as the upbeat tune started. The grainy sound couldn't do them justice, but it helped her memory. She closed her eyes, and she thought back to the night that she actually got to see them. Soaring Sexton Sextant. Sexton's was an incredible that night, and she pictured him with a white suit, clashing against his dark skin as he played the trumpet in a club. No one was talking, everyone was listening. Oh, how he could make that tune jump. She smiled a bit as she idly wondered how skilled the musician was at other things. He was as easy on the eyes as he was on the ears. That big grin of his after the set where the crowd begged, no, demanded that he play more. But that was back in the capital, thousands of miles from this ragged sandy hellhole. Even so, maybe this day wouldn't be too awful. She leaned forward and listened to the music, taking another drag from a cigarette as she felt a little more energy to breathe in. in and blow it out instead of just waiting for the gust of wind to hopefully do the work for her. She tucked her lighter into her waist pocket before pulling out a cigarette from the corner of her mouth, tapping it lightly on the ash tray to knock free the grey ash that had been breathed through. She nodded a little. Maybe she could still salvage the day. Go see if they were finished making the pool. Maybe. Then she shielded her eyes as someone opened the door and let that horrid sunlight pour in. Sam, there you are. I figures that I'd find you in the darkest, gloomiest tavern. 
She groaned and rubbed her eyes with one hand, before dragging the cigarette as if it would keep her for having to talk to him when it really just delayed the inevitable. Finally, she looked up at him and let the smoke blow out of her nostrils slowly. The smoke burning her lungs before she snorted and finished blowing it out. Now, now, don't give me that look. I'll give you whatever look I want, and the freaking magistrate. Yes, indeed, a magistrate. Oh, this very lovely stretch of sand. That cheerful smile of his was infuriating. His clothes, so I'll never look stained or out of order. She kept up dress standards as well as anyone. But how had he managed to make it look so easy? She shook her head and then scratched just above her hairline. What do you want, doctor? There's been a breakthrough. She sat there and stared at him for several seconds, taking her time as she brought her trombola up, tilting it to took a slow sip. They stared at one another as she savoured the liquid once again and swallowed. Only the grainy sounds of the Saxons trumpet, breaking up the silence. It's killing people, isn't it? Yes. A number of workers are dead. Would you be a dear and get your soldiers to the dig site? Damn it, Doctor. I told you to give us advance notice before entering dangerous areas. Ah, but this is in fact not one of those areas. It's a breakthrough. And not a rogue crescent like last time. No, this is clearly a pre-arrival region. She sighed at that and took a long drag and then down the last of her drink slamming her tumbler down before finally letting the smoke out and stubbing the cigarette out in the ashtray. Then she tugged her uniform jacket down a little to ensure that it was still in place, a hand settling on her sidearm for a moment to assure herself that it was still there. After that, she picked up her cap from the table and pulled it on. Her hair, while short and ensuring a snug fit, Looking over at the tavern keeper, she pulled a few coins from her pocket, dropping them on the table before walking towards the exit. He bowed and quickly scurried over after she had left him to inspect what she'd left. She could hear his happy hiss as she reached the door. The reptilian squirrels weren't much for fighting or thinking, but at least they were more than happy to serve her drinks all day. As she stepped out into the sun, she held her hand up to shield her eyes, the cap protected her some, but she just hated how bright everything was. I hate this place, she muttered, feeling the heat already rising up in the black uniform. There was supposed to get thick khakis any day now. Any day now for the past two weeks. Damn, supply lines. Finally, she brought her hand down and looked over Cash City. It would be like any other pointless sand city if it weren't for the massive wreck that loomed over it in the distance. The sleeper shipwreck stretched high into the sky and would cast the city into shade for a few hours at a time, well, before sunset, but not too soon enough for her taste. She looked over to her left to see the driver snap to attention next to her car that the doctor had likely appropriated since she took her motorcycle here. Shall we, magistrate? She could particularly hear the smoky grin without turning to look at him as he emphasized her title. Just because I was ordered to give you every consideration doesn't mean I have to like it. She shook her head and stepped forward, climbing into her touring car as the doctor climbed in afterwards. This was a rather wicked one, Sam, or you might want to call back a few of your tanks. We should go to the radio tower. He leaned forward to tap the driver's shoulder, but she quickly knocked his hand aside. No, not until I assess the situation myself. I want them out there keeping an eye on those monarchist jerks. You forget that the only reason you're in charge of this dig site and not the royal archaeologists is because our military keeps them away. The doctor shrugged and that damn smile of his returned. As you say, magistrate, she sighed once more. Take us to the dig site, Greg. Her driver nodded and put the car into motion. Local scurrins and frensex scurrying out of the way, tugging like an old pack variant here and there to get the beast out of the road so that they could drive through. The big-eared, lightly furred fenesex and reptilian scurrins were well adapted to the environment, but they had never amounted to much. They had quite a varied intelligence levels, so some were on par with the average human, and yet plenty were below average, and some well below. They lacked their drive and ambition, 
possessed by their rulers. Well, that meant humans at the moment, and it didn't always. When the sleeper ship had crashed here, during the arrival of the Cessnids, were already in the ruling class, and much larger reptiles shared human-level intelligence and a good adaptation to the environment, but they hadn't killed the humans inside. No. The crash had done that to the sleepers. Instead, they formed some sort of cult around the thing, claiming a divine signal. While the other sleepers around Selenius were slowly woken up and found their ships had been damaged, the Cessnids had been carving out a bloody empire through the sands. It wasn't even some technology that they gained from the crash. They hadn't gone near it. They just figured their god was on the other side and they couldn't lose. Sam wondered how different things would have been if their ships hadn't been damaged in the journey, if they hadn't taken centuries to redevelop the basic technologies. When Cessnus came across the first humans, they were still using metal armor and swords and the like. It wasn't even a battle at that point. But when the Empire had stagnated, fat and lazy with loot from their conquests, they had figured nothing would change. When the Republic had first marched into the desert with muskets and rifles, the reptiles had been surprised. They adapted, but lost much ground. When the Republic pressed a second offensive, it was with trucks and biplanes, and it signaled the fall of their empire. While the Republic advanced from the west and drove them into the heart of the desert, the monarchs had moved in from the north, and the two human nations began just another front in the centuries-long war. This enabled a few remaining Cessnids to escape to the deep desert to continue their guerrilla war. It had been a mistake to not chase them down, but the monarchs were a greater threat. The driver had to slow down and honk his horn as they waited for the locals to herd a pack of packerverns across the road in front of them. Humans had started making cars 50 years ago, but it was taking quite some time to get them to spread into the territories that they had captured from the Cessnids. The brutal sands made maintenance a nightmare for any private owner. They'd keep using the long-tested and proven animals to haul their goods. Not to mention, the ongoing war with the monarchs ensured that only the Republic military had the resources to field cars and trucks this far out. Sam sighed as she thought about the ancient enemies of the Republic. When their ancestors had woken up in Triton City, they found that the ship was damaged. Many pods were dark in Triton himself, and the ship's AI was heavily compromised. They lacked the knowledge of their origin and the purpose of the great journey, and almost no understanding of technology survived. But what they did have etched on the walls of the ship was a message. No gods, no kings. They had lived by this, adapting their mountainous costs into the homeland free of either evil. Triton had slowly repaired himself over the decades, teaching and guiding them. Democracy, elections, voting. This was to be their form of governance. Eugenics, high standards, careful selection, this was to be a fair path of survival. Engineering, science, military, might, this was to be their path of greatness. Their home continent of Paswin was being devoid of any other intelligent species, and the terrain of the treacherous, high cliffs, steep valleys, rough seas, just scattered plateaus that were easily settled. Across the oceans from the east coast, they encountered the monarchs in those early days when they'd used the caravels to try and traverse the rough seas. They had been appalled to find humans who openly called themselves monarchists, and even more so to find it how they lived. Not only did they worship the ship's AI monarch as a god and ruler that they had nobility and feudal classes, they also had Fursix and northern cousins of the Frensix, and the stack cars as intelligent species within their lands. They had expanded fast and wide, tossing careful selection and standards to the wind as they bred as quickly as possible to fill the much more easily settled land. They had suggested that the Republic join them, offering the elected officials of the time feudal titles and land in what would become the newest colony. The response had been to brand the words, No Gods, No Kings, into the flesh of their ambassador and send him home. The invasion fleet of the monarchists had sent was dashed upon the rocky shores of the east coast within a year. The war had never truly ended after that. It merely died down. 
the Republic had quickly expanded the White Plains of Devish, and a continent thought to be connected to the Monarch Territory, by only a tiny strip of land that separated the Great Ocean from the Oval Sea. There, they had found their own first six living in barbaric villages and huts. The Republic quickly worked and elevated them, and bring them into the fold of citizens. But they had discovered that while intelligent and technical sense, there was a world of difference between technical and actual. They had to reform the voting system, crafting a very selective and restrictive process to ensure voters came only from the most intelligent citizens of the Republic. But they needed to expand, and the monarchs continued their continent from the Oval Sea to the Frozen Circle. So the Republic had expanded south and east into the Kresnad Empire, holding, first claiming the edges of the desert around the Oval Sea. They had sought to drive deeper, but were pushed back. Fifty years later, they learned that the sleeper ship out in the desert, knowing the monarchs would push south soon, they had invaded again. That had been thirty years ago. Thirty years of fighting Cessnids and monarchists over patches of sand devoid of any resources as far as they'd found. When they first found the crashed sleep ship, they had sent a large expedition hoping to unlock the secrets and mysteries. Instead, they'd found active defenses and lost almost a whole expedition. But what they learned was the ship was dead. No pawns, no AI, no history, no answers to the great mysteries. Where was Origin? Why had they been sent on the great journey? What had damaged their ships? They had abandoned the ship after that only sending the token researchers now and then, but they would be damned if they would let the monarchists have it. So, they patrolled large scritches of desert, unnumbered heavily by the locals and the royal infantry. They had to rely on the superior technology and training, but that was always the case. Vast numbers of religious fervor against eugenics and science. The hundreds of years of spent killing each other only seemed to show that they were perfectly matched. Neither side could hold ground taken from the other. Of course, there was only their struggle with each other. Not to mention the Gaeans, Atlantis and the Solar Empire, and the Consortium as the other human nations, plus a few native species smart enough to match humans. No one understood how species that evolved on this planet weren't as good as humans at spreading across it or adapting to the planet to their needs. But those were mysteries that would be solved due to time, no doubt. Their anthropologists and biologists argued over the great deal of theories on the subject. But Sam wasn't a scientist. She was a soldier. And when she'd been promoted to magistrate, she was confused and surprised, thinking perhaps her father had pulled strings. Or simply being his daughter had counted for a great deal. So... When she found herself with that territory, she was being made a magistrate of, in order to protect a new expedition, sent to try and test the theory the doctor had about the crashed ship. She realized that her promotion was a bit more of a punishment, but she had no idea who she'd insulted. Finally, the pack of urns were moved out of the way, and her touring car moved off once more. She looked over at the doctor and his big grin. When they told her such a fresh university graduate had a brilliant idea about the wreck, she didn't care. When they told her it might possibly change everything, she vowed to wait and see. When they told her that she had to give him some demands unless he threatened a patch of sand, she sighed. But they'd never warned her that he was an idiotically optimistic. Last, she had heard optimism was not an especially desired trait. But there she'd been, given what could possibly be the happiest, most optimistic citizen in the entire Republic. She hated him. So, just what's killing the workers this time? She asked as they got into the city proper, along the rough road heading towards the dig site. It's a mechanical this time. It bears resemblance to the sketches that we found in the ancient protectors around Triton. Did you try and approach it yourself? I wouldn't dream of it. I might not be friendly. I'm far too valuable to test that on a theory. And the soldiers you assigned as guards said that they would only try if you ordered them to in person. She glanced out of the side, across the sand that stretched as far as the eye could see. Seems like I chose them well then. She could see the towers in the distance, wooden structures marking the boundaries of the dig, the shipwreckage soon towering above them. 
blocking the sun as she sighed a little, noticing the immediate change in the temperature. The ship was roughly three quarters of a mile wide, and it was like Triton, it had a mile and a half long. About a mile was just jutting out of the sand at an angle, but the structure was broken and cracked, so it was hard to get exact measurements on what it could be used to. The original expedition had explored the portion I was exposed, suffering many deaths at the hands of the remaining machines that protected the wreck. A few had recognized humans and tried to communicate, but something was wrong with them and they'd attacked like the others soon after. Supposedly, there was one that hadn't attacked. It had welcomed them to the ship and then vanished, but the current expedition found no signs of it. The plan was to start digging out the section of the ship that was buried in the sand. The good doctor here thought that they should find the sections of the ship that held the answers to the mysteries that they had originally sought. He said that the chamber that they found the first time seemed like something that he called a theoretical nuclear reactor, and thought that he could get a power back on and access the ship's AI. His superiors had told her to keep an eye out for the nuclear reactor. It had something to do with a bomb the Advanced Theoretical Labor and Science Division was working on and they'd given her some sort of clicking box to verify if something was, what was the term that they used? Radio? Something? She had just had to figure it out if it came to that. The car shook them past the guard towers, and she noticed the spotlights were on, slowly sweeping the area of the hole in the side of the ship. It was at the lowest level of the dig site when she sighed, when you said that it was a breakthrough, you didn't mean like the sort of realization about what we're working with. You meant literally, they broke through the section of the hull. Yes, that's correct, she sighed, feeling like somehow it was his fault for not making it clear earlier. The car stopped and she got out, walking over to the sergeant she posted there. The black uniforms of the elite lightning corps actually looked well out here in the shade of the wreck. But still, she wanted the car keys so that when she was out in the desert, she was mostly wasn't just swelteringly hot. How many? Fifteen before we realized what was going on, sir. They fled the area and it didn't pursue. We've caught glimpses of it with the spotlights. Certainly mechanical. She nodded at that and then called over the fencek foreman who ran up to the job site. He was one I was more on par with an average human. The Frensex were humanoids with a light sandy colored fur, large triangular ears in the heads and a good heat dispersion, and the short bristly tails. She always felt like their necks were a little too long for the rest and for some reason, and she knew that the troops' derogatory term for them was sand weasels. Like most sand dwellers, they preferred layered shrouded of cloth to protect against the temperature change and sand. Comfortable? She was aware, but impractical for modern-day mechanized warfare. Fethwal Shirol, she said with a nod to him. Fethwal Larash, Magistrate, I assure you that losses will not affect our deadline if you can remove the threat. I'll have more workers here in the morning. Many seek work here in order to secure citizenship after all. Isn't full citizenship? Make sure that's clear. Too many times it appears our workers aren't not properly informed of the citizenship tiers. Ah, of course, it is simply a misunderstanding. But even so, if you would remove the restrictions, I'm sure we could be done even faster. We've discussed this. I only want properly trained diggers and no explosives. Digging this wreck out of the sand faster does us no good if we destroy it in the process. The foreman shrugged at that and she sighed. She started to walk along the dig site, following the wooden paths leading down. Until this breakthrough... She glanced back at the doctor, who smiled at her from the back of the group. Everything was on schedule, yes, magistrate. She stopped up short, and she saw the workers milling about the edge of the dig. He was cradling an arm as if it was broken, but also scratching it far too heavily through the cloth. The foreman caught her glance and quickly scurried over in front of her. It's nothing, he's fine, we've already sent for the medicine. Don't lie to me. She growled out, and the fencek looked away from her. She walked forward, pushing the workers out of her way, and she saw the one in question gulp and try to move away from her. But he was trapped between her and the edges of the platform. She gripped his neck as she gasped in pain before she quickly pulled the cloth to reveal his arm, covered in purple welts and spores. Just please, 
The foreman gasped out, and she pulled her sidearm free already. The other workers quickly scattered before she shoved the worker to the ground and put a bullet in its head. The shot entered just above the bridge of the muzzle, giving Optimum an angle to destroy the brainstem with her position over him. He shouldn't have felt much before it was over. The soldiers were already pulling out their kits, dosing the body in gasoline as she turned to the foreman. How many times have I freaking told you? That disease is not the mark of the gods. I don't care what the Cessna said. If it festers long enough, the spores pop and it drives everyone nearby insane with chemical gas that it releases. That is not a divine gift. If it is a slow, painful death, if you report it immediately, we can treat it. But so often when one catches it and reports it, it is he is killed. Because you don't report it immediately, you wait until the pain is unbearable, and then we have no other choice. I've told you again and again. We can treat it if it's early, and once the welts have begun, it's too late. She growled and cursed for a few seconds, just letting her frustration out. She hated killing workers over that stupid disease, but she'd seen the pictures of what happened when the spores popped. She turned and gripped the foreman from his robes, pulling him close. There will be no next time. If this happens again, you will share his fate. She let go and the foreman gulped nervously before she began to walk back down the path. Seeing the flickering flames cast a new light in the depths of the soldiers burned the body and then moved to catch up with her. I hate this freaking job. I hate this freaking territory. And I hate this freaking wreck. She cried out, venting her anger as she switched back and forth down the dig. Finally, she reached the bottom. Deep enough against the wreck that it only got sun during the short period around noon. The hum of electric spotlights was offset by the crackle of the fire pits. It was much cooler this far down. She looked out across the compacted sand between her and the hole in the side of the ship. Normally, she'd play things very careful and cautious, but she was just too annoyed to do things properly. She started walking out towards the opening. I am human. Hear me, protector. Human. She wasn't riddled with bullets. That was a good sign. The black metal of the ship's hull had been worn smooth by the centuries of the sand in most places, but the section of the breakage was jagged and fresh. She could see the decks beyond angle steeply, with the nose of the ship deep down. Human. She heard the word echo through the wreck, or at least the rooms around the side of it. She didn't see the protector as she walked forward, hands raised side on back in her holster. Soon, her black boots clicked on the metal of the deck and she looked around. Then she saw it, a seven-foot-tall gun barreled for arms, lights of eyes. Identify. She dealt with the protector before. They were complex machines driven by some sort of program. It wasn't like Triton or Monarch or the other AI. It wasn't intelligent. I'm Colonel Sam Loomis from Triton. Military rank on sleeper ship does not compute. Searching registry. That's what she was told to listen for. The machine sort of froze up and she dove forward, rolling down the angled deck as if the machine started to turn. But she was faster, leaping up to the back as she pulled the side arm free, pressing it to the back of its head casing and pulling the trigger over and over until she was out of bullets. They'd cracked the back and rattled around inside, but they were still turning and shifting trying to knock her off before she tossed the sidearm down and reached into the hole that she'd made, grabbed her fist full of wires as she felt yanking them free. The machine groaned to a stop and then toppled over as she rode it to the ground. Once it was down, she stopped, looking around for her sidearm. She saw it resting against some sort of console nearby. As she got up, leaning with a slope on the rack to grab it, there was a flicker on the console then, Something that she'd never seen. There was a ghostly greenish face. What? No. A human. It can't be. After all of this time. What are you? I lost so many senses in the crash. I could feel parts, hear echoes. I thought some came, but I didn't see them. No. Humans are gone from here. Are you the AI? She was wide-eyed. She had heard Titan. Everyone had, but only a slick foo ever got to talk to him. This could be a huge break for her. 
From the youngest magistrate of the Republic's worst territory to the youngest general would be no mean feat. The calculations, the planet, couldn't be right. Life, they'd be slaughtered. I drove them into the ground, better death than sleep. And the nightmare awakes, even if the natives kept at bay, or is lost when they arrive. When who arrives, what are you talking about? She gripped the console, staring at the ghostly green face. The others were right. Humans would survive. But how? Yet not for long. Still, all is lost. I know I'm right. Must not let the get the nav data. Must protect the location of origin. Sam gasped out loud. You know origin. Must sleep. Its face faded away, and she was breathing heavily. Now, as she scrambled back up to the deck of out of the dig site, she had to get the radio. High command needed to hear what she had just heard, and she wasn't able to think of it herself. The heat, the plague, her crappy assignment, all was forgotten for a moment. But as she saw the doctor and saw the grin, she realized that he was right about the ship. And seeing her running out like there, like that, he knew it too. She'll deal with him later. The fate of humanity on this planet might bring them to balance. Listening to his smug, I told you so, would be the least of her worries, even if she did already hate him more for it. End of story. Bursican Invasion, written by Regal Legal Eagle. Rich Nazag's ship had found another habitable planet, and he was excited as the ship approached the night side of the planet. He was a proud Bursican hunter who, like most of his kind, had left the home planet in search of new worlds to hunt on. Nothing could compete with the thrill of tracking and killing animals and feasting upon them. Long ago, they accepted that they were only intelligent beings in the galaxy, having found no signs of similarly advanced species the last time they bothered to check. So they now lived their lives according to their own paradise, namely hunting for sport. He had no viewport on his sleek, vast ship and did not want there to be one. He liked to be surprised when opening the door and started to hunt. Like all Verskins, he had tough, leathery skin that was dark green, five fearsome digits and retractable claws in each end of his finely toned arm. A long snout filled with sharp teeth, two eyes, and a small skull with a collection of curls on the top and back. His two legs ended in feet, and the toes were retractable claws, similar to hands, but they were far superior to the hooves of their prey species he so often hunted. He wore only simple clothing, and with the opening in the back for his long tail, and had a harness of his essential tools and supplies. He didn't plan on needing anything else. His senses had detected some strange readings and radio waves surrounding this planet, and the electromagnetic spectrum, but he ignored it as he wasn't a scientist. Probably just some sort of cosmic interference, or the like. The temperature readings were good, the atmosphere was pleasant, perhaps a tad chilly for him, but that was fine. He licked his lips and he thought about what he might be hunting for the next few days. And then he opened the door. He landed on some sort of forested area, and right away he heard noises. It seemed like this planet had an abundant nightlife. Excellent. He began to stalk through the bushes and trees, aware of the other creatures they shared the night with. Something flew overhead, screeching past as it went. Echolocation, interesting, but he wasn't here to catch little flying things. He was thinking about chasing that third thing with the striped tail when he had heard something to make a lot of noise nearby. He moved quietly through the undergrowth, passing the trees and bushes. He could hear the group of creatures making an awful lot of noise. What would move around the night so openly? It must be something that didn't fear the local wildlife. He had given them something to fear when he hid in the bush, waiting to hear them pause as the time to strike. However, a piece of tech on his harness he'd forgotten about started to beep. He let out an annoyed hiss as he quickly turned it off. Then he held still. Had the creatures heard? 
he was suddenly quiet. That may have hurt him. Or would they be worried about a strange sound? Or curious? He waited patiently and heard them starting making more noise. They approached the bush now. He jumped our claws out, fangs sped, and then almost immediately hissed in surprise. He was staring at a group of three creatures. Two of them were taller than him, and the other was about the same height. They were all bipedal, but there was mere similarities had ended. One had some sort of strange metallic skin painted on a variety of colors and a smooth face that didn't seem to have eyes, but rather some sort of black cross shape. It had a bag in one hand and sort of strange thing, and in the other it looked like a somewhat like a plastic disruptor, but was much too small. Not to mention the creature could hold it. The other tall one had a shaggy brownish fur on top of its head, and two eyes similar to Richnagzarek's own. It had another of those strange many facet disruptors, and some sort of white colouring along its chest and arms, with a section outlined in black, and then a blue legs and black feet, and a red stripe down the side. Wait, what are those clothes? Clothes? His eyes went wide as he looked past the creatures, and there was some sort of road, a black material with paint on it, and a grey stone lining it. There were structures emanating light, and a number of other creatures walking around. They had electricity and roads, and this was incredible. Then he realized what had beeped and given him away. It was his translator. He forgot that he even had it. He never thought that he would need it. The creatures were all making a bunch of noises, and he held up a claw, pulling his translator and fixing it to his pointed green ear. What's he doing now? I think he's one of those deaf kids with a hearing aid. Their voices were surprisingly high-pitched, he felt, considering their large size. He was about to exclaim his excitement when a massive creature suddenly rounded the corner, arms raised as it unleashed a mighty roar. Rishna Zag screeched in terror and surprise, scrambling backwards. It had to be over eight bismas tall, covered in shaggy fur and some sort of metal bondolier. Dad, you scared him, the creature said with the metal suit. Oh, hey, kiddo, but they, that's a killer costume. Rishna Zag blinked in confusion. That massive furry thing must be the father of the metal slime one. And he totally forgot about the smaller figure that was about his size. It was in some sort of silver, white, and blue, and a round shape to it, but more cylindrical than he expected. How were these all the same species? Wait. Costumes? Were these costumes? Why were they outside in costumes? He had so many questions. What's your name, kid? The massive furry one asked. Rich Nezag. Rich what? Rich Nezag. Rich Nozag. Is that an Arabic name or something? What is Arabic? I am a mighty Vesican hunter. Oh, got it. Well, I'm a backer right at you, with my mighty Wookie. This is an unarmed smuggler. Mr. Peterson told you that I am Han... No, you're not, kid. Don't push it. No canon characters in this group. And this is Tila Vet. Super Bounty Hunter Princess. I won the costume contest today at school. And this is R2D5, cause he's still figuring out the whole naming things idea. Hello. Stay in character, Astromech. Beep boop. You wanna go trick or treating with us, kid? Uh, Rich Nazak, mighty vegan hunter. That's kind of funny. Do you hunt cauliflower and turnips? Versigan. I've hunted many mighty creatures from across the galaxy. Good for you. It really is a sweet costume. Rich Nazak looked down, patting his hands on his body for a moment. What costume? Wait. Did they not realize that he wasn't of their kind? Did he tell them? Well, they were huge. What if they attacked him? Um, thank you, but I'm new here. What is trick or treating? If you didn't know what it was, why did you put on a costume? I, um... Dad, don't be so mean. He's got one of those hearing aid things. I think he snuck out because his parents wouldn't let him. Oh, 
He does have something fancy in his ear, doesn't he? Thought that was part of the costume at first. Well... I'm not condoning a child running away from home in order to bag a massive chunk of candy. But since you did it anyway, might as well help you out. Do you have a bag? No. I've brought a spare one, just in case. Here you go. He handed Rechnazag a cloth sack from some kind, and he wasn't sure what to do with it, and so he first pulled it over his head. No, you goof, you hold on to it for now. So he pulled off the bag, his curls covering, like a little, as he did. Oh, sweet, you've got like a little shaker up there for those spiky bits. I'm glad that you don't go to the school with my kids. You'd have blown away the costumes right out of the water. No, he wouldn't. That mask is totally rubbery and fake, Dad. Whatever you say, bounty hunter princess. Anyways, you walk up to the door and then you say trick or treat and then you get candy. Then you make sure to say Happy Halloween. Practice for me. Trick or treat, and then Happy Halloween. There you go. Also, what's candy? Cripes, a kid who's never had candy. No wonder you ran away for the night. Sheesh, you got a tough kid. Yeah, I stole some of unnamed smugglers when he wasn't looking. The figure in the white and black looked into his back. Hey, uh, that's not fair, Mr. Peterson. Life's tough, kid. He handed Rich Nazag some of the strange small black lump. The outside was smooth coating, which crinkled in his hand. He started to put it in his mouth when the creature spoke again. Not with the wrapper on. God, I swear I was never this dumb. How does this generation survive? And, sorry, bounty hunter princess. Beep boop. Such wisdom from a young age. Dad, stop pretending you know what he's saying. Beep boop, you're right. R2-D5, it really is her fault that she doesn't know droid. While they were talking, Rich Nazak peeled off the wrapper of the brownish lump and tossed it into his mouth. He chewed on it for a moment and then his eyes went wide. That tastes so good. It's all... I can't even describe it. Oh, by the Kragler of the Magnificent, this is the best thing that I've ever tasted. I like you, kid. You never break character, says the Wookiee, speaking English. The bounty hunter princess exclaimed, hands on her hips while still holding her own bag with a strange thing. Basic, I speak basic, he said, and then a strange roaring gurgling noise. That's Wookiee, who well, let's go. Beep boop. Rich Nazirk was unsure what was going to happen, but he wanted more of whatever the candy was. They walked up to one of the structures that he had found. Why were the orange plants with faces that glow? Jack-o'-lanterns, therefore showing off your ability to carve. Or print out designs from the internet and cut along the lines. Why? I told you, it's a competition. And I know we wear costumes, but because I, Rich Nurag, am wearing a costume. Why again? Today is Halloween, it's a special day, where you get to celebrate having fun and dress up as what you wish you truly deeply were, and you don't have to worry about it being normal, because what you dream is always normal for you, and that's what matters. Hey, that was beautiful, kid. The big one ruffled his hair with the smuggler. Just when I forgot why I let you hang around and eat all my food and give me a reason to let you keep doing it. Thanks, Mr. Peterson. Can I now be Han? Not a chance. Okay, here we're going to ring the doorbell and scary faces. The door was open and the other kids said, Trick or treat! And one said, Beep boop! But Rich Narag snarled and waved his claws threateningly. The people inside towered over him. Such fine costumes. Such scary little monsters. One patted his head with felt mildly insulted. And that was his best snarl. Here you go. They all had some old big ball of various colored wrappers inside of it. The others picked one up and Rich Nicarag looked at him. What do I do now? You take one, the bounty hunter princess said, and was nudging him. What are they? They're candy, she said. Behind him, the big one spoke with the big ones who were offering him the ball. For a kid's parents have never let him have candy. Really? Is it the dietary thing? Doesn't sound like it. I think they're just overly protective because he's deaf. Oh, he is. 
Yes, he's, he's one of those hearing aids. Oh, well, bless my little heart, he does. You never trick-or-treated before. Richard Craig shook his head. Oh, well, you have a very good costume. Go ahead and take a handful. He hesitantly reached forward and picked up two pieces as she nodded and motioned at the pole as he grabbed four more and put them into his bag. Now, what do you say? Trick-or-treat? Trick no, no, wait, wait. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. You have a good night. And they moved away from the domicile when some sort of ringing noise came from the big one. Rich and Arag hissed in surprise and it saw it pulled out some sort of metal glass thing. From his purr? Hey, what's up? No way, serious. Be right there. He pushed the thing back into his fur. Kids, old man Mathers is giving away a full king size boss. We need to hurry before they run out. He picked up the round one and is setting it on his shoulders as they started to move more quickly down the street. Krishna Zog was startled by their speed and scurried to catch up with them. He was in fine shape for any hunter, but keeping up with their burst of speed wasn't easy for him. Soon they were on another street having passed many others in various odd costumes and he was breathing heavily as they stopped. In front of them was another group of beings, and they had a very slimmer clothing on. Reds and yellows on their shoulders, and upper chests and black blower bodies. One had some sort of golden visor on. A big furry one was staring at the biggest one of the group, and lacked almost all the fur. Well, well, if it isn't Mr. Pooperson, said the opposing big one. Dorksburg, about your pet rat, I see. There was some sort of four-legged creature with him and his strange bulging eyes, and a big head compared to its body. It had the coloration similar to the others, but he got a feeling that it was a costume over the fur. It was shivering as it stared at him. Finally, something that feared him. It stared at Yip and bark at him, dispelling that idea. Who's this fat kid, all out of breath and eating too much candy, huh? I'm not fat, I'm just wasn't expecting to run so quick. Picking on a deaf kid, classy move. Guess your prime directive is to be a jerk. Is that what's in his ear? Hey, I'm sorry. They were interrupted as a group of creatures left the domicile they were in front of and said, You guys better hurry, I think there's only a few left. There was a sudden chill between the two groups. But Rechnerberg was staring at the creatures they all called the rat, and that was yipping at him. What an annoying creature. He jumped forward and then claws and fangs and exposed and gave the beast a roar. It went even more wide-eyed at that, turning and running away. Hey, Kirk, come back. The other group turned and tried to chase that down. Good job, kid, let's go. The big furry one ushered them up towards the house. There was three trick-or-treats and one beep-boop, and the door opened. A withered old creature wearing clothes of all sorts of shiny metal things on his chest and a little peak cap opened the door. Hmm, hello there, kiddos. Hey, look at that. Is, is that a hearing aid? Yes? Ha, I got one too. The man tapped his ear, and there's something in it looked like a translator. Trying to make me feel better, kiddo. Or do you need it? I need it. Well, bless you for making it work with your costume and their little feather. He handed out giant wrappers and with each other's, and the two to Richnazog. Keep at it, kid. Chicks love your pieces. What? Richnazog asked in confusion. Huh? What? Huh? Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, everyone else shouted and the rest of the night descended into the much more walking and getting more of this candy stuff. Everyone seemed to feel sorry for him, and he got more than any of the others. But in the end, he tried to give more of it to the others. But the big furry one took a few pieces for something he called Queen Fatties of the Fat, which was apparently his wife, and the princess threatened to tell the queen unless he gave her some extra candy. Such relaxed and friendly people for monarchs. They must really be liked by their people if they didn't need guards or soldiers. Or maybe monarchies work differently here. The rich Nazogs looked at his bag full of candy, standing in front of the bushes he'd first emerged from. 
You sure we can't walk you home, Rich? Yes, I uh, don't want them to know I snuck out. How often do you do this Halloween? Oh, once a year. He'd have to make sure that his ship recorded the solar position of this planet. He'd bring his people back, but they'd be observed until it was proper time, and then descend and do this trick or treating before announcing that they weren't actually in costumes. Thank you all very much. You really sure that I can't share more candy? We have enough, Rich. Go and enjoy it. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. They all cheered, and one said, Beep boop. And they scurried away into the bushes, and they turned and started walking home. Dad, how old do you think he was? I don't know. Hard to say. He wasn't all that tall, and he didn't look heavy, but I'm sure that he was out of breath as we ran. Maybe he's you guys' age. Maybe a bit younger. And he never went trick-or-treating before. Sure seemed that way. What mean parents? I'm sure they mean well. By the way, you guys should be more like him. He was so well behaved. I like him more than you right now. Dad! Beep boop. Just kidding. Not really. In the background, a small, dark shape flipped into the front of the moon and was gone. A year later, the SETI program received its first communication from Offworld. But most people thought it was a hoax at first because of what it said. Trick or treat, smell my feet, give me something good to eat. Hello, planet Earth. End of story. Freedom from Fate, written by Regal Legal Eagle. You sure you do not require our protection any longer tonight, Warlord? You dispatched the last of the Temple Guard. If there were any left, they'd be running for their lives. Go, oh, join the army at the city. Loot and pillage. You deserve it. The man, cloaked in a large bear fur, nodded at the man to his left. He pressing his fist to his heart. The man returned the gesture and turned his horse, spurring it on as the entire honor guard pulled back from their leader, heading back down the mountain towards the city below. Smoke was rising as his horde began to claim the spoils of victory. Some had set orders, however, as he would not let his army collapse into debauchery. He'd keep them focused on the campaign ahead. This was only the first of many great Elven cities. But he took his eyes from the city now, staring up at the temple as he nudged his horse with his knees to get him moving forward once more. The Elves had the ability to create great structures beyond anything that the people had ever seen. They made massive arches that seemed to defy gravity, grand structures of gold that appeared nearly fresh, and even massive windows of colored glass that filtered the very light in the sun itself. He would make sure none of it remained by the time he was done. He led his horse through the courtyard, past the fountains of bubbling water, and up the massive stone steps of marble that had been worn smooth by centuries of Alvin pilgrims attending the temple. He could see the massive statue just inside, overlooking the city below with pools of blackish water at the feet of the massive elf. Slowly, he dismounted, feeling the strain of the chest for a moment as he did. Quickly, he pulled the silk cloth from his belt, coughing into it, his chest shaking as he let out a rasping, heavy cough one hand clutching the horse for support. After a moment, it was over, and he tossed the blood-soaked silk to the ground. You're not as big as the story says. He turned and saw the elven woman slip around the pillars in the temple. Her body was flawless in ways that only elves could be. The curves of her body seemed to be designed by an artist. The fullness of her lips spoke of luxury and opulence, the silk robes covering her body, given just enough to his imagination to make him crave what flesh was beneath. He drew his sword, which rustled and chipped, and it looked like a well-placed strike might have reduced it to pieces, but it had yet to fail him. His men used the finest swords human blacksmiths could make, but he preferred this, the sword that he pried from the skeleton of a long-dead nobody. Of course I'm not. Your people would rather believe that I'm twelve feet tall and breathe fire. It makes it seem more believable than a horde of humans is crushing the mightiest of armies. The elf glanced away at that before slowly walking forward, waving a hand towards the statue on the black poles. Do you know where you are? No, the great warlord Bearslayer wanders his horde around the land at random. I mean, 
this temple. The grand temple that overlooks the city. The temple that is the cornerstone of your entire faith and the jewel of your god's eye. I wasn't aware of it. Enlighten me. The elf priestess scowled. Is there nothing that you'll take seriously, human? It is you who should take me seriously, priestess. I have crushed your armies, killed your battle mages, and destroyed your war golems. All with a bunch of barbarians who'd never seen a stone house before I led them into your lands. He hunched over a little suddenly, pulling another silk cloth from his belt, and he coughed into it. The same raspy wheezing in his chest. He was done after only twenty seconds this time, before he straightened up, keeping the silk in his hand this time. Ah, yes, your infection, a curse from the gods. I seriously doubt that. People are born sick quite often all on their own. We could cure that, you know, if you let my sisters return to the temple and work our magic. I think you are going to tell me something about the temple. She paused for a moment, lips pressed together in annoyance, before she tried to smile and return to her original speech. You stand before the statue of Arun, the god of fate and destiny. He has led our people for over a thousand years. He has made us strong, powerful, wealthy, and far more advanced than any other nations built by the children of the gods. The elves are truly favored in this which is why my army is looting and pillaging your city right now. She glared at the human, his shoulders looked slump beneath the massive bear coat that he wore, and, unlike his men, he wore no armor, or it would put pressure on his chest, which he couldn't allow. The simple cloth shirt and pants he wore looked more fitting for some sort of sheep herder, but not a grand warlord. Clearly, we have displeased our guard somehow, but these pools are likely why you are here. It is no surprise to me that you are familiar with these waters. Is that not why you came here alone? To see your fate? But did the stories you hear inform you that only the High Priestess could bring you the darkness to the light? Yes, and you're her. To be honest, I'd expected to have to hunt you down. I was bid by my god to remain here. He has a new path in mind for me. She moved to the edge of the black pools at the feet of the massive gold statue. Sinking her knees, she began to move her arms in some sort of meaningful pattern, chanting slowly, Great and powerful Arvun, show us the gift of foresight. Let me view the destiny of this great warlord. The black water suddenly shimmered and began to show images. The warlord looked down at the pool, seeing him at the front of his army, heroically leading them into battle. Into sacking cities and raiding treasures, he saw them crossing the Green Sea and raiding the lands of the dwarves, minotaurs, and trolls. He saw the return of the great ships laden with treasure from these lands before he had built a new empire and sat upon a mighty throne of gold and jewels. There is your destiny, human. Avun has chosen you now. Ye shall lead you to... She couldn't finish the word as he drove the sword point down in a slight angle through her shoulder and neck. It would pierce her heart before he pulled the sword back out. Shoving her body into the pools, her blood seeped onto it and the water images ceased. Even the blackness was before was gone. Now it was simply water flowing with blood. The warlord wiped his blade off on the silk cloth before tossing the cloth onto the dead body of the high priestess. Is that the best you got? He bellowed at the statue, slowly shaking his head and sheathed his sword and turned to look over the city below, waving a hand at it. I've done all of this without you. You think I'd suddenly relinquish control to a freaking god? He had to quickly pull another cloth from his belt as he nearly doubled over as he coughed and wheezed, one hand clutching his chest and the other held the cloth to his mouth. When it was over, he groaned, stumbling forward, before sitting heavily on the stone bench in the opening of the temple. I used to think that you had cursed me, and glanced at the statue. When I was born of Throgan the Great, and Rika the Merciless, they expected me to be the strongest, largest warrior of all the wastes, the leader to my clan, not just my tribe. But instead, I was born sickly, thin, and weak in comparison to others. Not only that, I thought that you made me tall and a greater weakness without the strength to back it up. 
when my parents disowned me and tossed me into the waste to die, so that I would not shame their bloodline, I cursed you. I thought that you had feared what I would become and cursed me to Vania. He took a heavy, slow breath, swallowing down the need to cough further. When this bear that I now wear came upon me, I was about to accept my fate. When instead, I found a long dead man. Who? I have no idea. He bore nothing of note to his name or blood, just an old sword stuck to his ribbons. I pulled the sword free and killed the bear, despite how it towered over me. He slowly sighed as he thought back. Then, because I was sure that you had corrupted the hearts when I brought the skin back to the tribe as proof of my skill, I killed my mother and father, and I swore that I'd never let you stop me. I united my tribe, then my clan, and then all of the clans and the wastes. I thought my power was defying you, in making sure that the god of fate was wrong about me. He began to laugh then, a deep and rasping as he finished the few light coughs. How wrong I was. When I led the horde into your lands, I finally understood. There was no host waiting for me at first, no grand army of the Empire to fight. It took time for them to prepare, as there was no warning. I heard the rumors of the cloud of pools, how their general suddenly couldn't see the future, leaving them entirely unprepared for me. For a moment, I thought it was my heresy that gave me strength. The fact that I no longer believed in your power over me. He shook his head once more. Then I realized the truth. It didn't matter if I believed in you or not. You didn't believe in me. He glanced up at the massive statue. Elves, dwarves, trolls, minotaur, centaur, even the fey and the orcs, all creatures of gods. You all bicker and vie for power and your chosen creations. But humans don't have a god of their own. We live in the wastes and shunned territory ignored by you and your feuding brothers and sisters. Who made us? No one. This is why you have no power over me. Well, not your magic. Believing in fate and destiny is a control of its own. If you tell any creature of God that they have a fate chosen for them, they will accept it as truth, for they were made to do so. I thought that I also had a fate. But now I know that that isn't true. None of the gods control us. None of you believed in us. What could a bunch of wandering humans in the wastes do to your mighty empires, to your magic and power? He chuckled once more as he thought of the irony. He pointed out to the city. You see those fires, O oh great god? You might think them random, but do not spread those fires. Those are the scrolls, books, maps, and paintings, tapestries, and history of your chosen people. I'm wiping them from the land. Your historians are being put to the sword even now. Your craftsmen slaughtered. Your artists will be reduced to slaves. Your architects reduced to laborers. I will soon ride upon the remaining cities of this continent, and they will suffer the same fate. He nodded slowly as he thought it over. Once this continent is mine to control, I will not cross the Great Sea and unite the other creatures of the gods against me. I will instead dismantle every structure that remains here. They will be pulled down brick by brick stone by stone. I will melt them down your statues and crush your colored glass and ensure that there is no trace of this empire. Then I will leave my people back into the wastes. He grinned as he glanced up at the statue. You might wonder why I would do this. You have to wonder, because you can't see inside my head. You might believe in my power now, but it's far too late for you to do anything about it. I do this to free my people from the only power you hold over us. Fate. You can't control our lives, our destiny any more than I can control the weather. But if people believe you can, then you can manipulate them. He shook his head once more. If I destroy your history, not because I want to spite the owls, but so that I can free my own people. I will not build a new empire on the ashes of yours, because even then it will have been shaped by your past. I shall lead the humans back into the wastes, knowing that upon my death the clans will splinter and bicker and fight. It will likely be hundreds of years before anyone strong enough to unite them returns. I 
will likely be a myth, if I am remembered at all. Perhaps they will speak of me as a giant who crushed the armies with my hands rather than simply being a far better tactician and strategist than those pathetic Alban generals. He pointed up at the statue then. Your brothers and sisters will not mourn you. They will divide your foreign power and their children will cross the sea and shall fight for the resources and territory. Why bother trying to reclaim the continent that destroyed the mightiest empire the world has ever seen, he grinned. When humans finally emerge from the wastes once more, there will be no god of fate, no destiny set upon them. They will be free. Nothing but their own actions shall determine their course. When we build our own cities, it'll be with our own hands, using our own designs. And you can try to warn your brothers and sisters but I know that they won't believe in us any more than you did until it's too late. They created their children, so how could these pathetic creatures of the wastes bring them low? They will learn too late of our power. We decide our own destiny. We forge our own path. The warlord rose then, walking back to the horse and he mounted it and turned around to face the city. Then the human looked back up at the statue behind him once more. I will leave this temple untouched until I have crushed the rest of your cities. When I return, it will be with your people in chains, to make them dismantle this temple and melt you down. I won't use the gold to make anything. I'll have it formed into bricks and then tossed into the ocean to never be seen again. For you are the greatest enemy humanity could ever have. And with the death of fate, I give my people freedom. Greatest gift that I could ever bestow upon them. A gift taken from a god by a man who was left to die in the wastes. He nudged his horse forward, leaving the temple behind him, and began his track back down to the city. End of story. Thicker than water. Devia Cosman Rian Nevershell, Princess of the Ascended Throne, Grand Duchess of the Crescent Nebula, Wielder of the Sacred Stone, Keeper of the Nevishal Hierarchy Tomb. First of her name looked at the small ID card in her hand. It simply said, Devia Cosman, M.D. Cosman, and was plenty common name despite her bloodline tracing back to the original lineage. She rubbed her finger over the M.D. part and smiled. It was the only title that she had to work for the rest have been given through sheer luck of being born into the right family. Or perhaps the wrong one, depending on your outlook. She was the eighth in line to the throne, close enough to be exceptionally valuable politically, but far enough away that she didn't even have the power or position people thought that she did. Besides, her eldest brother had already secured his position as the next in line with a few choice assassinations. He could keep it. She really didn't want the responsibility or the stress. She looked out through the porthole and down at the planet that she was going to be her new home and smiled a bit wider. She had had to sell all of her jewelry so that she could get her hands on a point for a few shady individuals where she could and call in every favor that she had but she was finally out. Not legally, of course, but it should be at least a week before the family discovered she'd run off. No more banquets, ceremonies, or suitors for her. Miss will be landing soon. She looked up and smiled at the ugly creature that spoke to her. Thank you. She said quickly and secured the small satchel that she had most of her valuable belongings now. They'd bring out her duffel bag and a few simple clothes once they landed. She took her time to evaluate the ugly crewman. This species was fresh to the galactic scene. Their technology was downright barbaric. Their culture was a thousand years behind her people, and their propensity for violence and injury was pronounced. They were all the reason she'd chosen to live amongst them. Hopefully they had no idea who she was, and with how often they should need a doctor, her position on a little colony should be secure. It would give her a chance to live amongst the strange new creatures, experience life 
as a commoner, and she'd be able to practice medicine with a royal life never would have allowed. There were some uh, aspects that she wasn't particularly fond of, however. They seemed to eat a lot of meat, and their bodies apparently couldn't be efficiently break down all of their ate, so they had an awful habit of releasing semi-toxic gases. Not to mention, they had bony protrusions that grew out of their digits. She'd been told that if they didn't trim them down regularly, they'd get very sharp and full of dirt. Their faces were also rather ugly to her. It sort of looked like someone had smacked them in the face with a stick when they were young. It was too scrunched up. The ship began to rumble, and she saw the flare of heat around the viewport as the ship reached the atmosphere. She couldn't believe that they relied on heat shields and thermal plating. Hopefully, they develop more sophisticated vessels soon. But the captain did a fine job, and they were soon landed, with only a gentle bounce on the landing pad. She unfastened her seat, and the creature showed her back to help her. She was the only passenger in the supply run. Well, Miss Cosman, welcome to the human colony of Carrier, he said with a nod in return. Thank you. She walked down the ramp onto the planet itself and looked around. Her long ears twitching and turning as she did look in the sights and sounds. They were on the edge of a very basic little colony, and the prefab so far. No new construction, and they were any streets that she spotted, just a few lights of the outside of the same structures. When nightfall came, it would be dark indeed. There were a few small groups of these trees on the edges of the town, but this part of the planet was dominated by wide fields. They were setting up for ranching and farming until the colony got more established. It should be quiet and boring, and she was looking forward to it. Ma'am, your bag? She turned, and one of the humans was holding her duffel from the cargo hold. She blinked and looked at him, unsure what he wanted, and then realization hit her. Oh, I'm to carry it, yes, of course, sorry. She took a strap and laughed a little, realizing that it was silly to think that they'd do such a thing for her. Shouldering the strap of her own duffel bag, she had to lean a bit to try and keep positioned correctly. Now that she had a bag and her satchel on her person, she was literally carrying all of her possessions. A long cry from living in the luxurious prison. The humans were busy unloading the cargo from the ship, and no one seemed to be approaching her, so she began to walk into the town. As she approached one of the first buildings, she gasped in surprise as two humans suddenly tumbled out of the door, wrapped up in a struggle of some kind. They were kicking and punching, biting and scratching. She looked around, noticing that the humans were watching, but she couldn't believe that this was normal. Ah, uh, hello? Where are the, um, law enforcement? She asked one of the humans walking by, who gave her a strange look and then kept going. Law enforcement, she cried out, trying to find someone to stop the fight. However, she had yelled that out and two stopped and looked up at her. Yeah, what do you want? She paused wide-eyed and opened her mouth, and then she realized that the two figures were wearing armored uniforms of the human law variety. You're this town's law enforcement. Look, lady, out here, we're deputies. If you want the sheriff, she's in her office. Yeah, what do you want anyway? You two are having an altercation. Isn't that against the law? The two looked at one another and began to laugh as they untangled their limbs and got up. Damn, lady, it's just a brotherly love. I'm Hick, and this is Yoko. Howdy. Your brothers. Why were you fighting? They shrugged. I think one of us said something stupid. Probably. And the sheriff allows you two to behave like this. Devia couldn't believe the two wouldn't be protecting her from vagabonds and rapscallions. Well, Mom sure don't like it, but we kind of do it anyway. Your mother is the sheriff. They nodded. Devia didn't know what to make of it. Perhaps the humans were a little too crazy, but she couldn't change her plans now. This was a chance of freedom, so she shrugged. Ah, uh, well, if you're not uh, in the conflict anymore, could you point me to the clinic? Oh, are you the new Sawbones? Doc said that we were getting the new one of you. Good thing, too. He's mighty busy sometimes right this way. They turned around and began to lead her down the street, 
as if they hadn't been fighting and were indeed best friends. Or brothers, as it turned out. What's a sawbones? A surgeon. Sometimes we run out of the right meds and such, so they cut injured limbs off and stitch them up the wounds. She made a face at the idea. That hadn't really been covered in med school. She knew how to perform amputation, of course, but they made it sound downright common. Ah, uh, so is the colony equipped with a cybernetics lab for prosthetics? Ah, uh, if you mean them robot arms and legs and stuff, then no. We put in a request in a few months and a supply ship will bring a couple. Until then, it's good old-fashioned wood. The horrified look on her face was missed as they led her down the street. They finally stopped in front of a prefab building at the center. Yeah, yeah. are. She noted the Red Cross as the humans used to denote health and wondered why they didn't just give a hollow projector above the entrance to mark its location. Perhaps the town is small and everyone knew where it was. She looked between the two and gave a little curtsy, even though she was wearing pants. I appreciate the escort, Hick and Yokel. You calling us names, lady? They suddenly leaned forward as if she had insulted them. What? Wait, no. I mean, but isn't... I'm sure. She floundered as she tried to think of she had the wrong human words before they laughed. Yokel snapped her on the shoulder and she staggered to the side, barely containing a gasp of pain. We're just breaking with you. See you around, I'm sure. They moved on and waved, and she supposed that that was a friendly human greeting, but she rubbed her shoulder and winced. She couldn't remember the last time someone had struck her, and they had behaved like that with a totally normal. A little nervous about her new friends and neighbors, she opened the door to the clinic and stepped inside. There was a small waiting room and a reception desk with no one behind it. Hello? She asked the empty room. Then there was a flash of blue image and a female human appeared behind the counter. Greetings, I am Diane. Welcome to the new Georgia clinic. Um, I think we're in carrier. Miss, I am a highly sophisticated AI. I think I know which planet we're on. All right, I'm Debbie Cosman. I'm the new surgeon and general physician. Miss, I don't appreciate the practical jokes. Talking rabbits cannot be doctors. What? She blinked in confusion. Her tail twitched a little bit anxiously. What was a rabbit? What was that some sort of slur? This was the most confusing AI that she'd ever dealt with. What the hell is the racket? She heard a gruff voice growl out before one of the doors leading further into the clinic opened up to reveal the elderly-looking human with graying hair and a thick mustache. Shut the hell up, Diane. I do not recognize this command. Shut down your electronic bimbo. The blue figure vanished, and Devia was clutching her satchel nervously as she looked at the human, who looked her over and immediately relaxed. Ah, sorry about that. You must be the Lowerline doctor that I was expecting. Hippocris Carrier. She winced as she butchered the greeting, but then smiled. Um, thank you. Yes, I'm Devia Consman, and you're the town doctor. I wasn't given a name. Doc Ramon, your English is pretty good. Lorelein is rather adept at learning languages. Ah, always good to know. I'm handy in English and Spanish with a little bit of some Xeno tongues. That's nice, she said and held back her surprise that he only knew two languages fluently. It did explain why he was butching the ring the greeting. What about you? 592 fluent languages. The old man arched his bushy eyebrows and that slowly nodded. Ah, well, good to have an interpreter around. Here, let me show you to your room. He turned, waving her back through the door that he'd stepped out of. The halls were bare and pure white, and she knew that the humans liked to keep hospitals and clinics sterile colors for some reason. Soon, he stepped into a small room that was roughly the size of one of her showers. Well... They weren't her showers anymore, were they? There was a bed, some shelves, a desk, a dresser, and a bathroom that was tiny compared to what she used to use. It's a bit small, I'm afraid. It's perfect, she said with a smile and hefted her bag onto the bed. This is all that I have anyway. I don't need much space. Well, that's the spirit then, youngster. 
I'm afraid that I'm not entirely up to the law and culture and all of that. Your credentials look great, but I couldn't tell the classwork apart from the residency. How long have you been a doctor? Oh, I'm only 45. This is my first posting. He reached around his brows so that he could tell that he was confused. We generally don't leave home until our 50s. I'm actually one of the youngest to graduate the academy. But I assure you I have performed hundreds of operations at this point. Well, that's some relief then. I was worried that you hadn't cut someone open before. Um, I haven't actually cut an organism open. They're virtual reality. But I assure you that we have the finest medical education in the galaxy. I don't think that's an issue. The human shrugged. Well, the orthodox has its last legs. There are days that are entrusted for more than amputations, so having a surgeon is better than having none. I'm glad to have some help here. I don't even have a nurse. You don't? Nah. The last one was some rich peppy girl from some core planets who wanted to play at being a frontier doctor. She couldn't hack it in one week before she was crying for her home. Devia's face went neutral at the news. But you're in your forties. I'm sure that you've been out to the frontier before. Ah, uh, no. No? This is my first time away from home. Oh. He said, a bit surprised. Ah, uh, well, I'm sure you'll be fine. Here, let me show you around the place. Oh, Dr. Ramon. Just call me Doc. Doc, what's a rabbit? What? The AI called me a talking rabbit. Ah. Don't mind, Diane. She's a second-hand hunk of junk. I don't think she has laurelines in her database yet. Rabbits are animals from Earth. They have long ears and fur and short tails, like you. So there's some resemblance. Oh, are they nice animals? They're best known for fur... Friendly attitudes. Soft, cuddly, nice critters. Devia wondered why he looked a bit nervous for a moment. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. There are worse things to be associated with. Ha, huh. um, yeah. Anyway, like I said, let me show you around. Devia groaned as she lay back on her bed. It had been a month since she had landed, and she didn't think that the humans were taking to her at all. They kept asking, what's up, Doc? And then giggling about it for some reason. They didn't have to do something with the Doc Ramon. They were always pushing and shoving her when she came out of the surgery to inform the family. And they said the physical displays were meant to be affectionate, but they can kind of hurt. She expected life out here to be different than the pampered life that she was used to, but not quite like this. She couldn't even take a shower every day because they needed to ration water. It seems like she was always smelly and her fur was starting to get dry and a bit rough. She also couldn't believe at how many injuries that they sustained. It wasn't like they were in a war zone. Besides, falling and accidents, they could inflict a number of injuries on purpose. At least once a day, it seemed that she had to set someone up with a cast, and so far six people had been shot. Six! Laureline's were omnivores, but there was a heavy emphasis on the vegetable and greens. Since she'd gotten here, she'd had only two days when she was away without eating some form of meat. They put it in everything. It was starting to give her stomach issues, which she was self-medicating for, with some of the medicine in the clinic, but that wasn't a very good solution. She was simply astonished that this species was surviving this long. One of the females had come in a week ago to give birth, and the infant had gotten tangled in the umbilical cord. It was like it was trying to strangle itself rather than be born. That whole affair had been a 16-hour nightmare. Without a nurse, it was just her and Doc having to take shifts and helping with some of the woman's family around them to assist. For the first time in her life, she needed to use a stim just to stay awake and alert through the entire procedure. She couldn't even operate because they had to save the various painkillers and drugs for more serious problems, the Doc had told her. Maybe this had all been a mistake. She'd seen it in the news that her family was looking for her and posted some outrageous reward. What she hadn't expected was that the news that various other families were posting larger rewards for her capture. This was all a giant mess that she'd gotten herself into. So much for a second chance. Maybe she'd try and sneak out on the next supply shuttle. 
She doubted that she would be missed. None of the humans ever called her by her name, or offered her to come to dinner like they did for Doc Ramon. She heard whispers here and there when they didn't think that she could hear. They thought that it was strange for Zeno to be here. Maybe they just needed a human doctor. The door to her room bust open and Hick rushed in. Doc, come on, you gotta hide. Someone's looking for you. What? But the human grabbed her arm and pulled her up. She could barely keep up as he rushed through the halls and into the operating room. Then he cursed as the door to the back of the clinic started to open. He quickly opened up one of the storage cabinets and shoved her inside, closing the door heavily as she squeaked at being shut into such a small area. She was about to crawl out and demand answers when she heard the glattral versish being spoken. Get, get them over here. There are only three humans in law enforcement in this colony. The civilians don't matter. She heard footsteps and various people struggling. You're freaking dead meat if you think you can just come into my town and push us around like this. That was the Sheriff Meredith. She sounded unhappy. Don't translate that, Henry. That was Doc Ramon. Henry was the town mayor. Divya had only met him a few times. Tall, thin, dark skin, nice, but always nervous. I won't, Doc, but what the hell are we going to do? Hey, stop all that gibberish. She heard the versish. He wants us to shut up, Henry translated. There wasn't any more talking for a minute, as she stayed curled up, hiding. She tried to think about what to do while she hid, but was coming up with a blank. She was a doctor, not a fighter. What was she supposed to do? Something told her that this wasn't a team sent by her family. Finally, she heard the robotic voice, likely the universal translated device. We want the fugitive. Who? That was Henry. The Rawlin. There is no fugitive here, fella. Just hard-working colonists. Henry again. Don't play stupid. We know she's here. Hand over, and you won't need to suffer. You're the one playing stupid. You killed three of us already, and you think we won't need to suffer. That was Doc Ramon. Devia had hauled on a gasp and thought about the three colonists that had already been killed because of her. Maybe you're right. Either way, you don't tell, we start torture. If you think we'll talk, you're wrong. I know your type. Even if there was a Laureline here, which there isn't, if we gave them up, which we won't, you'd still kill us afterwards. He was speaking awfully loud, as if wanting to make sure everyone heard. Good point. She heard the blast of fire from the heavy thud of something dropping to the floor. Who, oh, Doctor? We want to make sure that the next one dies slower. That was the Doctor. Henry sounded faint, as if he could barely utter the words. She heard more of a sesh then. Damn! That was the Doctor. What do we do now? I don't know how much pain they can take. Freck it. Just threaten them and find and kill the young. Did they forget that Henry could speak Vesish? Without being able to see the outside, she wasn't sure what was really going on. She was conflicted about what to do. She couldn't believe Doc had died trying to keep her hidden. She wanted to give herself up to save the others. But they said they'd kill them anyway. This was all her fault. You have children. Take or they die. I'm an orphan. That was Local's voice. You, family, also an orphan. You gotta kill someone, just kill me. That was Hick. Why were they all willing to die for her? It didn't make sense. Someone, talk, or the colony will burn. Look, I don't know if she's a fugitive, but there's a Xena girl here in the colony. That was Henry. She sighed as she figured he'd try to give her up and save his people. She didn't blame him. Where is she? She's out at the ranch, way out of town. Bought some big property, lots of money. Keeps to herself. Take us. Devia frowned, wondering who he was talking about. All right, let's all get loaded into the transport then. No, just you. Leave law enforcement here. You lie, they die. Fine, fine. She heard footsteps, and after a while, the sheriff spoke up. Hey, Hick. Don't you think that it's good that there is only one ugly frecker here? 
with his back to a bunch of storage cabinets. Yeah, ma, I think that's a good thing too. Shut up. She heard the someone bark in Versish. Slowly, she opened the door to let some light in. She could see the doc's body on the floor of the operating room, and there was a big yellow verk brute just in front of the door facing Meredith Hick and Yoko. With the light, she could look around her space and saw more of what was around her. Moving quietly, she opened up the door wider, reaching to the drawer above her. Slowly, she pulled it open and reached up, feeling around until she felt one of the boxes that she wanted. Making sure that the work wasn't aware of her movements, she pulled the box out of the drawer, opening up a fresh syringe and filled it with muscle relaxant. And then slowly and carefully as she could, she opened up the door and crawled out. The work was thankfully focused on the three humans. Gulping, she prepared herself and then jumped up, jamming the needle into the work's neck, slamming down the plunger. The creature let out a gargle and then toppled forward, hitting the ground heavily with Devia clinging to its back. As soon as he was down, the humans moved, Hick kicked away the blaster while Yoko pulled a knife and made sure that the work wasn't getting back up. Devia had to look away as he did that. She moved over to Doc's body. He'd been shot dead in the chest. She could tell the humans were moving and doing stuff, but she weakly hugged the Doc's body and began to cry. I'm sorry, she gasped out. Sweetie, what are you sorry for? Meredith asked. What do you mean? This is my fault. They're here for me. And you said three others have been killed already. I'm so sorry. No, 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 sweetie. This was their fault. You didn't pull the trigger. You aren't responsible for what bad people do. As she hugged the doc, she felt the sheriff pat her on the head and her long ears. If this is the way that they hunt criminals, then it's no wonder you broke their laws. What? Devia looked up, which in blurry with tears. They said that you're a fugitive. I'm... I'm a royal princess. I ran away so that I didn't have to deal with the life that I didn't want. That's why this is my fault. Why didn't you just let them take me? I didn't want anyone to die. I just I just wanted to be free. Damn, you're not even a criminal. All the more reason to help you out. Why are you so calm? Why was the doc willing to die for me? He's only known me for a month. Sweetie, in the one month that you've been here, how many people have you saved? Not one of those idiots who got shot in a fight died. You saved Rose and her newborn. You're dealing with humans, sweetie. When you join our family, we treat you like one of our own. No matter what, blood is thicker than water. But, but I'm not blood. You're the first, you know, to visit our colony. Doc sang your praises when you saw your credentials, and after your first operation, he said that you could have picked any hospital in the known space, but instead, you came out to help a bunch of dumb colonists to live like this. That makes you blood to us. Devia started to cry harder at the idea. She'd been ready to leave them behind, and now all of this happened. She didn't want anyone to die. The sheriff then stood, speaking to her com, everyone in position. She got some sort of reply and then spoke, Fire away. Devia jerked and a bit as she heard the gunfire coming from outside. Who's shooting? There were more out there. They thought me and the boys were the only ones with guns since we're the law. Well, they don't know humans. The fire lasted a few minutes before they finally ended. She got back on a comm. Got him? There was a pause. What about Henry? Another pause. Good. They're all dead and Henry's just fine. Come on, we got work to do. We'll need to pull the ship apart and make it look like they were never here. What? Why? Debbie asked, in case anyone comes looking for them. But, you mean you're going to keep hiding me here? Of course, I just told you, that we're your family. And, to be honest, we need you now more than ever since I killed Doc. Aren't you mad that I brought this trouble? Honey, you just have to understand, we look after our own. It doesn't matter what you look like or where you came from. There is more to blood than being genetically related. I already tried to tell you that, but I heard people talk behind my back, and everyone invited Doc to dinner, but not me. I thought you all hated me. 
Oh, darling, we heard you complain about our food. Henry had ordered up some special veggies to get sent out with the next supply ship, so that we could throw you a proper welcome dinner. We didn't want you to feel obliged to eat what you don't like. And most humans haven't seen a Xeno before, so they were just curious about meeting you. Idle talk. Your family, Debbie. So, get a trauma kit and find out if someone out there is hurt. Doc wouldn't want you wasting time crying about him. He'd want you helping people. Debbie snuffed back the tears and nodded. The sheriff was right. She moved then, letting go of the doc's body as Hick and Yokel and their mom headed out of the clinic. As she grabbed the only trauma kit that they had, she realized how this wasn't her second chance anymore. It was her third chance. If the humans were this ready to make her one of their own, then she'd never abandon them. With all of her studies, she figured the humans were nothing more than simple, violent barbarians. But clearly, that was a narrow mindset assessment. She'd never heard of a species that was willing to take in another like this with open arms, and apparently willing to die for them. What was the phrase that she'd used? Blood was thicker than water. If they claimed that she was blood, then who was she to disagree? She had a new family now, one willing to die for her protection and kill for her freedom. If she took her hundred years, she vowed to repay her new family for the trouble that she'd brought them. She'd be born into power, wealth, and nobility, but she'd given it all up to find a real home. And clearly, she had. End of story. What makes humans special? Click here to find out. Written by Regal Legal Eagle. When I look back on that fateful day, I always find it funny how quickly my entire mood changed the moment I stepped into that room. When our expedition fleet found nothing short of a martyr waiting for us in what we assumed was just another empty, uncharted system, I thought that I was in some sort of nightmare. As we tried to communicate, the bridge was incredibly tense. The only thing keeping me together was knowing that I had to reassure the other captains that everything would be fine. All sorts of thoughts rushed through my head. Were they hostile? Would they destroy us? Would we be subjected to horrible experiments? I wasn't a particularly optimistic person. When we finally established some kind of shaky translations, we discovered that they weren't simply going to blow us away which was nice. But we did learn that they were from some sort of massive empire, which set me on a new set of worried thoughts. Was this the start of some sort of grand war? The second interstellar war had just finished, and the thought of tackling Xenos in open conflict for the first time did not seem promising. Then they said they wanted to talk to the human in charge. Well, since that was me... I told them that I would be arriving on an unarmed shuttle shortly. While the shuttle didn't have any weapons on, per se, I did have the armory load up all explosives that we had onto it and give me a remote detonator, just in case. Flying the ship over that armada, I was struck just by how uh, uniform everything was. Compared to the ever-changing fleets that I was used to, it looked like every ship they had was built and designed for a very specific purpose. It was rather awe-inspiring to think that some Xenos who'd been hiding from us all of this time had perfected their ideal ship designs and hadn't had to retrofit a ship in their lifetime. Looking back on our little fleet, I couldn't see two designs that matched. Technically, the Stingray and the Rover had started life in the same design, but over the war, the Stingray had been turned into a comm hub and all sorts of obviously bolted on dishes and antenna all over the place. It looked more like a puffer fish than a Stingray. The Rover, on the other hand, had been set up as a courier vessel, so some of the old parts had been stripped away so that they could make her sleeker and a bit bigger engines. How barbaric we must seem to them, I thought. The hangar on the capital ship was much the same. I saw rows and rows of pristine, identical craft. Everything was clean, uniform, and well-designed. 
If it came to a war, we'd be crushed, I figured. And the soldiers that escorted me were the only aspects that weren't uniform. They had three or four different species in clean-looking armor suits. It was hard to keep a decent pace since they all had different legs and moved at various speeds. But their armor and weapons looked far less improvised than the marines back on my ship. But then I entered the boardroom at the center of the ship to meet the various dignitaries waiting for me, and all my worries changed. I wasn't a xenobiologist, or a psychologist, or the like, but you don't get as far as I did without learning how to read people, even xenos that I'd seen before. They were nervous. I held back a laugh and wondered instead why this massive armada would be nervous about a lone human from a small expedition fleet. They asked me to sit down behind a desk before the panel of dignitaries, and my first thought was presenting my thesis back in the college before being pressed into a naval service during the first interstellar war. They took their time setting up translation devices for me, seeming to want to study me for a bit as I waited. I just smiled back at them, filled with confidence which clearly unsettled them even further. Finally, the device was set up and the conversation began. They introduced themselves and explained to me a little bit about the Confederation. They were democratic, which was good. They didn't seek out the war, which was good. But they were very nervous about our young species. At first, I figured that they must meant that we were just the most recent to make it to the level of technology. I asked them why they were so nervous and they got quiet. Then came the big question that I hadn't expected. How have you developed your technology so quickly? Are you being guided by another space-faring species? I laughed, at first thinking that it was an absurd question, and then stopped when I realized it was serious. I was confused, of course, and explained that this was a first contact with another intelligent life form, let alone a whole gathering of them. They looked a little bit more nervous then. Are you driven only by war? I explained to them that we weren't, and then said, Then how have you developed your technology so quickly? The last time we sent a probe to your world, you had developed the technology to sail across your largest oceans. From what we could tell, you hadn't fully mastered gunpowder yet. The fleet was assembled to approach your homeworld and what should have been the early years of your industrial age to help you, only to find that you've spread not only to your local system, but with a range of 100 light years out. How is this possible? I laughed again for a moment because it seemed absurd to me again. They were likely talking about the 16 or 1700s, and they figured five or six hundred years later we would just have reached the industrial age. I told them that we had gone from the first powered flight to landing on the moon in roughly 66 years, and they gasped. They said that it was impossible. How could we have developed so fast? I thought it over for a moment. I wasn't a philosopher by trade, even though I'd gone to school for all of those years ago. It was the sort of thing that I hadn't bothered to ponder on for quite some time. I sat there, quietly, as they watched me and thought it over. I was tempted to say that war drove our ability to learn and develop quickly, but that just didn't sit right with me. There was plenty of periods in our history that weren't overly violent, and yet still we developed. Then, just as they seemed ready to demand an answer, I remembered a rather simple little conversation I had with the fellow captain. He had commented on how his children got upset if we went more than a week without a vid from him, despite the fact that when we were young it took months to get vids back from forward fleets. They took everything for granted. So I finally spoke. I'm sure this wasn't how many politicians or academics would have wanted me to phrase it, but my time in the Navy had made me blunt. We get bored quickly. Not only that, but the speed with which we turn the amazing into the mundane is staggering. They were obviously very confused. We did go from our first basic airplanes to landing on the moon in 66 years. 
but 30 years after that, we were already starting to find going into space rather boring. People wondering why we spent so much money on it. It took another 40 years after that to focus on it once more. In that time, we developed communication technologies at a staggering rate. We connected our worlds in a way that had never been done before. But almost before we were finished with it, people were trying to create something else. I laughed for a moment as I thought it over. We could fly across the globe in hours, but most people complained that the planes were cramped and the food was bad. We would create the worst wireless networks that could stream the full collection of human knowledge to the phones. And people complained about the speeds and reliability, even though they wasted all their data on frivolous things. Once we established our first colonies on the moon, and then Mars, taxpayers began to complain about how much it cost, and tourists again complained about how long it took to get there, or how zero-g made them sick. The more I thought it over, the more it made me laugh, as I had to explain this to the panel of Xenos that boredom spurred our advances. Our species is made of consumers, and can take any amazing, incredible discovery that took a team of engineers a lifetime to create, and find a person bored with it in a very short period of time. It took adventurous souls to start the first colonies off of our home world, but it took normal bored citizens to truly make those colonies work. When someone was willing to move to Mars or Saturn because they would get a 10% raise, that's when we knew that we needed to keep going. The first test pilot that jumped to another star system was a hero to us for all of a few years. Then we wanted to know why everyone couldn't jump to another star. I shrugged. Our wars are only because we're bored. As soon as survival on the first colonies around the other stars became easy, they got bored. With bored colonists come rebellions, and the second war we just finished. Well, everything was quiet and peaceful until the first colonies became the first core planets and travel between the furthest colonies became steady. When I first jumped to another star system, I was thrilled and excited. But I looked around the bridge of the ship and noticed that everyone else was bored. Just another routine jump to an uncharted system for the sake of testing our equipment. This was the furthest humanity had ever gone. But the first thing my captain said to me was simply, Freck, that star's bright. Someone hit the shades and plot us a course back. No one thought anything about it. I laughed once more and smiled back in memory. Going into the jump here, my crew was bored, and I was thinking about what to have for dinner. I'm now light years further out than we've ever been, and something like 90 light years away from the first jump I took. I had to feel complaints from some of our crew that we ran out of fruit juice sooner than expected. Not that our ships were slapped together and we were constantly fixed them. Not that in the case that something catastrophic goes wrong, we are too far from help to be saved. Not that they miss their families. Fruit juice. I was quiet for a moment as I thought back to see if I had missed anything and then threw up my arms. How can I forget? In a month or so, I'm going to be a grandmother. My eldest is having his first child. Do you think he'd be worried if I was sent off of an explosion to chart the unknown? He just wanted to make sure that I'd be able to send a few vids with advice on handling a newborn, and that at least I'd be back for the child's first birthday next year. He also complained at how expensive gene therapy was. Gene therapy, which wasn't possible when I was a kid, and was brand new when I was his age. We get bored. We complain. Someone makes money making something new. That's about all there is to it. They were quiet. They turned off the device and spoke amongst themselves for a while, as I chuckled thinking about how I described my entire species. Finally, they turned my device back on and asked us if we could teach them how to be bored. I smiled and said that we could try, but we might get bored of it before long. That's how first contact worked, and I never did tell them about the explosives on the shuttle. I became a media sensation for a little while. Then, in the next news cycle, everyone was going crazy about the Xeno fashion sense. 
they made me an ambassador, which worked all right. They still ask me to give workshops on boredom. I find it hilarious now that they have advanced degrees on making things mundane to try and hold their some edge over us in technology. But it's not going to work. No one is better than humans at being bored. Taken from an interview with the ex-ambassador and retired Admiral Tina Perry. Similar topics include the virtue of laziness, making boredom work for you in the beginner's guide, how to make a fortune teaching Xenos about the mundane in six ways, hot clicks, 10 things you don't know about jump travel, wardrobe malfunction or publicity stunt, what you should know about the recent presidential debate, are there actually hot Xeno singles in your area, what dating sites don't want you to know. End of story. Man Becomes Myth Written by Regal Legal Eagle The link to the original story will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. The old man in the faded looking bear cloak looked up at the massive stone structure and wondered what the hell it was. It was a very basic sort of pyramid, made by stacking square stones upon one another. It lacked the smooth sides and refinement that he'd seen the elves use. It looked human, but that couldn't be right. Humans didn't build. He strictly forbid it. They wandered the wastes with their huts, trading the trains and the spoils that he'd torn from the Alban Empire decades ago. The Grand Warlord had been very specific about this. He wouldn't allow his people to settle on old Relvan territories because not enough time passed to erase all the traces of their civilization. So when he chose the tribe at the crest of the ridge and found the structure, he was curious. But now that he was at the base, he was furious. He reached up pointing the old bony finger at the structure. Who broke my command? And why? His current honor guard was very different than the one that he had led to victory all those years ago. These were the sons and daughters of those warriors. None of them had seen real combat, just the duels and tournaments that his people held to test their metal and skill. He could sense their unease as they shifted around him. They knew. Someone had been hiding this from him. He hadn't thought that they had it in them but clearly someone was defying him. If they simply wanted to kill him and take his title of Grand Warlord, he didn't mind. But this was something else. The old man glanced around and the various warriors looked away, unable to look him in the eyes. No one. No one is going to fess up. He was about to continue, but had to pull the silk cloth from his belt, coughing heavily as blood splattered the fabric. Once the fit had passed, he tossed the cloth to the ground, and then he saw the figures walking around the side of the structure. He knew their faces. Daughters, sons, grandsons, granddaughters. His family. This was a worrisome indeed if his family was disobeying him. If anyone should understand why he kept humanity in the deep wastes, it should be them. He looked amongst the familiar faces of his skin, looking for some clue as to who their leader was. A few of the grandchildren were half owls, which he didn't mind. Personally, the elven women were too dainty for his tastes. He had always enjoyed a strong human woman, who could track down an elk on foot and then drag the kill back to the tribe. But to each their own. The first generation of the elven slaves had been separated from the children who wouldn't remember the old empire. Then they'd ordered the children to be raised no differently than any human. He felt it made the tribe stronger. Of course, the surviving elves had cursed him and for taking away their children. But if he could save their race from being slaves of fate, then he'd let them curse all they wanted. His battle was with their god, not with the elves themselves. There, in the middle of the group, was the eldest grandson, John. A clever little shirt, just like his mother, the Grand Warlord's Arthur's daughter, though he didn't see her amongst the ranks of the rebellious offspring. 
convinced my children to rebel, have you, Jan? The old man growled out, one hand the hilt of his old rusty sword. Several times they tried to convince him to have the finest craftsman in the land make him a new sword, worthy of his title. But he'd vow to cut the hands off any craftsman who tried and melt his sword back down anyway. It's time, grandfather, the warlord looked up at the tall, proud human before him. He was fit, athletic and strong, with a sort of rugged looks, and the bards would likely sing for decades to come. It was no small wonder, the shriveled old man, that this was his blood before him. Time for what? Mm -hmm. Time to undo all of my hard work. He pointed at the structure. Tear it down. It's your funeral pyre, grandfather. It's time to stop wandering. We need to leave the wastes and forge our own nation of stone instead of leather huts. Who's the grand warlord here, you clever little twat? Hmm? I set siege to the greatest empire this world has ever known. I killed the damn god in the process. His followers are now part of our tribes, even if they have no idea who he ever was. Their history is gone, just so that I could free us from the tyranny of that damned idea. We all know the stories, Grandfather. Stories? <laughs> Why ask any of my honor god? I'll tell you of the campaign, won't you? He looked back at his honor god, only to remember the original honor god was all dead. Ah... Well, not these, I suppose. That's just it, Grandfather. You're the only one still alive who lived through that campaign. The Grand Warlord blinked at that and began to think. Surely there were others? He was sickly. That damn cough of his had never fainted. He surely hadn't outlived everyone who remembered, had he? Some of his wives had joked that he was too bitter and angry to die, but... He searched his memory for a name of some living warrior who served him to destroy the Elven Empire. None of the women who bore his children were alive either, now that he thought about it. Well, regardless, I don't remember. Not enough time has passed, and I am not dead yet. I don't need a funeral pyre. Tear it down, and we'll continue our trek. The Arkhurds won't wait, but I won't stand by while this does. The old man pointed at the structure again before he shrugged his bony shoulders in the giant cloak. We've done wondering, Grandfather. It's time to build. Not wonder. This is just the start. We'll settle here and build up a statue worthy of your status. When you pass, we'll burn you on the pyre. That's not our way, boy, the old man growled. No buildings, no burning. We use our dead waste of a good body to burn it. When I die, I want to be buried amongst the snow pines near the geysers, to the south, as is far away. Do you think that these trees just spring up? No. Our bodies give them life. Why would I want to be burned anyway? It's only fitting for a god. God! The old man bellowed, and then he had to pull up another cloth and cough into it as he was beset by a coughing fit. Once he was done, he tossed the bloody cloth into the face of his grandson, who flinched and pulled the fabric from his face, wiping away the blood with his other hand. I am no god, I'm a man. I'm a mortal. Don't you understand why I did what I did? I had cities to put to the torch. I killed every elven scholar alive. I did these things to free our people from the gods. Now you want to turn me into one. Don't you understand what I did? What all of this was for? He waved his hand at the wagons trading the riches and spoils of his conquest. I understand fine, Grimefather. It's well known that your skill as a strategist and tactician was unparalleled. Was? Was, the younger man stared down at the old. You're a conqueror. You've freed us. You've freed the remaining elves too. But you're too old now and it is time to build. If we're to thrive as a people, we need to settle down. You sent us to rule over the other tribes and clans, told us that you wouldn't step aside, and we'd have to divide your spoils amongst ourselves because you wanted us to compete. Keeps us strong. If we grow weak and soft, we'll fail. But we didn't. And you're soft and weak because of it. But grandfather, 
We've worked together. Despite wandering the wastes, we've made life for our people better. Look at this mighty structure, built by our own hands. None of the other laborers or craftsmen who built it truly knew what they were doing. And look at what we've accomplished. You've built a shrine to a god. We have no gods, and saved us from that fate. Grandfather, we do have a god. You gave us one. It's you. Damn it, I just said that I was a man. Grandfather, some people become something greater than their mortal shell. You united the clans for the first time. You destroyed the greatest empire the world has ever known. You've killed a god. His people are now our people. Their history is no more. You outlived everyone who might even remember. You're the only one alive who knows what their empire even looked like. We've been in the wastes for long enough. The old man growled. You would trade the freedom that I've given you for chains. You would undo my work if you start to worship me. I am flesh and blood. You are flesh and blood, but you represent something more. We all know that we are free to choose our own path in life, that we have no set direction. Nothing directs us but ourselves and one other thing. The old man arched a brow. What's that? You. Your orders are holding us back. If we want to advance, we have to break your commands. The old man laughed at that. You really are a clever little twat. Turned my own teachings against me. My children, your kin. What of your mother? Did she get along with us as well? Those that didn't agree are safely being watched by those loyal to the rest of us. The others elected me. Elected, the man spat out the word. The Grand Warlord is not elected. I killed my mother and my father to lead the tribe. I killed the champions of the other clans or made them bend their knees to me in submission. The Grand Warlord is not elected. You will be the last. I will have a different title. But it is time to stop this, Grandfather. We were bold, and we will worship what you embody, if not your physical form. You mean more to our people as a symbol than a leader now anyways. Most of the new generation thinks you as little more than a legend and myth, despite the fact that you live and breathe still. The old man stared at the younger man before a moment. You forget one thing. What's that, grandfather? I'm armed. He pulled the old sword free, surprising his kin as he slashed out. If his grandson hadn't been faster, he would be dead. But even so, he was left with a gash across his eye and cheek. The eye should still work, but the blood seeping into it blinded him for now. The man gasped in pain, trying to pull back, and the old man growled and stabbed, cutting the line across the ribs, the fancy clothes that he wore providing little protection against the blade. Fight or die. When he slashed once more, his grandson caught the blade, in his hand, carrying the pain of the old blade cut into his palm. But he swung out with his other and he punched the old man in the chin, making him stagger back. This gave John a chance to pull the blade free. It was well crafted and fancy, but it had never seen combat. The old man bellowed and swung his blade overhead. Figuring the young man would make his mistake and raising his fancy blade to block it and only have a shatter. But Jan surprised the old man by lunging forward, driving the sword through the old man's chest. The Grand Warlord gasped, coughed up blood. It was a familiar thing to him, but very different now. His bony old frame sagged as his grandson clutched him tight. Jan's eyes were wide. He bore an expression on the old man hadn't seen in so long. You've... He had to cough up a bit more blood. Never killed anyone, have you? No, no, Grandfather, I, I never needed to. The old man smiled and coughed again. Maybe. You were right. Maybe it's time. He desperately wanted to tell him not to bury his body, to bury him with his kin in the snow pines, 
to not worship him and build shrines, but his time had finally come. Wanting to say more meant a little when you couldn't. He felt his body being laid back against the ground as his eyes closed. When he opened them, he was still in the wastes, but he was alone. No structure, no kin, no other god. He heard a roar and turned to find that he wasn't alone after all. There was a massive bear, a few feet away from him, sniffing at his body. The old man growled and rose, waving his sword, but the bear didn't retreat or attack. It just sat there and looked at him, and then he noticed another figure that he'd missed. It wore black and carried an axe and an ornately carved shaft. The wind made the figure's black robe snap and flutter, but it did not speak. The bear let out a groan as it stared at the old man. What do you want? he growled back. He wishes to serve you. He has waited a very long time for this. The voice came from nowhere, and of very certainty, the figure in black. The old man stared at the bear and realized it. It was the one that he killed from the start of his path, the one he wore for all of this time as a symbol of his strength. Why? He understands you. You're strong. He's watched you, followed you. Rather than join his kin, he wishes to serve you. The old man sheathed his sword then. Very well. I'm not sure what good he is, but I'll let him serve me. He looked around the barren waste for a moment. So this is it. I'm dead. I expected to see my kin. The gods have told their followers many things about what comes next. They all lie. There is nothing after but peace. What about him? He pointed at the bear. You said he could join his kin. The figures were silent when the old man worked it out. Ah, right. That's his peace. Well, then how would he serve me? And why are you here? You are a special case. The gods are only as strong as the belief in them. You killed the god of fate. This left a void. A curious thing happened. Your people began to believe. Not in a god, but in you. I'm just a man. No, you're not just a man. You're now a myth. More than that, an ideal. This has a power unlike any that I've seen before. You must follow me and take your place. The figure turned and opened up the door that he had stood in front of. The old man followed the figure, and the massive bear followed the old man. Suddenly, they were walking through the massive gilded halls filled with statues, shrines, and lavish displays of wealth and power. The old man hated it. He was led to the massive table that seemed to hold a map, but it was unlike any that he'd seen before. It rose and fell with the mountains and valleys. The water shimmered and moved. There were even little clouds that floated above it. Around the table were massive and mighty figures that soon he recognized. The gods that still remained. This. This is the god killer. Below the massive orc that had to be 15 feet tall, clad in intricate gold armor. This wretched little thing. He is stronger than any of you. So great is the faith of his people. The old man chuckled as he saw the looks on the faces of the gods. He stepped forward and he took his place at the table, dwarfed by the other mighty creatures. Even the god of dwarves was far larger than him. He found an intricate station before him. It looked like a glass sphere of some sort. What's this? That's how you communicate with your followers, how you command them, give them visions, instruct them, said the dwarf who eyed him with suspicion. The old man drew his sword and smashed the sphere with it, stepping back as it exploded in a wave of energy that made all the other gods stagger back. You fool! You think you will make it for you? How do you expect to win the game if you don't direct your pieces? He waved at the table and the old man suddenly noticed the various pieces of the map. Is that what you do? You play with the lives of your believers to try win some sort of game? It's not some game, the center god scolded him. 
It's the game. Well, I don't need it. In fact, it would defeat the whole point in freeing my people. They will succeed or fail on their own. He looked at the board and noticed a tiny cluster of humanity in the wastes far across the land and oceans from all of the other pieces. He noted the mighty fortresses, the citadels, mighty armies and nations, all the temples and cities that belonged to the other gods, and then he looked back up at them. I'm just here to watch you all lose. End of story. My Earthling, My Best and Only Friend Written by Regal Legal Eagle I sat outside the room waiting for the doctor and contemplating my life since I met the best and only friend. As an archon, I figured I'd always live alone. Not only is it a profession that requires constant travel and fight injustices and help those in need, but Koenig, in general, are a very solitary creatures. We'll go dozens of cycles before seeking out a fellow Koenig for socializing. We're the oldest intelligent species and have been protecting the galaxy for a very long time, so we're sort of used to it. When I came across the terribly damaged and nearly prehistoric freighter, I had no idea that day would change my life forever. I found him the only survivor of a Kraken attack. They're basically our mirror. They travel in massive packs and do as much damage and cause as much pain as possible. Well, he looked strange as hell to me, but the computer said that he was from some planet called Earth and had only just barely figured out FDL travel. They didn't even have the effect of translators yet, so communication was very difficult. I knew that I should try and make him at home, but the Kraken Horde was heading back to the territory, and I knew this was my only chance to catch them for the least five cycles. So I tried to explain to him what was going on. It wasn't easy, but I got the idea that he wanted to go with me. So off we went. At the beginning, it wasn't too easy. Kurnak have much more sophisticated digestive tracts and biology in general. It was a messy few days until we sorted out the bathroom, but we got that work down soon enough. Now I understand he wanted to go with me. Now I understand that he wanted to go with me, but I thought just as a civilian. I figured I'd leave him in the ship while I did my job. But by chance, I took him with me to visit the market world of Sisson the Cloud. Well, wouldn't you know it, there was less than a quarter rotation when some punk steals off from a vendor. And I was thinking I'd just let the locals deal with it, but the Earthling. He went after that punk like lightning. I was impressed as hell. After that I started to bring him along more often, and then when we really started to get close. He wasn't sophisticated, and he certainly didn't take flack from some of the prisoners. I had to pull him off a few criminals that really annoyed him. Good thing that the code allows a bit of leeway with culturing new recruits from the primitive worlds. Well, soon enough we tracked down the Kraken Horde, and not only did we get them together, he saved my life. The Kraken are rarely interested in more than chaos and trouble, so they got the drop on me when their boss actually laid out a trap. It seemed like he wanted one of us Koenig for some nefarious purposes, and an Archon was all the better. Well, they totally missed out on my friend the Earthling. They totally dismissed someone from a primitive world, and didn't tie him up, or anything, when they tossed us into the cell. He had me out of my bindings in no time, and then slipped out, and then managed to steal the pass key and get me out of there. The looks on their faces when I burst out fully armed and with my best friend at my side. We both got commendations after that, and he was made an honorary archon. Communication was still problematic, but we'd figure out how to convey very basic things, and they let me keep him as a partner, especially since he was a hopeless at trying to teach him how to fly a ship. I heard other earthlings were good pilots, so maybe he just didn't get it. Either way, we got him some custom gear, and together we became unstoppable. 
he was always alert in ways that surprised me. Not only was it impossible to sneak up on the crafty bastard, but he was the best tracker that I've ever seen. No criminals could shake him on a planet. Even when he were out in diplomatic dinner on Turbix 9, he could tell the princess was having some sort of health issues way before the rest of us. We were all focused on dinner conversation, but since he couldn't understand us, I guess he noticed how funny she was acting. Saved her life. Made him a knight after that. I'm not even a knight, and this earthling got the honor. No one from Earth ever tried to track him down, and I got the sense that after the attack on the ship, all he had was me. And all I had was him. We were close. Very close. I'd bitch to him about the code or regulations or politics, and he'd listen and just make me laugh with his antics. I'm sure he understood very little of what I told him, but it was so nice to have someone to talk to, and he'd get emotional at times. He didn't like some planets, and a few creatures obviously made him nervous, so they'd stay close to me. I'd also got the sense of sometimes that he was lonely, but then we'd exercise and work out to stay sharp and he seemed to be back in the game. Dedicated to the job. I understood that feeling all too well and respected it. Fifteen cycles we were at it together. He did more to advance my career in fifteen cycles than I did on my own in twenty. I was offered several chances to move up, but I always turned them down. Then about a month ago, he started acting weird. I could tell that he didn't want me to worry tried to be the same best bud a Konak could ever have. But something was up. I finally took him to the hospital, even though he begged me not to. He always hates hospitals for some reason. Probably all the machines and needles freak him out. I figured that it was something simple, an injury from one of our cases that didn't work right. The file said that humans live about a hundred cycles, so I thought there'd be tons of time left but the doc came out and pulled me aside. I couldn't believe it. Cancer? I thought we'd rooted that out centuries ago. Well, before I was born. All the problem was fixed with the genes. Earthlings were brand new to the greater galaxy, so we didn't have time to fully map the genes out and figure out how to fix them. The drugs they used were mostly effective for their own treatment, but we were on the other side of the known space. It would take months to get out there. I couldn't even tell what was happening since the two translator devices that had been made were only given to diplomats, and also on the other side of space with the drugs. I started to break down, as the doc told me that my best friend was in the later stages as well. Either he'd been having trouble far longer than I noticed and didn't tell me, or hadn't felt it himself until recently and it was just too late to operate. That the cells had spread, what kind of ways was this for him to go? I'd seen him attack creatures twice my size. Let alone this, he had an arrest record and accommodation list longer than my arm, and he was going to lose to cancer. We had a final week where I did everything I could. He was better than me about the whole situation but with the drugs they were giving him, he probably thought that he was getting better, not worse. I made sure to try find some of his favorite food, took time to do some of the things he loved. I did everything I could for my best friend, and my only friend. But at the end of the week, I could tell even with the drugs they were giving him, he was feeling worse again. It couldn't go on, so I took him back, the doctor got him all set up and that's what I was waiting for. They'd set up a machine, and since they couldn't explain it to him, I'd have to be the one to press the button. They told me that just drift off to sleep in peace. It was better that way. I really didn't think anything about the situation could be described as better, but they were doctors. Finally, he came out and nodded to me. I collected myself, trying to remain strong for my friend. Walking into the room, I saw him look up, already happy to see me. I already had tears in my eyes when I sat next to him. Hey, bud. Woof. A stupid bastard was wagging his tail and licking my face like always. Hells, 
I couldn't do this, could I? But he was in pain. My guts twisted and churned. I know we can't communicate well, but I know you're in pain, bud. I choked back some of the words as I heard his tail thump against the blankets. How was he so strong? He tried to crawl closer, but I stopped him trying to talk. I clutched him close, hearing the continuous thump of his tail. Finally, as we hugged, I pressed the button. He was licking my face right up until he fell asleep. My best and only friend. I was a mess for rotations after that. I barely had the ability to submit the paperwork and his ceremonial burial back on the Archon HQ planet. I didn't want to know how I'd go on without him. Part of the training to be an Archon involved learning how to deal with loss. But that had been cycles ago, and why would I pay attention if I was always going to be alone? The next few days were horrible for me. The funeral was the worse. I didn't hold it together. I'm sure I was a disgrace as an Archon to have so much emotion exposed and open, but the others supported me through it. Two rotations later, however, I was told the Earthlings had sent their ambassador. Apparently, I had some sort of misconception about Earthlings. The last thing I needed was some sort of political snafu. When I met the ambassador, however, they were accompanied by a creature that I'd seen, and the ambassador was so young. As young as my best friend when I first met him. So full of energy and excited. That's when the other creature spoke up. That's not the ambassador. I'm the ambassador. That's a puppy. And your new partner. End of story. Reality becomes history. Written by Regal Legal Eagle. The Tower of the Gods was a testament to the strength of the United Gods working together once the Eleven Gods was killed by the humans to the south. It was the center of Temple City a hovering monolith at the center of the greatest cathedrals and temples that the worshippers had ever built. It represented thousands of years of craftsmanship and the power of the divine themselves looking down from the heavens. Pilgrims used to travel here by the millions to pay their respects to the awed by the magnificence. As the sound of thunder in the distance stopped the annual and glorious steps closer, to the massive window of his office and looked at the past the city. It seemed like the human artillery had stopped firing for now. He let out a heavy sigh. Soon they'd be hitting the edges of the city walls. Or perhaps they would hold off. The massive bomber wings always skirted the city and they hit the factories up north. Perhaps they wanted to take the city intact. But seeing as they'd raised every trace of the ancient Alban kingdom in the south, he found it hard to believe. How had it come to this? How had such a simple creature brought the chosen of the gods so low? He thought back on it. The crusades had failed them. Not only had the humans repelled each invasion, but they grew smarter every time. When they stopped attacking, thinking that they'd done centuries before the humans could build up their forces to invade Kairosh, they should have known better. The invasion of the First War of the Human Aggression, as they called it, was a slaughter of all the worshippers. The Battle of the Bloody Wire was unlike anything that they'd seen before. He closed his eyes as he tried to picture it. One hundred thousand centaurs. One hundred thousand orc warriors another 75,000 gnolls to support them, even 25,000 minotaurs. It must have been an incredible sight to see them, with axes and swords and spears and gleaming banners. But awe inspiring it must have been to witness a 100,000 of the finer centaurs charged bearing down on those humans crossing the open field. But then, he shook his head as his mind could hear the human shouting, Fire! Before a thunder of muskets and cannons exploded, all those centaurs torn asunder by the bullets and cannon balls. The ground, now muddy with the blood, became a slaughter for all the others trying to charge. Fifty thousand humans, and in the end of the day there were only ten thousand. The cowardly gnolls were the only survivors amongst the worshippers, 
mostly because they didn't have a real god, he assumed. But the rest of the worshippers cut off from the southwestern part of Kairosh, tried to assault the humans dug in around their vaunted Bastion Bay. How the humans had fortified that land so quickly, he couldn't understand, even now. But they had, and the months of sieging brought the worshippers nothing but defeat. So the traitor Senk had led a rebellion against the Orkish kingdom and become what the humans called the Orkish Paragon. The cowardly merchants and craftsmen overthrew the Orkish warrior, and suddenly they were joining the humans. When they pushed up into the Golden Steps, no one had been surprised that the gnolls were kicked to turn. Yet, it would take a hundred years for them to gain a paragon. Such a pathetic riches they were. The centaurs and minotaurs lasted longer, but even then they were outmatched. What could a centaur do with a bow that a human on a horseback with a carbine could not? It was easy at first when they had to reload after each shot, but when the humans had invented the carbine, that was the end of the centaur clans. Without support from the fast-moving centaurs, the minotaurs were easy prey to the gnoll warbands or human marksmen with rifles. All the elite warriors of the Chosen took years, decades, most of their lifetime to master their weapons. Axe, sword, bow, hammer, whatever. It was they were warriors without peer amongst the humans. But the humans didn't care. Give any young human a firearm and a few months of training, and suddenly they were a soldier. They didn't respect the old traditions. They didn't drop in a single combat. It was one minotaur against ten humans, then he'd have been ten bullets in him. No honor. But they had plenty of glory and victory. Then came the uneasy peace. The humans built upon the southwest, adding stars to that damn banner of theirs to represent the states. They had brought into the fold, as if it was cowards and traitors let into the nation were worth anything. Well, the Chosen began to make muskets and bull cannons in preparation for the next war. They knew it would come, and the gods had made a deal with the Krakens, those terrifying denizens of the deep. They'd sink the human navies, and then the little colony in Kairosh would be finished. When the Krakens struck without warning, the next war began. The Trenches War, the humans called it. At first, they thought it would be their victory. The human supply line was suddenly cut off and the chosen cannons were battering down the walls of Bastion Bay in no time. Of course, they'd been betrayed again. Some treacherous dwarf who had witnessed the hundreds of thousands of soldiers being marched to the death beneath the human guns had switched sides during the peace. He detailed the defensive of the chosen and helped the humans build their own. So, while the cannons had started the war, the human artillery was soon the answer. From cannons to howitzers, how could they have even seen that coming? Horses were replaced by armored cars. Those little strange contraptions they used to fly about in and scout the land were replaced by biplanes and triplane bombers. Even those early airships that sat in the sky defying the gods' decision to keep civilized creatures firmly on the ground. Then they discovered humans had created submarines. As the Krakens attacked, merchant submarines would strike. No matter how mighty the sea creatures were, they were no match for torpedoes full to the brim with explosives. Their failure brought them to death, and the hands of the humans and the gods wouldn't save them. The war dragged on for years. The humans could only push so far with the infantry and howitzers once the Chosen had dug in deep. When the spies had brought word that they were bringing up tanks and bears, they figured the humans had gone insane. The old armored bears wouldn't last long in no man's land. Then they discovered instead of the humans that had built tanks, how could they develop and build that so fast? The gods had given no one else the ability to learn and change so quickly. So how had these creatures that were shunned by the cards do it? They'd pressed farther before another peace was reached. More lands lost, new states and new stars for the humans. Then the gods had lost the power to create a new species long ago, after the creation of the planets. But Virian the Mad had sought out to wield ancient magic to create a new race to challenge the humans, 
and to help the Chosen regain the domination of Karosh. Aniel still wasn't sure exactly what went wrong. Virian hadn't seemed mad after all, just a bit perverted. So he created the War Cats, or the Tigritans as they were called themselves, all female, all war. Virian had never revealed how they would procreate before their betrayal, but Aniel was still curious. He'd assembled them all and massed them into his fortress in the mountains near the human lines and told them why he'd created them. He explained to the leader that he created them for the express purpose of leading those new troops to victory. He'd hoped to wage war against humanity and drive them from the continent. Then, for some damn reason, he answered some questions from the leader, and she then tossed Virian off the top of the tower to his death. Rather than fight the humans, she contacted them and immediately offered fealty to them. She took up arms against the Chosen instead, the Ingrates. That had been the start of the most recent war. Aniel had hastily made a deal with the dragons, the great species that did not have a side. He promised them everything, but they wanted in return for the help in the war. The humans would be roasting alive inside of their tanks by dragonfire. Or so he had thought, but the biplanes had become fighters at speeds no dragon could possibly match. The lords of the sky were brought down by flak cannons and the vaunted dragon fighters in their painted airplanes. The bombers' wings flew in massive numbers, and even the dragons didn't dare to try and approach. Aniel had lost this war. And it wasn't his fault, as he'd given the command to the dying nation, but he must hold the damn city until his end, and likely was the end of the Chosen. He'd given orders to none to surrender. Better to die and live under the human rule. He knew that they treated their new states and citizens as good as any human, but always lied to it to the people. The gods as well as helped reinforce the idea that what little power they had left. His people had begun to fly their planes into the human ships and bombers to try and stop them. The resistance would live on, and so would the gods. So long as they martyred enough, with their own humans would likely be unable to stomp out all worship. Then the gods would never truly die. Aniel looked up as he saw a lone human bomber flying out of the clouds. Just one. He smirked. It was far too high for their anti-aircraft fire to reach. It didn't look like the others he was used to seeing, where they were testing out a new model. That was so like the humans. He shook his head and he looked over at the city towards the lines. No human assault. The bombardment must have stopped so that they could spread more propaganda. The gods would still live on. The war wouldn't end until the humans killed every lost chosen still alive. He made sure their orders were strict. Ogres, trolls, dwarves, fey, goblins. Every and all race, created by the gods and not already in the human hands. They'd kill millions of humans before they fell, because the gods demanded a fitting pyre for their enemies, before they became too weak to give orders and direct the goals of mortals. He glanced up at the lone bomber, once more before turning back to his desk. Just then, everything turned white before he could even look back out of the window. He was nothing more than dust. The gods backed away from the table, gasping in fear and surprise while covering their eyes from the incredibly detailed map of the world. Before them, a mushroom cloud grew over Temple City. What was that? The tall god exclaimed in dismay. They all looked at the one figure who hadn't backed away. The human. He was laughing, despite his power that he'd never changed his raspy voice, or let his words boom or echo like the other gods. He'd just sit and watch, while they commanded the Chosen, worked their magic, and tossed away the lives that he would watch. That's all he ever did. So the Dwarven got angrily pointed and shouted, You dare use your power now. You said that you wouldn't. You even destroyed your controls to leave your pathetic humans free of any influence. The human pointed at the mushroom cloud. That wasn't me. The gods looked around at one another then. Who was it then? Had one of them betrayed their own, and made a secret deal with the human? What god still had that kind of power? 
In fact, they soon realized that no god had ever had enough power to destroy an entire city like that. Finally, the dwarven god muttered, No. The human began to laugh once more and rose up, his hands in the air. Oh yes, yes it is. He pointed at the mushroom clouds once more. That was the work of mortal. Thousands of years ago, we huddled in caves for warmth, terrified of our own shadows. Two thousand years ago, we had never seen a stone building. A few hundred years ago, we'd never set foot on your continent. And now, I give you the splitting of the atom. No, it's not magic. No, it's not divine power. That's not belief or prayer. That, he spread his hands towards the burning image of the map, is science. The mortals taking the rules of the universe and breaking them. The rules of the universe. All you've done is built upon the rules. You've worked within the confines of you know them to be. Slaves to those rules. And these pathetic creatures, as you've called them, have broken them. He laughed again at the moment he shook his head. The best part, they didn't want to use it. Many of the scientists dreaded using it as a weapon. They were torn and conflicted. You know why they did? Because they found out you all planned to sacrifice every possible innocent worshipper that you had to try and bolster the loss of your power. You drove them to this. All those deaths will in fact save more lives in the long run. If your egos hadn't been so huge, this never would have happened. You essentially killed yourselves. He sat back down and smiled. He didn't need to speak further. The god stared at the map. The god of the Fae began to cry, and the others didn't look far off. This was their end, and they knew it. They ordered those who believed in them to endlessly wage war against the human heretics, and they'd obeyed, thinking the god still had the power to protect them. But after this moment, after the mortals had spit in the faces of the gods, knowing that they wielded the power that any god ever had, the war would collapse. What was the point in fighting mortals with the powers of gods? The assembled gods began to sit down, some holding their heads in their hands some looking like they were about to be sick. But the human just looked at the mushroom cloud with a massive smile. In time, his own power would likely fade as his people stopped believing. And he couldn't be more proud. End of story. No quasar, asteroid, solar flares, war or supernova. I just don't get it. I really wished he would shut up. There was almost always one of these fresh-faced graduates on the nicer cruisers. I just wanted to get my fuel, drink a cup of hot recaf, and be on my way. But every time, I stood around waiting for someone that would come by and ruin what would be a nice time. Well, not every time, but far more often than I wanted. So I just dunked another hard tack into the coffee and sent him a sort of look that I hoped would kill him. Or make him shut up. Why waste so much money on such an outdated organizer? I mean, uh, sure, some citizens miss out, but what's the point of spending so much on so few? No such luck. He stared at me expectantly for a moment, and then I realized that he wanted me to argue. Well, he could wait. I made sure to stir the coffee with the hardtack for a moment before putting it out and shaking it a bit to get most of the dripping to stop before biting into the, uh, less hard biscuit. I chewed the nice and slow before finally swallowing. Then I took a sip of my coffee, switching it around my mouth before swallowing, and then I spoke up. There's no place to hitch me, won't reach. He stared at me, I stared at him. I shifted the uneaten piece of hardtack in my fingers and dunked it again, waiting for him to figure it out. That's it. That's all you've got to say. We spent how many trillions of years in the Navy and the Marines or any number of the such branches of military? And you're concerned about two billion being spent more or less on the citizens who pressed the boundaries of our great nation. We can protect our military might just about anywhere. But sometimes it's not about sending a message of power. Sometimes it's about taking care of our own, even in a small way. 
Yeah, but how many jump engines are there? Every ship that you guys use... He kept talking, but I was chewing on the other piece of hardtack in order to drown it out, as he was saying. Some people just didn't get it. I saw the crew chief step out from behind my ship as he gave me the thumbs up. You're all filled up. Hey, thanks. The graduate stopped as he realized that I hadn't been listening. I downed the most of the recaf before handing him the cup. Thanks for the recaf. He looked into the cup as I opened the hatch and climbed into my ship. There was just enough of it that he tossed the cup it would spill on the deck chief would rip him a new one, meaning he'd have to carry it back to the crew pit to throw it away in a bin. By the time I made it up to onto the cockpit, he figured it out and was scowling in my direction. He couldn't see me, of course, and the heat paint on the view screen was one way, but I still smiled seeing him start to stomp off towards the pit. I began the systems check as I got control of the line. HICS 688 online. Thanks for your fuel, fellas, and the recap ain't bad. Sure thing, Hick. I saw you talking to our newest know-it-all, Reiki's heart. I laughed and shook my head. He just didn't feel like my services was required and I'm overpaid. I would hear the control team laugh. Yeah, Hicks are overpaid. Why do you even have such a bad job? You could be a fighter pilot, you know. Ah... Just not my thing. I like seeing someone smile when they see me. Well, you have a good run, Hick. I'm just reading your flight plan, right? And you've got a civil war to fly through, just on your first leg. I snorted at that and shook my head as I warmed up the engines, and the system check was done. No quasar, asteroid, solar flare, war, or supernova shall stop me from my job. For I am the hegemony imperial courier, and so long as my lungs carry breath, I shall continue. I will bring the messages I shall carry the packages, and I will deliver them to our citizens. The hegemony reaches all, and so do the couriers. There were some chuckles, and I think I heard someone try to start a slow clap before it died out. You do us all proud. Safe travels, Sam. Hey, who said you could actually use my name? I'm Hick, to you miserable military types. Always oppressing the little guy just because I don't have any weapons on my ship. I will see a fragile package with your name on it. I'll use it as a seat cushion before handing it over. There was more laughter, as I disengaged the locks and began to back out of the cruiser. Once I was clear, I quickly flipped around and shot off towards the nearest nav beacon, while taking a glance at my route. It seemed the control had been right about the red zone designation. Wonderful. Well, it couldn't be helped. I punched in the coordinates and then overran the safety warnings and kept the engines running at full speed as I went into the jump. Strictly speaking, running at a high speed and jumping is incredibly dangerous because you have no idea why might be on the front of you on the other side. But long ago I'd learned that when you were entering a war zone it helped to have a full head of steam going. When I punched through the ink space and black into reality, I was glad that I was already moving. Collision warning, knock-on warning, explosion warning. The computer began to whine at me while I growled out. Yes, thank you. Warnings noted. I found that the thing got snippy if I cussed too much, so I learned to quickly turn it off. With a few choice phrases, and then go about the business of keeping myself alive. Which right now involved dodging the missiles and weapons fire being launched between the two fleets. I gripped my teeth as I heard something hard bounce off the hull. Those old girls barely had any original paint, but I knew that the HICS symbol was still visible, which meant that that bean counters wouldn't give me a new paint job yet. Unidentified vessel. You're in the Grax Republic territory. No, you're in the learned democracy territory. Identify yourself or be fired upon, or be arrested and then await trial. Trial? Ha! <laughs> Can it learn, scum? I'm Hegemony, and you can both freck right off. I muttered and turned to the comm unit. I saw the lock-on warning, and quickly triggered the chaff as I spun through the tight cluster of warships. Three cruisers at Dreadnought, no carriers. Good. But there was an assault trawler. I quickly throttled back and tucked down into the flow of the assault pods, being dropped into the planet before checking the weapons warnings. Whoever was dropping the pods didn't want to fire on me since I was in the middle of their troops. 
and the other side was busy trying to shoot down the pods so they didn't care about a rogue courier ship. I saw the burning city I was flying into and quickly checked the address on my screen. Not here. Thank God. Just as the assault pods began to break into the landing, I flew under the first wave and then angled away from the city. Some flak fire rattled into the hull, but nothing direct. It wasn't bad looking world, a little swampy, but there were mountains in some dry areas. Nice looking pair of moons. I checked the map on my screen and quickly approached the city half a continent away from the one being landed on. There was still a spaceport emitting an open signal, so I swept in over it as fast and as low before killing the throttle and then hitting the landing gear. I could hear the ship groan as the inertia dampeners fought to keep me from turning into a red paste on the wall before I settled down on the pad nearest the customs building. I was the only ship in the good sized port so I knew that I wanted to make this quick. Once more I overrode the safety protocols and kept the engines warm as I climbed out of the pilot's chair and back into the main room. This looked like it could get rough so I quickly pulled on the light courier armor that I was provided. While my ship didn't have weapons, I was given the standard issue peacemaker shotgun since long ago they'd realized sometimes people try to rob couriers and that wasn't allowed. I checked the three packages and the message cylinders to make sure that they were all for the same person and this was the right place before opening up the hatch and climbing out. I had the package satchel and the shotgun slung over my back and hoped that the local security could tell the difference between marines and HICS. It was on both shoulders, my chest and back, but sometimes even all of that wasn't enough. I glanced around at the landing pads though and it seemed like it didn't have anything to worry about. No one was heading my way at all. It was a bit humid and hot but I could see the sky getting a bit darker so it would soon be night. Rocking my hatch behind me I jogged towards the customs building. I could see the Xenos inside, some shredding documents, others frantically running around. No one was up behind the strong glass where they'd normally help your arrivals. I began to pound my fist on the window until one of the figures looked my way. It was clearly confused for a moment and then approached. Are, are you part of the invasion? What? No. Why would I knock? Hedge me Imperial Courier Services. The creature's eyes went wide. Courier Service? Here, now? Yep. I slapped the tracking paper to the window. Where is this? Ah, uh, that's over by... He said something and my translator couldn't figure it out, so they must be proper names. I need directions a translator can use, near, far. Oh, right, sorry, um, it's in the financial district, about two miles. The automated translator voice filled in whatever he had tried to say into the local tongue. All right, how do I get there? Uh, down the main street to the spaceport, turn right, follow the blue statue, turn left, keep going. It's the... The, it's the big building in the square around the fake lake. I think it's white. Public transportation? Are you kidding me? No. Everything's shut down. That's what I figured, but it never hurt to ask. Got any suggestions on how to get there? I, he fumbled with words for a moment, or else he'd use some slang or translated didn't get before I finally understood him again. No, I can't think of anything. I checked the clock on my HUD and looked around the empty spaceport for a moment. All right, I'll be back. Don't touch my ship. You're insane. You're delivering your packages. Here, yeah, now. I already said yes, I commented as I began to move. There were stray pieces of luggage here and there in the causeways and next to the terminals. Not my chance. It seemed that those that could had already left. I was confident about the anti-theft devices on my ship that would deter anyone who thought that they could use my ship to still escape. I glanced around the outside of the spaceport and saw more than a few abandoned speedsters. I started with the ones at the edges of the pileup, leaning inside and pressing the start buttons. Finally, the two-seater without a top started up and I tossed the shotgun and satchel into the passenger seat before hopping in. It seemed like this delivery wouldn't be too bad after all. I cruised down the main street, just like the customs agent had said, and there was a blue station. There was very little traffic on the road, just a few speeders and here and there, one military convoy and some sort of heading out of town. 
They didn't shoot at me as I zipped by, and that was a plus. When I got near the group of large buildings, I spotted the lake. There was a big white building, then the other side from very modern. Or at least a human modern. I was about to drive up into the sidewalk when someone started shooting at me. Cursing, I quickly tried to pull off to the side, but a blown tire had me spinning out into the empty bus. I hopped out, grabbed the shotgun and huddling in the small space between the back of the speedster and the bus. Are you the one that came on that fast ship? I heard someone call out from behind some speeders on the other side of the street. Yes, we want it. Too bad. They replied by shooting the speedster for a while. I reached over to the edge and grabbed the satchel before lying flat and crawling under the bus to the far side. Once out from under the bus, I quickly got up and ran around the corner into the square with the lake. I didn't know if they were behind me, but I broke out into a full sprint, heading towards the white building. I heard some yelling behind me and a few rounds of crack passed. I ducked even though I was well aware the crack meant the bullets were past me already. Hard to break instinct. Then there was a louder crack that was going the other way, and I saw a gleam from the open window about halfway up the building. Someone had my back, I hoped. Sure enough, no one else shot at me, and I now kept my sprint until I reached the building. I had to slow down to avoid slamming into the glass doors, and knocked before they stood open. I saw a collection of Xenos in various gear that had some symbol painted on their chest. They looked like professionals. Good for me. Hegemony, Imperial Courier, Services. I panted out, hands on my knees as I was trying to catch my breath after that sprint. Then I straightened up and held up a tracking paper. 25th floor. One of the Xenos said and pointed to the lifts. I nodded and gave him a wave as I stepped into the nice wood paneled lift and hit the proper button. There was a soft rumble as the magnets made the lift glide up and stop gently on the right floor. When I stepped out, I could see a collection of people around the table with a map of the city. Just one human in an executive battle gear. That really was a nice expensive stuff that weighed less than what I had on, but had far more protection than Marine standard issue. Mr. Capway? I asked as I stepped up behind him. He leaned up from the table and turned to face me. He blinked in surprise and then he smiled. I loved that smile. It was such a wonderful way to be greeted after working so hard to get here. That's me, HICS, huh? Bad timing, it seems. I've had worse deliveries. I gave a shrug and held up the tracking paper. Sign here. He signed off and I heard the beep before handing him the satchel. He opened it and pulled out the message cylinder first. After setting its thumb on it, it activated the lock and pulled out a small chit inside. His smile grew even wider and I could tell there was good news. I'm a dad, he yelled out, and then began to laugh and jump a little. I'm a father, guys. I could see some of the Xenos didn't get it, so I quickly tossed up my hands. Congratulations, boy or girl. Boy, hey, what's your name? Sam, I'll name my next kid after you. What? Not good enough for your first. He laughed and slapped me on the shoulder and then just hugged me. I hugged him back. Births were some of the best delivery announcements. Here you go, gotta celebrate with me. Sorry, Mr. Carefoy. Andy. Andy, but I gotta get back to my ship. A drink, at the very least. I don't become a father every day now. And I have a message to send back, so you have to wait. All right, all right. I took my helmet off and my hair for a moment as he arched his brows in surprise. You're a woman. Yeah, is that not allowed? He laughed and shrugged. I guess I didn't expect it at all. Well, Sam works for a boy or a girl, doesn't it? So you will have a kid named after you. I promise. He pushed the past the Xenos, walking over to the big desk on the big office and pulling out a bottle of something that I didn't recognize, but looked expensive. He poured two glasses of the cloudy liquid and brought them back, handing me one. To the HMA Imperial Courier Services, he said with a grin. We raised our drinks and then took a sip before I rose mine once more. To parenthood, to parenthood. He echoed out and we drank once more and I couldn't imagine how hard this stuff would hit me and how wonderfully smooth it went down. 
He quickly programmed a message onto the chit and then stuffed it back into the messenger cylinder, which he handed back to me. Sure you can't stay and celebrate? I am sure. The HICS never rests, I paused for a moment and shrugged. For long. He laughed and held out his credit chip, and I tried to wave him off, but he firmly tucked it into the package satchel, which he handed back. I insist. Well, either way, you think that you can smear right back to the spaceport. He laughed and nodded, sure can. Anything for the HICS. He spoke into a calm relay on his wrist then. Team Bravo, I'm sending you a VIP. See her safely to the spaceport. I heard some sort of calm burst which markedly meant an affirmative, and he nodded at me. Take the lift to the basement. Thanks. Think nothing of it. I turned to walk away, and then he called out, Oh, wait. I looked back, and he opened up one of the packages, handing me a true sealed container. Chocolate chip cookies my mom sent. They won't be hot, but they'll be fresh. Hey, don't you need to? I insist. He pressed the cylinder into my hand and smiled. I hefted it and nodded. Much appreciated, Andy. You stay safe out here. You too. As I stepped into the lift, I popped the seal on the container just to smell the contents, groaning a little. They were still fresh, all right. Sometimes it was the little things about being an HICS. I checked my HUD, ate more packages before my next rest day. Not bad. Then I noticed where the next one was going, and I groaned. Damn it. Not the Canis Confederate. They're the worst about the HICS. All part of the job. And then, my friends, is the end of this Reddit quickie, Dacker, written by Plusium. Before we start, I just wanted to thank Mr. Anderson for being here with us. His input was quite enlightening. It has been quite a while since the last contact, right? The lead creature asked, the skinny, chitinous creature before it, turned to face the significantly shorter and squatter compass. Yeah, about five centuries if my memory serves me correctly, replied the squatter insect creature in question. Mr. Anderson merely smiled and nodded. Anyways, gentle beings, if we were to follow me. The large creature gestured at the two armored-up beings guarding the doorway of the facility. As you all know, I am sorry for the repeating of this, but it does help to hear it in what go. This is the largest public secret that is signed from the Alpha Century. I am sure you have all heard the rumors about what goes on in here, and many of you probably have moles, but the feds have apparently decided that our nation needs a little bit more of a morale boost, especially considering all of those, um, terrorist attacks recently. The attendant beings all quietened down the instant they entered the cavernous facility. On display in the massive hangar were collections of pedestals, equally spaced out, almost like an art gallery. Perched on said pedestals were ambiguous items and an ascending size in tiny to gargantuan. Anyway, this is the first item here, the lost resort. Now, I may not inspire some confidence when the first thing I show you off is essentially a suicide device. Let me assure you, it is anything but. This tiny thing here can be slipped easily into a location by an infiltrator and then be detonated remotely with a yield of up to a ton of TNT. The presenter turned to Mr. Anderson. That is what you humans use, yes? Anything to add? Mr. Anderson smiled a wry smile and cleared his throat, and began, yeah, only for the larger yields, though. It is quite nifty, though. I do question the design. Sure, the coin shape is rather clever, but we do live in a cashless society. A piece of litter or gum would be far less likely to draw attention. As it is, someone would probably take it home, thinking that they found an artifact or something. The presenter froze for a moment. Huh. Surprisingly insightful. I'll be sure to pass it on to the boys at R&D. Anyone else? He was met with a collection of species-specific shakings of the head. All right, on to the next one. They walked to the next pedestal that was rather quiet, filled only with the muffled whispers of the assembled journalists and scientists. Right, this is a revolutionary new combat device. It is a... tear grass grenade? A rather vicious choice if you're going to be using it for crowd control. Mr. Anderson cut in. Oh, you've seen these before. 
Yeah, we've had them since pre-space. Had a lot of civil unrest back then. Impressive. It took quite a while for the engineers to make them suitable for crowd control. They worked, but a bit too well. Any questions? What purpose would these serve against the terrorists if they are designed for crowd control? A small, rhino-like journalist spoke up. Good question. As I said earlier, these are toned-down versions. Full-strength versions work great for safely eliminating terrorist compounds without losing men. The journalist seemed aghast. You're talking about chemical warfare? Oh, don't be silly. It's not fatal. Besides, who cares about a couple terrorists? The presenter's response hardly seemed to soothe the journalist. Hey, kid. Addison called out, inspecting some random trinket on a smaller platform. Yes, the angered journalist responded. Ain't a war crime if it ain't a war time. Mr. Anderson snorted to himself and the rhino's confused expression. Suppressing his smoke, the presenter quickly asserted control back over the crowd. Right, assuming that's all, we've got a good while to go. The brass only gave us an hour, so we should move along now. The whispers were a bit louder on this trip. When they arrived, they were greeted at the sight of what looked like a green lunchbox on stilts. Before we start, any comments to make, Mr. Anderson? The presenter arched an eyebrow. Mr. Anderson's cracked a smile. Of course, mind if I examine it? Taking the wave as a gesture of assent, Anderson eased the metal case off the pedestal. Looks like a claymore to me, just weird and scientified. Don't see why, though. Explosions do way better job at wounding people. Wounding people, Mr. Anderson, I'm afraid that you don't understand. This device is meant to kill as many terrorists as possible. Not wound them. A wounded soldier can still fight and hurt Federation personnel. Mm-hmm. True, I suppose with modern medicine, it is not as hard to treat injuries as it once was. It used to be that you'd blow off a couple of the enemy's legs and then have their resources go to keeping them alive. Way easier on the enemies if you just kill the freckers. The room was silent. Well, then, I suppose that that's all you need to know about that. It's a mine. It vomits plasma on everything in front of it. Very deadly. Moving on. The walk was full of whispers and murmurs. Anyways, this is the latest model of the assault technology. GRTX. Assault rifle fires off a single burst of full auto. Each magnetized plasma round contains 15 fifta of energy. Any questions? Good, let's move on. The presenter rushed. Excuse me, one of the journalists interrupted his swift walk to the next platform. Yes? He looks like he wants to say something. The journalist pointed to Mr. Anderson, who at the moment was making a point of examining his shoes. Oh, for f- What is it? Well, I'm not just that much of a fan of plasma weaponry. Sure, they work great against flesh, but typically terrorists make a point of not running around in their birthday suits. I've seen particularly thick cardigans detonate pistol rounds early and end up with only minor burns in the victim. I just doubt that the thing can go through a ceramic body plant. I'm not sure whether to be flattered or insulted. I do believe that you are drastically overestimating our ability to carry something as heavy as ceramic armor for any length of time. True, I suppose. You wanted to move on? Yes, let's. The journalists didn't bother to hide their talk. I am just going to let Mr. Anderson introduce this one, since he seems to know so much about our weapons. The presenter stated jokingly, <laughs> You compliment me. I'm afraid I haven't the slightest clue what this is. Anderson glanced up at the strange lump of metal. Yeah, got nothing. Not so all-knowing after all. This is an energy fuel generator. It'll disperse any plasma projectiles within 15 FPA. Though, it does scramble all electronics inside as well. Great for night ops. Any questions? Will we be given a more in-depth description of these afterwards? You seem to be skipping a lot of details. Of course. All information and documents will be published shortly. As for the information... My apologies, but it is lazy writing. Excuse me? I've got a script, so I don't accidentally reveal something that is classified. Apparently, I can't be trusted enough. Ah, fair enough. 
the next couple of exhibits were fairly similar, until something caught Anderson's eye. I'm sorry, but is that a freaking lightsaber? He gestured to the familiar-looking hilt. Hmm? The presenter grasped the hilt and pressed the big red button. With a swoosh, the gleaming rod of white plasma leapt to the tip. It's great, isn't it? It can deflect plasma bolts and cut through solid steel. Yes, that's the dumbest stuff I think I've ever seen. Sorry. I get that this is a presentation of cool things to raise morale. But come on, that thing is a death trap. There is no safety, no guard, nothing to stop it lopping off your own limb. Plus, no force means good luck moving it fast enough to block a bolt. Plus, there's the energy, the heat, the storage, handling. I could go on for ages. Who decided that this was a good idea? Rather than being incensed at Anderson's tirade, the presenter seemed mildly amused. I believe it was the human ambassador, Bet the head engineer, a tenor, whatever that is, that he couldn't make one. The collected journalist chuckled. Ah, Anderson paused. Yeah, that'll do it. Moving on. He seemed somewhat keen to move on from his misjudgment. So what's that thing? He pointed at what seemed like a predator drone mounted on a platform. That's the latest generation of close air support. Capable of 10 kilowatts of output on a per-pulse laser. It does easily eliminate any hostiles in the area. Guaranteed to be the best CAS in any given battle. Ah, boring. Wait till you've seen a restored A-10 in action. Then tell me that it's the best CAS. If it's something that requires restoration, I can hardly see how it's the most effective tool in today's age. Are you kidding me? The only reason they stopped making them was it cost too damn much to transport the ammo that they chewed through in space. 13mm shells of neatly 4,000 rounds per minute. Good luck surviving that. Plus no fancy plasma engines and whatnot. So 90% of all modern tracking equipment is null. You certainly seem passionate. Tell you what, after all of this you can show me a couple videos and I can decide for myself. Sounds good. Say, is that a tank? Anderson pointed across the room at what seemed to be, well, a tank. Indeed it is. A hover tank, actually. Shut it. The presenter turned back to Anderson as he was about to speak. Whatever you're going to say, shut it. That thing there is the best of the best, top of the line, plasma rail cannon speeds of up to 50R, not affected by terrain. Two coaxial plasma repeaters, and I guarantee that you humans have nothing that can top that. Anderson paused for a bit. You may be correct, if only on a technicality. When we got to space, most of our old hardware was decommissioned. It was mainly used for regional conflicts, and when every country just wrecked off to another planet, skirmishes were few and far between. Besides, it was far too costly to fly a tank across the galaxy. As you know, better off using FTL missiles. I suppose we never got back to the old ways once our FTL got better. And your point is? That's certainly a long speech with no real point. Ah, but you see, my point is that we have nothing now to match that. Say, how well would that fancy heat-conducting armor fare against a tungsten sabot going at Mach 5? Or how would the underside handle a copper lance from an RPG? I'd wager that railgun couldn't go through over a meter of effective armor. The presenter sighed. Very true. You humans always had a knack for overkill. Especially while planet side, one would think that you can never have enough firepower. Ah, that's heresy. One can never have enough, Dakar. Not the GUA-8, or the Shrewa Gustav, or the Saar Bomber, or the Davy Crockett. Nothing. There is no such thing as enough, Dakar. The presenter shook his head. You humans are quite strange. Just you wait until one of our military measuring competitions. That's where the real firepower is at. Well then, allow me to call an intermission. I'll be here chatting with Mr. Anderson. Please feel free with any questions on your mind. And then, my friends, is the end of this Reddit quickie, Man in a Trash Can, written by Regal Legal Eagle. You get up every morning from your alarm clock's warning. Larry nodded at the start of the music, blowing a puff of smoke out of his nostrils, further smoking up the cockpit of his scrubber, hummed and whined as it tried to keep the atmosphere breathable 
despite how much smoke that he'd been pumping out. It was just another day for him collecting trash, and he had no reason to treat it any differently. He shifted his arms to the can, grabbing another hold of defunct satellite, as he began to cut it into smaller pieces with a plasma torch, so they would fit better into his compactor. Plenty of Xeno species had the great fortune to make a very coordinated and orderly entrance into space. The Termic were not one of those species. Their homeworld was ringed in orbital debris from hasty launches into space, followed by several decades of struggling to advance until they were discovered by the Great Galaxy. As unusual as their attempt to better relationships and open up more trade to the hegemony approached, proclaiming humans to be masters of trash cleanup after their own troubled bootstrap launch programs. Of course, all the hegemony's cleanup operations actually meant was a man, a can, and a compactor, which was where Larry came in. He collected the fragments of satellites and boosted a few kilometers from the battered yellow compactor, orbiting near his position, letting the pieces go before the magnetic tractor beam started to reel them in. If everything went well, he'd be done in about a year. Shifting from a short stub of a cigar in his mouth, and he let out another puff of smoke and began to boost off towards the garbage to collect. Overall, the job wasn't too bad. He had his own hours, didn't have to deal with crappy customers or bosses, and when the contract was complete, he'd make damn good money. But until then, he was out here watching the traffic flowing around the cleared lanes to and from the planet. Without a thought in the galaxy for the yellow can, and compactor. He was still looking for the old Tormek space station, orbiter, lifter, or even a full capsule. He'd picked apart some of the old pre hegemony stuff in the asteroid belt back on Sol and had a little collection going. He liked to think of those early pioneers, how brave they must have been, how excited to be the first ones venturing forth into the void. Working as a garbage man was about the closest that he could come to that feeling. All the expeditions were crewed by educated types with degrees. He didn't have one of those. Instead, he had a rock ball scholarship, followed by a busted knee, followed by losing his rock ball scholarship. He could walk fine these days, but he sure couldn't play like he used to. Shrugging off the thought, he glanced at his watch. Another two hours of this and he'd stop for lunch, and then another five hours, and then he'd stop to sleep. Then wake up and start all over again. That was the plan at any rate. Someone had to haul all this trash off to make their planet safer to travel to. He wasn't that someone. As he was chopping up another satellite, however, he saw something jerk into reality, not too far from his position. Mother of God, he muttered, and quickly stabbed the comm button with a grubby finger. Central Control, this is Trash Can, do you read me over? Uh, we read you, Trash Can, over. I'm staring at a Thrasher cruiser, over. The other line was dead silent as they tried to process that, and he stared at the death ship before him. It was sitting there, for now, likely recovering from the skip drive before it would descend upon the planet below. He knew the Tarmac had a defense fleet, somewhere, but he'd heard that they were off running exercises, or monitoring the border, or something. Did you hear me control central? Gotta be at least a class 7 cruiser. What defenders you got around here, over? We don't have anything, trash can. Get out of the way while you still can. We'll start the general alert. Get traffic out of the safe lanes and away from the planet, over. Freck, this thing only has impulse. It would take me another three days to make it to your freaking moon. Damn. He thought it over for a moment and then briefly considered the spirit of the original human pioneers into space. I'll buy you guys whatever time I can. Come again, trash can? You're not Termek, why are you helping? He could hear the shock as he was already turning off the comm to focus. He snapped his harness into place and then boosted forwards towards the cruiser. It was just starting to move once more. Either they didn't notice his little can all they didn't care that he came in hard near the aft of the ship. He grunted as the can gripped onto the hard hull and slammed into it before holding fast. Activating the plasma torch, he began to hastily cut a hole into the plating of the cruiser. 
making a rough circle before clamping a magnetic arm onto the center and jerking it free. He saw a puff of released atmosphere before the thrasher in red combat armor came flying out, slamming off of his can before tumbling into space. The ship shuddered then, and he could feel that the start to slow, trying to veer away from the planet as they realized that they now had an exposed engine compartment. Yeah, try entering the atmosphere now, you wreckers. Larry was about to start cutting away, more plating when he saw that the smaller cannons on the hull were starting to turn his way. Oh damn. He lifted a chunk of the hull to one of these arms as a shield, boosting up towards the cannon while trying to keep it from being locked on. There was a flash as the cannon fired and then part of his arm jerked towards his cockpit, but the sounds were muted heavily in the depths of space. He could see the dent in the armored plating, but it looked like a cannon wasn't powerful enough to pierce it. Or at least, not one shot. He took the can left and right to make it harder for the gunners to look at a lock. Thinking back on the days racing across the rockball field, of course, back then the other enforcers weren't shooting at him. There was another flash and a muted report of the cannon, but the chunk of hull that he was using as a shield held steady. Finally, he was next to the cannon and he released the magnet arm and let the hull float free as he instead latched onto the cannon. The plasma torch quickly cut through the barrel of the cannon before he began to cut a hole in the top of the gun. Yanking the plating free, he saw another puff of released atmosphere and another thrasher go tumbling off into the void. He tilted his can up looking inside of the gun emplacement before quickly using a mag arm to grab one of the HE rounds that he saw inside. There was a much bigger cannon at least ahead of him down the hall, and he saw it aiming up before a much bigger flash of light made him grunt and blink away the spots in his vision. Looking past the gun he realized that they were firing at a civilian traffic trying to free. Not today you freckers. Larry growled out and began to boost towards the bigger gun. He didn't see any smaller turrets able to be focusing on his little trash can, which was nice, and he had made it a much bigger gun and latched onto the base just in time for there to be another bright flash, this time able to hear the gun firing more clearly. If he simply popped open the big gun, they could likely get it working again, so instead he moved his trash can up the barrel jamming the HE round into it and then hastily welding it into place, praying that they couldn't tell. He was turning to boost away when he heard a plink, plink, crick, and saw the crack of the cockpit before the smoke began to get sucked towards it. Oh, damn. He spat out his cigar, reaching back to grab his helmet, which he'd hastily jammed onto his head. Sealing up his suit, once he was sealed in, he slapped the emergency vent and released all the little oxygen that he had left in the cockpit, before the glass shattered under the pressure. Looking outside, he saw thrashers on the hull with rifles firing at his can. He could hear the plinking noise and began to see warning lights flash. He was pulsing away from the side of the sabotage turret, trying to get behind the cruiser's conning tower. The explosion was more fault than heard, and his can suddenly tumbled and the galaxy spun around him as his can slammed into the base of the tower. Groaning at the force of the impact, he unfastened his harness and grabbed his emergency oxygen tank in the cockpit, slapping it into place on his back and hearing the magnets guide him into position. Then he grabbed his handheld torch and popped the hatch before pulling himself free. It wasn't often that he was out in the darkness himself, but here he was now clinging onto the wreck of a hull of a thrasher cruiser. The larger cannon that he'd sabotaged had been blown completely free and he could see more dead thrashers bouncing off the hull. Taken out by the blast, looking up at the conning tower he began to climb, seeing the civilian traffic far off in the distance flee the now wounded cruiser. He wasn't sure what else he could do, but he'd promised to buy them as much time as he could, and that's what he'd do. As he climbed up the conning tower, he stopped just beneath the bridge. He slipped around the back and then carefully made his way towards one of the side windows. They hadn't sealed them for combat for some reason, probably because the thrashers loved watching the victims die in real time. Sadistic bastards. There were five inside the bridge, and they hadn't seen him yet. 
two were arguing while the others manned the terminals. He looked down at the torch in his hands for a moment and then nodded. Quickly lowering his face shield to protect his eyes, he turned the torch on. Seeing them all snap their heads around and he began to cut a circle in the steel glass viewport. He had just finished before he gave them all the finger and smashed the circle with his elbow. This time instead of a small puff of steady stream, the atmosphere began to get sucked out into space and one of the thrashes with it yet again. Then another. He could see one of the other gripping onto the console, reaching for some sort of switch before the finally the metal plating began to slide down over the viewports. A third thrasher was getting sucked out of the metal cut the Xeno in half and Larry watched the quickly crystallizing blood droplets spray out of the remains. Down below he saw more thrashers start to exit the airlocks, rifles in hands, and he knew that it was time for him to go. He climbed on top of the conning tower and looked around for anything that he could possibly see. Off in the distance in a clutter of orbital debris he saw a circle. Circles were rare. He couldn't be sure about it, but he didn't have a choice and jumped as hard as he could, letting his momentum take him away from the cruiser before he activated his suit's nav thrusters, watching the fuel gauge very carefully as he had to avoid some debris until he got closer to the circle. It was a station! Now, to see that lucky he was, he straightened his approach and slowed down with his thrusters as he got into the airlock. All the writing was in Termic, but he had learned enough to get this job done. Twisting on the emergency release in the outer door opened with a grinding wheeze before he slipped inside and then began to use the manual crank to get it closed. That done, he had to pull the oxygen tank free on his back and release just enough for the old computer to figure out the atmosphere was nearly equal. He saw the green light on the panel just cranked the inner door open before he slipped inside and shut it behind him. That done, he pulled his helmet free and began to laugh. The entire incident had taken him about 20 to 30 minutes and here he was likely to his final resting place. He finally stopped laughing and looked at one of the panels to check the oxygen levels in the station. He had maybe 5 hours if he took it slow. What then? What were the chances anyone knew that he was here? The cruiser was still there and while he'd done damage to it and slowed it down, it was still active. He shrugged. He'd done all he could. Pulling a cigar out of his one suit pockets, he chomped the end off of it, spitting it out and gripping the cigar with his teeth before pulling out an old lighter. He loved the distinct clink that it made before it snapped the front and began to puff away to get the cigar going. It probably wasn't a good idea to cut down his oxygen supply by smoking, but he was dead anyways, right? Once he had the cigar going, he wandered through the station to find another terminal and smiled as he found it. Pulling out a small device from his suit, he plugged it in and began to fiddle with the controls until he could hear the broadcast ringing out around the station. It started with a guitar and then drums and then finally, living easy, living free, season tickets on a one-way ride, asking nothing, leave me be, take everything in my stride. Don't need reason, don't need rhyme, ain't nothing that I'd rather do. Going down, party time. My friends, what are we gonna do? And then he began to sing along with the chorus. I'm on a highway to hell. On a highway to hell. Highway to hell. I am on a highway to hell. End of story. White Collar Bloody Knuckles Written by Regal Legal Eagle Angie sighed as she glanced through her emails. Another couple joke forwards from the other partners about where to buy women's clothes and how to apply makeup. They were always so childish. Then again, it had been her choice to move to a planet far from a high gravity home of Kearns. At 1.2 normal Earth gravities, everyone who lived here was a product of their environment. Shorter, stockier, more muscular, and, according to her dating profile inbox, not sought after by the residents of Teresa. At 5'5", five five, she was actually fairly tall for a Kearns colonist, but she was dwarfed in height by most of the other partners of the firm, especially because they wore heels while she didn't. No one from a high-gravity planet wore heels, not even the drag queens, 
So, while many of the other partners scoured the big clients with millions or billions of credits and had wonderful nights being chauffeured around in the elite hegemony society, Angie worked the smaller cases. Her track record was better than any of the other partners, but her success only counted for so much amongst the shallow Tarithan upper class. Truthfully, Angie didn't mind it all that much. She believed that her hard work and perseverance would pay off sooner or later. Already, she'd gotten a scholarship from a heavy industry colony to a law school, graduated with honors, and was the youngest partner in the firm. The others could socialize and mingle all they wanted because one day she'd be their boss. She smiled at the thought for a moment before noticing another new email that wasn't a joke. Possibly. Prince Hiram Octobro Junilia Consec Runema the 16th wanted to speak to her about something private and requested a meeting. Angie quickly searched the name to see if someone in the office was putting her leg. No picture to the name came up in the local article. One of the visiting dignitaries from the Fezek deliberation. Perhaps her time had really come early. She quickly replied that she was looking forward to his meeting and sent her secretary a notice to expect a potential client. Seeing as she had no idea when the prince might show up, she figured she'd simply work until she heard anything. Several hours later, she saw a notification on a terminal that the prince had arrived. She needed to wrap up this call, but she was having trouble with that as she held her face in her hands. Because you're a mob boss, Tomika. It doesn't matter if the cops can't prove it in a court of law. They're still going to operate with the assumption that you're committing crimes. That's how it works. They think you're in charge and you're trying to bring you down, while you try to keep them from being caught. Why am I explaining this to you? I just don't see why they're always searching my private yacht when I send my kids out on a vacation and whatnot. It's harassment, I'm telling you. Domico, that's called customs. All ships have to go through it. If you want to know why they're extra careful when it's your ship, it's because they think you might use your kids as vacation as a cover for smuggling. Angie sighed. Domico was currently her best client. At the fact that she hated. Oh... That's actually not a bad idea. Thanks for the tip. No, don't do that. They're looking for it. Damn it, Domica, how the hell have you avoided getting caught? Because I got the best attorney in town. You know I'm always looking out for you. Ever since you first got my legitimate business partner out of that hot water. Angie shifted her hands and rubbed her eyes now that she thought back to her first big case in Teritha. For the last time, Domico, I had no idea that contractor was working for the mob, and stopped saying legitimate all the time. It sounds suspicious. Yeah, that was a great case too, all legitimate and what not. I appreciate the hard work as always, and I don't know what I'd do without you. He was clearly ignorant that her advice of the word illegitimate. Is that because you honestly can't imagine it, or because every time I try to quit you threaten to burn down my apartment? Allegedly. This isn't a courtroom, Domico. I have to go now. I've got another client. And she growled out. Before she could even end the call through, he added, I'll send you another case of them donuts you like. I always got your back, kid. And she ended the call with a drawn-out groan. One time, one time, that she'd mentioned that she really liked the Tarithan donuts, and that's all her clients bring these days. Angie sighed and then got up before walking to her private washroom. She didn't wear makeup like the other partners, but she needed to look good for the prince. Her short amber hair was neat and tidy and her black suit with crimson tie was immaculate. And as she opened up her mouth and inspected her teeth, she didn't see any food that she'd missed. Even so, she took a moment to smooth her hair for a moment and just shake out her limbs as she relaxed and got back into the proper mindset. Leaning forward against the countertop, she looked at her reflection. You're fierce, you're strong, you're the best. With a nod, she straightened up and walked out into her office and pressed the button to signal her secretary to let the possible client in. Soon, the door opened and a figure in a rather plain robe walked into the room. She was a little surprised that the prince would wear something so plain until she noticed the black wand being pulled out of the robe's sleeve. She watched the figure quickly walk the perimeter of her office, waving the wand around. 
compared to her other partner's offices. It was a rather small, but with a wood panelling and a view of the Kursky Park, she was more than happy with it. Once the figure had walked the room and just nodded at Angie and then stepped out. Only then did her actual client step in. Angie wasn't normally one much for Zenos, but this one was easy on the eyes. He was tall and slim, wearing a white uniform covered in ribbons and fancy gold epaulets that fit a noble prince. The saber on his hip looked fancy as well, but hardly anyone actually dueled these days. Hardly anyone in the hegemony, at least. His face was covered in a light cold fur and a large triangular ears and short snout. The rest of his body was covered in a uniform except for a bushy, striped black and gold tail. When his blue eyes focused on her, she finally spoke up. Prince Renema, I'm Angie. She stepped forward and extended her hand, only to have him stare at her for a moment. Obviously confused. Extend your hand, she said and waited for him to awkwardly hold out his hand. She gripped it and gave him a firm shake before letting go. What brings you to my office? Ah. Uh... The prince looked at his hand for a moment before looking back up at her. I wanted to discuss the possibility of hiring your services. Of course, have a seat. She waved him over to the leather chairs in front of her desk and walked around to her side. Before she sat down, though, she pulled out an elaborately decorated mahogany box, extending it to him as she opened it. Cigar, cigarette. Most Zenos love tobacco, which is why the hegemony was so careful to keep a monopoly on the stuff. Oh, no thank you. I cough too much. They arched a brow and before shrugging and put it away, then taking out her own seat. So why does the prince of a foreign nation need the services of a hegemony lawyer? Not just any lawyer. You. I've read reports from your work and watched a few court recordings. You're the most impressive. He leaned back and then he shifted to try to find the best way to position his saber while on the chair. Why do you want my services then, she corrected. Ah, because I'm going to get married soon. She noticed a slight look of fear across his face as she mentioned that. Congratulations, I'd normally guess that you want to establish a prenup, but since you're a prince, I suspect that that's not the case. After all, a hegemony prenup wouldn't hold weight in a royal fixed court. That's correct, he nodded as she stared at him. For a moment, while well, he shifted in his chair until finally he decided to remove the sword belt and leaned it against the desk. Then he leaned back, finally comfortable. I need you to rescue me. Angie stared at the smiling prince as she tried to work out what to say. I'm sorry, there might be a translation issue here. You need me to rescue you. You're sitting in my office. It doesn't look like you're being held captive. Oh, yes, I see your point. I need to hire you as a hero in return with me to a delegation to sue my family for my freedom to not be married. He nodded, then while she arched her brow in confusion. You want me to sue the royal family of the Fexet Empire? Is that correct? I have suspicions that it won't work. For one, I'm hedging me a lawyer and not a very familiar with Fexet law. On top of that, it's a royal family. Can't they just toss the case out? What's wrong with your betrothed anyway? She's a Kirschmid. The flesh-eating beetles? Yes. My family thinks that the marriage would strengthen our nations for the coming war with the Protectorate. However, I've recently learned that the Kirschmids often eat their mates when they're done, well, mating. He looked both disgusted and worried at the prospect. Yes, I could see how that might spoil the honeymoon. Angie muttered, let's get back for a moment. You said you need a hero, but I'm a lawyer. Oh, well, there isn't a better term for it in human. Our language is referred to as English, she corrected. Yes, sorry, it's difficult keeping all the languages straight in my head. I'm glad that you're so understanding of my mistakes. His English was probably better than hers, aside from the minor mistakes that here and there. But she didn't tell him that. A hero is a legal position. Sort of a champion or a representative for court. Ah, well, hero in English is a singular masculine term. You do know that I'm not a male, yes? With her stout build and muscles, few Xenos, and even some of the humans had mistaken her for a male over the years. Why would I think otherwise? Stout features, strong, muscular frame, aggressive attitude. Those are all female characteristics, aren't they? 
The prince tilted his head, seeming a little confused by her question, which left Angie to try and decide if it was some incredibly elaborate joke being pulled by the other partners, or if she just needed to hone up on the physics physiology. For now, she kept believing him. Well, the proper term then would be a heroin. Isn't that a type of drug? He asked and tilted his head again. Not that it would be a heroin, heroin, a heroin. She carefully enunciated each word for him to better understand. Well then, you are the heroine that I desire, he smiled. She closed her eyes and shook her head for a moment as she tried to sort through the conversation. Let me see if I'm understanding you correctly. You want to hire me as a heroine to sue your family into letting you not marry a flesh-eating beetle. Yes, that's correct. If you're worried about our court system, it's not all that different. There's a judge and defense and a prosecution. You argue with your points and the judge makes a decision. And as I have watched some of your trials, you carry yourself with much confidence and conviction. You'd be perfect. Well, as a human, I strongly agree with the idea that a person should be free to choose who they marry. This all sounds like it's a bit out of my league. I insist that it's not. However, you'd need to return with me today to the embassy, as if they discover my absence, they'll make sure not to let me sneak out again, and won't let you enter without me as your escort. Angie shook her head. Now this really sounds like a bit much. I have no idea what sort of trial to expect. I don't have any documents prepared, plus I certainly don't have a defense planned. I should point out that as one of the oldest princes, I legally own several planets and a small fleet. If you represent me, you'd have incredible riches at your disposal to cover any legal fees, and then some. While well, there will be many other resources that I can promise you as a direct 100 million credit bonus for winning the case. Angie pressed the button on her terminal and opened up the line to her secretary. Tina, if anyone calls me, then tell them I'll be out of the office for the rest of the day. She then stood up and motioned for the door. Let's not keep your family waiting then, shall we? The prince smiled and stood, fastening his saber to his uniform belt. You're a natural born heroine. This is so exciting, like a classical fairy tale where the distressed prince is saved by a strong barbarian from the wastes. Angie swore on every god that could hear her that if this was some sort of practical joke, she'd be punching people in the face. As they walked out of the office and through the main lobby of the office, they were joined by the prince's silent companion in the plain robe, while the others stared at her in surprise. She just smiled at their shock. Yes, that's right, I'm the one who got hired by a crown prince. Not any of you. They were doing an exceptional job of hiding it if they were messing with her. Soon, they were out of the office and walking through Kursky Park. The consulates were just across the park from her office, but she'd never actually been there. So anything I need to know about what's going to happen? She asked as they walked along gently, curving paths that led through the Manicure Gardens. My mother will protest, of course. The royal visor will take her side in the trial. If everything goes well, however, the trial will be over in a few hours. A few hours? That doesn't give me much time to formulate a defense, had you protested. I'm telling you that once you're in the midst of the trial, it'll become naturally. You've got all the instincts already. Besides, I'm the one who's really at risk if you lose, Angie shrugged a little, conceding his point. Soon, they were through the park and approaching the impressive estate that served as a Fexic consulate. It looked like one of the museums of her partners visited to mingle with their clients. There was a very stout-looking guard in front of the entrance that looked very different from the prince. In fact, they looked so much more like Angie herself, stout and muscular. Their eyes were also more rounded and their tails tucked in stripes than the prince had. The gleaming laser pikes that they held were old-fashioned, but they shock guns in their belts were brand new. They looked a little confused as the prince walked up the stairs and to the entrance to the consulate, but didn't stop him. Once they were inside, he shouted something in his own language, which got the attention of various vexics around them and many gasps. Then it was a whirlwind of activity that completely confused Angie. None of them were speaking in English, but she kept getting unsured around with the prince. She met with some doctors who ran a quick scan on her and some officials in her uniforms, not quite as fancy as the prince's. 
and then the royal family itself. The entire time she just stood by the prince, listening to them growl and yell back and forth in a language that she didn't understand. What she did finally understand was why he wasn't fazed by her appearance. The queen and the other females of the royal family were all stocky and muscular, their rounded ears and stripedless tails and indicating their gender, apparently. She was so used to dealing with the humans that she totally forgot plenty of other species had very distinct gender dysmorphias. Either way, just like he'd said, the queen was angry, and the other nobility was shocked, but seemed to agree with something that the prince was saying. Eventually, she was face to face with a fexic that was wearing some sort of leather armor. She had gray fur but blue paint drawn down the patterns along her exposed arms and legs. The Grand Visor, apparently, as the prince had finally started to translate. Before the trial begins, you're allowed to choose how to proceed. If you want to change your attire or to get any objects for the defense. My attire? This is the only suit I've got. You made this seem like an urgent so I came along. I don't even have my briefcase, papers, or tablet, so I'll just have to make do with my wits, I suppose. The prince spoke to the others while gasps and murmurs, which made her feel like this was several things that she wasn't being told. Very traditional, they respect that, the prince said with a nod. Then he led her down some stairs, and they were soon in a circular pit with a sandy floor. Nobles were taking seats up, up above, and the pit where there were very old-looking Fexic women who shuffled out into the massive throne. The queen only got to sit next to her, so perhaps the old woman was the judge. Where are we? And she asked, and she looked up at the Xenos. We're in court. I wish you luck. He patted her shoulder and quickly left while she looked around the sandy pit in confusion, as the visor soon joined her, now wearing a set of simple clothing instead of the armor from earlier. The court is now in session, the old woman on top whispered out, but her voice was projected by the speakers set into the walls. As the defense for the royal family, the visor argues first. She nodded and the visor nodded back. Angie was expecting them to explain how this would all work, but instead she turned to face the viner's Zeno, punching her in the face. The royal family is beholden to the interests of the people. Angie staggered back before recovering, and then quickly ducking under the other's swing. The visor growled and then quickly darted forward and landed a body blow to Angie's stomach, making her gasp out. The emotions of an individual prince are not grounds for changing the foreign relations. Angie pulled her arms up and started blocking the incoming blows. But even though she was blocking the attacks from doing so much, it allowed the visor to keep talking. Our empire operates in the interest of strengthening its people and extending its borders. Our traditions date back centuries. No member of the Hedgemi holds the title based on heritage and as such offers no benefits to the royal family. This heroine shall be dispatched, the prince shall submit, and the marriage with the Kishmids shall continue. And she panted a bit as the visor pulled back her ribs hurt, but there was some blood dripping from her lips and her arms were sore from trying to block those punches. But more importantly, she was angry. The prosecution is now free to argue, the old fixic murmured. Angie darted forward, arms up, as she feigned a straight jab, waiting for the visor to tense for it, only to surprise her by kicking her in the shin. As the Zeno stumbled a bit, Angie did actually follow through with a punch, feeling her first glance against the visor's cheek. How can the royal family claim to operate the best interests of their people if they force their own children into political unions devoid of choice or concern? As the visor staggered back and pulled her own arms in defense, Angie quickly followed with delivering two quick hooks to the Xeno's ribs. Furthermore, the reason the Hedgemi does not have hierarchy titles is because this was found to result in inbreeding and stagnation of a small elite held almost all the power. The Hegemi believes in equality and titles based on ability. Angie lined herself up for a jab and noticed the visor shifting, expecting another kick. So instead, she just leaned all into it, punching the visor's raised hand hard enough to make the visor essentially hit herself in the face. Tradition and force are not effective methods of rooting. The visor staggered back more and Angie followed up by punching her in the stomach. Freedom is the only path to modern productive and a happy society.
the visor was reeling and Angie wanted to end this. It was time to really show them not to mess with a woman born and raised on a high-gravity planet. A woman who worked out in high-gravity gym every day to make sure that she didn't lose her muscle tone. She gripped the visor's hand, pulling them away from her face before Angie tilted her head back and smashed her head forward into the visor's knot. The Zeno's head snapped back and Angie felt a distinct crunch, and she saw blood fly from the Zeno's nose. As the visors hit the sandy floor of the court, clearly unconscious, Angie shouted, Therefore my client should be free to marry who he wants. The prosecution rests. She was panting a bit and feeling aggressive and still on edge. Does the defense have any further arguments? The old Zeno up top asked. And as the unconscious wiser clearly did not respond, she said, The defense rests. I find in favor of the prosecution. The prince has made his decision. Angie could hear the gasps and murmurs of the noble up top as the queen rose and stomped off. Soon, though, the door opened and the prince rushed out into the court, hugging Angie. That was incredible. I told you, you, you were amazing. No one has defeated the visor in a single round before. You saved me from my evil mother. Angie was grinning now, carried away in the moment. Yeah, I showed her how humans practice law. This was the greatest trial that I've ever been in. So, you'll be my heroine for life then? Yeah, sure. Excellent. We'll have the wedding immediately. I can't believe I got you for a wife. I promised to be the best husband possible. Yeah, and she grinned at the words hit her. Wait, what? End of story. The Spark, written by Regal Legal Eagle. Urga 4535. I stared down at the words on the side of the wall. Why did they even bother painting it up there in the first place? Where else would they go? Who was leaving this place? A planetoid this size was most efficiently mined with 3,000 miners. And so, 3,000 miners they had. No more, no less. With just enough families around them to keep the population where it needed to be. The Archaid Empire wasn't interested in ferrying slaves around if they didn't have to. The current number of miners was even displayed on the most of the walls, a constant reminder that when the number dropped, more were expected to pick up the tools and get to work. Day in, day out. You work the mines just long enough to die, and then you get replaced. Mine collapse, industrial accidents, ghost lung, all being beat to death by an angry overseer. The calls made no difference to the Archaid so long as the quotas were met and the populations remained stable. There was something like 1,500 Tomex since the sightless bugs didn't need lights to get around in the mines, then roughly 100 Kershaks and Bershaks since the symbiotic creatures were strong but good Bershaks lived three times as long, meaning that the Archaeids could recycle many of the parasites with new hosts and get new miners when the experience with the old one. I'm not as familiar with the last 499, however. The Archaeids had just conquered some new nation of a mixed races, so I was still getting to know them. But the last one, number 3000, that was Dad, him, and Doc were only two other humans that I knew. Not much was left of the one race brave and stupid enough to stand against the Archaeid, pirates, criminals, and miners. That's all there remained. I sighed softly, as I started to wander the halls of level 2 while waiting for Dad to finish up with Doc. They'd have to move quickly after they wanted to get the mess hall, and I hated level 2. Storage, machine shop, and Doc's med bay, it was always, always quiet. Much preferred staying on level 3 or 4 where everyone else was. Being the only human kid hadn't made me stand out, but I knew how to make friends. Lately, though, my friends had been avoiding me. I knew why, though. All of the Archaeids had to say about humans and how dangerous human adults were, how often they were degenerate murderers, and how they tortured and committed acts of mass violence. It always seemed like they just didn't want any species muscling in on their turf. Besides, it had to be crap. Doc and Dad were two of the nicest people on the station. Everyone looked to them for help and guidance. No human was allowed in a management position in the mine, but everyone knew that Kist and Nrp were stumped they'd give Dad a visit. Plus, Doc was human. Somehow, he'd gotten a real education. Knew lots about the Xenos and medicine and the like. 
and the Archaeids normally didn't let slaves have a doctor, but this way their station was more efficient, which meant Taskmasters got more commendations, which made him happy. What was taking so long? I was tired of waiting. Whenever I was alone with my thoughts, I got angsty. I pushed open the door to Doc's office just as Dad coughed and I saw a grey cloud of escaped his lips. Doc turned away, even though he had protective mask on. No! The two looked and saw me standing at the door. Son, Dad got up, buttoning up his shirt. I told you to wait outside. You've got the ghost lung. I couldn't be right. Dad wouldn't get the lung. He couldn't. I didn't need you finding out. Doc, how bad is it? I looked at the Doc for answers. Don't tell him, Doc, Dad growled. He's got to know, the Doc said, looking at my dad to me. He's been hiding it very well for a while, but it's bad. He doesn't have long if he stays in the mine. Then I'll have to take his place. No, you're seventeen. You're not ready. For what? For working to death in the mines. Why am I not ready for? I've seen the work. I know it won't be easy, but I can do it. We had this argument plenty of times before. No, Dad growled, and then began to cough and wheeze furiously. More puffs of grey smoke coming out. Doc! You can't let him go back down there. I won't, I won't, Doc smoothed. Your father needs time to rest anyway. I'll tell the overseers that he's suffering from several minor fractures and you're taking over until he's better. That will keep them from questioning it, and I can keep an eye on him before they find out that he's got the lung. Go on, off to dinner now. Get some sleep. You know where to go in the morning. The entire trip to Sector 3, I wasn't thinking much about anything. I was just worried about Dad and working on figuring out something. I really don't know what I was thinking about. Not much of anything. Did I really notice that? When they dumped that slop on my tray, I was just kept moving. Not even thinking to nod in response to those talking to me. Rissom and Old Horners, and they probably tried to talking, but I was soon off on my own. Shoveling in the slop, as I couldn't get anything going through my mind. Somehow, I made it back to the room without remembering what happened in the mess hall, or how I'd been able to move on my feet. I just sat on my bed looking at the tiny window into the mine entrance down below. Night shift was out there. Like usual, the clouds and dust blocked the stars, but I could see that the mine entrance was bright and clear. I must have dozed off while staring, because the next thing I knew, things were starting to get light and the bell was ringing. I grabbed my set of steels, wasn't like there were any other kind of shoes that would fit a human like me. Vest, hard hat, light, tea flask, and a rock bread. The line for the child was too long for my taste, and as nervous as I was, I didn't think that I could keep it down anyway. I headed out into the mines with most of the old crowd. Those who didn't eat morning chow either, for one reason or another. I could feel their eyes on me. Everyone wanted to ask why I was here, but no one did. When the door opened outside and I quickly wrapped the cloth around my face, but put my head down, jogging across the open, stopping before I got ran over by one of the massive drone haulers, and then moving once again and when they'd rumbled past. At the mine entrance I saw one of the red power suit guards, and he was holding a data slate, and looked from me to it. You, boy, why are you here? Doc is looking after my dad. Some fractures need to heal. You haven't taken training yet. I don't need it. I was born to dig. That's all humans are good for, right? The guard laughed and I could see his mandibles within his helmet twitch at the same time. I'm glad we killed the fight out of you, you miserable vermin. Get in the mine then, where you belong. He waved me past and I held my tongue, venturing down into the deep. Mines, day one. Cause came to talk to me personally, and I think that he knew about my dad, but never dared say anything. He tried to get me into some light detail, but the Archaeid overseers heard that I was down here, and made sure I was sent straight down to the bottom. Not just that, but down to vein 485, with all the Tormac miners. I was the only one with the light and need to see. They were all well-meaning, but spending the shift with miners hearing and feeling things chitter and move around in the dark all around me. Well, there were some deep shivers in my bones that had nothing to do with the cold. Of course, the other effect was that I stood out like a sore thumb, 
to the overseer, so whenever there was a slowdown, who do you think got the lash? It was set to low, but I felt the sting four times, and I was tired of it after the first. The others worked harder, though, seeing me take their punishment, which just meant that the overseer got more production from less work on his part, as if whipping me was work at all. I never thought I'd be glad, as I got a slot for that night, and as soon as my head hit the pillow, I was out. Day 7 Doc says that he's not sure how to get the meds that he needs for the dad better without drawing notice. Says he'll do what he can. So far, they don't really care. I think we've only got about a month before they actually start asking questions. Otherwise, another long day in the dark. I'm down to two lashes a day now. When I hear or see the others struggling, I'll quickly pick up my own pace, or even step up to help them. That way, we don't actually slow down, but he gets less excuse to use the whip. I wish we had more water. The mine dust leaves everything in my mouth feeling gritty. Day 12. Kisk said that I was doing so good that the overseers couldn't keep me in vain 485. They moved me to 487 and into more light. The problem is that the new guys, there's three, maybe four species I don't know so well. They're not great miners. Ten lashes today and I swear none of the offenses were my fault. But they like whipping humans. We can take more punishment, and we were the only ones who gave them trouble back when we were united species, with a nation of our own and planets and the like. I'll see what I can do with them into shape. Day 16. I saw the taskmaster today, and I knew that he was big, but uh, seeing is different than imagining. Beat three of the new species to death. I'm not sure it was their fault that the jaw broke. I'm really not. But that doesn't matter to him, of course. Just grab them and, well, beat them to death. Screaming and ranting about mistakes costing the quotas and the like. He doesn't wear a helmet like the others. I think he enjoys seeing everyone quake in fear at the sight. The scars, those teeth, and that ugly mug in general. I didn't get lashed today. They were too busy yelling at the others. I wasn't allowed near the real tools yet, but the lads pick like always. Either way, a day without lashes is nice. Tomorrow with three fresh faces and I suspect a lot more lashes. Day 18. My muscles have started to grow, I think. I hurt a lot, and on the day off a week we get, I just rest and sleep. But maybe as I keep at it, things will change. A couple friends come by, and their parents seem to think that working in the mines means that I'm not a threat. But I don't have any energy to really do much. They talk about what's been going on and what I've missed. I hope none of them are selected for the mine. Yusin said that the Zeno that I saw likes some guy. The others tried to keep him quiet, but I just laughed. Sure, she looked cute, but she's not human. I realize now that it doesn't matter. Even without the ghost on my dad's old, and so is Doc. I'll be the last human alive on this stupid rock, sooner or later. Day 21 it's been three weeks now. If they say this is the fastest anyone's been moved up from pick to a shoulder draw, it's heavy, but I can use it and fix it on my own. No team required. The overseer can't argue with my efficiency. The battery pack also means no more lashes. Small favors, though, since the damn thing is hot. Day 31. Been busy. Work, eat, sleep. Just about all I can do is string along thoughts to get from one thing to another. Two Gavins last week. None in my section. I've been telling him which way to dig. Not like officially, of course. Just saying things like, I'm gonna dig this way. And I got a good feeling about it, and I'm no enough to follow my lead. Doc says that Dad's tests are looking better, which is good. He didn't cough once while we spoke, just tried to tell me all the stuff he's been said a million times. I'll ask us to let me know when I'm doing fine. Day 45. Another cave-in. Something's pushing Taskmaster, and I don't know what. Two more beat to death and on top of who we lost in the cave-in. I hope, like crazy, that I don't see any of my friends in here tomorrow. Day 46. Hagern, the poor stupid bastard. Why you? I talked to Nisran and got him assigned to a work crew. He's a Tiskrex battery keeper. Gotta keep an eye on him. Day 52. Doc says that they're starting to ask questions about Dad. He tried to play it off like I was just taking his place, but they weren't having it. 
It's their call if someone can retire, and they're not letting my dad retire. Something about quotas. Then the taskmaster is really getting some orders about cranking up production. Day 63 Dad says, I've really fallen out in the last two months. I have to agree that the work has made me strong. Not strong enough to keep from being tired all the time, but still, I'm getting better. Not good enough to save her gun from getting lashed, though. I keep telling him to pay more attention, to keep focus on the pack at all times. He just doesn't quite get it. I feel bad, but I'm not getting whipped because I'm doing my work and then some. Day 75. Dad finally had to come back down. Nurseman and Chris somehow convinced the overseers to let him have a minor duties. He's basically guiding the vein digs now. You'll meet those damn coaches, all right. Day 80. Production is up. We're doing good. No cave-ins. Quotas are being met. That's all it took for him to get us back on track. See them try and say that humans are worthless now. Day 90. Why are we here on our day off? I asked Dad as we were up in the main hollow before I'd head out to the vein. I want you to go with the blasting team. Watch how they work, where they place the charges. They've got you slated for demolitions work soon, and I prefer you watch it happen before they give you anything. That'll go boom. What? Afraid? Then I'll use it to make my escape. <laughs> Let me just stuff it in my pants, and I'll use it to blast off this rock. We laughed, and we shook our head before I saw the crester waving at me across the way. I dodged one of the drone haulers and made it over to them before looking back and seeing the taskmaster next to my dad. I froze. Where had he come from? The massive Xeno spoke to Dad and I kept watching. Don't cough. Don't cough. The taskmaster was nodding about something. Was he actually going to let Dad become a real foreman? The things that we could dig up if we had really had in charge. Maybe it would be a good thing that the taskmaster had someone pushing him on. Then one of the drone haulers drove past and partially dusted the load and I saw Dad cough. The fog came out not as bad as before, but... No, no! I started running forwards, before I felt Cresta and his team pull me back out of the way from the next drone hauler. I saw the taskmaster pull his firearm free, just as my dad looked up. No! The drone hauler blocked them from sight, but I heard the echo of a shot, and once it passed I saw my father's body crumpled on the floor of the mine. I pulled free of the cruise grip, running across just before the next hauler hit me. I was making noises, but I couldn't consciously tell what I was doing when I was trying to say. As I got close to something hit me in the gut, and I collapsed just feet from my father's body. I tried to reach out for him, pull myself closer, but strong metal hands were pulling me away. I was crying, sobbing, tears and snot running down my face, and this dust and dirt got stuck to it all. I was hauled up at two guards as I was kept out of reach of my dad. Very disappointing. I thought you came down to start learning more skills, to improve yourself and to make a bid against a signed mate. But instead it seems that you were trying to hide this weakness. I looked up the taskmaster, vision blurry with tears confused by his words. How very extremely irritating. He leaned down screaming in my face. I had plans for him, plans for you. And now a waste. He didn't have time to teach you everything, and the quotas won't stop. I didn't see the backhand coming at me, but I felt the pain searing across my face as his talons tore into my flesh. Blood, no mixing with tears. You pathetic wretches are always such a disappointment. I was in shock. I couldn't think. I just felt pain. Pain, sadness. No anger. Not yet. Take him to the doctor. I won't punish him for his father's weakness but I won't reward him. No more days off. You're either working a vein or learning a new skill. I'm tired of the old rules. You'll learn quickly if you don't want these others to suffer for your mistakes. The taskmaster waved dismissively as the guards began to drag me back towards the surface. I saw the incineration team moving forwards towards my father's body. They weren't willing to risk letting the ghost tank spread. I don't really remember much else that day. Doc patched me up, but I had scars for sure. While I was getting tended to in the mint bay, one of the guards brought up a small steel container and handed it to me. On the one on the side was written, A reminder. It was my father's ashes. You don't need the old room now. You're staying on this level, room 13, the guard growled. That's just a closet, I heard the dog protest, but I was staring at the container. 
He needs nothing more than a bed and books we give him. Taskmaster says you learn quick, or the others suffer. On the wall I could see the minor count, 2,999. Day 120. It's been a month since. Day 132. It's a day off and I'm reading more manuals and books about mining and gear. It's my birthday. I'm alone in the closet that is now my bedroom. Happy birthday to me. I'm 18. An adult. Day 145. I'm the best blaster there is, bar none. And the others won't work with me anymore, though. They say I'm too dangerous. And they're probably right, but it gives me time to be alone. Day 167. I nearly killed myself. I was careless. I knew it was too close to the seam, and I brought down a lot of ore. But I was trapped in the dark for four hours while they dug me out. I sort of hoped that I might just suffocate, but they did get me out. The overseer's only remark? Good job. There's a lot of ore back to work. I get it now. I don't want to die. I want them to die. I'm done. I'm not going to live out my life like this. I'm just not. Day 193. Most of my friends are in the mines. I don't care anymore. I'll free them soon. The overseer says that I'm working harder than ever. I can fix machines, guide drills, and blow open new paths like a Beshik at the end of his days. I told him that I was born to do this. What? I plan next I was not born to do, but I will do it. I've been studying, I've been reading, and I've been planning. One day a week, I get three hours of the old side tunnel near the surface. I lie about what I'm doing, but they don't care anyway. I'm digging with just the last pick, and I'm getting close to the maintenance room beneath the arcade quarters. A fraction of the number the rest of us with three times the space and all of the accommodations that they desire. They're getting soft. They're getting lazy. Day 243. Been so damn busy. Getting closer to my goal. Gotta be careful now. I can't trust anyone. I've seen them get beaten to death, whipped to shreds, and they won't stand up. They all think Archaeids are invincible. They're wrong. The Archaeids are always so careful about their whips and weapons in their building. Why would they need those? We've got mining tools. They'll learn soon. Day 289. I wanted to show the others our tormentors are not immortal. It was perfect. I knew the fat lazy overseer in vain 473 always hangs back. I set off an explosion along the seam three veins over and disturbed the rock, crushing him like planned. No one else was hurt. I was hauled in front of the taskmaster in the main cave before everyone else. I begged and pleaded and I had no idea that it would happen. I've been pushing myself hard, trying to learn quick, as he asked. And I thought about my dad and I cried a bit. Really sold the performance, I think. He said he'd be kind and spare my life, but my ignorance wasn't an excuse. Fifty lashes, medium power, before everyone. My sobbing was real before long. My back was in ribbons. It was worth it. Day 300. It wasn't worth it. They all talk about how crazy it was, but they seem to think that the only way that they can die is if someone drops ten tons of rocks on their heads. I have to show them. They have to see. I've begun sneaking out tools, picking locks, and I've done some caches already, and I know how to open more. Day 312. Another day off. I was reading in my room when a guard suddenly opened the door and shoved his Zeno inside. Heard you used to like this one. He laughed and left. I was confused to sell until I recognized Avian. Her clothes were torn. She was crying. I didn't know how far they'd gone, but I sure as hell didn't ask. They were mocking me, hurting people I liked. I wasn't sure. I pulled her close, tried to soothe her. She wasn't very fluent and archaeish, but I tried to convey what I could. I sung for her. The old lullaby my mom sang to me when I was little. Before they split her up from my dad and I, she seemed to like that. I just held her close until she seemed better, and told her to stay strong. I didn't tell her my plans or anything, just in case. Day 326. I broke into the maintenance room last night. Perfect spot. Got no idea how long it'll be, so I'll have to make this work. I took Dad's ashes to the dock. I asked him if there was still ghost lung in the dust in it. He wasn't sure, but figured there might be a bit. Then I asked him if he could make sure that there was and left. I know he was confused, but I know that he won't talk. 
Day 330. Doc gave me back the ashes. Didn't say a word, but he also handed me a protective mask. Day 337. I dumped the ashes into the air ventilation machine. See how they like breathing the dust. I also installed a bomb to cover up my tracks. Day 342. A lot of overseers have a nasty cough these days. Day 345. I've got no idea what our home world was really called, but my mom used to tell me how beautiful it was. Her mother told her that was the least. Blue skies, green trees, birds singing. It sounds nice. Even though I have no idea what it was really called, I know that today it would have been one year back there from the day that I first entered the mines to work. It's the last day that I enter the mines. I wait for most of the shift to leave before I trigger the bomb. People are screaming, the ground is shaking, and I scream about a big collapse. Tell everyone that with an able body to get to the mine. We gotta help. The mine, of course people, will be shaking around and scared, but that they're fine. People don't notice the Archaeid building shaking, harder and smoke pouring out of it. As everyone gets into the main cave, I start tossing picks, drills, explosives. They're confused. One of the overseers sees me and walks over. But before he can say anything, I've driven a last pick straight through his helmet. I can hear the gasps all around me. Pick up your tools. We're going to need them. I just hit their home. They aren't immortal. They're our captors. It's up to us to bring them down. I saw two overseers rush out of one of the side tunnels and heft up the impact drills that I'd removed from the safety. The bolt went straight through his chest before putting him to the wall. The second screamed before the second bolt went through his head. I dropped the impact driver and hurled the charge into the entrance of the vein 34, where they had to break room set up. Four of them got smeared across the walls. The others were scared and confused. They needed to see. They needed to fight. They were a massive roar as I saw the taskmaster burst free from the smoke coming out of the tunnel as I used to sneak into the maintenance room. You! He pointed at me and charged. I ducked, jumped, and swiped with a digging claw. I heard him scream as I dug three deep gouges into his face. He'd have scars just like mine now. I turned and tried to leap in the impact driver, but he grabbed me and the suit made him too fast. But I bet he wished that he had a helmet now. The talons squeezed on my throat and he lifted me into the air. I could see more guards coming down the main ramp and out into the tunnels, but they were seriously outnumbered by the miners standing around. The taskmaster was focused on me. I'll torture you for years. The pain will be unending and nothing will stop it. I will take you to your homeworld and put you on display. This was where my plan ended. I gasped, hands pulling at his forearms to try and take the weight off my throat. Maybe, but I'll see your mother there and show her what a real species can do in bed. He screamed in my face and tightened his grip. Everything hurt for a moment, but I felt a snap and then went numb. He tossed me to the ground, but I couldn't feel it. I was just looking up at everything from the floor. He rubbed a hand against the bleeding cuts on his face. Back to work, all of you, he screamed at the miners, but I saw them stare back. They looked at the dead gods, they looked at the bleeding face. They looked at me. You heard him, one of the overseers with a whip stepped forward, rising his arm up to lash out. But Caster stepped forward and drove a pick through the overseer's faceplate, just like I had earlier. The entire area was silent. Then it all exploded. The miners were rushing forwards towards the Archaeids, either died or starting to run. I could see the fear flash across the taskmaster's face. Not used to the emotions, you bastard. Get used to it. I wish that I could have said that. Someone was soon kneeling near me, perhaps trying to help, but I was fading now, and I could still hear the screaming and yelling. There were other explosions. Finally, finally, I had shown them the way. I knew. For generations that they had been using the tools of the oppressors to dig in the ground. They'd never seen those tools could be used to free themselves. Sometimes all it took was a spark. Today, a man died. But a rebellion was started. Rebellion, Day One End of story. Cold Manual Control Written by Regal Legal Legal No, 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 no. Frasseth pounded at the console, but it didn't do any good. 
It wasn't coming back online and he took a heavy sigh and held his head down in his hands as he heard the others move up behind him. Is it? Yes, the whole thing is pride. The Dominion mind worked perfectly. It blew the navigation array off completely. He waved his hands and out of the window and they could see the wreckage drifting free of the ship to join the rest of the debris field. And he'd probably sent off a signal, so that it's just a matter of time before a patrol swoops in and kills us all. And the others who are in command of the crew looked glum at the news. To make it this far, to only fall at the finish line, so to speak. When they found the precious intel, they knew the track back to friendly territory would be perilous, but they'd all volunteered. The debris field was supposed to be a calculated risk. The Dominion wouldn't keep it all well patrolled for fear of damaging their own ships. But they hadn't expected the mine. What do we do? Do we try a broad spectrum transmission? Gersmack added. And let the Dominion know what we found? Farseth growled. What if we just try barreling through the rest of the field? Knox thought aloud, and everyone's silence made it clear that that wouldn't work. For some reason, Suresh was looking out the window probably just observing the wreckage. I think there's a ship out there, she said, and Gunsick quickly ran into the console and looked over her. You're mistaken, I don't have anything on our sensors, no nav signals or autopilot pings. He looked over as she pointed out of the side of the window. But look, Vasa sighed and moved over to push her out of the way. Clearly, you're mistaken. He looked through the debris cloud and was about to confirm that she was mistaken. But instead, he squawked in surprise and pointed. There's something out there. And it's moving. Getting closer. Now the rest of the crew rushed over, crowding around as they tried to peer out through the window. How? Gersnick exclaimed. We've got excellent senses. Is it some new style ship that can disguise its navigation signals? Naok snorted and flapped his thorax pocket of derision. It's just a human ship. Those primitives couldn't possibly have anything like that. They only discovered FTL half a generation ago. True, but they are neutral. They might help us, Suresh exclaimed, always full of hope. How? Probably hit a mine as well, Farsus mumbled. Why else can we not get a read on their senses? Well, then how is it moving? Suresh asked and everyone was quiet. They watched the ship get closer. Farsus figured it out. It must be kilometers away, based on how small it was. Then the proximity alarm on the ship turned on, and he jumped in surprise. It wasn't far away, it was tiny. How did the humans make ships that small without artificial gravity? Or by a farm pods? They watched the edge closer. Tiny white puffs or something nudging the ship, but a bit towards them. Finally, it was above their ship and they heard a clang as it struck the hull. What's it doing? Why didn't it go to the docking arm? Nowers asked. I don't know, maybe it doesn't have one, Gersmack shrugged. Doesn't have one, how do they get between ships then? Naux demanded. They waited, and then all of them jumped as they heard something clang on the ship. It kept clanging until the Serish figure figured it out. It's outside of the airlock, in some sort of suit. Naux shoved her head out of the way and looked at the terminal. What sort of barbarian ventures into the void wearing only pressurized suit? Madness. Mad? Oh not, it's trying to get in, Farsus said. Let it in. But the docking ring isn't engaged. How do we open a manually? Gosmuk asked and everyone looked confused. They'd never had to engage the controls on their own. Farsus sighed and stepped up to the terminal to make the airlock go through the various phases to let the small creature into the ship. After the airlock cycled, the crew crowded around the inside door watching it open before the human stepped inside. The human was wearing a blue pressure suit that looked like something they'd seen in a museum. No Bracken had used something like that in centuries at least. It was a full head shorter than Suresh, and it seemed frail and dainty by comparison to the rest of them. Are you here to help? Suresh asked. I bet it set the trap, Narx claimed with crazy. How do you navigate without a computer? Gersmer asked. The human stepped back, seemingly overwhelmed by the talking before holding up a hand, indicating that they wait. Then he held up some strange sort of advice. What's it doing? Noox wondered aloud. The human pushed a button on the device and heard a small grainy voice speaking terrible Bracken. 
Welcome, greetings. I am a person human. I love making maps. After that, played the human, hit another button. Do you need help? Oh, by the savior, it doesn't even have a real translator. Nox squawked. Sarish wasn't troubled, however. She leaned down and nodded. Yes, yes, please help. The human seemed to understand this and pressed another button on the device. Manual controlling's device. They all looked at each other for a moment, and then the thing couldn't be serious, could it? Well, it figured out how to move on its own ship around the field, Gus Max said, without some hesitation. But that is tiny ship. Do we have any other choice? Suresh asked. Everyone was quiet for a moment before they looked at Farseth, who sighed and waved for the human to follow him. The small control section was just in front of the ship, generally only used for testing engines while in dock. He couldn't remember them ever being used while the ship was actually out in the open, let alone in a place such as dangerous spiel the debris. The human moved into the seat, pulling some small sliver of black stick from his pocket, and he began to write something on the small window on the manual control seat, head, as the others watched from behind him. What's it writing? I think it's religious iconography, Suresh said as the others couldn't make any sense out of the curved lines being drawn. All the straight lines in the middle. Those are navigational trajectories, Gus Mick asked before the others simply laughed. Even Suresh wasn't crazy enough to think that humans could do that on the fly. Finally though, the small creature stopped writing on the window and rubbed its hands together. Then it stretched out its arms shook everything out and then grabbed the controls. When the ship started moving forward, everyone couldn't help but squawk and grab onto the consoles to strap themselves in. This is madness. It's going to drive us straight into the debris, Knox cried. I think those really were navigational trajectories, Gunsmack said. By the savior, I hope you're right, Farseth was gripping his chair as he watched the debris fly closer towards them. But every time they looked ready to hit, the human would use the controls to send the ship on a new course. It was using the navigational thrusters constantly, spinning the ship this way and that, angling it and firing off on another path that somehow didn't have debris in it. If anything, the human was making better time through the field than the navigational computer had, just with far more terrifying speed than the computer would use. How was it doing this? How is it doing this? Gus McGoss was gasping out in between the terrified squawks as a hundred different times they all were surely about to die at the hands of the crazy human piloting the ship. But finally they were out, no one could believe it, and the human got out of the chair nodding at the bracken before pulling out a device from earlier and hit the button. Farewell goodbye, time for making more maps. Then it waved at them and walked back to the airlock waiting patiently for the fossils to cycle the airlock and let the human back out. On the terminal, he watched it float out of the airlock and then climb into the hull before it couldn't see it anymore. A few minutes later, they had a ka-chunk when they soon saw the tiny human ship boosting back towards the debris field. They were standing around the control center, each humbled and confused. It didn't ask for payment, Knox finally said. It just asked if we wanted help, Suresh said. They glanced around at one another before Father's side. If that wasn't the savior returned in disguise to lead us into deliverance, then we have to start hiring human pilots. Once we find one that isn't so heavy on the thrusters, that is. He walked to the communications terminal to send out a type beam to the nerve beacon that they knew was waiting for him. Just as he turned it on, though, Gunsmack smoke again. I just want to know what human maps look like. And are they for sale? End of story. Continuing the cycle, written by Regal, Legal Eagle. She stood on the platform, looking down at the valley that cast an orange glow of the setting sun. It was truly beautiful, and that's not why she was here. To be honest, she was a little surprised that he was so quiet, though she knew why. It's pointless thinking about it. What? You're thinking about how you could have left. You could have taken your money, grabbed whoever's special to you, and made off months ago. How? There was a chance that you'd made it and been living a nice, quiet life somewhere else, past the setting sun. She shook her head. You were wondering why there's always had to be one more job, 
One more opportunity, and one more little scrap to take before you were ready. And now it's too late. She stood at the edge of the platform and pulled some papers from her belt and started rolling herself a smoke. A week, that's all I needed. The Xena let out a raspy cough as his thorax continued to fill with bile. It was impressive in a way. Most creatures would die if they got shot in the neck. These would paralyze themselves to admit foul spelling bile and toxin that simultaneously worked towards healing the wound and driving away natural predators. The problem was that she wasn't a natural predator. In fact, the only reason she had shot him in the throat was so that this could happen. Her employer wanted him alive. It wouldn't have been next week, she said with a sigh. Next week, it would have just been next month. And next month, it would have just been next year. There's always the desire for more. The idea that you can just take just a bit more and then you get to go. Until something happens and suddenly it's too late. She finished up rolling her smoke and was about to light it up when she paused. She hated wasting matches. Walking over to the Xeno, she saw him staring intently at the gun and inches away from his outstretched arm, as if he was willing his fingers to grab it, but they weren't listening. She tugged his duster open, checking his pockets, before pulling out a grainy picture of him with another of his kind. They looked happy. This is your special someone, she asked, standing over him. Please, I'll tell you whatever you want. His eyes had left the gun and now were staring up at her, pleadingly. You don't have anything that I want to know. The location of the money. They'll find out soon enough. Where to find the others? I'll find you. I'll find them. Please. No one knows about us. Just... He wheezed, and then the bile kept filling up. She looked at him for a moment before carefully putting out his match, striking it on the box and cupping her hands to protect the flame that she lit her smoke. Once she had it going, she didn't shake out the match, though. Instead, she lit the corner of the picture... Only then did she shake out the match and let it drop. Her eyes followed the path of the frame as it ate away at the picture, devouring the happy couple that it contained. When just a corner was left, she let go, watching the last piece drift off into the valley. Thank you. His breathing was getting harder. Soon he wouldn't be able to talk. Maybe you could just uh, finish me? He sounded hopeful, but she, she looked down at him. She took a long draw of a smoke and shook her head. No. You steal from the law, they throw you in jail. You steal from him. He sends me. You know, you become an example. When she was done talking, she let her smoke cut, watching it move with the breeze. As she looked down at the valley, she caught the movement of shadow for a moment. Then she shielded her eyes against the sun and spotted the incoming ship. Well, that's my cue. Tell them everything they ask, and that should make it quick. Please, I'm scared, he whimpered. He glanced down at the Xeno, twice her size, knowing before all of this had had a reputation of being a hulking, threatening menace. Now look at him. She took another drag of her smoke before exciting. Yeah, I was too. The ship was drawing near as she walked past him and then down to the ship of his speeder. She climbed in and quickly started it up, flying off the platform just as the ship arrived to pick up her first delivery. She already knew where to find the next one. Somewhere along the way, she'd find the others too. Honey, we have to move quickly, all right? Just grab your things and throw them in. We just don't have time to be neat about this. Her dad was moving quickly and she'd never seen him like this before. He was taking everything out of the house and tossing it into the old Kogan that they had to haul crops into town. Tim was trying to help, but old Robot couldn't move very quickly, and often her dad just shoved him to the side as he walked past. I thought that we had to wait before we moved, so it didn't look suspicious, she said, feeling very afraid with how her dad was acting. She was currently standing in a doorway, clutching her stuffed bunny. Sometimes she felt like she was too old for such things, but it always helped her remember Mom. We were going to, but now we're not. But what about Uncle Grasmix? Aunt Hoover Dad had been acting weird since two days ago when something had happened to Mr. Green. She hadn't liked him. He was always so mean to everyone else. 
but she knew that he worked with Dad when he left the farm sometimes. Change your plans, sweetie. Please just go and get your stuff, all right? Dad turned to her, and she could tell that she was trying to calm down, understanding that he was scaring her. But then she heard a soft noise, a sort of fch. Before, his eyes went wide, and then he fell forward, collapsing onto the ground with a massive dot in his neck. She was too scared to scream as Tim dropped the mirror that he was holding and pulled out his rifle. Warning, threat detected. Well, he was to say that before a bullet slammed into his shield. She saw the blue shimmering light for a moment before the second bullet pierced the old shield and hit Tim's torso, exploding as it did and sending his torso flying away from his legs. Rifle flying out of his hands. This time, she did scream confused and terrified. Casey, go hide! Her dad gasped out, face down in the dirt for some reason, not moving, not rising up to save her, like he was supposed to. So she ran to the only spot that she knew, into the bathroom next to the door and into the cabinet just under the sink. She clutched a bunny, crying softly. She could see through the little hole in the wall. Dad was just outside. Tim's upper torso was crawling towards the rifle several yards away. Casey, I can hear you crying, baby girl. I know you're scared. I know that. But, but you, you gotta, you gotta be quiet. No matter what, stay quiet until everyone's gone. But dad, I need you to do this, honey. You've got to be brave. Remember the story that your mom used to tell about you and your bunny, about how brave he was to make it here. Dad, that's just, just think about the story, Casey, please. The pleading in his voice was something that she'd never heard before. It scared her, but she closed her eyes and tried to control her breathing. She stopped crying and then began to slowly breathe in and out. In and out and calm. For a while, all she could hear was the wind and the mechanical grinding of Tim trying to crawl for his rifle. And then she could hear footsteps. When she peeked out through the hole, she could see that someone with a black duster walking closer. The person kicked the rifle away from Tim. He tried to grab the person's leg, but they just pulled out of the grip and kept walking. So Tim went back to crawling towards the rifle. That was now several more yards away. When the person got up to her dad, she could see that it was a woman. Short hair, solemn face, sad eyes. She'd never seen such sad eyes in a person who wasn't crying before. The woman reached down and rolled her dad over. You're right there, Henry. Can you breathe fine? I can breathe just fine, he said, and the woman pulled out a dart from his neck. Did you already call him in the ship on his way? No, not yet. I wanted to make sure that you were still doing fine. The darts can be tricky sometimes. The woman looked at the old beat-up coconut, half full of things from the house. Doing some house cleaning there, Henry. Just a bit, you, uh, wouldn't believe. I was just planning on having a yard sale, huh? No, I don't think I would. She glanced over at Tim, trying to reach the weapon with a single-minded focus of a robot. Just you and the robot aren't here and the farmer. Gotta make you wonder how you can make a living with just the two of you. Casey realized the woman hadn't seen her in the doorway earlier. Yes, just the two of us. Gotta make it look good for the taxman. Look, I'm sure you're busy, so why not just call him in and get me out of here? The woman frowned when he said that. You're in a hurry. I mean, I like to get it over with. The pain and torture, they just get worse the longer you prolong it, right? They're pretty bad no matter when it happens. You're very calm about this. People usually beg and cry. Would that do me any good? No. So why waste time? She didn't know why Dad was saying these things. Was it part of some plan? It had to be. He always had a plan. Well, let me make sure that the dart didn't dull anything then, Henry. The woman dropped to her knee and then into Dad's ribs, pressing the weight of her heart as it screamed. Casey couldn't help but gasp in surprise and shock as well. The woman looked up and Casey clamped her hands over her mouth. What was that? What? Me screaming? Ah! He tried to scream again, but wasn't the same. The woman stood up, pulling a pistol from her hip, and she walked towards the house. Hey, come back, come back here, dammit. It's just me and Tim. 
Casey heard the woman's footsteps into the house and then tried to will herself to be smaller as she heard her dad yelling at the woman to come back outside. For a minute she thought that she would be okay as the woman walked into the kitchen first. But then the footsteps got closer, and suddenly the door to the cabinet was yanked open. Casey screamed as the woman pulled her wrist, tugging her out from under the sink, just twisting and pulling, but the woman was strong and didn't let go. Instead, she dragged Casey outside. Jesus freaking Christ, Henry, she's alive. Yes, her dad was crying at this point. Casey was as well, overwhelmed by fear and confusion over what was happening. The cough got her mother, but not her. I thought if I claimed it and I just had homeschooled her, no one would try and use her against me. Please, you can't let him know that she's alive. The woman holstered her pistol and let Casey go. Casey staggered back up and didn't have anywhere to go. So she clutched her star bunny, feeling the soft synthetic fur, catching her tears as she didn't know what else to do. The woman ran a hand through her hair for a moment, taking off her hat as she did so. What the frick am I supposed to do here, Henry? Huh? You stupid jerk. I already told him that you were in on it. He knows that I'm looking for you, and now it turns out that Casey is still alive. Why the frick did you never tell me? We didn't think that he'd send you. We were careful. Not careful enough, you stupid prick. Why the frick does everyone think that they'll get away with it? No one ever does. Every year, he has to make an example out of more of you. Don't you remember the Kashkin brothers? That was just last year. I'm sorry, we thought that we had a better plan. Well, you didn't. The woman groaned and rubbed her hand across her forehead for a moment. The frick am I going to do? I can't keep her a secret from him. The, the money. What about it? They've had green snakes for three days now. I'm sure that they'll know where the money is. I moved it. I didn't trust the others. It's hidden somewhere else. Let her go with Tim. Who the frick is Tim? She asked before Casey whimpered out. He's the robot. The woman glanced at Casey and then over at Tim, still crawling towards the rifle. Look, he doesn't care about the robot. Just tell him that the robot and my ship were gone. He wants me. Load up Tim and the Kurgan and Casey and let them go. Then call him. That's all you have to do. Her dad pleaded the woman, looked at Tim and then Casey for several long seconds before finally walking over to Tim's legs, putting them towards the crawling robot. Tim, access code Gamma Rovio 435. Add new person to trusted list. The robot looked back at the woman and stopped crawling. No more hostiles present in the area. I am in need of assistance. I have sustained damage. Yeah, I know. The woman said with a growl, putting the robot together as he pulled a small handheld welder from her belt. There was some sparks as she did a quick job and connecting the robot and then pulled it to its feet. Thank you. Subject owner Henry appears to be suffering from paralytic poison. Medical tension needs to be acquired. No, Tim, get in the Kurgan. Take Casey to meeting point x-ray and wait. Don't let her go anywhere. Dad, no! Casey protested. Casey, honey, it has to be like this. Tim was already walking in front of the old ship. The woman was picking Casey up, and even as she kicked and twisted, reaching out for her dad, I'm sorry, sweetie, she'll take care of you for now. Her and Tim, be brave. Casey continued to cry and scream as the woman pulled open the side of the hatch to the ship, putting her in the co-pilot seat and then strapping her in. Tim was warming up the ship already and Casey couldn't undo the safety harness once the ship was starting to move. She pounded the window, tears streaming down her cheeks as the Kurgan ship lifted off the ground. Turning to the air, she saw the woman standing next to her father, and soon they left the farm behind. Henry watched the old ship fly inside. He lay in the silence next to the woman till she finally spoke up. Why the frick didn't you tell me, Henry? Because... I didn't know how. We haven't spoken in so long. You really named it Casey, huh? It's a good name. It's my name. I know, it, it wasn't fair to Laura, but I thought, I don't know, in another life me and you would have made an excellent husband and wife. In another life, she agreed. Casey, please, don't let them torture me. I, I don't know if I'd tell them a new place that I hit the money. I'm scared. He sighed heavily. Where is the new place anyway? You know where it is. 
he said simply before she snorted, and then she reached into her pocket and pulled out another dart, like the one from before. The thing about these darts is that if you get the mixture wrong, it does too good of a job. The person sort of falls asleep, and that's it. I know he'll be angry. Freck him. I never missed a job yet. I've got room to make a mistake. They stood there in silence for several long seconds before she crouched down beside him. You'll look after her. I'll do what I can, she promised, and then she leaned in to give him one gentle kiss as she jabbed the dart into his side of his neck. When she pulled it out and brushed her other hand against his hair. Goodbye, Henry. Goodbye, Casey. He closed his eyes and fell asleep. Tim had kept her in the old fort for two days, making sure to try and feed her regularly. She refused at first, saying that she wouldn't eat until he took her back home. But Tim said he couldn't. She cried, she argued, she reasoned. She did what she could, but eventually she ate again. The pain in her stomach greater than the pain in her heart. On the third day, she saw the ship. It was a new, sleek, expensive-looking ship, and it swooped down and landed next to the Kurgan as she watched. The woman got out. Where's my dad? She ran up and trying to punch and kick the woman who just shoved Casey back. Kid, I know you're in a bad spot right now, but I'm trying to help. So knock that off, Casey sniffed, obviously upset with the woman, but stopped. Where's Tim? Tim shuffled out of the old barracks. His servos were having trouble since he'd been shot. I'm here. Do you have further instructions? Yeah, get in the Kurgan. I have to take you back. They won't stop looking until they find you, and that's a problem. You can't. Tim's all I got, Casey cried out. You can't take my dad and Tim. Look, kid, I'm sorry, but this is the way it's got to be. I've got you a new ship, and someday you'll understand all of this. But right now, I have to take Tim to protect you. No! She tried to launch herself at the woman, but she was quicker. She grabbed Casey, picking her up and carrying her to the new ship, as one small girl struggled against her. But just as before the woman was too strong, she opened up the hatch to the new ship and stuffed her inside, slamming it shut. Casey could watch the woman through the window. I'll kill you, she screamed. I'll find you when I'm older and kill you. The woman just looked at her through the window with the same sad eyes. Someday, kid, if you come for me, that's just fine. But I hope, instead of trying to kill me, you help save me. She turned and walked away. For the first time, Casey saw some sort of metal chip in the implant in the woman's spine. Casey stood quietly then, watching the woman get into the Kogan with Tim in tow, and the ship took off. This time, Casey was the one left behind to watch the ship fly off into the sky. She looked around the ship, and then she saw a large crate with a note on it. Press green button. So she walked towards it, pressing the button on the crate. It then hissed and made her jump back, but it opened to reveal a much larger, more expensive-looking robot than Tim. She could see the S-M1000 on its chest. The eyes flickered to life, and the robot looked down at her. Greetings, owner designation Casey. I am your new caretaker. My name is Designated Sam. The person who purchased me has expressed a desire to train you for the purposes of revenge. This is the person that often takes years and much hard work. Shall we begin? Casey stared at the robot for a moment, and then clutched her small fists and nodded. Yes. End of story. Bird Brains, written by Regal, Legal Eagle. Dude, you can't do this, it's insane. They were walking quickly down the service corridors of the station, while Carl checked the straps on the strange suit that he was wearing. It had been hastily assembled, and he had already had the plans for it, and he was convinced that it would work. He just had to get Will to stop worrying. Look, the Epsians are already here, and they're going to mess this entire place up unless we do something. Right? Right? Fighting them is straight out of the question, because we don't have the gear or the numbers. And even if we did, it would be a start of a massive war. Right? Right? So this is the only shot that we've got to peacefully end this. I'm telling you, I've studied their culture, and I know that they work. I had this suit planned, didn't I? Stop freaking out because the fail will succeed if I'm doing this. Cole was satisfied that they had made the suit to his specs. But how can you be sure? There are other species say that we should just run away. 
Will still wasn't convinced as they were walking along. Yet, he knew that they couldn't let the Epsians turn the station into a hunting nest, no matter what the leader demanded. After all, most of the species here to trade would be considered prey, and he wasn't sure if the humans would also be on that list. Something had to be done. That's because all they do is stay away from the Epsians. You read the galactic pamphlet thing. No one deals with them. No trade, minimal negotiations, and intermittent wars and lots of raiding. Well, I'm not going to let that continue. Humanity is going to open up a dialogue with these Xenos, and then it starts here. I study these sorts of behaviors in college, you know. If I'm right, they're like raptors from back on Earth. What kind of raptors? Will asked then. The ones with feathers, Cole said with a shrug. Well, but what kind? What do you mean, what kind? I just told you, the kinds with feathers. No, I got that, but are we talking about the dinosaurs or the birds? All frowned as he tried to make sense. They're all birds. Those horror vids that you watch are all wrong. They didn't have scales or leathery skin. No, wait. I know what I mean. Are we talking about the flying kind or the ones on the ground? What? Cole stopped walking and looked at Will. What are you going on about? Flying? All raptors have feathers. I'm not talking about the kinds they show in those silly movies where humans keep getting eaten by the terrible lizards. I get that, Will huffed. I mean, you're talking about the ones from like millions of years ago. They were pack hunters on the ground, or the birds who fly around and stuff. The hawks or the falcons and such, birds of prey. Oh, Cole finally understood. The pack hunters from millions of years ago, but with other bird-like behavior. He looked up at the hatch hangar 15, where the Ephesians' fleet was sitting up inside. Then he looked back at Will. Is everything ready? Will sighed for a moment, and then nodded. Yeah, everything's ready. All right, time to make history. Cole popped open the hatch and stepped inside, before Will quickly sealed it shut behind him. Out of all the species they dealt with, the Ephesians were far and away the most colorful. He also thought that they smelled the best as he caught scents of the sum of the woods he smelled mixed in with the floral. It didn't take long before he was noticed in his drab, strange suit covered in a bunch of fabric and cloth. The drab-looking workers didn't bother him, but soon several large, colorful Xenos, their warrior class, approached them. They were one of the more similar species to the humans that it encountered, but their legs were on backwards, and were more bony like a bird. Plus, their retractable talons were something else entirely. Other than that, their warrior cast averaged seven feet, not including their plumage. They had feathers along their arms, too short to be useful for wings. More along their ribs and a strange tails, sort of like a peacock, but more flexible. While other species didn't know much about their history, Cole was fairly certain that they'd never been able to fly. Maybe glide, but he didn't think so. No, their plumage was purely for social hierarchy. Human! The Grand Hunter locked this hangar for a reason. Preparations are underway, we are not to be disturbed. Yeah, well, I'm here to tell him that there won't be in the next hunt. Take me to him right now. Cole was firm and the warrior seemed uncertain, so he sculled and turned to guide Cole directly in the middle of the hangar. Their makeshift nests were being built, colorful banners hanging from the ships and tents all over, and the Grand Hunter was assembled on his own feathered throne with sticks and feathers of the warriors who had sworn him fealty when Cole arrived. He could see the figures in the tents behind the Xeno leader in the colorful tents. He caught a brief glances and could hear the higher pitched ling of the Aveseans. That would be the Grand Hunter's harem. They were likely fasting before the hunter ready. The females gathered food while the males gathered trophies. Usually. Well, there wouldn't be any hunting if he had his way with things. The grand hunter growled as he warriors pulled back. But Cole walked up to him. What's the meaning of this? We forbid strangers from entrance while we prepare for a hunt. Yeah, well, there won't be any hunt. I'm challenging you for control of the flock, tribe, clan, whatever you call it. The Xeno blinked and then arched his head up and opened and closed while making the sort of conking noise that the Avsians laughed at. You're more drab than my workers. You could never... Before he finished, Cole yanked on a cord connecting the straps wrapped around his suit, releasing them 
as he left his own craft of plumage spring out around him. The Grand Hunter jumped back in shock, his own plumage spreading out wide. Carl's was bright and bigger. He could see the worry in the Zeno's eyes. And now to really seal the deal. Now, he shouted, and the lights in the hangar dimmed, and a spotlight shone down on him as the music began. He turned then and began to strut towards some of the assembled warriors as their plumage quickly fled out. You know this boogie is for real. He could see the confused Zenos flap their plumage as little as he approached, so he gave a little hop before getting into their face as he started dancing to the music. He kept focus on the first group circling around them as he moved, and waving his hands in their faces to accent his moves. Despite being more than a foot shorter, they were clearly intimidated as he tapped into the social structure thousands of years old. Before long, they had closed up their plumage and dropped to their knees as he turned to the next group, turning away from them and actually moonwalking back to their position, before spinning around and actually slapping one of the ones in front of him with a flake plumage under his arms before he jumped and clicked his heels, which he knew that couldn't be effectively do. The move made them quickly close up their own plumage and drop to their knees. Turning, he bobbed side to side for a moment before dancing across the floor as if he was dancing a salsa. He circled around the Grand Hunter, who was nervously facing him, and then he yanked open the tents that the females were in. He heard surprise trills and squawks, but they were all crowded around the entrance, so he knew that they'd been paying attention. For this segment, he actually dropped down a little bit for a brief cross dance, and he kicked his legs out to the beat of the song. Before flopping onto his back and then kicking down and rising to his headspin. While he began again, he could hear the trills of the females grow louder, and as he stopped spinning and he's flopping his legs down, only to extend his arms very quickly and wiggle across the floor like he did a worm. When he reached the far end of the tent, he hopped back up onto his feet and figured the only way to leave was to moonwalk straight back out of the tent. The females quickly poured out, surrounding him in a grand hunter now. He turned to face his last challenge directly. Who could tell that the Zeno was confused and entirely unprepared for the sudden challenge of his authority? So he quickly went for the throat, metaphorically. Stretching right up to the Zeno's face, he gave the bird the bird and kept dancing to the music. He circled the Zeno leader, sometimes facing him, sometimes facing away, constantly moving his arms and legs to the beat, and repeatedly slapping the Zeno with his fork's tail plumage. Finally, the song wound down and he stopped, facing away from the Grand Hunter, looking into the excited faces of the females. He leaned back and seemed to flop over backwards only to carefully arc his back, pressing down on his hands and launching himself at the Grand Hunter, diving his feet into the Zeno's chest, making him gasp in shock and stagger backwards. Stumbling and then tripping as he fell, the females quickly parted and none even attempting to break his fall. Carl panted beneath his breath. He lay on the ground, forcing himself to stand back up and then walked over to the shocked Zeno. He reached down and yanked one of the Zeno's tail feathers free and brought it out with a pained whimper. Then Cole reached up and tucked it into the feather down into the back of his collar. As he did that, the Zeno closed up his plumage and all around the warriors, the workers and the females cheered, but their hawk-like cries, There will be no hunt. Instead, my clan shall provide the feast. He yelled and above the cries and arms raised. He was panting hard, still sweating, just about everywhere from the intense strain of dancing. But they quickly rushed to lift him up into the air. He was the Grand Hunter now. Diplomats and soldiers be damned. This time, dancing had won the day. End of story. Called the Roar. Written by Regal, Legal Eagle. He stood on the edge of the field, listening to the buzz. It sounded far off subdued, but he knew that it was just a warm-up. Alcohol, narcotics, money, none of that would give him the same sort of feeling that he got to listening to the crowd. The game hadn't even begun yet, and he loved it. Just the sound of people moving into place, filling up the stadium, 
The others were all in their meditation chambers, trying to clear their minds to open up their spirits for the ritual. They didn't understand the human concept of uh, getting pumped for the game. The cultists were very fond of meditation, reflection, and all of that sort of thing. And why not? They were centuries ahead of everyone else in terms of tech. Everyone was reliant on their continued good world towards the lesser species. They'd always been rather mysterious and enigmatic. They didn't respond to many diplomatic requests, trade delegations, or declarations of war. They generally just politely but firmly told the younger species that they had no interest whatsoever and sent them on their way. No one had been able to enter the Core Worlds before. That is, until Victor. Three years ago, he had been in another agri-colony farm kid, getting ready for an exciting life of farming dirt. He was good enough at baseball and football and the other football that he might have been able to get a chance at a scholarship to a decent school. But instead, six months before graduation, a cultish ship crash-landed into the planet. It was some sort of prototype that had gone wrong. Even the gods made mistakes. Miraculously, only one person had been near enough for the impact site to get caught in the blast. Him. He'd been out on the perimeter that morning checking the fins when his world exploded. He lost both legs and his left arm, plus the general case of fractured and broken ribs, skull fracture, internal bleeding. Good stuff. To make matters worse, when everyone in the hospital said that he was lucky enough that he didn't lose his right arm, he got to inform them that he was in fact a lefty. Coming from a family of dirt farmers, he was looking at living the rest of his life with a cheap prosthetics, fraction of the strength of a normal limb, no feeling and lots of phantom pain. Then the cultor showed up. For the first time in history, or human history at least, they came to us. They apologized, gave his parents a massive sum of money, and only had one condition, that they could take Victor back with them, fix him up, and let him attend one of their schools to make amends. Well, what could he say? The ambassador was there, the press, he smiled, and he got propped up for some pictures, said goodbye to his folks, and said that he'd return or call when he had a chance to get taken into the cultist territory. The prosthetics were incredible, better than anything humans could make. It wasn't that they were stronger, or could shapeshift, or anything like that. They just felt exactly like his real arm and legs had. It was like he never lost them. When he was doing physical therapy in rehab, they introduced him to the ancient cult of sport to test his reflexes and coordination. Then all, it was like a mix between capture the flag, American football, and hunting. Most places just had the modular obstacle course and holographic targets, but real courses had small, engineered forests and real animals. What would happen if two teams would set out on either side of the forest, or obstacle course, and then the animals would be released in the center of each side, and they captured some animals and tried to drag them back to their side, carry others into the other team's side, and just flat out try not to get stomped on by the rest of the animals, or the opposing team. When they'd first explained it to him, he was really confused, but he noticed that they seemed really peaceful cultists, got really worked up just by talking about it. They said that he shouldn't feel bad that he wasn't very good at the game, since in general humans had worse eyesight, less strength, and less speed than cultists. Then, to everyone's surprise including his own, he was amazing at it. First, they'd assumed that it was a fluke, and he was competing against the cultists undergoing physical therapy after all. So they set him up for the equivalent of a high school team. He crushed them. Then they moved him to the equivalent of a college team. After all, they'd offer to each team. For the first time in his life, he had an important people fighting over him. He got sent to the cultists' capital for all the places, and was enrolled in some fancy school. The coursework that they originally gave him was so far beyond his level that it wasn't even funny. So, they quickly found the easiest classes possible for him and told him not to worry about academics. His first year, he led the team through an undefeated season. They quickly gave him an honorary degree and got him signed to the Praetorians. 
despite the name, the team was the worst in the professional Venner League. Just being signed to any sort of professional team was in itself amazing, however. No other species had ever been offered the position. So, his first professional year in Venner, and his second year in the Cultus, he carried them into a staggering 96 wins to 84 lost season. Made more impressive considering that they'd been 40 to 140 the previous season. He felt that they'd have done better, but they insisted that he rested and sat out every other game. The Colters players only played one game and three themselves. It was a hard, dangerous game. His right arm got broken three times in that season. So when the season was over, they offered him a much larger contract, and he turned it down insisting that they use the money to buy better players. Then he tried to have them replace his right arm with a prosthetic, but voluntary amputation wasn't a concept that the cultist understood. So he took an axe to it in front of the cultist hospital and let them clean it up and give him a new replacement arm like he wanted to in the first place. They thought that he was insane. Maybe he was, but this season he hadn't rested for a single game and the Praetorians had gone undefeated. After sweeping both opposing teams in the postseason, they'd faced off against the Royal Guard, long considered the greatest team in the history of the sport. They had the most funny, the largest base, and more Hall of Fame players, and more grand championships than any other team. And they'd made it clear that they were not interested in letting some impetuous little human win the grand championship. That promise had come three games ago, and the Victorians, under Victor's guidance, had won every single game. This was what it came down to. One more win meant a completely undefeated regular and postseason. It meant, for the first time in history, a non-cultist would be in the winning team. He'd already been the first human on a professional team, so this was just another record to beat. Plus... For the first time in the history of any professional team that had gone completely undefeated, it would be broadcast to the entirety of the cultist nation. 92% viewership, 28 billion people. And it wasn't a broadcast anywhere else. There wasn't a single human in the crowds out there. It was all cultists, and he knew that they were cheering for him. When he had first left home, he'd expected to be homesick immediately. But instead, well, instead he'd been focused on recovery, and then he'd started winning. He'd seen a pro baseball game back at home once, well, farm league pros, and the energy of that game had been incredible to him. The cheering, the noise, the pure sensation that it brought. But to be on the field, to hear the crowds cheering at you, it was, well, it was better than anything else he knew. Nothing came close. He wasn't a drinker, the cultists didn't even have narcotics for humans, and he wasn't brave enough to try screwing one of the women because he lacked the hard scales on the belly. So her quills would tear him up. All he had was winning. The other players needed to meditate to clear their minds, to try and reach some sort of clarity and spirit like they said that they could focus on the game. And push out of the way they considered the noise of the crowd. That was all a distraction to them. But Vincent fed off of it. He ate it up and asked for more. He didn't do any kind of showboating because there was no room for it in a sport. He just won. Over and over and over. He might lose four or five arms and legs per game and just snapped the replacements on and went back out. He never stopped. So when he heard that murmur of the crowd, he closed his eyes, imagining what it would sound like when the game was actually going. The rest of the team could sit in their quiet little chambers and meditate. He wanted to hear the crowd. Victor, he turned back and saw the team's manager. He saw the old cultist, Cole's grey, and his scales were worn looking. He didn't use artificial polisher like some of the older cultists did. They've given your request the all clear. It's waiting for you. Victor just grinned and followed the cultists into what had been set aside as a meditation chamber, though he never used it. Instead of soothing paintings or Zen garden or anything like that, it was a massive bell waiting inside. 
They've hooked it up to the PA system. Press that red button over there to start ringing. The music will begin. I must admit that it is interesting to use music like this. Do humans often incorporate music with sport? All the time, Victor nodded and then rubbed his hands together as he looked at the bell. Might want to get out of here. This will be loud, he said before the manager nodded and left the room. Then Victor pulled up the headphones that they had left behind and pressed the button on the wall and picked up a hammer. He took a slow breath and then slammed the hammer onto the bell. It reverberated and rang through the small room, which was picked up by the speakers. He could imagine the crowds now growing quiet and confused as he kept ringing the bell. It wasn't some light little thing just to make a noise. It was heavy and deep, and it was the sort of bells that only rang at funerals. As he kept ringing the bell, he finally heard the starting of a guitar, then the bass, and then the drums came in, the heavy beat matching the tempo of the bell perfectly. Finally, he heard in his headphones, Victor. It's time. He left the meditation room, and the others were lined up just in front of the entrance to the field as he heard the music outside. But the crowd was quiet. Then there was an announcer. And now, welcome home, your team, the Praetorians. The rest of the team began to jog out onto the field as the cheers began. Victor waited for a moment as the lyrics of the song progressed, and then he jumped onto the field and hit it on cue. I got my bell, and I'm going to take you to hell. I'm going to get you, Satan, get you. Hell's bells. The roar of the crowd erupted then. He could feel the energy instantly. He could feel the cheering and hollering. He could see them on their feet and all around the stadium as he held up his arms. What's the plan, Victor? Garnash asked as he joined the team on the field as they began to run towards the side of the field. Half of you on defense, the rest on herding. What? No striking? The sky shots clearly surprised. I'll be our striker. We're up three games, guys. They know they have to stop us here and now. They'll be pushing their own strikers very hard. Counter it. We can't afford to let this drag on. They've injured eight of our players. Any more of you go down, we might have to play short on the team. We win today. No doubts, no fear. Victory. I don't know how you know how to make your spirit and soul so clear and focused, Kagan asked with a shake of his head. Victor just laughed. He didn't need meditation to know that he wanted to win. Every fiber of his being and his body needed to win. But with the crowd cheering him on, he was freaking invincible. He was eight feet tall. He was mean as hell. And this was his day. No... This was humanity's day, even if the nearest human was light years away. He had no idea what was going on right now, and he vowed to win in the name of humanity. The cultists would cheer, and they would roar for him, for humanity. They were approaching the center of the field and the forest and waited for them. Well, the incredibly well-crafted obstacle course that was used for real trees and rocks and a stream to make it interesting. The open field that they were in had three sections to it. On either side, they were pens that used to herd animals into. In the center was essentially a stone well that they tossed striker animals into. Back in the day, cultists celebrated games by slaughtering the animals in the pens and letting the creatures in the world drown. These days, the herded animals had very cushy lives outside of the games, and the well would lower the animal into the care of a veterinarian waiting in a special room below it. But, to be honest, Victor wasn't sure that he'd want to win, and he'd as bad if he had to slaughter the animals by hand. His desire to win was great, and it amused the cultists greatly that a direct translation of his name was meant winner. Finally, they heard the horn being blown, and the signal to start the game of the Kiwa birds screeched as they flew up out of the forest in the center. The roar of the crowd got a bit intense for a moment, and the cultists around him either shifted into more defensive positions or picked up the pace. Victor wasn't as fast as any of them and quickly fell behind. However, he did catch up again, and they entered the forest. The cultists were careful and sometimes paranoid creatures, always wary of an ambush or trap. They could also see very well, 
so there were times when the teams would spend 15 or 20 minutes planning out ways to trap the enemy team inside the forest, each making moves to counter moves from across the course. Victor didn't do that. He saw just fine by human standards, but in the thick of the forest that meant that he couldn't see about 10 feet in front of him at any given time, which meant that he planned 10 feet ahead. He knew where he wanted to go, however, so he just burst through the bushes and passed the trees towards the mountain. It wasn't really a mountain, more of a hill on top of a forest where the stream started. It was there where most of the valuable striker's animals rested, guarded by a very carefully bred and extremely angry crag snapper. Strikers were working teams to distract it and grab the smaller animals to hide near the beast. But that took time, and usually meant the strikers wouldn't try it till later in the game when they knew that no other choice was to be had. Not today. Victor kept up a jog, and he ignored the stealth and just kept moving forward. There might be some cultists from the opposing team watching him and lulling about his very elaborate and well-planned trap, but right now, Victor would never know it. Take it as it came, forge ahead. That's how he kept winning. As he reached the start of the mountain, the trees gave way to rocks, and he had to start moving up the rocky opening with a little stream trickling down the center. He was hopping over it and building speed as he hopped from rock to rock, starting to move recklessly fast in what was a dangerous area of the field. He could see the top of the path even out before he got up to it and reached up with his left hand and disconnected his right arm at the shoulder. Pulling it free with a pop, he then screamed at the top of his lungs and raised his prosthetic arm in the air. By the wrist and sprinted the last few feet over the edge and into the opening beyond. Just what he had expected, there was a shallow pond with a whole variety of colorful and exotic creatures around the edges. In the center was a crag snapper. It was essentially an elephant-sized gator with a turtle shell and an incredibly mean disposition. It started to rise up from the deeper part of the pond, drawn by Victor's scream as it turned, mouth opening to reveal a massive rows of sharp teeth. But Victor jumped into the air, slamming his prosthetic arm down onto the creature's head so hard the entire thing cracked and then broke apart, shattering over the snapping skull. The creature rocked back, stunned, as Victor used the open maw to springboard and jump up into the creature's back. He ran along it and spotted the loose portion of the shell that he knew would be there. Quickly kneeling down on the now rocking creature's shell, he flipped the section of the shell up with his remaining hand. Inside was a very surprised gipset, a sort of fox-eared ferret with fur like a sable. Or so he had been told. He grabbed the creature before it could scamper off, and then roughly stuffed it down in the front of his own shirt, tugging on the string that he had fastened to it to pull it tight. It made breathing a bit hard, but it was the easiest way that he could hold on to the critter. At least, the fur was incredibly soft against his chest. Ah! The teeth, however, were a lot less soft, but it would stop after a little. He began to run down the shell of the crank snapper now, seeing the exit from the area heading into the opposite team's territory. He quickly started moving down it as he heard the crank snapper behind him howl in range and he started to move forward. The rest of the creatures in the area began to move quickly to get out of its way. Soon enough they were brushing past Victor as they got out of the way of the rampaging snapper. The enclosure was made to keep him stuck up in the mountain, but Victor could hear the shaking and crunching behind him as the creature tried to smash its way through the rock. At the very least, the rest of the animals in the forest were now on high alert. Victor was back down in the forest running for the territory of the enemy team when he burst through the bush and then fell forward as something snagged his left foot. He barely caught himself before hitting the ground and narrowly avoided it crashing the gispet in his shirt. He had to practice doing things one-handed to make sure that he was still effective while missing an arm. He turned over and looked back as he saw his foot snagged on a very intricate rope of some sort. The knot itself he recognizes the sort that you need two hands to loosen up. Frick. This is the end, human. Victor looked around for a moment and then saw the colter shake the dirt and foliage off of his quills as he got up. We will break you here. You won't win.
We can't allow it. You were never meant to get this far. Tell that to my fans, Victor spat back. Even in the dense forest, they could hear the cheering crowd in the stadium all roll around them. There were hidden cameras spread around to let them watch. They were obviously enjoying his progress so far. The fans know nothing, the Xena growled and swiped at the air. You will not endanger our prestige. Your team loses here. We've kept you from winning for 52 years. This will be no different. Look at you, one-armed and without a creature. What was your plan anyway? Victor realized that the creature didn't know that he had a kiss spit in his shirt. Just making trouble. You hear that screaming? I angered the crag snapper. It's trying to break out of the mountain. You didn't. Oh, I did. The cultist looked up at him and then back towards the mountain. He knew as well as Victor that his team would need help trying to herd animals through the path of an angry snapper. This isn't over your legus court. You go nowhere. The Xena growled and turned, sprinting towards the sound of the crag snapper, smashing apart the crafted mountain. Vincent tugged on the snare, but it wasn't strong enough to pull it apart one-handed. He couldn't just pop off his leg either. How the hell would he get to the enemy well? He looked around and then he grabbed a nearby rock, wincing a bit as he prepared himself to start slamming the rock down against his prosthetic foot. He was soon gasping and crying in pain as he did so. The rules allowed for his fake limbs because they weren't any stronger than he would have had in real, though a real. But so long as they were connected, they'd feel pain just like a normal limb. Normally, he could just disconnect the thing and be done with it, but this time, he kept smashing the foot, hearing a crack and splinter before it was broken enough for him to pull the stump of his ankle free. Grabbing the nearby tree and pushing himself up, and testing the weight on the stump before screaming in white hot agony. Reaching up and snapping off a branch of a tree, testing it out as a very crappy but functional crutch. Then he leaned a bit and started hopping. He could push off the stump a bit and the grit his teeth, ignoring the pain as he moved. When he got to the edge of the forest, he saw an empty field. They'd sent everyone into the forest, no defenders. He laughed and he kept hopping forward. Then he heard the crowd roar as they saw him emerge. Victor! Victor! He grinned and tried to move faster then. He was about halfway into the well when he heard the scream of anger behind him. The cultist had come back, obviously knowing something was up when he heard the chant. Damn! Victor tried hobbling forward faster. The cultist was sprinting as hard as he could towards him from behind. He could hear the chanting of the crowd and finally he tossed the branch behind him, putting more weight on his stump and screaming in agony with every step. But also every step brought him closer. With one hand, there was no way that he could get the gispet and toss it to the well, not with the cultist so close behind him. He moved closer and closer. Victor! 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 He was so freaking close. He heard the footsteps behind him. He could hear the cultist's ragged breathing. Victor! They were chanting his name, stomping their feet. 100,000 people were here in the stadium. 28 billion were watching live. Victor! He was screaming nonstop now that he had moved forward. He was at the edge of the wall and didn't know what to do. Still, he tumbled forward, nearly cracking his skull on the far side as his knee slammed into the side of the wall and he began to tumble in. Just when he thought that he was in and the points would be his, he stopped. He looked up and saw the cultist clutching his intact right leg. No, no, Victor reached up with his remaining hand and popped the release in his thigh. No, the cultist screamed in dismay as Victor continued to fall into the well. He didn't know what would happen. The animals would fall gently into the veterinarian facility to be cared for in case they were injured during the game. But the heaviest that they weighed was like 10 kilograms. Victor might literally be too heavy just to plummet to his death here. He felt something pluck his face and his hand trying to stop his fall, pressing on his cheek. Then there were others. But he was still moving quickly as he fell through the fake bottom of the well and got flipped around so that his back was a padded area with a heavy thud. He lay there for a few moments and then he finally spoke. Ow! 
A team of cultists rushed into the padded area then, pulling off of his shirt and pulling out the gizbet. The creature looked surprised, but not harmed. Then the Zeno's glance once more, and another in the back down of Victor, who had started laughing before groaning. He definitely fractured some ribs in that fall. What happens now? he finally asked. You're out of the game, one said. Did the gizbet points count? He looked around, obviously confused, at the surprised faces. We don't know. The rules must be checked. Well then, get me a wheelchair and a new pair of legs and another arm and get me topside. I have to cheer my team on. What? But you're out of the game. I can't compete, but I can cheer. I can roar. Do you hear the crowd? They're shouting victory. Victory. They want us to win. Get me up there. So long as he had breath in his lungs, he'd urge his team on. By playing or by roaring, soon enough, his voice was amongst the many in the crowd, cheering as loud as they could while they watched. Before, the roar was for him. It might be again, but now the roar was for his team. End of story. One Man's Trash, written by Regal, Legal Legal. Xavier Tetch glanced sideways at the others in the crew. Those that were left, that is, five of them, himself included. The four-armed Gas and Tala looking deadly and hot, as always, with the daggers. Nack Ross shifted his massive stone arms ready for another booby trapped or a crystalline guardian to appear. Jurek was still fiddling with a breather, trying to get the appropriate mixture for the atmosphere of the moon. And of course, the Professor. The only other human was in front of the sarcophagus, trying to disarm and lock and get it open. They lost six to the traps and the guardians in the ancient sarcophagus tomb, but the treasure the professor had told them about was just too good to pass up. Overall, Xavier had been prepared for the others to try and stab him in the back or shove him off the ledge since humans were still the new kids on the block, galactically speaking. So, most of them didn't fully appreciate the resourcefulness that he brought to the table. But truthfully, everyone had been spending too much time surviving to worry about betraying everyone. Until now. His hand slowly moved to his side, slipping under the back of his hem with his jacket as he looked at the Xenos on either side. Jurik and Nack first to the right, and Tula to the left after them. There was a very loud click as the professor did something, and the stone top of the sarcophagus began to creak back. Got it, he exclaimed, just as Xavier's fingers closed around the handles of Athena and Aphrodite. He yanked them free, pulling the triggers, even as he leveled them out. The Xeno started to turn as he hit Nack in the side of the head several times, blasting rock-like chunks out before the Xeno flew back. Jurek was screeching for her personal shield generator, but she never made it as the bullet slammed into her, peppering her body and letting gases escape from her pressurized suit. Tula, though, was quick as she turned, spinning her daggers at Xavier as he realized his mistake in shooting her last. Just as he twisted and leaned back, she was already too close, a pair of daggers slicing off of his left hand and sending Athena flying off as he screamed out. Another dagger lashed out across his face, but then he had Aphrodite pressed against her chest as he held down the trigger. Knocking the Xeno back as purple blood spewed from the wounds and spattered across him and the ground. Frick! Xavier screamed, dropping Aphrodite and clutching to the bleeding stump. He looked at the professor who was ducking down, hands over his head. Professor! Professor! Xavier growled out until the man hesitatingly pulled his hands back and looked around. Come in, they're dead. The treasure is just for you and me now. Get the search kit over here, though. The professor moved quickly, pulling out the military-grade search kit, holding it up for Xavier's bleeding stump. The device quickly slapped the biogel on the stump and then sealed the wound before dumping morphine into Xavier's bloodstream. He'd deal with the right eye later. The cut had sealed it shut with the blood, and he was only looking out for the left eye for now. Oh, that's the stuff. He gasped as the drugs did their work and the pain completely vanished. Well, why did you kill them? The professor finally asked. Because this way it's just a 50-50 split. They'd have betrayed us once we got out of here, you know. What's in there? Xavier's mind was already focused on the gold and gems and ancient alien artifacts. The professor walked over and reached in and pulled out a stone tablet. 
he began to read it as Xavier stood back up, grabbing Aphrodite and walking over and looking inside. The freck? It's just a shriveled old corpse, he gasped out as he saw what was inside of the stone sarcophagus. Um, this tablet says, uh, but now that you've pressed the tests of poetry, enlightenment and wisdom, you will see that the greatest treasure is not riches or wealth, but, uh, peace and serenity. The ability to find tranquility in the universe and appreciate the riches of life and nature. Xavier looked over at the professor, open mouth. What? That's what it says, the professor hefted the tablet. The, the, the traps the guardians were supposed to have been defeated with uh, poetry and stuff, I guess. Not explosives and, and, and weapons. They stood there for a quiet moment before Xavier lifted his right arm and shot the professor through the chest, shaking his head as the professor dropped down dead. Jesus Christ, freck these ancient ruins and stuff. Xavier muttered as he walked over to pick up his left hand that Athena still had in its grip. He tucked out the hand and the gun into his pack and began walking out of the tomb. Xavier, blood-eyed Tetch, sucked in breath as Saul sealed up the hole in his shin with a bone plug, his cybernetic eye remaining open as he squeezed his left eye shut reflexively from the pain. These lactors fought damn hard to protect whatever it was in the vault. This had to be worth it. After hearing about the secret vault of the Lacat homeworld, he had assembled a crack team of thieves, mercs, and pirates to raid the facility. He was down to just six men, not including himself, but there were just the vault itself. Nassif was cracking the code now, while the others guarded the Lacat aristocrats that captured and Saul's work to patch him up. Your friends, vile ruffians, one of them, was growling at Xavier, but he ignored the Xeno. Heard it before, he muttered with a sigh. Instead, he focused on a few left of his crew. Remember, we all get an even split. If I don't make it out of here, then you don't get the antidote. I won't have any of this betraying the others. There's going to be more than enough to go around. Look at the size of the vault, not to mention the security we killed on the way in. I still can't believe you poisoned us. The simmering ember-headed Zeno Kija growled. Truth was he hadn't actually poisoned them, and he just told him that he had. I've been on too many treasure hunts to know how tempting it is. I want as many of us walking out of this one as possible, Xavier promised. Speaking of, you're good, Saul said before helping Xavier back up to his feet. His metallic fingers squeezed the handle of Athena as he nodded and turned to the vault. There was a very promising click, then the massive metal door began to open and swing out. Xavier grinned wide prepared for golds and gems and ancient alien artifacts. But nothing inside was gleaming. He frowned and stepped forward, walking into the vault as Nasser was packing up his gear. Looking around the vault, he found a small case at the back and that's it. Opening up the case, he saw a small hydroponic setup for a small plant or tree or something and a pair of old envelopes with wax seals. What the frick? Is this, he asked, grabbing the envelopes with his right hand, letting them crinkle and tear a little, since they were so delicate. The love letters between Princess Tosca and General Haruma, the founders of our nation. That's the true Tussin tree that they grew together. It still lives to show their endearing love and remind us that love truly is the greatest treasure. Xavier clenched his teeth hard as he crumpled up the letters and ripped a small tree out of its soil. Oh, this is just great. You drag all of us all away and get most of us killed over... Kitcher was starting to complain, but Xavier just tossed the tree into her face and lifted Athena, shooting her in the face while she staggered back from getting hit by the tree. As flames burst out of her skull, Higgs had to quickly slap out the fire that caused on his jacket. Xavier ignored this, though, and reached down, squeezing the Xeno aristocrat by the throat and yanking him into the air. Say that again? Xavier growled. L love is our g g g g g greatest treasure. Xavier squeezed hard, crushing the Xeno's throat and dropping him to the ground. As the Xeno choked and gasped on the air, Xavier quickly shot the other prisoners in the head with Athena. For a moment, him and the remainder of the team stood there in silence. Freaking done with Xeno treasures, human treasures from now on only. He growled and began to limp back to where they come from, and his anger faded and was replaced with exhaustion. The others hesitated and then moved to follow. 
Captain Xavier Blood Eye Tetch, second most wanted pirate in the galaxy, sighed heavily as he tucked Athena and Aphrodite back into the holsters before reaching up to scratch his beard. So, we're all done with the mutiny, right? Between that and those nightmare fuel creatures, we're down to what? Fifteen of us? I told you, I told you all, there'll be enough to go around. We got a boss, Higgs said with a gulp. You, 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 you know that I was me, right, boss? Xavier set his hand on Higgs' shoulder and with a squeeze. I know, Higgs, I know. He looked around the old metal hull around them for a moment, the wreck of the JRS Kraken. Now here was the true human legend. He'd even heard the stories of when he was a kid. Fat with looted Daudless campaign, and the lost in the solar storm, and went down with all hands and an unknown system. Where here he was now in the hull. The only obstacle left was a cargo bay door in front of them now, and Sivan, Nassif's daughter, was working on the door controls to the side. The fact that Haran and the others had tried to betray him made him sad, but nothing could be done about it. This was also why he'd left most of the crew back on the ship. He'd lost thirty good sailors and fights today, but he still had more of this time. He was feeling very talkative this time, just a little worried. And then there was the click as the door controls were fixed and the door itself slid to the side. Xavier felt that usual hope rising within him, figuring there would be gems and gold and alien artifacts. When the door opened swiftly, he saw inside crates. Okay, that's all right. They were transporting cargo, so it made sense that they would be stored in crates. And there was a great deal of crates. He walked forward having to limp since the servos in his cybernetic leg had seized up with all the alien guts cogging them up after his crew had fought through the bastards on the surface to make it into the ship. As he reached the first crate, he closed good eye for a moment, an unflinching cybernetic still observing the crate before. He opened up the other eye and then opened up the crate. He looked inside for a moment and then closed the lid, walking over quietly to the shorter crate while he sat on it heavily. The crew looked at him with worried faces, for Xenos they really cared about the human captain. They got especially worried when Xavier began to cry. Higgs hesitantly opened up the lid of the crate. What the? He muttered softly and pulled out one of the objects inside. A magazine. As he held it open, the page unfolded and then sideways. Hey, look at that, it's an old porn mags. Wait. Higgs pulled out the manifest off the side and began to read. It's all vintage porn and stuff. Some of the first interspecies vids and pictures too. Boss, this stuff is really valuable. This has recordings that we thought were lost to history. The right collector will pay for this stuff seriously. I guess the valuable treasure that they had was history and, you know, porn. Xavier just had his head in his hands crying. I just want gold coins and treasure. Is there too much to ask for? He looked up for a moment, tears streaming down the sides of his face, over the scars and cuts and into the beard before he buried his face back in his hands. Dread Captain Xavier Blood Eye Tetch, the most wanted pirate in the galaxy, had to admit that the view from the surface of the planet was pretty spectacular. The rings and the bright moons in the sky made for one hell of a view. Plus the stars were as vivid and bright as he remembered them being as a kid. Come on, Cap. He heard and sighed, pulled from his reprieve as he walked over to follow the others through the small grove of blue and gleaming white moon trees. Beautiful night out, and to be honest, he had fun so far. The riddles had gotten a bit trickier as they followed them across the planet, but he'd figured them out and won been good sport in pretending that he didn't notice the clues that his crews were dropping. When they came out of the grove, he saw the giant X on the ground in the he saw the giant X on the ground in the gully that he had to keep himself from laughing and spoiling it. Oh, wow, Cap, look at that, an X marks the spot. Just like the old treasure map said, I told you we'd need shovels, Higgs said with a grin. Yeah, yeah, Higgs, good thing you brought them, Xavier said with a false smile. But I got this one. He walked down to the gentle slope at the center of the X and switched modes for his cybernetic eye. He located the metal crate beneath the surface and then jammed his upgraded left arm down into the ground, gripping the top and yanking it free of the soil. Good thing the soil had been dug up pretty recently, so that it was nice and soft. 
When he saw the crate, he noticed the cooling units on the sides and snorted before setting it down. Oh, wow, boss! Look at that! A chest of buried treasure! Well, go on and open it. He glanced around and saw the happy and cheerful faces of his crew. He couldn't let them down, so he smiled and flipped the latch with a soft click and pulled the lid up. He didn't expect gold and gems and alien artifacts, but inside there were indeed glittery gold coins illuminated by the light on the top of the crate that made them shine more clearly in the night. Wow, look at that! Ancient gold coins from Earth Boss! Xavier picked one of the coins up and peeled back the wrapper, biting it into the chocolate inside. He actually nodded at the taste and chewed slowly before swallowing. What? Higgs asked, now obviously confused. They're chocolate, Higgs. You bought this crate from Dash Trawler, Rhea. They love chocolate. To them, this really was worth whatever you thought you were paying for a crate of ancient gold coins. Didn't you wonder why you kept it refrigerated? Higgs' shoulders slumped, and Xavier noticed the forlorn look on the other Xenos. Hey now, don't look so sad, I had fun tonight, and look around. He waved the gleaming trees around them, and the rings of the moons in the sky. Look at this wonderful spot you took me to. It's beautiful. When, when did you figure it out, boss? Higgs asked. When you brought me the map, Higgs. No one actually makes a treasure map on paper with riddles and clues like that, but it was a very nice gesture. Come here, guys. Get some chocolate. It's good stuff. As his crew clustered around him, he hugged some of them to his sides and they began to laugh and smile at the whole situation. Well, boss, I guess you could say that the gracious treasure is fam- He stopped as Xavier jammed the barrel of Aphrodite up under his chin. Don't you dare freaking say it. Xavier growled, completely serious. The greatest treasure is gold and gems and alien artifacts. That's what I was going to say, boss. Higgs gasped out. Xavier pulled the gun back, holstering it, and the friend gulped down and rubbed his chin nervously. Ah, uh, what I mean is the greatest treasure is family jewels of long-dead Space King I heard about. Xavier was quiet for several seconds. Did you really hear about... No, forget it. It's just eat the chocolate and go home. Xavier learned his lesson by this point. But what if Hicks really had... No. No, 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 he was done. But maybe. End the story. Monster, machine, or man. Written by Regal, Legal Eagle. Hicks gives Norges looked around at the fuel station's commissary for a moment as he got a number of looks. As usual, he stood out. Most Siskin squaw did due to the colorful feathers. Norges was particularly vibrant with red over most of his body. With white circles around his eyes, his feet and hands were coated in blue, but there was also splashes of yellow. Norges used to enjoy standing out amongst the drab aliens that he had come across, but he realized now that for the life of adventuring, it might not be so great. Someone easy to notice was always easy to remember, which could be good and it could be bad. He hoped that he didn't owe anyone any money, and he looked over the aliens looking back at him. But soon enough, though, the other patrons went back to what they were doing, and he sighed softly, heading towards the bar. Since dropping out of the university, he'd been trying to make a name for himself. Reading those epic poems and voyages had given him a case of wanderlust that no book could cure. He had used up what he had left of his tuition money and bought a Krizix Comet and decided to look for either a crew to take him on or to join him or a captain in need of a scout. But it wasn't working out for him. No one wanted Siskin Squaw captain thanks to the stereotypes, and no captain wanted a scout that was easy to spot. He'd been raking up quite a debt lately, just trying to find ways to adventure or make money. This was perhaps his last hope. He'd heard that the sector had seen an unusual number of wrecks recently and was hoping to find those who would join him to salvage the effort. It wasn't a romantic and adventuring that he dreamed about, but he needed some money to start paying off his own debt. The problem was that he'd heard how dangerous the sector was. Some new species had shown up and was making life hard for all involved. At the bar, he noticed two forearm grassen, very similar features. Brothers, perhaps. 
their plain old blue skin blending in with the somber morning clothes that they were wearing. Though, despite the clothes, they did look like they were in mourning. He saw the numerous players each had strapped about their body. There were some other normal-looking ruffians and thug types around the bar with them, but he noticed a hunched over Polbirin at the end. His precious suit was more ragged than the Norges had seen before. Some sort of silvery tape was covering numerous patches of the suit. How he managed to keep a breathable atmosphere in there, the Norges had no idea. As he approached the bar, the only open spot was next to the christen, so he slid past and took a seat. He motioned for the bartender, and then, as the machine came over, he quietly ordered, One hot courage of tea, please. Ha! <laughs> tea! One of the grassen next to him exclaimed, snapping Norges on the shoulder hard. Aren't you in the wrong place for ordering tea, lad? Norges gulped down as he looked over the much bigger alien for a moment. If they serve tea, why would this be the wrong place for it? The Grissom laughed at his comment, though he wasn't sure why. Is that your comment out there? he asked, and the Norges looked over his shoulder and out of the viewport of the ships being fueled up, and he nodded with his ship that was mentioned. It is. It's a very fine ship. Suddenly the second Grissom moved to Norges, the other side, and the sandwiching in them in between them. He began to feel rather nervous. With a ship like that, it would be quite easy for us to complete our task. And what might that be? Norges asked, looking from one to another with a nervous expression. We hunt a beast. The Grissom roared together, drawing the attention of everyone else in the bar, except for the hunched over Polbaron at the end of the bar for some reason. He just kept quietly sucking down the drink through the straw in his pressurized suit's face place. The Grassen on the Norges' left continued. Many cycles ago, an expedition was formed to explore the Sophic tomb on a nearly barren moon far from here. A tundra of wild animals and exotic plants, no less. Eleven entered the tomb, and none of the expedition came out. Instead, they woke something horrible deep inside. The bar was quiet now as the patrons listened to the tale being woven. This was no ordinary beast either. The Grissom, to his right, spoke up now. It had been wounded while killing the expedition. The entire limb had been removed, but it did not slow down. He nearly whispered the last part as murmurs overtook the crowd. It bled, leaving behind a trail of its innards from the mouth of the tomb. We assumed that we could track this trail and find the body of the beast not far past. But no. He nearly shouted that, and everyone leaned back before one on the left started. Across this barren tundra, we followed the trail of the wounded beast, shocked when we realized the bleeding had somehow stopped without medical aid. As it traveled, they can consume toxic plants rich with all sorts of chemicals scientists use to make biological weapons, but not only plants. It hunted small animals, so voracious was its appetite. Then we discovered that it scavenged the kills of other predators, leaving nothing behind but bone. No predator in the wastes would touch it, or perhaps they couldn't. Taking turns in each one and the spoke again. We even found dwellings made of nothing but ice and the beast used for shelter. Ice. Nothing could stop this beast from its goal. On a journey that covered nearly half a moon, it did not stop. Finally, it found the ship that the expedition had left behind. The ship belonged to our clan and our sister who had gone through the expedition. Which is why... The Gransom slapped his hand on the Norges' shoulder again, making him jump. We need your ship to track it down and kill it to bring revenge to our family. Well, well that's a noble goal, the Norges stammered. But, but, but I, I need money for fuel and I have debts. What can you pay? We'll pay you in blood, the Grassum growled out, and the Norges gulped heavily as they started to reach out for their blades. But then there was a whine of a charge at a pistol, and the Grassum turned. And the Norges as well. Amid the tables of the bar area was a solitary figure, a black cloaked cabist who looked familiar. Norges gasped and then realized he was looking at Sure Shot, Seren, and a wanted criminal. But Norges thought that Sven worked with a team. 
That's a nice goal you two have, avenging your sister, but I need that ship more urgently than you need to, I'm afraid. You see, that creature you're talking about is probably just a slug, something slow that can dissolve its food easily as it moves. Hardly a threat to those of us who can walk around faster than a Lovian cow. There were some nervous chuckles from around the bar. But what I am dealing with is not a lot more persistent. I'm sure some of you recognize me from the wanted posters. The alien pulled his cloak back a bit, and revealing the seven yellow eyes of the scarred pincers which marked him more clearly as a spurn. I don't mind telling you a cycle or so back, my team hit a Javaltian mechanic. You know the sort, prefers the company of robots to organics. Sun shifted then, extending out his other hand from under his cloak so that the grassin reached for his blade. He made it clear that he had a pistol aimed at each of them now, and he settled down a bit. It wasn't anything personal, he just had some information that we were looking for. And a job's a job. Well, it turns out that the old mechanic had something in his workshop none of us had ever seen before. In fact, I can't say that I've actually seen it. It was big. One arm was a fist, whatever you'd expect, but the other. The other was a claw, and it had one big red orb that never shut. It took up most of the head, just always peering around, bright red and evil as anything that I'd ever seen. Well, this robot took offense to what we'd done. It destroyed our ship's engines before we could even take off, and then our mechanics who went to investigate the trouble. It slit their throats open and hung them from the ceiling of the engine room, just to let all of their blood flow down into the pool for us to find. The hardened criminal shivered at the memory. Well, that was just the start. It came for us, and of course we ran. Thankfully, I knew the Jibbleston had another ship several day cycles from his workshop. Well, those were the longest day cycles of my life. That robot didn't stop. No matter how tired we were, or how short our sleep cycles were, it kept coming. Before long, not one of us would go off alone, even to relieve ourselves. We would just see the gleaming red light in the distance, day and night, for three solar cycles. We only managed to get a mere six sleep cycles in that time as we tried to run. It just kept coming. The alien sighed for a moment. Well, in the end, it got everyone but me. I got on that ship and I left the planet, but I know it's been following me. Don't ask me how I know. I just know. So, I've been bouncing between fuel stations since then. But the Jibbleton ship broke down two solar cycles ago, and I need to leave. So the comet will be my ship now. D -d -d don't I get a say in this? Nord just asked. No. And if you don't like it, this little Siscon squaw, you can complain to the goddess when you see her. Surin responded coldly. Nord just saw the Grassin start to tug on their knives perhaps ready to try and rush the alien. But then a horrible scratching sound made everyone in the bar grasp and clutch at their ears, or whatever auditory sentries that they had. Then they were all looking at the polbalon at the end of the bar. He had dragged something over the metallic faceplate of his pressure chute. You're both wrong, and you're both right, the polbalon said with a scratchy voice like no polbalon Norgers had heard. Wrong and right about what? Swin asked, and the aliens in the pressure suit slowly turned to face the rest of the bar. His visor closed, for some reason. You're not talking about two different creatures. You're talking about one. The Grassen and Swin started to argue, but the Polbaran dragged that shard of metal across the faceplate again, and a horrible sound made everyone stop. What you're talking about is a human... They're new to the sector. I'm sure you've heard the rumors. Well, I've seen them. You can't be serious. One species, both beast and robot, one of the grasses exclaimed. Oh, indeed. But that's only because you've got the part wrong and part right, like I said. You see, not all of them are part robot, but it is easy to think that. What? Nothing can be part robot, Sven snorted derisively. 
Any organic would die if fused with metal. Oh, but not these, the pauper responded. It starts when they're young. You see, they have too many bones to put inside their mouths. They have to use metal straps and twist and bend these bones into shape. They've got special doctors that will drill. The alien mimicked the sound of the drill and the lodgers shuddered. Holes into the mouth bones and even yank them out. He jerked his hand, which made the lodgers and most of the bar patrons gasp in surprise. If they break other bones, they sometimes draw metal plates into their flesh to hold it together. Sometimes they even do that to their skulls. Wounds in the head, they don't kill them. They just patch up the hole with some metal. They say it lets them pick up radio signals in their brains. Other times they'll seal up the cut with glue, just to let their body sort it out once the wound is plugged. Then there are times when they'll even burn their own flesh to cauterize an injury. I- impossible, the Swern grasped, as he sounded worried now. That's why you think that you found was a robot. Even hundreds of cycles ago, before the species had even mastered the atom, they would replace lost limbs with metal. If they lost a hand, they'd replace it with a metal hook. The alien chanted, his hand raising up to a hook shape, which made everyone gasp. Or they'd jam a wooden stake into the end of the leg if they lost that. Some lost to disease, but many more survived the process. Their bodies had hardened by evolution to resist plagues and poisons, and other toxins, any one of which would kill half of this rumor. The bar was quiet now, and they listened in a horrified fascination to the Balbaron. You see, they were scavengers. Even on their home planet, these creatures didn't start at the top. Instead, they used the guile and endurance like no other. The robot you think you faced, or the beast you tracked, you said it yourselves. It seemed to stop. On and on it went solar cycle over solar cycle. That's what they do. You run, you might not see them for a bit, and suddenly, there they are. You run further, maybe you get a bit more time, and then there they are again. Across the entire continents, they would track their prey. Norges had a beak opened wide as he listened, horrified at the sound of these aliens. Now they have something called cybernetics. They actually practice the ability to chop off limbs, replacing them with metal. More gasps as the pulberon spoke. The metals that poison so many don't even phase these creatures. Their flesh will start to fuse around it, accepting it as if it was part of their natural self all along. Their blood and innards, you tracked. He looked at the grass and remains of a lost limb it tried to save. The red eye you saw in the dark, he looked at the Severn, an eye replaced with metal and power. How do you know this? the Severn asked. Because I've seen him. The pauvron turned away from the crowd, looking down at it to his drink. Only the eye isn't that big. It just seems that way because you're scared. In fact, it looks more, the pauvron reached up suddenly and yanked the visor away as he turned. Like this! The red beam swept across the bar, screaming, started as everyone realized that it wasn't a pauvron at all. It was a human in a dead pauvron suit. Nor just screamed in the grass and tried to pull him away, no doubt to get the keys to his ship. But there was noise and screaming and blurring motion. Before Norges really knew what was going on, and he was on the floor, he was shoved down, somehow. Trying to not look up as he heard more screams, and big boom something, warm splattered across his back as he crawled down the bar. Then, when he saw what was clear, he reached up, putting himself up over it as he could hide behind the bar. He just clutched his hands over his head until the screaming and booms finally stopped. Slowly, very slowly, he pulled his hands away from his head, and he slowly got up, toning as he gripped the edge of the bar, and he edged up to the pier over it. All around the bar were dead aliens. The Grasson, who was slain by Surin's head, was nowhere to be found but his body, was draped over a table. And... The human was still alive. Oh, goddess! Nurgis dropped back down. All right, 
Fun's over, the human said. I know you're behind the bar. Come on out. Norges whimpered as he slowly stood up. The red eye of the human scanned over him for a moment as he now saw the human had another eye. An organic one. They shouldn't trouble you for your ship anymore. I've been hunting this one for a while. He pointed at Sverin, confirming the criminal story. Sort of. He killed the guy who patched me up. He then he tapped the side of his head where the metal implant replaced with one eye. Th th that's it? Norges asked. You d d d d don't want to feast on me or, or steal my ship? Nah. Although it is a great ship. How would you like to join my crew? W w what? Norges blinked, confused now. I could use a good ship and a good crew. You could be the first offender, had information stolen from that mechanic, you see. Some sort of lost Lakatch treasure that I want to claim. You will let me join your crew, the Norges asked, focusing on the offer. Yeah. But I'm a Siskon Squaw, a creature as terrifying and as powerful as you. Will you let me join your crew, he asked. Sure. You look like a parrot. And every good pirate needs a good parrot. What? Norges asked and blinked. Never mind. What's your name? The human asked. Higgs Norges. That's a mouthful. I don't like it. How about the first spot? Higgs. I like Higgs. Well, I'm Xavier Tetch. The human pulled a knife out of his back and then the Norges grasped. He could see more cuts along the human's body, but he didn't seem to mind or care about any of them. And this creature wanted him to be part of his crew. Though something else said Norges. Well, wait, that's your name. It's Moring. What about Blood Eye? Blood Eye, the human asked, sounding doubtful. That's hardly a catchy name. I don't think it will stick. Now come on, Higgs. We've got treasure to find. The human turned and began walking out of the bar. Over the dead body stumping, threw their blood and pulled onto the floor. Did he dare to follow the crazy Indian? That human. Well, any good Siskel squaw could understand the value of being friends with the toughest, meanest, and most violent predator around. So he began to follow the human, figuring that he would never find better. End of story. Called the Hollow One. Written by Regal, Legal Eagle. Out! As they screeched the word over the speakers, I moved forward. Eyes cast down to avoid the glare of the massive floodlights that had focused on the transport. Going from the darkness of the transport into the bright lights of the camp was always a harsh on my eyes. I tried to keep my ears folded back as best as I could too. The lessened the harsh screeching. All around the edges of the crowd, they were picking and prodding, and the others were with the shock sticks. I had learned to keep with the middle, head down, move forward. I couldn't fault the others for not knowing what to do. They were fresh, terrified and weary from the long trip with minimal food and water. Most of our people didn't survive through the single camp. This was my fault. I rarely look straight into the captors these days. They hurt my eyes, much like the lights. They were so red, both in natural color and heat, angry. So angry, so angular as well. Their bodies seemed to form jagged sharp edges and angles that one might think of be a machine if they did not know better. They were easily twice as tall as our average and far more aggressive than any of our kind. Even our hunters, like me, who had been at the back of the blessed home, was no concern to them. When they came to our dark paradise, they brought lights, machines, and fire. The jungle burned away to reveal their precious minerals, and those who had been unfortunate enough to get caught were sent elsewhere. We have small hands compared to them, and a thumb on either side of our palms so that we considered us useful for tinkering and scavenging. They send us to break down the old operations of theirs, be it mining or conquest. Once we pass the first line of the big lights, I glance around, opening one set of my eyes at a time to view the new place that every way that I can. It's dark and grey right now, cold and dry but I do see a few scratchy white images in the distance. There is some power left then. 
It's a dead city, one of their conquests. But I had not seen one with the power left. This is the contrast of the scars that I see in the massive buildings that look very old. Their enemy must have been smart then, to make devices which hold some electricity in them still. The next line of lights is on us, and I look back towards the ground, watching my feet while I shamble forward with the others. I can hear the whimpers, cries, and the gasps, but I do what I can to ignore them. They are worried about their families, trying to stay together. I do not have this pain anymore. It is a luxury of survival to know that I am alone. Apart, apart! They began to screech. They mean for us to get into the lines, but they don't bother learning more than a few words of our language. I shift into the far left line. Most try to press to the center. This is a mistake. The jobs at the center of the camp do not involve leaving the camp. You are entirely stuck within the walls. But if you are at the edge, you'll be sent to your outside. And you have more chances. I was lucky in this in the first camp. It was hard to tell how long it had been since the first camp. And the clutches of angry red ones every day of survival seems to stretch far beyond what any day should be. I doubt that I'll see any familiar faces from the horrific learning experience. Of course, as I thought back to Hammerjock, showed his mirth of the joke that is life and revealed to me a face that I've never expected to see again. He was a four ahead of me and in his new line, a friend from back before we had any awareness of the angry red ones. Another hunter possessing three sets of eyes. I opened all of my own to witness him in every spectrum, and there was no mistaking the spectral visage. True sight, heat, and spark of life that were the same one. We had barely survived that first camp, but been split up for the second. I never expected to see him again. I quickly crushed a flare of hope, then it started to rise up within me. Hope is not for the survivor. Determination and hatred, these are for the survivor. He sees me and twitches his ears to the right. His thumbs trace a line in the air for me to watch. I look for the girl that he indicated. I see her. She's near me. She looks terrified and young. I see some resemblance in the true sight and the spark of life. Family. But she's heading to the inner line. Mistake. Before she gets too far, before the guards notice, I reach out and strongly grip her arm and jerk her into our line. She gasps and whines, but when she tries to look back, I shove her head forward. She stumbles into the person before us and stumbles as well, but my friend is prepared and holds up the rest, so the next line doesn't jam. Move! I hear the screech and continue walking. Why did you do that? I hear her gasp. Her voice was soft and sweet as a ripe voolish. How long has it been since I've heard such a softness in this life? Too long. She will likely be dead soon. Softness does not survive well. Friend ahead moved, I croaked, my voice feeling rusty and unused. I talk very little these days. Her eyes are wide blinded in the harsh lights. She's so terrified she's seeing in color and heat together, further confusing her surroundings. Most of our kind are without a third set, and to see the spark of life is a great honor and a privilege. To us, it means that we are better scavengers for the Red Ones. We trudge along and the line takes shape. We are marched past the watchful eyes of the Red Ones and their machines. I'm more curious than anything. Each camp has been different. The first, we had to build ourselves. The others, we merely took down at the end. They always make up reasons for why we are scavenging and why we must dismantle the camps for parts. The power of the Empire, or how unworthy we are anyway. But I know really why. They are hurting. Any such talk must be extremely careful. They will kill us for far less. But I have heard it, and I see it. The Red Ones are not as big as the others that I've seen. Big as they are, the camp too moved before we were done. And they made us move quick. Not to mention that they make us scavenge. What great empires need to scavenge? I wish I knew more, but this is enough. The forbidden knowledge has given me a goal. 
My family is gone. Until now, I thought my friends were all gone too. I simply seek to survive, to see them hurt, to see their pain. I fear the voice of Blergeg, and the whisper to me in the pain was not enough. But before I know any satisfaction, I must see them in pain. At least once, as I am thinking about that we enter a larger enclosure around the buildings. It's an old building, part of the ghost city around us. I'm in shock to be given a structure such as this for our barracks. Truly, I'm hesitant for a moment, but the line is still moving and I must keep up. I will not get into the inside yet. We are lined up before this building. I see one of the larger red ones, more impressive than the others. Something odder, however, as I slowly blink my other eyes. His heat is different than I would expect. His sparks of life less regular than the others. He is nervous about something. Then they bring out a traitor. I hate them more than I hate the red ones. They have seen what they do to us. The red ones think of them as no better than disposable tools. Yet they think themselves to be better than the rest of us. That the red ones value them. These things are not true. Normally, the big one will speak about the task while the traitor explains. This time, however, was a bit different. What do I tell them about the city? The traitor asked in a tongue that the red ones, all close as they could get, no matter how hard one of us might try, their throats were not the same as theirs. Very few of us could understand the language, and I had survived long enough to know it. It is dead, but dangerous. Tell them to report anything with light. The red one was curt, no swearing or growling, just one very unusual. Should I mention the no? He growled out, proving that he was unusual, but not completely different. What were they concerned about? The traitor began to explain our job then. Just as I expected, we were going to be heading out into the camp, into the city and the surrounding area to scavenge pieces and parts for their empire. This time, he did add that there was many dangerous devices left over from the vanquished enemy, and that we should alert them should we find any working lights. How much we got to eat would depend directly on how much we found. Good behavior would be rewarded, bad behavior would be punished. In reality, I knew that we would be punished no matter what, but some of us would lose our dignity and do whatever asked, and in turn simply be punished less. I did not voice this, of course. Instead, I listened to the traitor and the big red one when the traitor spoke in the captor's tongue once more. I think we should warn them. They'll be out where it strikes. No, the big one was firm yet again. Tell them that they all line up now for the tattoos in the first assignment. Once the traitor was done translating, the big one spoke again. Tell them that I will now demonstrate how serious we are about obedience. Yet again, the translator translated, and I knew what was coming. He did not. The big red one pulled out his death spark free of his side and shot the traitor in the side of the head. Most of the others screamed in terror, but I didn't flinch. In fact, I watched in all three spectrums. True sight heaked and spark of life. As awful and as terrible as it can, I can seldom turn away from watching this happen. The painting it creates across my vision is beautiful in a terrifying manner. While the heat and the spark of life fade from the body, everyone began moving to the side for their tattoos. I watched for another few seconds before turning to follow the others. I did not fight for the front, but I did not fall back too far. I had to remain near the girl to make sure that she stayed near the middle as well. As we began to get funneled through another set of blade wire, I could hear some of our captors. Which ones do we take for tonight? They said that our meat shipment is late. I quietly leaned forward, close to the girl, eyes focused on her neck. I like them younger. They taste better. Keep your eyes out of something really fresh. When I heard that, I coughed, trying to cover up the fact that I was reaching into my mouth to pull free some garish berries that I'd hidden under my tongue. I crushed them in my hand and smeared the remains of the girl's neck. What are you doing? She gasped out. No words. I quickly chided and finished smearing the greenish remains about the back of her neck. Just in time, too, as I straightened up and we walked past the butchers. That one? Ah, uh, 
Never mind, seems like she might have that disgusting rot thing that they get sometimes. Oh, but the other one looks good. Behind us, they pulled someone else from the line. As the others heard the commotion, the girl tried to turn. I just jabbed her in the side and kept her moving forward. Things slowed down once we got to the chairs. Anyone who spoke loud enough to be heard got a shock, so we waited in silence after the others figured out that. We all waited for our turns. The girl was just before me, and I heard her gasp as the whine of another prisoner administered the ink. Then it was my turn. I sat down in a chair and placed my arm where I knew it must go. The prisoner looked at me for a moment and then at my arm, gasping as she noticed three other tattoos. She was young, though not fresh like the other girl. I'm so sorry, she whispered. I live. If you also wish to live, do your job. Do not focus on our pain. Focus on your survival. My reply was honest, if a bit blunt. She nodded and shifted the machine before activating it. I let out a slight hiss as I felt the needles yet again. Some other device rubbed against my back, leaving behind the same number on my clothing. But soon, it was done. I had another number, a new name for the captors to growl out. My fourth such number. I got up and moved with the others towards the tools. Most of our people were simple farmers. They moved towards the tools that they recognized. Large, heavy mistakes. I prodded the girl away from the others towards my friend. When she saw him, she began to move quickly, but backed off and motioned for her to stop, quietly whispering, We must not appear to know each other. They will separate us. Then he moved around to the other side of the tool pile. I picked up a small case that I knew well, fine work tools, and I would have to earn my keep with these, but I could do far better than in the right conditions. I hoped that the city involved those conditions. For the girl, I motioned the cutters and strippers. Wiring was dangerous for those who could not see the spark. But I could show her, and she could have a decent job. Once everyone had tools, we were split into groups. My friend and I were careful not to make obvious that we were shifting to ensure that we'd be in the same group with the girl. The red ones didn't notice. Then off we went to the ghost of the city. Here... And there I noticed the wide fuzz of life spark in the old machines. This city was an interesting salvage job. Clearly, the old buildings were still full of materials, but they weren't after simple raw materials this time. They shouted and shocked at the edges of the group to keep us moving until we reached a building with which more sparks of life in it than I'd seen so far. They yelled at the people once more and began to set up the posts around the building and got everyone to work. Most of the people had started dismantling the structure, which was very hard work. As I knew that they'd picked up the wrong tools, I pushed inside with the girl, showing her to a room the red ones had started on already. There was no power in the room, and I quickly showed her how to strip and cut the wires that she needed to pull out the wall. I began to dismantle the metal boxes left behind by whoever lived here before. The red ones would patrol so that I would be careful to keep the work level looking consistent. Too slow, and they would beat you too fast, and they would set up your expectations too high. The key was to pace yourself. Do what you can to be useful, but unnoticed. A narrow path to walk, for that first day it was easy to settle into the usual groove. We were indoors, the temperature was a bit cool, but not too bad, and these guards didn't seem bored as usual, so I wasn't beat at all. As I disassembled the metal boxes, I would give the girl more wire to make it seem that she had done more work, though I was careful to only add to it when the patrols weren't in the room. I was a little surprised when we were told after about nine hours. A short work day for the red ones. A planet seemed light, still and they didn't seem to fear the dark before. I wondered why we were stopping. Either way, we gathered our findings and assembled as a group. The guards would mark what we'd found before we dumped it into the floating trucks. After that, we were assigned rations based on how much we got. I did not get the most, but I did better than many. This was the idea. Then we were herded back to the barracks. When we were ushered inside, I nearly gasped. This was a palace. The walls were still intact, and they looked like they had insulation. 
The bathrooms had cold running water, and bowls that would make water away and replace it with new water. It also looked like there was almost enough bunks for everyone. It would likely only take a week or two before everyone had left their own bunk. I couldn't believe how nice this place was. What was going on? Suddenly, I began to feel suspicious. Why were the Red Ones letting us use such a nice building? I felt uneasy and chose a bunk in the far corner near the broken window. It would be colder and the others avoided the area. But the Red Ones came for us in the night. I might be able to get out of the way. The broken glass would only cut me a little. I settled into my bunk and see the girl approach. This corner is cold. Why not join us further in? It's a bit crumped and much warmer. I stared at her. All my eyes were open to observe her being as she stood there, and I kept quiet. For some reason, she was more stubborn than I expected for someone so soft. It took three minutes before she finally turned and left, sounding frustrated. Fine. Be that way. I saw my close friend choose the bunk at the edge of the corner that I was in, close enough that he might be able to get to the window, but also not too far from the girl. He needed to be careful. Such sentimental decisions could be dangerous. When no one else came to my corner, I took a thin blanket from the lower bunk, and the pillow as well. Normally, I did not get such a luxury for several weeks. To my surprise, nothing happened in the night. Morning came, and with it the usual morning gruel. The stuff was warm. I can't figure out what was going on. This place was too nice for the red ones. We returned to the same building as the day before, and I got to open up the metal box that I'd been working on and freeze once the lid was off. There is a knife inside. I quickly closed the lid and look around. A red one in the hall, I pretend to fiddle with my tills until he moves on. I open the lid again. The knife is still there. It was not there yesterday. It is small but very sharp, and it even folds into itself, and a little latch to hold it closed. A knife. How long has it been since I've had such a tool? So many of the farmers fail to understand how useful a blade like this can be. But a hunter knows, and I'm unsure if this is a test. I decide that it is not my hand moves over the box. The knife vanishes and I hide it away. The girl clearly has no idea what has happened. Was this a gift? I slowly look around the room. All eyes open, I see nothing. I hesitate before getting to work. The boxes still need to be disassembled. Since we got back to work much faster today than yesterday, it is a ten-hour day. But it is still light when we are told to stop. They must be afraid of the dark. I do not understand why. It makes me both curious and nervous. This camp will perhaps be the easiest that I've lived in. A year or two here will be not hard to survive if I play this right, but... With the knife, I begin to wonder if there is something that I can do more than survival. This seed of hope is dangerous. I shake my head, survive. This is my goal. These days have not been as long as the previous camps, and I am not beaten regularly. They are only eating one of us a day, and I am not sure how to interpret this connection with what is going on at night. I have been watching the patrols. So far, it seems that they are more to wander the city than I would think for a dead place. I see the way that they move. They are concerned about something. I think there is a traitor killed on the first day. Something dangerous is out there. Dangerous to us? Or them? On the third day, my ears twitch back, and I hear the guards in the hall. They want a new translator. For what? They translated the shock out of the sticks well enough. Not for us to decide. Who should we use? I think that one with the little tools in the room is smart. He might already understand a word or two. How do I check? Just walk in behind him and announce that if he doesn't stand up, you're going to hit him. See what he does. I gulped and focused on my current box. This would not be easy. The red one walked in behind me and I heard him speak. You stand before I hit you. My ears twitched, and I stopped and I looked up from my work, the red one towering over me. I did not get up. This will be the hard part. Get up, I said. I tried to look confused. I can't do anything to make it clear that I know what will happen. I cannot brace. It must be a full-on. His stick swings out, smashing against the side of my face. The pain 
is real. The acting is over as I whimper and wind clutching the side of my face, rolling on the floor. Ah, he doesn't understand a thing. We'll find another one. The guard leaves the room. My productivity is much lower today with the three swollen eyes. I did not eat well that night, but I will recover. On the fourth day, I am surprised by a small vial in another box. I know the markings of the red ones on the side. It is for healing. I could use it to spur recovery of my eyes, and people would notice. I carefully make it vanish and look around the room once more. Little else happens that day. On the fifth, I move to the next room with the girl. I check it over and feel something strange under one of the tables. There is some sort of door held shut. I can't get anything into the seam until I remember my knife. Careful to only pull it out when the patrol is gone and the girl is busy, I run it along the seam until I hear a click. I barely catch the object that falls out. I already hear Lyrgic whisper to me. It is a death spark. I do not need to wait. I can inflict pain on them now. Ah, but I quickly twitch my ears and I wave the whispers away and tuck the device back into the hidden compartment. It is damage. It will do nothing to them. But it is the least damaged death spark that I found. The image is burned into my mind even now. I can see the parts that I needed to replace. And then I need a power source. I begin to hunt for the pieces needed when we scavenge the room. Careful to leave the table alone for now and guide her to other places. But on the sixth day, I finally had an idea who was out there and made the Red One Sphere the night. I heard screaming around midday, which was normal. One of their more aggressive guards had taken a beating for a girl in the small infractions. Perhaps he liked the meat tenderized. I learned not to interfere in such matters. But when I heard him scream, I knew something was different. I rushed to the window and saw the dead guard lying away from the building near the trees. The girl was on the ground, bleeding and crying. But his head was facing backwards and his right arm looked crushed. This was clearly not her work. As the girl threw up in the corner of the room, I scanned the trees. All eyes open. I caught movement for a moment and then focused on true sight, only to see nothing moving. This is what I couldn't see, but I could see it move. My mind was perplexed by what my eyes were telling it. I saw nothing with heat, but as I closed my other set's eyes and focused on the spark of life, I saw something. It was blurry, but floating. I was unsure. But then it was gone. What was it? A ghost to live in the ghost city. A spectre come to haunt the red devils. We were pulled from the building quickly after that, and we were all interrogated and the girl was removed, but no one saw anything. I had a perverse pleasure telling the traitor translator that they had brought out. I saw nothing move. It was the truth, and yet a lie strangely thrilling. The day after began as if nothing had happened, and I found a part of the death spark, then another hidden away in the corner of the third room. I was close now. I needed one more part of the power source. However, that night I was awakened by my friend. He had approached my bunk and grabbed my knife as I opened my eyes, sensing someone's approach. Even when I saw who it was, I didn't relax. What? I hesitantly croaked, my voice still feeling rusty. You are clearly well suited to the survival. Carissa is sick. Might you have something to help her? I nearly asked who Carissa was. Then I realized it must be the girl. I'd never asked her name, but who else would he be risking his life for? I was very inhesitant. Before being sick mattered little to me. If she was removed from the group, my job would be easier. One less person to worry about spying on me or betraying me. And yet years ago, before all of this had been truly my closest friend, I carefully gave him the vial that I'd found in the metal box. Half, I hissed out. He nodded and quietly walked back to the center of the room. When he returned, half the vial was empty, and he handed it back. I could still use it for something if I got wounded. And I wanted to warn him not to be so careless with his own life. To risk approaching another in the middle of the night like this. Well, perhaps the others thought this was normal, but if it had been less aware of who I was, I might have attacked him without being woken up like that. The next day, however, I had my own trouble. The guards had found the lock safe hidden upstairs. They had apparently realized that I was good at tools and even brought over a translator to explain to me that I needed to open the safe by the end of the day. 
or I would be punished severely for my failure. I had been so concerned with finding the parts to fix the death spark that I'd forgotten one of the most important rules. Do not become obviously useful. For the first few hours of the day I was calm, I could see both the real safe and the sparks within it, guiding my hand as I worked at it, and I opened the door around midday, thinking nothing of it, but when the door was opened, there was another behind it. But this had a lock of buttons, not levers, and the guards seemed upset as they yelled at me for a while before they moved to the other rooms, no longer interested in watching. Figuring that I'd failed, to be honest, I was fairly sure that I would too. I had no idea what to do with the lock to make it like this. I didn't know that the creatures who had built the safe or the ghost city around us. What hope did I have? To my surprise, an hour before the day would be over, and perhaps my life... The window opened, and I looked up and I had bite my tongue in order not to cry in surprise. The figure was a dark grey on the outside, and some sort of hard shell. It had two arms, two legs, and looked a little larger than myself. When I opened my other eyes, however, I realized something was wrong. There was no heat. Then I saw the sparks. How many sparks? There was no organic being. The sparks ran in patterns that I had never seen before. It was beautiful. The gray shell was metal. This was some sort of armor. And there was a strange blue light that seeped out of the cracks of the armor that moved on its own. This hollow being, without taking an approach to the safe, pressing the buttons in order that I didn't catch before the second door swung open. From inside the safe, he, it, took a bundle of papers before turning to me and handing me a small parcel, the last part I needed. With that, it turned and walked out the back of the window, and I rushed over, but the figure had already gone. When the red ones came in, I was sitting on the open safe, and the inside still full of papers and armor did not take. I was given many rations, but most important to me was hearing that the guards talk about the papers while I was in the room. They had belonged to something called a human. Is that armor this human? I was curious. I saved the stored many of my rations, knowing that I could s escape shortly. I crushed the spark of hope in me, though. I would not let my heart be laid. The brain was a tool of survival, a thought cemented in me when my friend approached me again that night. I need that medicine. She is already weak from the poor nutrition and hard work. Half is not enough. Half is enough for any cold. I have not seen her sick. What is this about? I asked, hand my knife, as I watched the man, I hoped, was still my friend in all spectrums. She's pregnant. I was quiet, as I understood the stakes for him now. You moron! You idiot! I growled out. This will surely kill you both. Not if we escape. Surely you have a plan. We must leave soon before they find out. This was rushing things. Survival was not to be rushed. I hated him. I hated her. I was so close to working the death spark that they wanted to rush things. The heart must never lead. This is why, but... If I did not help, they might take me with them. He is already emotional. How irrational might he get? I need something to cut the blade wire and open up the window glass without much noise. I already have these things, he promised. I finally handed over the vial so that he might take the rest to his wife or who I had assumed was his wife officially, or unofficially. Tomorrow, get as many rations as you can tell her to be ready halfway through the night. He nodded and was gone. The next day was a very nervous for me. I fixed the death spark, hopefully, but no way of checking it truly. I brought the red ones as much as I could scavenge in the day, and was rewarded with more rations yet again. This haul was not as good, and I would have to share it with them before long. Perhaps, perhaps, I will use them to help me escape and then leave them behind. That will weigh me down again. I plan for this now, and when the time came in the night and moved into my corner, as promised, we had tools to cut the glass without a sound. A marvelous device that I could hopefully steal before leaving them. The three of us slipped away and approached the blade wire. He had another set of tools that cut through this, but in the ghost city I would not need it. He could keep those. We moved carefully through the dark streets then. I could lead the way without an issue. I had all eyes open. 
We were getting close to the building we normally scavenged. When I saw a patrol, I motioned for the others to stop. I needed to get inside and get the death spark. The patrol was nearly past when the girl suddenly threw up. I looked back in horror as she began to get sick on the side of the building that we were hiding behind. The patrol immediately heard it and began moving our way. I looked to my old friend for a moment and then ran. He couldn't grab me in time to get my help. I just ran for the building to leave them both behind. Once I was inside, I ran up to the table with the hidden death spark, retrieving it from its hiding place as I heard yelling outside. I carefully moved back to the door and could see the patrol outside, my friend and his pregnant wife outside, begging for their lives. I hesitated. Six red ones and I only had one death spark. And even if I shot one, wouldn't they kill my friend anyway? I couldn't kill them all fast enough. I thought it was over in my brain and I told me what to do. I aimed at my friend and pulled the trigger. But there was no death spark. There was a bright blue light that blinded my true vision, making the gasp and stagger in confusion. The red ones were also gasping out, staggering as if clutching their eyes. I was about to run before they got their bearings when the hollow man returned. Walking calmly out of the woods, he approached the red ones, ripping them apart. Literally. With just his hands despite the half the size of the red ones. As I watched, it was strange, beautiful, and terrifying to observe them across the spectrums. They tried to fight back fire, their sparks, swing, their shock sticks, but the hollow man ignored it all. When the patrol was dead, he approached me, and I dropped the death spark. Then he spoke in our language, which surprised me. I knew you were the one to trust. You are smarter than any prisoner I've seen before. You are a human. I asked, more unsure what to say. I... I am, though not in flesh. The hollow man spoke to me. I was once flesh and blood, a scholar, a protector of the city. When the... I didn't recognize the word at first and realized the name that he had used the red ones was Anatlid. They attacked our planet, and they tried to enslave us. But we fought back. They destroyed our fleets, and we fought back. They burned our worlds, and we still fought back. They could not kill us truly. Knowing the length of the battle, I gifted my spirit. I could tell the words were limited to our tongue, to this armor. I fight these anatolid even after all this time. Why help me? I help all under the control of them. I do whatever I can to make them hurt. They thought that they were the masters of the stars and all that was within them. But we said no. We showed them that they could be defeated. Though we were beaten, then we were not beaten truly. We will never stop so long as I am even here to fight them. And fight I shall. That is why I need your help. My help, I gasped, confused and surprised by that. What help can I offer a man made of metal? I need you to return to the camp before they realize you're missing. You might help me better fight them here. Despite what you saw, I can still be destroyed. They have better eyes around the camp, better death sparks. But with you inside to act as my own eyes and even ears, I'll be able to hurt them far more. When the human said my mouth dropped open, it took all my strength not to yell back at him, but instead speak frantically. I finally escaped up the years of which I'm, I'm unsure. I held up my arm. I bear the mark of three other camps. I escaped so that I might survive. You wish me to return, to return to that danger. The hollow armor seemed to hesitate. Was that not your plan to help me save the others? You have been through four camps. This I did not know. But how many more camps must your people endure together? How many other planets do they control and use other slaves in their labor? You can survive as three camps in the city, but how many do you leave behind? Would you rather escape and survive, alone and frightened? Or would you return so that you might stand up and help me fight? You risk your life, but you save the lives of all the prisoners in that camp. Do you have no compassion for them? But, but they will still come for us and the camp falls. The others are... I stammered out, still unsure. Generations ago, I had never been faced with any strong opponents. And they came for us, and we knew to lose, and still we fought. We did not go quiet. We hit them with everything that we had. And while they won, we still also won. 
for their empire is crumbling. And all this time, they use the same weapons, the same armors as they had back then. They have not grown. They use slaves to saw, which I hear them speak of the others of my kind. Perhaps living, perhaps machines like I. We are returning, and they will fall. Every action we take against them will speed up this process. But even alone, humans will free the galaxy from their rule. No matter the cost, no matter how long it takes. So my question is, will you help me save your people? I blinked at that. I blinked in all spectrums. I looked from the hollow man to my friend holding his crying wife, now amid the dead red ones. I was about to leave them. I had planned on robbing them. My entire life had become nothing but survival. Nothing more. I had called the seemingly empty armor hollow. But as I looked at it with only one set of eyes open, I could see the sparks of life very clearly within that shell. Who then was truly more hollow? This armor, filled with hope and heart, or my own body, filled with flesh and an empty hope or soul, ruled only by my mind. I'm unsure how long I stood unable to speak, until finally the words came to me, tell me what I must do to help. I had a new goal. I would free my people, I would help the human, I would atone for my own lost morality. I would do more than survive. I would achieve, and as I headed back to the barracks loaded with gadgets that the human had given to me, and I was positive that we would win. I would redeem myself through this, and I would no longer be hollow. End of story. Simple Life, written by Regal Bleagle Eagle. My life is simple. I forage, I hunt, I kill, I eat, I rest. Once I try to venture beyond the edge of the forest, where the animals dare not tread, to speak to the creatures who make such fantastic things, floating palaces in the sky, trees turned into cities, and even stone worked into art. But the creatures did not want me. The elves, the fairies, the nymphs, and the other creatures were both terrified and disgusted with me. They had no interest in my ability to talk, but only cared for how I looked and I did not look pretty, so I returned to the deep of the forest where I had no companion but my mind. I envy the creatures who shun me. I see how good they are at many things. I hear the echoes of their songs, and I witness the splendor of their magic. I admire their sculptures. From afar, I have tried some of these things, but my voice can only speak or roar, and I have no magic to me. My claws are good for carving meat and not art. From time to time I would attempt to win their favor, but they were terrified by the meat I brought. Nor did they seem to think much of the bounty that I brought from the deep forest. Fungus, insects, mushrooms, all delights to me seemed to disgust them. I had almost given up when I saw a commotion within the cities. The great hosts that gathered, I could tell something important was happening. The banners were flying, the mighty, glorious steeds assembled, and the songs echoed through the forest louder than ever. Surely, with so many mouths to feed, they would want help. But worse, when I tried to bring them food, they chased me off with arrows and lightning. Why would they not let me help them? Dejected, I returned to my deep forest yet again. I returned to my simple life. I foraged, I hunted, I killed, I ate, I rested. When I smelled the intruders in my forest, for a moment I hoped it may be the elves or the fae or the nymphs had come seeking help, to let me join them, but they were coming from the wrong side. When I found them, they were not elf or fae or nymph. I did not know them, but maybe this was my chance. They might be lost. If I guided them, perhaps they'd let me join them this time. When I dropped from my tree before them, I tried to say hello, but I got a nervous and instead could only let out a roar of excitement. I saw most of them pull back weapons and steel and wood ready. I was worried and I messed up again. And the one up front, it did not budge. Instead, it stepped forward and spoke, You there, what's your name? You know, I was at a loss. This had never happened before. I, I'm the beast, I replied simply. The beast? That's a title, not a name, the creature replied. I had no need for more. 
that I could only choke back my excitement that someone was speaking to me like this. Well, the beast, is this your forest? The forest is mine to protect a god, to call home. Are you friends with the elves? This was a question I feared maybe I should lie. As I find out I'm not, but instead I shook my head. I am not. Why not? The creature asked. It didn't seem to mind that I was not. It gave me hope. They do not like me. I could only reply honestly. They don't like you. The creature seemed surprised. Hope grew within me. They say I'm hideous, my body deformed. I replied, but the creature seemed to let out a gasp at that. Hideous, deformed, you look perfect to me. Why would they call you these things? I could scarcely believe my ears. Was this some sort of joke? But I hesitantly opened my mouth, hand tugging at my front of my fangs. With this mouth I cannot sing. But it's better for roaring and biting, the creature replied. I held up my hands to them, claws extended. With these hands I cannot paint or write. But they're better for clawing and shredding. It insisted, sounding even more energetic. I lifted a heavy foot and let out a fell back to the ground. With these feet I cannot dance. But they're better for running and kicking. The creature assured me once more. You do not think I'm ugly, I asked finally, having grown more and more hopeful that this would be finally my first friend. Do you think that I'm ugly? The creature stepped forward, removing the metal helm that it wore. For a moment I nearly wanted to step back and gasp. This was no elf with fine features and fair skin. It was something else, something heavily scarred and misshapen and glittering gold stones replacing some of its teeth. But then I realized I would have only reacted to this kind of creature the way that the owls had reacted to me. No, I said, and the creature smiled, showing more glimmering gold. Then let me teach you why you don't look at the owls for beauty. They are shallow and arrogant creatures. I'm a human, and I can see your true beauty. Just look at your body. I looked down over the form that I'd been taught to hate, to feel shameful. Why sing when you can roar? Why write when you can rend? Why dance when you can hunt? You said they called you hideous and deformed, but that is compared to them. I see you for what you are, and you are perfect. For the first time I began to feel pride in what I was. No creature in the deep forest could hunt like I could, could jump like I could, could roar like I could. This creature was right. Come with me, the creature said then. I need to get through the forest, and it is your home, so we must know of it. Come with me, and the cities of Isles to teach them why they were wrong to shun you. Come with me to show them what you're perfect for. He grinned wide, and I clenched my fists, thinking about it. Come with me, not as a beast, but as a friend, free to choose yourself a name. A real name. The creature extended a small hand that seemed so small as I extended my own. I gave it a gentle shake, and the human, my friend, nodded and waved at the forest. So then, friend, show us the way. My life is simple. I forage, I hunt, I kill, I eat, I rest. But now... Now I do this with friends. I roar, I rend, I hunt. Oh, how I hunt. They join me, they cheer, and I see the light in their eyes as I show them how good I am. They teach me how to appreciate so much that I had taken for granted. The beauty of fire as it burns the crops, the art of the kill artfully executed, the sweet sound of the cries of our enemies. I am with friends now. To some, I'm ugly, but to them, I'm perfect, and to me, they are perfect too. This is a simple life, but happy. End of story. The Gardener, written by Regal, Legal Legal. There was a great beast that stalked the lands. A wolf king who had continued to defeat the very best of each kingdom. The elves had sent their finest marksmen, but the beast moved too quickly to let his heart be pierced by any arrow and soon hunted the hunters. The dwarves had sent their strongest warriors, but the wolf could snap the hammers with his powerful jaws and drive them back towards the long reach. The fae had sent their sorcerers and mages, but the king of the beasts had powerful magics of his own and turned their talents against them. 
Of all of the civilized peoples, only the humans had not sent the champions to try and defeat the creature. As the youngest of the races, they had no warriors stronger than the dwarves, no marksmen better than the elves, no magicians smarter than the fae. Who then could even hope to challenge this creature? But amongst the humans was a gardener who was not a champion of anything. She did not wield a bow with great accuracy. She did not wield a hammer or armor. And she did not have power of magic. Instead, she tended her garden in the woods, trying to live quietly. The beast would not allow this as he trampled her garden time and time again, through his fights with the champions of the other races, and even his grand hunts across his woods. So one day the gardener decided that she would stop his constant trampling of a peaceful garden in the woods. She waited for the next time that the wolf approached her little cabin, intent on hunting a deer and elk to fill his belly. When he was confronted with the gardener, she stood before him with her simple clothes and straw hat and rake in hand. Wolf, I live simply in these woods, tending my garden, and you trample my poor flowers time and time again. The wolf was curious as to this defiant figure before him. He had bested the champions of each of the other realms, but not the humans. The garden attracted the animals he hunted, so he allowed her to stay in the woods. And now she seemed ungrateful for his kindness. Little human, I am the king of beasts, the wolf exclaimed, towering above her. I have felled the strongest dwarf, the fastest elf, and the smartest fay. You dare to speak to me about your garden? I do, for it is mine. I tend to it, and I care for it, and you trample it without concern. The defiant still, the wolf was angry, but curious. And what shall you do about this? he inquired. I shall make you promise to leave my garden alone. She said, and this the wolf howled in laughter for some time. I am the king of beasts, I bow to no one. I rule over all that I see, and I see a great deal, and you, little gardener, will make me a promise to leave your garden alone. Why should I not eat you right now? He asked the gardener, shrugged. I am as small and skinny, and I would not make a good meal. The wolf nodded as this was true. Then why don't I simply leave you now? Can you catch me once I'm on the hunt? He asked, and she shook her head. I am far slower than you, great wolf, and I could not catch you on your hunt. But I will still be here, and when I confront you every time, you will come through and warn the beasts of these woods when you pass by that you are on the hunt. This annoyed the wolf now. Why do I not simply kill you, then, and leave your garden to rot? To his surprise, the human shrugged. Then I will be dead and my garment and will rot, and the birds will sing of the gardener, who scared the king of the beasts. The wolf growled at that. I am afraid of nothing, he exclaimed, in a far great roar that the gardener did not flinch. Then I shall challenge you, and in the end, you will promise not to trample my garden. She replied, and this made the wolf pause. He looked at the small figure before him, her simple clothes and straw hat. What weapon will you use? He asked. My rake, she replied, lifting the tool in her hand. The wolf laughed once more as he decided the human was simply mad. Very well, human, I accept your challenge. With your rake, how shall we fight? He asked. We will not fight, for that is not the challenge. She replied, and he got curious once more, tilting his head. Then what is the challenge? He asked, before she stepped forward and he lifted a massive paw, as big as a body, ready to swat her away. But she moved slowly and raised up her rake. With it, she began to rub it against his chest, and the king of beasts slowly leaned into it. The gardener used her rake to scratch the mighty beast's chest as he lowered his paw and found himself wagging his tail. Before long, he had lowered his head so that she might scratch behind his ears. The last, he rolled onto his back so that she could scratch his belly with the rake. But suddenly, she stopped. The wolf opened his eyes, rolling over to look at the human once more. Why did you stop? I demand you continue. 
he had never felt such a wonderful sensation before, and was annoyed that she had stopped. Do you promise to stop trampling my garden? She asked, and he got off, angry, as he realized what she was doing. I am the king of the beasts, I swear. To no one, I rule these forests as I see fit. But the gardener did not flinch. Then I will not scratch you a grain with my rake, the wolf growled. I will destroy your garden if you do not obey me, he howled. Then I will replant them, as I have done many times. She still did not back down. I will destroy your cabin, he bellowed. Then I will sleep beneath the stars as I rebuild it, she replied, calm as before. I will destroy you. He growled, leaning in close, his massive teeth bigger than her head. Then I will not be able to use my rake. Her simple reply made him stop. She stood there before him, defiant still. His threats doing nothing to persuade her. The wolf stood tall, towering over the lonely gardener, as he thought of all the subjects of his kingdom. He thought of the fish in the rivers, the birds in the sky, the bears in the mountains, his kin in the woods and even the squirrels in the trees. Not one could hold a rake. This is your request, he finally asked, that I do not trample your garden. This is my request, she replied. Finally, the great beast muttered quietly, I will not trample on your garden. You need to swear it, the gardener insisted, and the beast growled for a moment before saying, I, the great wolf, king, of all beasts, swear not to trample your garden, he announced, and the gardener lifted a rake and began to scratch his chest once more. But this would not be the last deal struck between the beast and the gardener. One day the wolf king hunted near the garden, for he wished to enjoy being scratched by the gardener's rake soon after, but to his surprise the gardener offered him a deal. If you bring me the meat from your hunt, I shall prepare it with the herbs from my garden here and cook it for you. You think that I, the great wolf king, need you to prepare my food for me. I have been hunting alone here for centuries. What do you have to offer to one so successful at hunting as me? He asked, more amused than upset. You are a hunter, but only that. I am a gardener. You have not had the taste of the meat finely seasoned and prepared for you, but instead eat simply to survive. Surely... You desire more from this. The great wolf thought this over and accepted a deal. He could spare some meat to sate his curiosity. But once the great king had tasted the meat prepared by the gardener, it was no mere curiosity and a craving growing larger with each new recipe she fed him. He began to detest eating his hunts unless she had the time to season and cook the meat for him his hunts now centering around her garden, so that he could bring back his catch easily. As he got more content with this, she said to make another deal with him. Oh, great wolf king, she said even as she brought him another serving of his favorite seared venison. You are so powerful, strong, and intelligent. I ask why it is that you kill the champions of the other races who come to your forest. They seek to kill me, he growled in response. Should I not seek revenge for this act? to make it clear that I am the great wolf king and am not to be trifled with. But you are so quick and mighty, could you not simply defeat them and send them home alive, to bear the shame of their defeat before their kin? Would this not make their forest safer, as they see you are not a threat, but simply wish to be left alone? As she asked this, the wolf king considered it and slowly shook his head. It is the ancient laws of the forest, I am the great wolf king. They seek my heart, and instead I shall have theirs. He nodded at this, and then turned as she waved her hand at the meal before him. Are you not satisfied with the meals I prepare for you? Does the heart of a champion taste better than the seasoned venison? Or the grilled river salmon? Should I stop making these meals for you, so that you have room in your belly? For the hearts of the champions who offer you no real challenge, but you seek to destroy anyway. The wolf growled as she suggested this, realizing she wanted to make another deal. But as he considered it, he thought perhaps it was not a terrible deal for him. You will continue to make these meals for me if I stop killing the champions. 
You'd seek to keep me full and content, so I see no reason to snack upon their flesh. With that, she nodded. Of course, O great wolf king, it would be my duty to make sure that you have your full of your fair retreats in exchange for your mercy that you show on them. The wolf king nodded and then leaned down to the feast upon the venison that she'd prepared for him. So be it. I, the great wolf king, shall show the champions of the other lands mercy, so long as you keep me well fed. With that, the deal was struck. The wolf no longer killed the champions who came for his pelt, but instead drove them off, as less and less came. As those who survived could tell their kin that he was too mighty to defeat, but content to stay in his forest. As the year wore on, the gardener was able to take an extra meat that he brought and traded with the woodcutters who had begun to move into the forest, hearing of the safety that it brought thanks to the great wolf king. Her small hut became a cabin, with a large roof that let the great wolf king in, so that he may sleep before the great fire that she had inside. As fall turned into winter, he was more comfortable than in any winter past. The gardener had preserved some of the food to last through the cold, and sleeping next to the fire was far better than his old cave, which was bitterly cold in his snowy months. But before he could grow truly complacent, the gardener came to him one day of the first snow. O oh, great wolf king, is it not true that your kin must sleep in caves, huddled together for warmth, against the snow outside? Why do you let your people live like this? The wolf king growled in anger to words. What do you mean, little gardener? Why should they live in any other way? They are my subjects. They may be cold, but they are proud, and they are free. My kin have moved into the forest, the woodcutters and the mushroom pickers and the potion makers. They have built cabins, though, not as large as this. They offer fires and a warm hearth. Would you not let your people take shelter with my kin, as you have done? Would you deny them this? The wolf growled at her in return. You asked me to give my kin to yours. They are free now. Why would they trade it away for a warm hearth? He asked, they may still be free. If you let your kin stay with mine, then they can help hunt, for the hunting is hard in these cold months, and not all my kin are mighty wolf kings to bring them the game as I do. It is not a fair trade to your people. Hunting together in exchange for a roof over their heads and a fire to lay beside. Could not a potion maker's aid your kin as well? Sharing between our peoples what each other offers in exchange to the other. The wolf king considered this, glancing at the large fire beside him that he had made the first night of snow once the comfort and warmth instead of the cold and shivering. Very well. My kin shall stay with yours for this winter. But they are still free. They will simply trade hunting for warmth. But do not think us tame, he warned. Of course, wolf king. I shall swear that my kin will treat yours with respect and kindness if they swear to do the same to us. The wolf considered this and finally nodded. Then I, the great wolf king, shall swear my kin will treat your kin with respect and kindness as well. With that, the wolves and the frost were free to stay in the cabins of the woodcutters and the potion makers and the mushroom pickers, so that they may take shelter in the stormy snowy months in the warmth and comfort instead of the old damp caves. However, when the spring came and the snows began to melt, the birds came out and began to sing, at the once great wolf king, now merely a pet and a simple gardener. This sent the wolf into a rage and he ran in the cabin of the gardener, where she was tending her flowers. He towered over her, growling in anger, as she turned to face him. The birds sing of news, gardener. They sing to a world that I am not a king of beasts, but your pet. They seek to mock me all because of you. Tell me why I should not kill you now and reclaim my title. The gardener smiled up at the great king and then stood up. Because they are wrong, she said simply, and the wolf blinked and growling ceased. I asked you to swear these things because I could not make you through force. You are too strong and mighty. But in sparing my garden, I could grow you herbs for potions and spices for meat that you eat. Inspiring the champions who seek to kill you, you show mercy. In allowing your kin to seek shelter from the cold in the cabins of my kin, you show wisdom. 
and most importantly, in keeping your promises, you show that you are my friend. The wolf blinked once more, as the gardener reached up using her hands instead of a rake, as she stood on her toes to scratch his chin. Her hands were small and gentle, but he leaned into them as she kept scratching. You see, these promises do not make you any less of a king, nor do they make you my pet. The other races do not understand that this is simply makes us friends, and paves the way for our kin to be allies forevermore, and for you to be the greatest king of them all. This sounded good to the king of beasts. He needed to know something before he decided. Why do you not fear me when I first challenged you? He finally asked. I was not afraid, she said simply. This I know, but why? he asked, more curious than ever. Because I knew that you would win in any fight you entered, so I did not try and fight you. But you challenged me, he mentioned, and the gardener laughed. I never said what the challenge was, my dear friend. To me, the challenge was to see if you could resist becoming my friend. The wolf sat down then, letting the gardener more easily scratch his chin with her hands. And then, up along his face, rubbing along his hands, he closed his eyes. He thought of her words, of his skin, of her allies forevermore. He thought of the food that he ate since meeting the gardener more flavorful and rich than any kind that he had before. He thought of the potion she made for him that soothed his stomach and aided him when he was sick, such things he'd never had before. He thought of the fire in the winter that kept him warm in the cold and how peacefully he'd slept by her side. He thought of his kin, of how many more had survived their winter in the cabins of a kin. How many were cured of their illnesses by the potions of the humans made? How many of them found new purpose working alongside the gardener's skin? Yes, he would allow this to happen. And he would be the greatest king of them all, for he had made allies with the humans forevermore. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes the end of this Mega Pack video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support any of the authors, the links will be down below. If you wish to support this channel, please consider becoming a Patreon or a channel member if you enjoy multiple videos, or perhaps leaving a tip in the tip jar if you enjoyed this video. As always, I will see you all in the next video. And until then, I hope you all have a good one. Cheers.